Then of commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard, The Lord's Supper, Part Two. Twenty-ninth Lord's Day, Question 78. Do then the bread and wine become the very body and blood of Christ? Answer, not at all. But as the water in baptism is not changed into the blood of Christ, neither is the washing away of sin itself, being only the sign and confirmation thereof appointed of God, so the bread of the Lord's Supper is not changed into the very body of Christ, though agreeably to the nature and properties of sacraments it is called the body of Christ Jesus. Exposition the Catechism, in the answer to this question, rejects the doctrine of transubstantiation advocated by the Papists, and also the doctrine of consubstantiation defended by the Ubiquitarians and others, and explains the language which is here used, together with the true sense of the words of Christ, This is my body. In our exposition of this question, we shall consider in the first place the form of speech here used, and the true sense of the words of Christ, and then notice the controversies in regard to this subject. And here we must refer to this sacrament, what was said when speaking of sacramental phrases in general. It is in this way that Augustine makes an application of the general rule of sacramental phrases to the particular instance of eating the flesh of Christ when he says, quote, The only way by which we can determine whether a scriptural phrase is to be taken in a proper or figurative sense is to see if it can be properly referred to some moral duty or be made to harmonize with the true faith, and if this cannot be done, then we may know that it is spoken figuratively. End quote. And then, a little further on, he produces this example, quote, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Here Christ seems to enjoin a shameful crime. Hence it must be understood figuratively, as teaching us that we must partake of the passion of our Lord, and joyfully and profitably call to mind that his flesh was wounded and pierced for us. End quote. As the scriptures sometimes speak of baptism properly, and at other times figuratively, as we demonstrated when speaking of baptism, so they speak in like manner of the Lord's Supper. It is, for instance, a figurative mode of speech when Christ says, of the bread, this is my body, and of the cup, this is my blood, and when Paul says, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. For in all these instances the name of the thing signified is attributed to the sign by a sacramental metonymy. It is in the same way that we must understand Paul when he says, This is my body which is broken for you, because he attributes the property of this sign, which is to be broken, to the thing signified. It is in the same way that Cyprian says, quote, When we drink of the cup we hang to the cross, we suck the blood and place our tongues in the very wounds of our Redeemer. End quote. It is in the same way that we must understand Chrysostom when he says, quote, The blood of Christ is in the cup, the body of Christ which is in heaven is placed on earth to our view nor is it only seen, but it is touched. Nor is it only touched, but eaten. It is held and eaten by us as a token of love, as we sometimes fondle those whom we love, etc. End quote. These declarations are all to be understood as spoken figuratively of the body of Christ. These are proper forms of speech when Christ says, This do in remembrance of me, and when the fathers everywhere in their writings say, The breaking of the bread is a memorial of the sacrifice of Christ, the bread signifies the body of Christ. It is a figure, a sign, a sacrament of the body of Christ. Of the controversy respecting the words of the institution of the Holy Supper. Since our adversaries, the Papists and others, deny that Christ speaks sacramentally in the words of the institution and contend that his words are to be literally understood, we must here say something in regard to this controversy. The Papists imagine that by virtue of the consecration the bread is changed or converted into the body of Christ, the accidents only remaining. They call this transubstantiation. There are others again who contend that there is a consubstantiation or coexistence of the body of Christ in or with the bread. These two classes of persons equally boast that they understand the words of Christ in their natural sense, which, however, is far from being true, for the true simplicity and property of words is that to which, for a proper understanding and interpretation, nothing is added, taken away, or changed. But those who believe that the body of Christ is with, in, or under the bread, add to the words of Christ, and so depart from their true simplicity. For if we are to retain simply what Christ said, and if that is not to be admitted which he did not say, then we cannot say, the bread is bread and the body of Christ at the same time, but simply, the bread is the body of Christ. For Christ did not say, my body is in, or with, or under the bread, for the bread is bread, and my body at the same time, nor did he add, as these persons do, really, substantially, corporally. But these were all the words he uttered, This is my body. Neither can the advocates of the doctrine of transubstantiation prove that they interpret the words of Christ in their natural sense, 
when they say that the bread is changed into the body of Christ, for this is an invention of their own. Christ does not say the bread was already made or being made or would be made his body, but he merely said, The bread is my body, from which it is plain that no change can be admitted if the words of Christ are understood in their literal sense. Hence it is with little success that these persons endeavour to make it appear that they interpret the words of Christ in their literal sense, when they in so many respects and so manifestly depart from them. We, however, retain the words of Christ simply without any addition or change, affirming that the bread is the body of Christ, the true and visible body which was offered for us upon the cross. But as these words, when understood in their literal signification, teach what is repugnant to the true Christian faith, for if the bread were the body of Christ in a proper sense, it would follow that it was crucified for us. We must interpret them sacramentally, which is to say, that the bread is called the body of Christ because it is the sign of his body, and that the cup, or the wine in the cup, is called the blood of Christ, because it is the sign of the blood of Christ. The cup is likewise called the New Testament, because it is the sign of the New Testament, as baptism is called the washing away of sin, and the washing of regeneration, because it is the sign of both these things, which are effected by the blood and spirit of Christ. The true sense and interpretation, then, of the words of Christ, This is my body which is given for you, is, This bread which I break and give unto you, is the sign of my body which was delivered unto death for you, and is a certain seal of your union with me, so that whosoever shall believe and eat this bread does, in a certain sense, really and truly eat my body. The name of the thing signified is therefore attributed to the sign by a sacramental metonymy, and that, both on account of the analogy which there is between the sign and the thing signified, and also on account of the connection which the thing signified has with the sign in its proper use. In this interpretation, which we have now given of the words of Christ, we have not been deceived and led astray by philosophy and human reason, as our adversaries basely misrepresent us, but we have been governed by those rules according to which, by the consent of all wise men, we are to judge of the correctness of the interpretation of any portion of Scripture, viz. according to the analogy or rule of faith, according to the nature of the subject or thing, and according to the testimony of Scripture which establishes the same thing. It is by the help of these three rules that the true sense of Scripture is generally determined whenever there is any necessity to depart from the letter to the sense of any particular portion of divine truth. 1. That no interpretation is to be received which does not agree with the rule of faith, or which is opposed to any particular article of faith, or to any command of the Decalogue, or to any express declaration of Scripture, is evident from this that the spirit of truth does not contradict itself. 2. That we may know if the sense or meaning conveyed by any words corresponds with the nature of the subject spoken of, when there is any controversy as to the true meaning, we must see, as here concerning the supper, which is a sacrament, how the scriptures in other places speak of the sacraments, and particularly of the supper. 3. And lastly, other parallel passages of scripture must be considered, which either plainly and confessedly teach the same thing, or from which we may prove, in other words, that the same doctrine is taught concerning the same thing as that which is comprehended in the passage under controversy, for if we can arrive at the true meaning of any other clearer and uncontroverted passage of divine truth, we may also be fully persuaded of the sense of the one about which there is a dispute, if both teach the same thing. Hence it is evident that the interpretation of the words of Christ in reference to the institution of this supper, which agrees with these rules, must be true, whilst those which differ from them are false. Now the interpretation which we have given of the words, which indeed is not ours, but the interpretation of Christ himself, of the Apostle Paul, and of all the Orthodox Fathers, agrees in every respect with these rules. There can, therefore, be no doubt of its correctness and agreement with the truth of the Gospel. We shall now proceed to the arguments by which we prove that the interpretation which we have given of the words of Christ is true. These arguments consist of four kinds. First, there are some which we deduce from the text itself and from the circumstances connected with the institution of the Lord's Supper. Second, there are others which we gather from the nature of the thing or subject by understanding the words in a sense corresponding with the thing itself, or which is the same thing as to understand them according to the nature of all sacraments. Third, there are others again which we infer from the analogy of the articles of our faith or from a comparison of the different parts of Christian doctrine. Fourth, and lastly, there are others which we derive from parallel passages of Scripture which teach the same things with such plainness as to leave no room for controversy. First, the arguments deduced from the words and circumstances connected with the institution of the Lord's Supper. 1. The human nature of Christ at the first celebration of the Supper sat at the table in its own proper place and is now in heaven. 
hence it was not then, nor is it now corporally at the same time in the bread, or in the place of the bread. 2. Christ did not at the first supper take into his hand, nor break his body, but the bread, hence the bread is not properly and in reality the very body of Christ. 3. The body of Christ was born of the virgin, bread is made out of meal, it is not therefore really the body of Christ. 4. Christ said of the visible bread which was broken, This is my body, and of the visible cup which he gave to the disciples, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Hence the papists do not hold fast to the letter when they thus transpose the words of Christ, My body is contained under the form of bread and wine, nor do the ubiquitarians when they say, My body is in, with, and under this bread, much less when they both say, my invisible body, which is contained under this form, or under this bread, is my body. For both of them do not only manifestly depart from the letter to a gloss of their own, but they also wickedly pervert the words of Christ in the very first gloss which they make. As if it were written, My body is under this, and in the latter they make Christ utter a foolish tautology, as if he had said, My body is my body. 5. The body of Christ which we eat in the supper was delivered to death and crucified for us. This, however, cannot be said of the bread, hence it is not properly nor in reality the body of Christ. 6. The cup is the New Testament, in the same way in which the bread is the body of Christ, but the cup is the New Testament sacramentally, as we have already shown, and as we may still further prove by this argument, the New Testament is not properly drunk with the mouth, but believed with the heart. But the cup is drunk with the mouth, therefore it cannot properly be the New Testament. It is now in the same sense that the bread is the body of Christ, viz. in a sacramental sense. 7. If the bread is properly the body and the cup the blood of Christ, it must follow that in the first supper the blood was separated from the body of Christ, and then they are both exhibited to us separately, as they are separate signs. But neither was the blood in the first supper without the body, nor is the body of Christ now given to us without the blood. For then, at the first supper, Christ was not yet dead, nor does he now die any more. The bread is therefore the body, and the cup the blood of Christ, not properly, but sacramentally. 8. That which Christ himself ate and drank was not properly his body and blood, or else he must have eaten and drunk himself but he ate of that bread and drank of that cup. I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine. Mark 14, verse 25. Chrysostom says, quote, Christ also drank of the wine, lest his disciples, when hearing these words, should say, What, shall we then drink his blood and eat his flesh, and so be troubled? For when he first made mention of this kind of eating and drinking, many became offended at his words. Hence, in order that this might not now occur, he himself first ate and drank, that he might thus lead them with a calm mind to the communion of these mysteries. End quote. Hence the bread and cup are not properly but sacramentally the body and blood of Christ. 9. Remembrance is not of things bodily present but absent. Christ instituted this sacrament to his remembrance, therefore he is not corporally present in the bread or in the sacrament. 10. Christ with his body is either not substantially in the bread, nor under the form of bread, or the supper is no longer to be celebrated. For the apostle commands us to eat of this bread, and to drink of this cup, and to show the Lord's death till he come. The celebration of this supper is, then, evidently not to be dispensed with, but must continue to the end of the world. Christ has not, therefore, come as yet, neither is he bodily present in the bread, or under the form of bread. 11. Lastly, as the bread was the body of Christ in the first supper, and as the disciples did eat the body of Christ, so in the very same sense, and in no other, is the bread now the body of Christ, and it is in the very same way that we eat the body of Christ, for the supper which we celebrate is the same which the disciples celebrated. But the bread in the first supper was not essentially the body of Christ, neither did the disciples eat with their mouths the body of Christ in, or under the form of bread, for Christ reclined at the table with his disciples in a corporal and visible manner, and did not undergo any change during the whole transaction. Therefore the bread is not now the body of Christ as to its essence, nor do we eat with our mouths the body of Christ in or under the form of bread. Second, the arguments which are drawn from the nature of sacraments. One, 
the very form of speech which is used furnishes a strong argument in favour of the view which we have presented. The bread is the body of Christ. But bread is not in its own substance the body of Christ, for it has been by reason of this that the idea of transubstantiation and consubstantiation has been invented. Therefore the language is figurative and sacramental, being such as is common to the sacraments, and which we have explained when speaking of the institution of the supper. 2. In all sacraments, when the names or properties of the things signified are attributed to the signs, it does not signify the corporal presence of the things in the signs, but a correspondence between the signs and things signified, and a sealing of the things by their signs, and a union of these two things in their lawful use. In this supper now, Christ attributes the names of the things signified, his body and blood, to the signs, bread and wine, saying, This is my body, this is my blood. Hence we must not understand these words as expressing any corporal presence. 3. The nature of all sacraments requires that the signs be taken corporally, whilst the things signified must be understood spiritually, and that the things which are visible are not the things signified, being only the signs and pledges of them. Hence, inasmuch as the supper is a sacrament, we must take the signs and things signified in a sense corresponding with the nature of sacraments generally. 4. Sacramental phrases must be understood sacramentally. The words of the supper, this is my body, this is my blood, are sacramental phrases, for they attribute the names of the things signified to the signs which are used in this sacrament. They must therefore be understood sacramentally. Objection, but the words of the supper do not contain any figure of speech, therefore they are not to be interpreted sacramentally but literally. Answer, we deny the antecedent, for Christ himself annexes a sacramental phrase, saying, do this, that is, eat this bread and drink this cup in remembrance of me, that ye may be admonished and assured that my body was given over to death, and my blood shed for you and given to you as the meat and drink of eternal life. The same thing may be said of this declaration of Christ, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, that is, it is the seal of the New Testament, or of the promises of grace, now fulfilled by my blood. 5. That which the gospel does not promise, the supper cannot seal unto us, for the sacraments declare, exhibit, confirm, and seal the same thing which the word promises. It is for this reason that the sacraments are called visible promises and visible words, but the gospel nowhere promises any corporal or oral eating. Yea, Christ in the gospel expressly condemns and refutes it by these two arguments. One, because his body would in a short time be taken up into heaven, and so be far removed from the Jews to whom he spake. Two, because the eating of his flesh in this way could be of no profit, nor does Christ, in the instance to which reference is here had, merely refer to a gross, carnal, and oral mandication of his flesh. But he rejects in a positive way the eating of his flesh in every form in which it may be done with the mouth. There is therefore no oral or corporal mendication to be conceived of in the supper, which is contrary to the gospel. 6. The figment of corporal presence and eating of the flesh of Christ under the bread is wholly repugnant to the formal character of the sacraments. It is therefore to be rejected. That the antecedent is true is evident from this, that it is neither the sign nor the thing signified, of which two things every sacrament consists. It is not the sign, because it does not strike the senses, neither is there anything included in it which it might signify, nor can it be said to be the things signified, because the scriptures never speak of any change of the essence, nor of any real commingling of the flesh of Christ with our bodies. Neither can there be any unless we embrace the reveries of the Eutychians and Swankfieldians, for the sacraments declare and seal unto us only such blessings as are contained in the promise of the gospel. Again, it is not the thing signified because it is effected without faith, and is common both to the godly and the ungodly, whereas the things which are signified by the sacraments are received by faith alone, and by none but the godly. And still further, if it were the thing signified, no one ever had been, or would be, saved without it, for all the sacraments signify the same things, which are also given to all those who are to be saved, because they are the benefits of the Messiah, comprehended in the promise of the gospel. These benefits are the same unto all, neither is any one saved without them. There is therefore no room left for a substantial presence and oral manducation of the body of Christ in or under the form of bread in the sacrament, and it is, in fact, nothing more than an empty name and idol in the world. 
objection this oral manducation is a sign of that which is spiritual and is a great confirmation of our faith therefore the body of christ is also a sacrament whilst the thing signified is invisible grace answer the antecedent is false because the flesh of christ is invisible under the bread and cannot therefore signify another thing which is invisible or confirm our faith sacraments or signs ought to be visible hence that does not deserve to be called a sacrament as erasmus says which is not accomplished by an external sign for the sacraments have been instituted for this end that they may as it were effectually show to our external senses what the word promises and the holy spirit works in our hearts that they may be visible testimonies and pledges of the promise of grace exhibited and applied it is for this reason that augustine says quote, a sacrament is a visible word end quote and quote, it is a visible form or sign of an invisible grace end quote. again quote, a sign is a thing which differs from the form which it presents to our senses and produces in our thoughts something else end quote. again quote, the signs of divine things are indeed visible but the things themselves are invisible end quote. hence also the definition of prosper Quote, the sacrifice of the church consists of two things the visible form of the signs and the invisible flesh and blood of our lord jesus christ in the sign and the thing signified thereby which is the body of christ end quote. there is therefore no invisible thing or action that brings to view the nature or thing signified by the sacrament consequently those who affirm that the flesh of christ is a sacrament in under or with the bread must show unto us this visible and sensible eating of the supper if they do not wish to stand in opposition to the general voice of the church again there must be an analogy between the sign and the thing signified for unless the sacraments says augustine have some correspondence with the things of which they are sacraments they would be no sacraments now if the flesh of christ be also a sacrament and if the thing signified be invisible grace what analogy and correspondence will there be between the two sacraments there can evidently be none from which it follows that the flesh of christ cannot be called a sacrament seeing it is not less the thing signified by the sacrament than the salvation which is signified analogically by the bread as by a sign hence the sacramental eating which is effected by the mouth does not when considered in itself extend to the body of christ in any physical manner because by this eating nothing more than the external signs are exhibited and received in their own nature Augustine, inquiring how the bread is the body of Christ and the wine his blood, says, quote, These brethren are called sacraments, because one thing is seen in them and another is understood. That which is seen has a material form, that which is understood a spiritual benefit, etc. End quote. 7. The communion which the word promises and the sacraments seal is not corporal but spiritual. But the communion of Christ, which there is in the supper, is the same which is promised in the word and sealed in the other sacraments therefore the communion which there is in the supper is not corporal but spiritual the first proposition is clear because the gospel teaches no other communion than that which is spiritual which is effected by faith the second proposition is also evident because the promises of the gospel extend unto us the very same blessings which the sacraments exhibit and promise for the sacraments are a visible word inasmuch as they promise the same thing which the word does by visible signs and are seals of the promise of the same grace eight all the sacraments both of the old and the new testament signify the same thing and the same communion with christ but the signification and communion of all the other sacraments is wholly spiritual therefore it must be the same as it regards the supper all grant the truth of the minor proposition the major is confirmed by what the apostle says for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body they were all baptized under moses in the cloud and in the sea and they all did eat the same spiritual meat 1 corinthians 12 verse 13 chapter 10 verse 2 objection but all the sacraments do not signify the same thing for baptism signifies washing by the blood of christ the lord's supper the body and blood of christ answer the thing signified is not different because as we have already shown to be washed with the blood of christ and to drink his blood is the same thing the manner in which the thing signified which is one and the same is expressed is indeed different on account of the different signs which have not the same analogy to that which is signified therefore as the thing signified and promised in baptism and also in circumcision and the passover is spiritual and not corporal 
so it is likewise in relation to the supper. Third, the arguments drawn from the analogy or correspondence of the articles of our faith. One, there are strong arguments in support of the view which we have presented, drawn from the article which has respect to the truth of the human nature of Christ. The word assumed a nature like unto ours in all things, sin excepted, and will retain the same to all eternity for our comfort and salvation. But human nature is not infinite, nor can it be at the same time in many places, nor visible and invisible. To be essentially present in many and in all places at the same time is peculiar to the Godhead alone. According as it is said, Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? Jeremiah 23, verse 43. God is by this attribute distinguished from all creatures, nor can the Godhead itself be at the same time visible and invisible, finite and infinite, but it remains always as to its substance invisible, incomprehensible and infinite, otherwise it would not be unchangeable. Hence we must not suppose that when Christ says, This is my body, that his body then sat visibly at the table, and was at the same time invisible in the bread, or that it now remains at the same time visible in heaven, and is also contained invisibly in the bread. 2. From the article of Christ's ascension. Christ ascended truly, by which we mean that he was taken up into heaven, with his body visibly and locally, in such a manner that his body did not remain, nor does it now remain on earth, but in heaven, and that he will come from thence to judge the world, hence he is not in the bread. Or, we may thus state the argument, the body of Christ is finite, seeing it is a true body, but it is now in heaven, therefore it is not in the bread. The major proposition is established by the article of Christ's ascension into heaven. While they beheld, he was taken up. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth, etc. Acts 1 verse 9, Colossians 3 verse 1. Again, if the true body of Christ is infinite, as our adversaries affirm, then it is also invisible and insensible. Hence, that was not a true body of Christ, being only apparent, which was seen, suffered, and moved upon the earth. And so all those things which are spoken of Christ in the articles of our faith could not have been truly done, but must have been done only in appearance, so that we still remain under the power of death, if this be true. Here, however, two things must be observed. One, the argument which we draw from the article of Christ's ascension does not remove his body from the supper, as some slanderously say of us, but only from the bread, for the distance between heaven and earth, whilst it makes it impossible that Christ's body should exist in heaven and be in the bread at the same time, does not stand in the way of his presence in the supper to be eaten spiritually by faith. Our faith in the promise joined to the bread and wine beholds and embraces the body and blood of Christ and all his benefits as most truly present in the supper. 2. The argument here deduced from the two articles of faith alluded to overthrows the conceit of Christ's corporal presence in the bread, for if the human nature of Christ must be everywhere or present at the same time in many places, his ascension would not prevent its being both in heaven and in the bread at one and the same time. But as the human nature of Christ is finite and not present in many nor in all places, it follows that the argument which we deduce from his ascension into heaven is irresistible, for as the consequence which naturally follows from the property of Christ's human nature in respect to the first celebration of the supper which we may thus state, the body of Christ sat at the table, therefore it was not in the bread, nor in the mouths of his disciples. As this consequence is legitimate and irresistible, so it is a proper consequence which we draw from the truth of the ascension of Christ into heaven, when we thus reason, the body of Christ is in heaven, therefore it is not in the bread, nor anywhere else upon the earth. Objection. It is only human reason which decides that Christ's corporal presence in the bread is opposed to these articles of our faith. Therefore, it may not in reality be opposed to them. Answer. We deny the antecedent because Christian faith and the word of God teach in connection with reason that the body of Christ, which is indeed human and finite, cannot exist at the same time in all nor many places, and that now, since the ascension, it is not on earth but in heaven, and will remain there till Christ come to judge the quick and the dead. Hence it is not only repugnant to human reason, but also to the word of God, that Christ's body should be present at one and the same time in heaven and in the bread. It is indeed an incontrovertible truth that human reason is not to be heard in divine things when it is in manifest opposition to the word of God, and that it should always submit to the holy scriptures which contain a revelation of the divine will. 
yet it is not to be simply and unceremoniously thrust aside or rejected, no, not even in divine things, as if the word of God could teach that which is in opposition to sound reason, but we must use it aright, that so we may distinguish truth from falsehood. God has endowed us with reason that we may be able, by the light of the understanding, to decide in regard to contradictory opinions, and that, knowing with certainty what is in harmony with the word of God, and what is in opposition to it, we may embrace the former and reject the latter. If this were not so, there would be no dogma so absurd and impious, there would be nothing in the polluted sinks of heretics, however detestable and monstrous, which could be refuted by the holy scriptures, for all heretics and impostors always boast that their opinions are not in opposition to the word of God, but that they only seem to contradict it in the judgment of human reason. To this it is objected as follows. The scriptures attribute to the body of Christ many properties and prerogatives, which are beyond and above nature, which our bodies do not possess, such as to walk upon the water, to be transfigured, to be carried up into heaven, to pass through a rock and closed doors, to be personally united to deity, to be made a sacrifice for sin, etc. Therefore it is not absurd to say that it is present at the same time in heaven and in the bread, or that it possesses ubiquity itself. Answer, the antecedent has falsehood mingled with what is true. The scriptures nowhere affirm that the body of Christ passed through a rock and doors that were closed, hence we deny it. The other things which are enumerated are, indeed, spoken of in the scriptures, but they are such things as may be found in connection with a nature that is truly human. For Peter also walked upon the water, and we shall also be transformed and ascend into heaven. But the ubiquity or presence of Christ's flesh in many places at the same time is never affirmed in the scriptures. For to be everywhere present, or to be present at different places at the same time, is peculiar to the Godhead alone, which is infinite, but every creature is finite and is by its own finiteness distinguished from the Creator. That now which is finite cannot be at the same time in more places than one, hence it is that the scriptures and the most distinguished teachers in the ancient church speak of this presence in many places as a most forcible argument of true divinity. Christ says himself, the Son of Man, which is in heaven, John 3 verse 13. Didymus says, quote, the Holy Ghost himself, if he were a creature, would at least have a substance that would be limited, as is the case with all created things. For although invisible beings are not circumscribed in place, yet they are finite as to the property of their substance. But the Holy Ghost has not a limited substance, seeing that he dwells in many. End quote. Tertullian says, quote, If Christ be nothing more than a man, how could he be present, wherever he is called upon, inasmuch as to be present everywhere does not belong to the nature of man, but to that of God? End quote. Hence our adversaries, when they imagine that these prerogatives are the cause of Christ's presence in many, and in all places, are guilty of admitting that as a cause which is none, or they at least argue from things that are unlike, for the cause of these things and that of ubiquity are quite different. 3. From the article of the Communion of Saints. The Communion of Saints with Christ is the same now that it has ever been or ever will be, both in regard to those who use the sacraments and also in regard to those who are by necessity excluded from their use. For there is only one Communion of Saints with Christ, inasmuch as we are all one body in Him. But the Communion of Saints with Christ has always been of a spiritual character, as the Apostle teaches when he says, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. He is the vine, we are the branches. He is the head, we are the members. He is the bridegroom. We, with the whole church, constitute his spouse. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17, 1 John 4 verse 15, John 15 verse 5, Ephesians 1 verse 22, chapter 4 verse 15, etc. Or, the argument may be thus presented, all the saints have the same communion with Christ, those of the Old Testament as well as those of the New, those who have the opportunity of observing the supper as well as those who have not the privilege, 1 Corinthians 10, Ephesians 4, Romans 8. Neither can we eat Christ in any other way than the disciples did at the first celebration of this supper, but they ate him spiritually, therefore we also eat him in a similar manner. We argue again from this same article, the eating of Christ is the same as his dwelling in us. But this is spiritual, therefore the eating of Christ is also spiritual. The major is evident from the fact that we eat Christ, 
that he may dwell in us and we in him, and not that he should depart from us as soon as he is eaten. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. John 6 verse 56. The minor is proven by this, that Christ's dwelling in us is the same as that of the Father. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. John 14 verse 23. But how does the Father abide or dwell in us? Assuredly by the Holy Spirit. Hence it is in the same way that Christ abides with us and dwells in us. Here the following passages of Scripture are in point. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his Spirit, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me and I in him, etc. 1 John 4 verse 13, Ephesians 3 verse 17, John 15 verse 5. 4. From the article of the forgiveness of sins. If Christ be in the bread in a corporal manner, and be given by the hands of the minister, then forgiveness of sins ought to be sought from the hands of God on account of that which is in the bread, and which the minister has in his hand, whether the bread remains at the same time with him or not. For remission of sins, for the sake of Christ, is most especially to be sought whenever we celebrate the supper. Those who commune ought therefore to pray thus, I beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, that thou wouldst be gracious to me for the sake of this thy Son, who is in this bread, who is handled by the minister, and whom I eat with my mouth. This is that shocking idolatry which is practised in the Popish Mass, which is doubtless so displeasing in the sight of God, that it were better for us to suffer a thousand deaths than that we should ever be guilty of it. The Gospel teaches us, however, that we ought to ask of God the forgiveness of sins, not for the sake of Christ who is in the bread, and who is carried in the hands of the minister and eaten with the mouth, but for the sake of him who suffered and died for us, and who is now in heaven at the right hand of God, interceding for us. Hence, we thus argue, that which goes to establish the shocking idolatry of the Mass is to be rejected, the corporal presence and oral mendication of Christ in the bread go to establish the idolatry of the Mass, Therefore, they are to be rejected. 6. We may here yet add the arguments drawn from the sacrifice and worship of Christ. Wherever it is evident that Christ is bodily present, whether it be in a visible or invisible manner, there he is to be worshipped by having our thoughts and affections directed to that place. But Christ is not to be thus worshipped in the supper, for we are not to have our thoughts and affections turned to the bread or the place of the bread. Therefore he is not present in the bread in a corporal manner, nor in the place of the bread. The major proposition is too plain to need any proof. The minor is evident from this, that since the ascension of Christ into heaven we cannot, without being guilty of manifest idolatry, associate divine worship with any particular place or thing, unless God expressly command it, or utter some promise in regard to it. For Christ has plainly taught us, that we are now no longer to restrict our devotions to any particular place or thing on earth. The hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4 verses 21 to 25. And still further, if we are to worship Christ in the supper by having our thoughts and devotions directed to the bread, then the priests who offer sacrifices would have in their own hands that whole sacrifice by which they offer the Son unto the Father for the purpose of obtaining forgiveness of sins, and so it would be necessary to repeat the crucifixion of Christ. Objection, but Christ did not command that we should offer or worship him in the bread, but that we should eat him. Therefore, neither the offering of Christ to the Father, nor the worshipping of him in the bread, as the papists do, can grow out of his corporal presence in the bread. Answer, those who thus argue beg the question, for the scriptures nowhere affirm that Christ commanded us to eat him in the bread. Then they also shift the question at issue, for the command which we have concerning the worship of Christ is general. He is the Lord, and worship thou him. Let all the angels of God worship him. Psalm 45 verse 12, Hebrews 1 verse 6. This general command, without any exception or expectation of a special precept, should constrain us all to obey and adore Christ in the bread, if it were clearly evident that he was invisibly concealed in it, not less than if we saw him present with our eyes. 
so Thomas acted properly when, without waiting for any special command, he worshipped towards the place where he saw Christ standing, exclaiming, My Lord and my God. John 20, verse 28. As long, therefore, as the idea of a corporal presence in the supper prevails, so long will the idolatry of the papists continue, for the papists themselves, when they make an offering of Christ in the Mass, will not have us to understand this as if Christ were put to death thereby, but merely as an exhibition of Christ, who is present in the bread in a corporal manner, and a seeking and obtaining the forgiveness of sins for the sake of him whom the priests hold in their hands, and present unto the Father. Fourth, the arguments, drawn from parallel passages of Scripture which teach the same doctrine in language which does not admit of any controversy. 1. Parallel passages or phrases that are alike have the same sense and interpretation. All those phrases are regarded as similar or as sacramental phrases in which the names or proper effects of the things signified are attributed to the signs, as circumcision is the covenant of God, the Lamb is the Lord's Passover, the Sabbath is the covenant of God, the Levitical sacrifices are an atonement for sin, the blood of the victims offered as sacrifices is the blood of the covenant, the covering of the ark is the mercy seat, that rock was Christ, the bread is the body of Christ, the cup is the New Testament, baptism is the washing away of sin, and the washing of regeneration, etc. Genesis 17 verse 10, Exodus 12 verse 11, chapter 31 verse 16, Leviticus 1 verse 4, Exodus 24 verse 8, chapter 26 verse 34, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 3, etc. Therefore, the interpretation of all these phrases is similar. God himself interprets some of them in this way, as may be seen by a reference to the above quotations, where he calls circumcision the token of the covenant, the lamb the sign and memorial of the Passover, and the Sabbath the sign of the covenant. We may therefore justly interpret the rest in the same way, and say, the Levitical sacrifices signify the atonement which the Messiah made for sin, the blood of the victims is a sign which confirms the covenant, or it is the sign of the blood of Christ, by which the covenant was sanctified. The covering of the ark signified the mercy seat, that rock signified Christ, the bread is a sacrament of the body of Christ, the cup is a sacrament sealing the new covenant, baptism is a sacrament of the washing away of sin and of regeneration, etc. 2. The blood of Christ is the New Testament in the same sense in which the cup is, but the cup is the New Testament sacramentally, that is, it is the sign of it, therefore the blood of Christ is also the sign of the New Testament. That the major of this syllogism is true is evident from this, that the words of Luke and Paul, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, and those of Matthew and Mark, this is my blood of the New Testament, have without doubt the same meaning. The minor is proven by the first argument and cannot be understood in any other sense, for the New Testament is not an external ceremony or thing, but it is the gracious reconciliation with God which the gospel promises for the sake of the blood of Christ. The cup must then either be the thing promised, or it is the seal of the promise. But it is not the promise nor the thing which is promised, therefore it is the seal of the promise. 3. We may here repeat the words of Paul, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? 1 Corinthians 10 verse 16. The bread is now the communion of the body of Christ in the same sense, in which it is also his body, because the words of Paul and Christ have the same meaning. Paul may indeed be regarded as giving us an interpretation of the words of Christ, but the bread is the communion of the body of Christ sacramentally, that is, it is a sacrament or sign of our spiritual communion with the body of Christ, for bread cannot properly and literally be called a communion. Therefore, the bread is also sacramentally the body of Christ, which is to say it is a sacrament or sign of his body, that the communion or communication of the body of Christ is spiritual is proven by these arguments. 1. Paul speaks of such a communion as that by which we, being many, are one bread and one body, which is spiritual in its nature. 2. The communion of Christ, of which the Apostle speaks, excludes the communion of devils. Hence he says, Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils, ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 21. This is not an argument resulting from mere impropriety, as some suppose, but from an impossibility of the thing itself. It is the same as when Christ says, Ye cannot serve God and mammon, Matthew 6 verse 24, for the original word, which in both places is translated, Ye cannot, is the same. Paul reasons in the same way when he says, What concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? 
2 Corinthians 6 verse 15. 3. This communion of saints with Christ and of Christ with the faithful, the scriptures explain spiritually, as when it is said, Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. 1 John 1 verses 3 to 8. This spiritual communion which the saints have with Christ and he with them is the same as that in which we profess our belief in the creed. 4. Lastly, Chrysostom interprets the words of Paul as expressing a spiritual communion, saying, quote, Why did not the apostle use the word metoke, which means participation, that he might direct attention to something more excellent, viz. to that union which is of the most intimate nature? End quote. And a little further on he says, quote, Why do I call it communion? Because we are the very same body of Christ. What is the bread? It is the body of Christ. What are they made who receive the body of Christ? Not many, but one body. For as bread is baked out of many grains, so are we also incorporated with Christ. End quote. Homily 24 in 1 Corinthians 10. For the words of Christ as recorded in the sixth chapter of John are also here in point. What, and if ye see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, it is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6 verses 62 and 63. In these words Christ expressly rejects the eating of his flesh with the mouth, and refutes it by two arguments which we have noticed on a former occasion, and at the same time establishes the idea of a spiritual mendication. Hence we are not to imagine a corporal eating of the body of Christ, seeing that the scriptures expressly condemn it. Objection, but the sixth chapter of John has no reference to the supper, therefore it cannot be said to prove anything against the oral mendication of the body of Christ instituted in the supper. Answer, but it is a false argument which proceeds to the denial of the whole, when there is only a denial in part. We admit that this chapter does not refer directly to the ceremony of the supper, but it does not follow from this that it has no reference to it whatever. It has reference to the promise, This is my body which is given for you. For this promise is drawn from the discourse of Christ in the sixth chapter of John, and is confirmed by the signs of bread and wine. It cannot, therefore, be understood of any other eating of Christ's body in the supper than that which we have in his discourse in the Gospel of John, which is spiritual. For, as we have just seen, it condemns the eating of his flesh orally. To this our adversaries reply, This chapter does not condemn an oral, but a caponatical eating, to which we answer that every eating of Christ's flesh with the mouth is caponatical, and therefore condemned, for a caponatical eating is not only a bloody tearing and eating of the flesh of Christ and chewing it with the teeth, but it is any kind of eating which is done with the mouth, for the caponaites do not say, How can this man give us his flesh to devour, to tear with the teeth, etc., but they said, How can this man give us his flesh to eat, that is, with the mouth? Neither does Christ withdraw their minds from a gross eating with the mouth, to that which is more refined in its nature, but directs them to his ascension into heaven, which would take place in a short time, when his body would be far removed from their mouths, from which we may infer that it was a spiritual eating of which he spake, which is effected by the Spirit and by faith. 5. From the fifty-fourth and sixth verses of this sixth chapter of John, it is also evident that to eat the flesh and to drink the blood of Christ is to believe in Christ, to dwell in him, and to have him dwell in us, because the same effect of eternal life is attributed both to the eating of his flesh and to faith in him. The Lord's Supper now sanctions this same eating, for apart from this there can be no other promise shown in the whole gospel which is sealed by the supper. Therefore to eat the body and to drink the blood of Christ in the supper is to believe in Christ, to dwell in Christ, and to have him dwell in us. 6. We may here also quote the words of Paul, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. From this passage we may deduce the two following arguments. 1. The eating of Christ in the supper is the same as the drinking, but the drinking is spiritual, therefore the eating is also spiritual. 2. The eating of the body and the drinking of the blood of Christ is common to all the faithful, even to the fathers of the Old Testament, for we have all been made to drink into one spirit. But that eating which is with the mouth is not common to all the faithful, for the fathers who lived before the birth of Christ 
could not in this way eat his flesh, which may also be said of infants and many adults who have not the opportunity of observing the supper. Therefore this eating of the flesh of Christ with the mouth, which is affirmed by our adversaries, is not that true eating which the gospel promises and which the supper seals. End of section 47 Section 48 of A Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Asinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lord's Supper, Part 3. The Testimony of the Fathers in Support of the View Which We Have Advanced. Having now presented the arguments which may be drawn from the Holy Scriptures and from the foundation of our faith, we may next adduce the testimony of the Fathers of the early and purer Church, from which it will be seen that they teach the very same doctrine which we do concerning the Holy Supper. We shall merely produce from a very large number of extracts that might have been made from their writings a few passages which may serve as an index to the views which they held and taught in reference to this subject. Irenaeus, Panis terenus accepta vocatione a verbo dei non amplius est communis panis, sed efficitur Eucharistia, quoe constat ex duabus rebus, terrena et coelesti. Liber 4, caput 34. Irenaeus says the earthly bread, being so called by the word of God, is no longer common bread, but becomes the Eucharist, which consists of two things, the earthly and the heavenly. Terulianus Acceptum panem et distributum discipulus corpus sum illum fecit, hoc est corpus meum descendo, it est figura corporis mei. Liber 4. Contra Marcion. Tertullian says, the bread which Christ took and distributed among the disciples, he made his own body, saying, This is my body, that is, the figure of my body. Clemens, Alexandrinus, hoc est bibere Jesus sanguinem, esse participem in corruptionis domini. Pedagogus, liber 2, caput 2. Clemens of Alexandria says, to drink the blood of Jesus is to be made a partaker of our Lord's immortality. Cyprianus, nec potest videri sanguis edus corredempti et justificatie sumus, Esse in calice quando vinum desit calici, quo Christi sanguis ostenditur, qui scripturarum omnium sacramento et testimonio predicator, idem, hoec quoties agimus, non dentes ad mordendum acuimus, sed fides sincera panem sanctum frangimus et patimur, Dum quod divinum et humanum est, distinguimus et separamus item coesimus separate, jungentes unum deum et hominem fatemur. Sed et nos ipsi corpus edus effecti sacramento et re sacramenti capiti nostro connectimur et unima. Liber 2. Epistola 3. Sermones de Coena. Cyprian says, The blood of Christ, with which we are redeemed and justified, cannot seem to be in the chalice, when there is no wine in it, by which the blood of Christ is showed, which is spoken of in every sacrament and testimony of the Scriptures. Again, as often as we do this, we do not sharpen our teeth for the purpose of eating, but we break and distribute the holy bread with a true faith, whilst we distinguish and separate that which is divine from that which is human, and joining them again when they are separated, we confess one God and man. We are also by this sacrament made his body, and are cemented and united to our head by the things signified. Canon conceli niceni, in divina mensa rosus et iam hic non proposito panis et vino puere liter adhereamus sed sublato in altum mente perfidam, consideremus proponi in sacra ila mensa acnum de dolentem peccata mundi, qui sine mactatione a sacerdotibus sacrificator, et pretiosum etus corpus et sanguinem vere assipientes nos, 
credamus hoec esse nostre resurrectionis symbola, nam idio etiam non multum sed parum asipimus, id agnoseamus quod non ad satietatem sed ad sanctificationem asipiatur de divina mensa et quid. The canon of the Council of Nicaea says, Here is also the Lord's table. Let us not childishly cleave to the bread and wine set before us, but let us, lifting our minds to heaven by faith, consider that on that holy table is placed the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world, who offered himself as a sacrifice without being slain by the priests, and let us, receiving his body and precious blood, believe that they are signs of our resurrection. It is for this reason that we only receive a small quantity that we may know that it is not received for satisfying, but for our sanctification. Basilius, apo suimus antitipta sancti corporis et sanguinis tui. In litur, Basil says, we have set before us the figures of the holy body and blood of Christ. Hilarius, hoec accepta atque hausta it efficient ut et nos in Christo et Christus in nobis sit, de trinitate liber. Hilary says that which is eaten and drunk produces this effect, that we are in Christ and Christ in us. Gregorius Nazians, antitypta pretiosi sanguinis et corporis Christi, orazione de Pascha, Gregory Nazianzen says the figures of the body and precious blood of Christ. Ambrosius, cuia morte domini liberati sumus, huius rei memores in edendo et potando carnem et sanguinem domine pro nobus oblata sunt, significamus idem, hoec oblatio est figura corporis et sanguinis domini nostri Iesu Christi. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, de sacre, liber 4, caput 5, Ambrose says, because we have been redeemed by the death of our Lord, we, being mindful thereof, signify in eating and drinking the flesh and blood of the Lord, which were offered for us. Again, this offering is a figure of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, in 1 Corinthians 11, De Sacre, Liber 4, Caput 5. Augustinus, non dubitavit Dominus dissere hoc est corpus meum, cum daret signum sui corporis, idem Dominus iudam adhibuit ad convivium, in quo corporis et sanguinis fui figuram, discipulis suis commentavit et tradidit, idem, si sacramenta quandam similitudinem eorum reorum quarum, sacramenta sunt non habarent omni sacramenta non essent, ex hac autem similitudine plerum quae etiam ipsarum reorum nomina accipiunt. Sicut ergo secundum quendam modum sacramentum corporis Christi, corpus Christi est, sacramentum sanguinis Christi, sanguis Christi est, et sacramentum fide fides este. Idem, sicut ergo coelestis panis, qui caro Christi est, suo modo vocatur corpus Christi, cum revera sit sacramentum corporis Christi. Ilius vide lesit quam visibile palpabile mortale in cruce positum est. Vocaturque ipsa immolatio carnis, quae sacerdotis manibus fit Christi passio mors crucifixio, non rei veritate sed significate mysterio. Sic sacramentum fide, quo baptismus intelligitur fides est. Idem ista fratres itco dicuntur sacramenta, quod in is aliud videtur, aliud intelligitur, quod videtur speciem habet corporalem, 
quod interigitur fructum habet spiritualem, contra adem caput twelve in Salmum three, Epistola twenty-three ad Bonifas, in fenet prosper de consect dist tu, se hoc est, ser ad infant. Augustine says our Lord did not hesitate to say, This is my body, when he gave the sign of his body. Again, the Lord admitted Judas to that feast in which he gave to his disciples the figure of his body and blood. Again, if the sacraments had not a certain correspondence with the things of which they are sacraments, they would be no sacraments at all, and it is on account of this correspondence that they very often receive the names of the things themselves. As therefore the sacrament of the body of Christ is, after a certain manner, the body of Christ, and as the sacrament of the blood of Christ is his blood, so the sacrament of faith is faith. Again, as the celestial bread, which is Christ's flesh, is in some way called the body of Christ, inasmuch as it is the sacrament of his body, which is to say, that visible, tangible, and mortal body which was nailed to the cross, and as the sacrificing of his flesh, which was accomplished by the hands of the priest, is called the passion, death, and crucifixion, not in the truth of the thing, but signifying it in a mystery, so the sacrament of faith, which is baptism, is faith. Again, these, my brethren, are called sacraments, because in them one thing is seen, and another is understood. That which is seen has a corporal form, whilst that which is understood has a spiritual benefit. Chrysostomus Hic est sanguis meus, qui effunditer in remissionem peccatorum, quod dicebat ut ostenderet passionem, et crucem mysterium esse, et discipulus consolaretur, in Matthew homily 83. Chrysostom says, This is my blood which is shed for the remission of sins, which Christ said to show that his passion and cross constitute a mystery, and that it might administer comfort to his disciples, in Matthew homily 83. Theodoretus Servator sete noster nomina commutavit et corpori quidem idet, quod erat symboli ac signi nomen imposuit, symbolu autem quod erat corporis, causa mutationis manifesta est is, qui sunt divinis mysteris initiatie, volebat enim eos qui sunt divinorum mysteriorum participes, non attendere naturam eorum coe vindentur, sed propter nominum mutationem mutationi, coe fit ex gratia credere, qui enim quod natura est corpus triticum et panem appellavit, et vitem se ipsum rursus nominavit, is symbola coe vitentur, appellatione corporis et sanguinis oneravit, non naturam quidem mutans, sed nature gratium agisiens. Dialogue 1. Theodoret says, Our Saviour evidently changed the names of the signs and the things signified, and gave the same name to his body which belongs to the sign, and to the sign that which belongs to his body. The reason of this change is manifest to those who have been initiated into divine mysteries, for he designs that those who partake of these divine mysteries should not look to the things which are seen, but on account of the change of the names should believe the change which is made through grace. For he who called that which is naturally a body, wheat and bread, and also called himself a vine, honoured the signs which are seen with the title of his body and blood, not indeed by changing their nature, but by adding grace thereto. There is a notable saying of Macarius the monk, which we may also here repeat, quote, The bread and wine are a type or figure corresponding with the flesh and blood of Christ, and those who receive the bread which is showed eat the flesh of Christ spiritually. End quote. Macarius, homily 27. We might add many other testimonies from the writings of the fathers, which, for the sake of brevity, we omit. Of transubstantiation. We may now easily see what we are to think of the doctrine of transubstantiation, it is a wicked device of the papists, which we shall briefly prove by a variety of arguments. 
Before doing this, however, it is proper that we should first state in a few words what the papists understand by transubstantiation. They suppose that, by the act or force of consecration, by which they mean the repeating over the elements of bread and wine, the words, This is my body, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, the bread and wine are converted or changed as to their substance into the body and blood of Christ, so that all that remains of the bread and wine is the form or accidents, viz. the appearance, the smell, the taste, the weight, etc., they, therefore, consider the words which are used in the consecration of the elements productive and creative. They hold that the change is effected or made complete in the very instant in which the priest pronounces the last syllable, D, this is my body, after which the elements do not remain any longer bread and wine, but become the body and blood of Christ, which are now substantially present and contained under the form of bread and wine, so that all who partake of them eat his body and drink his blood with the mouth. As to the manner in which this change is effected, they do not agree among themselves. There are some who maintain that the substance of the bread and wine is changed by transubstantiation into the substance of the body and blood of Christ, so that the bread and wine become, as to their essence, the body and blood of Christ, retaining merely their external forms, which change is called a substantial change, or a change of the substance. There are others, again, who hold that the substance of bread and wine is not changed, but that it is annihilated, and that the substance of the body and blood of Christ takes its place, so that, after the consecration, the substance of Christ's body and blood assumes the form and accidents of the substance of the bread and wine, which change is called a formal change, or a change of the form. Lombard gives an exposition of both views, Liber 4, this 2, and seems to approve of the former. The papists call both changes transubstantiation. They affirm also that the pronoun this denotes some vague or indefinite substance contained under these accidents in general without having any reference to quantity or quality, so that it refers neither to the bread nor to the body of Christ, but to what was contained under the form which before consecration was bread, but which by the force of the words became the body of Christ, so that the words this is my body mean, according to their view, that which is contained under this or under these forms is my body. They also differ widely among themselves in regard to the accidents as to where they are grounded or situated, whether in the body of Christ or in the air or in the original matter of the bread and wine, or whether they are the properties of any subject. The common opinion is that they exist without any subject. This is the view of the schoolmen and of all the papists and consists of two principal parts, the one having reference to transubstantiation and the other to the eating of Christ's body with the mouth. But both of these things are inconsistent with the words of Christ, and are a wicked device. As it respects the eating of Christ's body with the mouth, under the form of bread, it is overthrown by the same arguments by which we have established the spiritual eating of Christ's body. And as it respects transubstantiation, we thus refute it. 1. That which is Christ's body in the supper remains, and is neither changed nor annihilated, otherwise the body of Christ would not remain or be present in the Eucharist. But the bread in the supper is the body of Christ sacramentally, as we have already shown. Therefore the bread in the supper remains, and is neither changed nor annihilated. The minor proposition has already been proven, and may be established more fully, one by the words of Luke and Paul, this cup is the New Testament, etc., the bread is the communion of the body of Christ. Two, by this argument drawn from these words, that which Christ broke he called his body, but he broke the bread and not some indefinite substance, or merely the accidents of the bread. Therefore the bread is the body of Christ. 3. It is also proven thus. The pronoun this refers either to the bread or to the mere accidents of the bread, or to the body of Christ, or to some indefinite substance. But it cannot refer to some indefinite substance, for it was bread that Christ gave and break, and not something general under the form of bread. Nor can it refer to the body of Christ, visible or invisible, for his visible body sat and talked with the disciples, and an invisible body Christ never had. The papists themselves confess that the body of Christ is not present under the form of bread when the priest commences to repeat the word this, but only after the change is effected, which, as we have already remarked, takes place when the last syllable of the words used in the consecration of the elements is pronounced. Nor can it refer to the mere accidents of the bread, for it was not the mere accidents that Christ broke. Therefore the particle this cannot refer to anything else but the bread, so that the words of Christ, this is my body, must mean, this bread is my body. 2. Christ broke bread. 
but he did not break his body, therefore the bread is not in reality his body. 3. The body of Christ was delivered for us unto death, but the bread was not thus given for us, therefore the bread is not in reality the body of Christ. 4. Christ does not say, as the advocates of the doctrine of transubstantiation do, my body is under these forms, or my body is contained under these forms, therefore they do not retain, but pervert the words of Christ. 5. Christ did not say, Let this be made, but this is my body, therefore the words of Christ do not change the bread into the substance of his body, but merely teach that the bread in this use is the body of Christ in a sacramental sense. 6. Paul expressly calls that which is given and received bread, both before and after it is eaten, therefore the bread is neither annihilated nor changed into the substance of the body of Christ, but remains bread. 7. In every sacrament there are two things, the signs and the things signified, or, as Irenaeus says, the earthly and the heavenly things without which there can be no sacrament, but transubstantiation takes away from the Eucharist the sign, or that which is earthly, which is bread and wine, therefore it destroys the nature or true idea of a sacrament. 8. The mere shadow or form of bread and wine cannot confirm faith in heavenly things, but practices a deception inasmuch as it is not what it appears to be, but the signs in the Eucharist ought to confirm our faith in heavenly things, viz. that we are as certainly fed with the body and blood of our Lord, as we are certain that we receive the bread and the wine, for the sacraments were instituted to confirm our faith by the use of visible signs. Therefore transubstantiation, which changes the signs into a mere shadow, cannot be true. 9. Transubstantiation destroys the analogy which there is between the sign and the thing signified, of which Augustine speaks when he says, quote, that the body of Christ so nourishes the soul as the bread nourishes the body, and as one bread is baked out of many grains, so we who partake of this one bread, being many, are made one bread and one body, end quote. Epistle 23 at Boniface. But the mere accidents of bread and wine cannot represent or sustain this analogy, because they cannot of themselves nourish, nor can we say as the accidents of bread and wine nourish the body and sustain natural life, so the body of Christ nourishes the soul unto eternal life, for in this case the analogy would be between that which is real and that which is a mere shadow. Therefore the analogy which holds between the sign and the thing signified is evidently inconsistent with the doctrine of transubstantiation, and so refutes it. Concerning consubstantiation the papists, from what we have said, imagined that two great miracles were wrought in the Eucharist by virtue of the consecration of the elements, the changing of the substance of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, and the subsistence of the accidents of the bread and wine independent of any subject, both of which may easily be refuted, for the former evidently contradicts the analogy of the entire Christian faith, whilst the latter is at war with all sound philosophy. And as to that virtue which there is in the act of consecration, of which they make so much account, it is nothing more than a magical device of the devil and of human ingenuity. When some of the ancient doctors perceived these absurdities, they rejected the doctrine of transubstantiation, and coined that of consubstantiation, which teaches the coexistence of two substances in the same place, or the presence of the body and blood of Christ, not under the forms of bread and wine, but in or under the bread and wine itself, these persons maintained that the signs were not transubstantiated, or changed as to their substance, but that they were consubstantiated, by which they meant that the bread and wine remained, but that the body and blood of Christ were substantially present with, in, or under the bread and wine, and eaten and drunk with the mouth. Lombard refers to this view and asserts that it was already before his time advocated by certain persons, and calls it a paradox, a strange view. Gietmund attributes it to Berengarius after his recantation and calls it impanation. Others regard Walram as the originator of this view, against whom Anselm wrote two books which are still extant. Others again ascribe it to Rupert, who lived shortly after Gietmund, about the year of our Lord 1124. Peter, Cardinal of Cambrai, declared that he would rather embrace consubstantiation than transubstantiation had not the Church of Rome decided differently. He lived about the year of our Lord, 1416. At length, Luther, falling in with the opinion of this Cardinal of Cambrai, as he himself testifies, did not at first regard it as an article of faith to believe that the substance of the bread remains or does not remain with the body of Christ, but maintained that either view might be held without subjecting their advocates to the charge of heresy. 
Subsequently, however, it seemed more probable to him that the bread should remain and that the body of Christ should be present in, with, or under the bread. This is now the generally received opinion of those who call themselves Lutherans. They interpret the words of Christ, This is my body, thus, in, with, and under this bread is my body, and they boast equally as much as the papists that they retain the words of Christ in their literal sense without any trope or figure and whenever they contend with the papist they refer the particle this to the bread alone which itself according to their view is the body of christ but when they are brought into controversy with us whom they call sacramentarians then the particle this no longer refers to the bread only but to the bread with the body of christ which is invisibly concealed in it and the sense of the words this is my body they affirm to be this this bread and my body which is concealed in this bread is my body this their gloss they prove, as they say, with plain and familiar illustrations, so that Christ, when he gave his body invisibly in the bread, said, This is my body, just as the farmer says of the grain in his sack, This is grain pointing to the sack, or as the merchant, in speaking of the money in his purse, says, as he holds it up, This is my money, or as the mother says of her child, lying in the cradle, This is my child, pointing to the cradle, or as the vendor of wine says, as he hands the cup, This is wine. These illustrations are gathered from their writings and disputations. But the same thing happens unfortunately to these good men, which the poet says of another class of persons, Stulti dum vitant vitia in contraria corunt. Fools, when they run from certain vices, rush into the opposite extremes. For instead of the absurd miracle of the papists in regard to the subsistence of the accidents of the bread and wine independent of any subject, they imagine another still more absurd, viz. the penetration of two bodies, so that they may be said to have wandered farther than the papists themselves with the words of Christ, whether we regard the letter or sense of the words. For the words, if taken literally, must be thus understood, This, that is, this bread, is my body, and if we have respect to the sense or true meaning of the words, it must be, This visible bread which is broken and given is my true and essential body given for you. It is my true body, not by any change of the essence, as the papists believe, for the word did not assume bread, neither was bread delivered or crucified for us, but it is my true body in a mystical sense, and according to a sacramental form of speech as Christ himself, and Paul and all the Orthodox fathers have understood it. The interpretation which the advocates of transubstantiation put upon the words of Christ is far from being their literal and true sense, for it is not true that the papists retain the letter, seeing that they put in the place of the words of Christ, this is my body, this gloss, this thing or indefinite substance contained under these forms is my body. Much less, therefore, do the consubstantialists retain the literal and true meaning of the words of Christ, seeing that they substitute their own words in the place of what Christ said, saying, in, with, and under this bread is my body, or the bread and the body of Christ, which is invisibly concealed in this bread, is my body. For neither is the bread by itself, nor the bread with the body of Christ concealed in it, properly the body of Christ, as a purse, whether full or empty, is not properly, and without a figure of speech called money. And as to the various illustrations or forms of speech which they bring forward for the purpose of establishing their view, they are evidently foreign, for, as it respects the instances to which we have already referred, that which is expressed by them is plain, as soon as it is uttered, that grain is in the sack, money in the purse, an infant in the cradle, and wine in the cup. But that the body of Christ is in the bread does not appear so clearly, neither can it be proved, since there is an article of the Christian faith which declares that it is in heaven. Of the schism of the consubstantialists the words of Christ, This is my body, were at first the only foundation upon which Luther based his view of the presence of Christ in the supper. Subsequently, in the controversy which he had with those who opposed the view of consubstantiation, he took refuge in the years 27 and 28 to the doctrine of ubiquity, and instead of the one foundation upon which he at first based his view, he now proposed four. One, the personal union of the two natures in Christ. Two, the right hand of God which is everywhere, 3. The truth of God who cannot lie. 4. The threefold manner of the existence of Christ's body in any place. Being at length driven from these, he again betook himself to the words of Christ, and desired that all disputation as to ubiquity might be brought to an end. Since the time of Luther, however, some who profess his name not finding a sufficient support for their cause in the words of Christ, have again taken shelter under the doctrine of ubiquity, and to this day regard it as the mainstay of their peculiar view. Yet there are others who reject it altogether. 
It is to this diversity of sentiment that the schism of the consubstantialists traces its origin. There are some who will be Lutherans simply, who defend impanation or the existence of Christ's body in the bread, and the oral mandication by the words of Christ alone. There are other multi-presentiary and omnipotentiary Lutherans, who hold that the body of Christ is present at the same time in many hosts on account of the omnipotency really communicated to it. And finally, there are some omnipresentiary or ubiquitarian Lutherans, who, for the purpose of defending the presence of Christ's body in the bread, seize the shield of ubiquity, and teach that the body of Christ, by virtue of its union with the word, is everywhere present, and therefore present also in the bread, before and after its use in the supper, and that the rite and consecration merely cause it to be eaten in the bread. Our young divines, that they may have a correct understanding of this controversy, must not be ignorant of these things, for, from what we have said, they may see that, to this day, the doctrine of consubstantiation rests upon two main pillars or props, ubiquity and the words of Christ. We have already explained what is meant by ubiquity, and given a sufficient refutation of it in the exposition of the articles relating to the personal union of the two natures in Christ, his ascension into heaven, and sitting at the right hand of God the Father, to which we refer the reader, and as to the words of Christ, they neither teach the doctrine of consubstantiation, nor will they admit of such an interpretation, the papists themselves being witnesses in the case. The ubiquitarians also acknowledge this in their writings, and have for this reason invented the doctrine of ubiquity because they clearly saw that their views could not be sustained by the words of Christ, but would soon be overthrown if made to rest on this foundation. Christ said, This is my body which is given for you. These words, however, the consubstantialists do not retain, neither as to the letter nor as to the sense, when they say, In, with, or under this bread is my body. We do not, therefore, need any other arguments for the refutation of consubstantiation than the words of Christ, to which we direct the attention of the advocates of this doctrine, and thus reason with them. Christ did not say, In this bread is my body, but this is my body. But these forms of speech do not express the same thing, for the former declares what is in the bread, and where the body of Christ is, whilst the latter declares what the bread itself is in the Eucharist. Therefore those who teach that the body of Christ is in the bread, and not that it is the bread itself, retain neither the letter nor the sense of the words of Christ. Objections in favour of consubstantiation refuted. Objection 1. It is a common form of speech when two things which are joined together are given at the same time, the one apparent and the other not, that that alone which is not apparent should be named, as we ordinarily say of a purse filled with money, this is money, and of a cask of wine, this is wine. Christ in the supper, giving in the same manner two things jointly, viz. bread and his body, named that only which was not apparent under the bread, saying, Take, this is my body. Therefore the form of speech which is here used is common and proper, and does not need any explanation. We reply to the major of this syllogism as follows. It is, indeed, a usual form of speech when it is evident that the thing which is not apparent, and which is named, is contained in that which is apparent, as it is plain that money is in the purse and wine in the cask. Otherwise it would neither be a usual, clear, nor correct form of speech to say of an empty purse, this is money, etc., but it is not apparent, nor have the consubstantialists as yet proven, that the body of Christ was concealed in the bread, when he said in reference to it, This is my body. As it is evident that money is in the purse and wine in the cask, when it is said, This is money, this is wine. Yea, we affirm in opposition to the consubstantialists that the body of Christ was not concealed in the bread in the first supper, but reclined at the table and is now in heaven, where it will remain until he will come to judge the quick and the dead. Therefore this argument of our opponents is a begging of the question at issue. We also deny what is asserted in the minor proposition, for Christ, having taken and broken, not his body but the bread which was on the table, giving it to the disciples, said, Take, this, that is, this bread, is my body, which interpretation we prove by the following arguments. 1. Christ said of the cup, This cup is the New Testament. 2. Paul refers the particle this to the bread, when he says, The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. 3. The bread and the body of Christ, when taken together, are neither properly nor figuratively the very body of Christ, so that Christ by this interpretation is made to utter a vain tautology, saying, My body is my body. We in like manner deny the consequence drawn from the above syllogism because there is more in the conclusion than in the premises. They conclude that the form of speech is common and proper, but the terms, common and proper, have not the same form and signification, 
for the most common form of speech may be figurative, as is the case with the common and yet synecdochial forms of speech to which we have so often referred, this is money, this is wine. For who is so simple as to believe that the purse alone, or the purse with the money, is properly money? So the sacramental form of speech in reference to the Passover was common and well known to the disciples. Where wilt thou, that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? Matthew 26, verse 17. And yet they did not speak properly, but figuratively, attributing to the sign the name of the thing signified by a sacramental metonymy. Hence all that follows legitimately from the above premises is that the words of Christ were common, plain, and understood by the disciples, but not that they were understood properly, literally, and without any figure. Objection 2. Christ said, This is my body. Christ now is true, therefore we must believe him, setting aside all philosophical subtlety, and, as a matter of consequence, must understand his words simply and literally. Answer. There is here an incorrectness in regarding that as a cause which is none, for the truth of Christ merely brings it to pass that his words are true, yea, most true, which we ought to believe, setting aside all philosophical subtlety, but this is no reason why the words of Christ should be understood literally and properly, for he who speaks figuratively may also speak that which is true, as Christ was no less true, yea, the truth itself, when he said, I am the light of the world, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman, and ye are the branches. Then when he said, This is my body, those, therefore, who have the boldness to say that figurative forms of speech are lies, ought to be hissed out of our schools and denounced. We may also invent the argument and reason thus. Christ is true, therefore he did not say that his body was concealed in the bread, when all his disciples saw that it reclined at the table. So we may also in like manner retort the consequence which our adversaries draw from the above syllogism, and say the words of Christ are to be understood simply, Therefore no interpretation is to be put upon them, which conflicts with the letter, as when it is said, In, with, and under the bread is the body of Christ, or that the bread is the closet or covering of the body of Christ. Objection 3. Christ is omnipotent, therefore he can bring it to pass that his body may be really in the bread. Answer. That, however, is no just conclusion which infers that a thing will be done because it may be done. The question is not what Christ can do, but what he will do. He has nowhere promised the presence of his body in the bread, or in the place of the bread. We do not, therefore, take anything from his omnipotence when we reject such a presence as our opponents advocate. To this it is objected as follows. The bread is present in the place of the supper. The bread is the body of Christ. Therefore, the body of Christ is present in the supper. Answer. But the minor proposition of this syllogism is figurative, according to the confession of our adversaries themselves. For James André in the controversy at Marlborn, when he could in no other way extricate himself from the difficulties which pressed themselves upon the views which he advocated, openly confessed that, when it is said, the bread is the body of Christ, the language is figurative, but that it is proper when it is said, this is my body. This same André afterwards wrote that, when the phrase, the bread is the body of Christ, is used, it is to be understood properly and without any figure. Is this not to blow hot and cold from the same mouth? Objection 4. The words of Christ cannot be changed. Christ said, This is my body, therefore the word signifies, ought not to be substituted for is. Answer 1. We grant the whole argument, for we do not substitute the word signifies for is, nor do we change the words of Christ, but we retain them, as they were uttered by Christ himself. But we maintain that the true and natural sense of these words is, that the bread is the body of Christ symbolically, that is, it is the sacrament or sign of the body of Christ or it signifies the body of Christ. Christ himself interprets these words thus, when he said, This do in remembrance of me. So does Paul when he says, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Tertullian says, quote, The bread which Christ took and distributed among the disciples he made his body, saying, This is my body, that is, it is the figure of my body, end quote. Ambrose in like manner says, quote, This offering is the figure of the body and blood of our Lord, end quote. Augustine also says, quote, Our Lord did not hesitate to say, This is my body, when he gave the sign of his body. End quote. 2. We may turn the arguments against our opponents thus. The words of Christ must not be changed. Therefore, the interpretation which the advocates of transubstantiation put upon the words of Christ, when they say, Under these forms is or is contained my body, is false. As also that of the advocates of consubstantiation, when they say, In, with, or under this bread is my body invisibly present. 3. 
the words of Christ must not be changed so as to express a different idea from that which he intended, and yet they are often to be changed in order that we may properly understand them, as when he said, Pluck out thine eye, if any man will take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Matthew 5, verses 29 and 40. Words must, therefore, be understood according to the nature of the things spoken of. Objection 5. The language used in testaments must be understood properly, unless there be something about the will of the testator which gives occasion for contention. The supper is the New Testament, therefore the language used in reference to it must be understood properly. Answer. We reply to the major proposition that the language used in testaments must be understood properly if it be spoken properly, and figuratively if it be spoken figuratively. But, if it is maintained that every word must be understood properly, we deny the major, for it is sufficient if the language be clear and intelligible, although it may not be spoken properly, but figuratively. When we know the intention and will of the testator, it is useless to dispute about the language or words of the testament. So God in the Old Testament spoke figuratively of circumcision, of the paschal lamb, and of sacrifices. So Christ also spoke figuratively in the New Testament when he says, Take and drink, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. For there is here a double figure, one a synecdoche, when he commands them to drink the cup, meaning the wine in the cup, two a metonymy, when he calls the cup the New Testament, meaning the reconciliation of the human race with God, sealed with his blood. Objection 6. The eating of bread is with the mouth, but the eating of the body is also the eating of bread. Therefore the eating of the body is with the mouth. Answer. The minor proposition must either be understood figuratively, or else it is false. If it is spoken figuratively, it must be thus understood. The eating of the body is the thing signified and sealed by the eating of the bread. If it is thus understood, it proves nothing, inasmuch as there is a change in the kind of affirmation which is made. But if it be understood properly, it is false, for the eating of bread is external, corporal, and visible, whilst the eating of the body is internal, spiritual, and invisible. They are therefore not properly one and the same kind of eating, but as the thing signified is distinct from the sign, so the reception of both the sign and the thing signified is distinct, although each occurs at the same time in the lawful use of the sacraments. Objection 7. That which quickens and nourishes us must necessarily be received. The body and blood of Christ quickens and nourishes us, therefore they must necessarily be received, that is, eaten and drank with the mouth. Answer. Nothing can be inferred from mere particulars, or we may thus reply to the major proposition, that which nourishes and quickens us naturally, by being brought into contact with the body, as is the case with common bread, does not indeed nourish and strengthen us, unless it be eaten with the mouth. But it is far different as it respects the nourishment of the soul, which is spiritual. The body of Christ does not nourish us naturally, for it does not produce in us any new qualities as medicine, but it nourishes and quickens us in a manner different from that which is natural, which requires that we should receive it differently. Now, as to the manner in which the body and blood of Christ nourish us, it has, in the first place, a respect to his merit. For the body of Christ was delivered and his blood shed for us, and it is in view of this that God grants unto us eternal life. Hence Christ's body and blood must quicken us in this manner as meriting for us eternal life. Secondly, we are quickened and nourished when we receive by a true faith the merit of the body and blood of Christ, that is, when we believe that we shall have eternal life for the sake of the merit of Christ's body and blood broken and shed for us. This faith now rests upon Christ as crucified and not as dwelling in us after a corporal manner. Thirdly, we are quickened by the body and blood of Christ when we are united to him by the same Spirit who works the same things in us, which he does in Christ, for unless we are engrafted into Christ we do not please God, who will receive us into his favour and grant unto us the remission of our sins, only upon the condition that we are engrafted into Christ and united to him by that faith which the Holy Ghost works in us. This now being the manner in which we are quickened and nourished by the body and blood of Christ, there is no necessity that his body and blood should descend or be made to enter into our bodies in order that we may be quickened by them. To this it is objected, our bodies as well as our souls are fed and nourished with the body and blood of Christ unto everlasting life. Therefore it is necessary that our bodies as well as our souls should eat and drink. Our bodies now eat and drink orally. Answer. The major of this syllogism Whatsoever is fed with the body of Christ is nourished unto eternal life, which is omitted, is false if understood in its general sense. For we might ask, do the different parts of the body therefore eat because they are nourished by the food which is received by the mouth? 
it is sufficient that eating is by the mouth as an instrument provided by nature for the purpose of communicating nourishment to the whole system so it is not necessary that our bodies should eat with the mouth the body of christ in order that they may be nourished unto eternal life it is sufficient that we receive spiritual food with the mouth of faith that spiritual nourishment and life may be transfused through the whole man question seventy nine why then doth christ call the bread his body and the cup his blood or the new covenant in his blood and paul the communion of the body and blood of christ answer christ speaks thus not without good reason namely not only thereby to teach us that as bread and wine support this temporal life so his crucified body and shed blood are the true meat and drink whereby our souls are fed to eternal life but more especially by these visible signs and pledges to assure us that we are as really partakers of his true body and blood by the operation of the holy ghost as we receive by the mouths of our bodies these holy signs in remembrance of him and that all his sufferings and obedience are as certainly ours as if we had in our own persons suffered and made satisfaction for our sins to god exposition seeing then that the words of christ this is my body do not teach transubstantiation nor consubstantiation we must now inquire why then does christ call the bread his body and the cup his blood that is why does he attribute the names of the things signified to the signs there are two reasons on account of which christ thus speaks the first is on account of the analogy which there is between the bread and the body of christ the other is on account of the certainty or the confirmation of what the signs and things signified exhibit jointly in the lawful use of the sacraments the correspondence or analogy which there is between the bread and the body of christ consists in these things one as bread and wine support this temporal life so the body and blood of christ are the true meat and drink by which our souls are fed unto eternal life two as bread and wine are received with the mouth so the body and blood of christ are received by faith which is the mouth of the soul three as bread is not taken into the system whole but is eaten being broken so the body of christ is received being sacrificed and broken upon the cross four as bread and wine do not profit those who eat and drink them without any appetite or desire and as it is necessary for us to come to the table hungry and thirsty so the body and blood of christ profit us nothing unless we come to his table hungering and thirsting after righteousness five as out of many grains one meal is ground and one bread is baked and as out of many berries pressed together one wine floweth so we being many are by the use of these signs made one body and grow up into one body with christ and among ourselves the certainty or confirmation of our faith is in like manner a reason why christ affirms of the signs what is peculiar to the thing signified for the signs declare that the sacrifice of christ is accomplished and that for our salvation as certainly as we have the signs yea that we are fed with the crucified body and shed blood of christ as certainly as we receive the sacred signs of the body and blood of christ end of section forty eight section forty nine of commentary on the heidelberg catechism by Zacharias Osinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lord's Supper, Part 4. Thirtieth Lord's Day, Question 80. What difference is there between the Lord's Supper and the Popish Mass? Answer. The Lord's Supper testifies to us that we have a full pardon of all sins by the only sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which he himself has once accomplished on the cross, and that we, by the Holy Ghost, are engrafted into Christ, who according to his human nature is now not on earth but in heaven at the right hand of god his father and will there be worshipped by us but the mass teacheth that the living and the dead have not the pardon of sins through the sufferings of christ unless christ is also daily offered for them by the priests and further that christ is bodily under the form of bread and wine and therefore is to be worshipped in them so that the mass at bottom is nothing else than a denial of the one sacrifice and sufferings of jesus christ and an accursed idolatry exposition this question is necessary on account of the errors and horrid abuses which the mass has introduced into the church it is otherwise asked why is the mass to be abolished this question however is contained in the above because the differences which exist between the lord's supper and the popish mass constitute the reasons why the mass is to be abolished 
for since the Mass has so many things connected with it, which are in direct opposition to the Lord's Supper, it must not be confounded with it, nor substituted in the place of it, nor tolerated in the Church by godly magistrates, but must be abolished. Before we proceed, however, to point out the differences between the Lord's Supper and the Popish Mass, it is proper that we should say a few words in reference to the term Mass. And first, there are some who derive the word Mass from the Hebrew Masa, which signifies a tribute or voluntary offering. The word has this meaning in Deuteronomy 16, verse 10, where it is said, Thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God with a tribute of a free will offering of thine hand. This offering was so called being, as it were, a yearly tribute, which was given most willingly and cheerfully. It is also understood by some to signify a sufficiency, meaning that so much should be given as might be sufficient, which perhaps is the more correct interpretation, since God, in Deuteronomy 15, verse 8, commanded the Israelites to open their hands wide unto the poor, and to lend that which was sufficient for their need. This the Chalde paraphrast interprets Missa, from which it is supposed that it is called Mass or Missa, as if it were a tribute and a free will offering, which should everywhere be offered to God in the church for the living and the dead. But this is not probable. It is true, indeed, that the church has borrowed some words from the Hebrew, as Satan, Sabaoth, Hallelujah, etc., but these and similar words were introduced into the Latin church through the Greek church, and were introduced into the Greek testament when it was first written in the Greek language, nor have we any Hebrew words in our church which the Greek church had not before. Furthermore, if we examine the writings of the Greek fathers, it will be seen that the word Missa is never used by them, from which we are inclined to believe that the word Missa is not derived from the Hebrew. Therefore, the term Missa, which is doubtless a Latin word, seems to be taken from the fathers, who used Remissa for Remissio. Tertullian says, quote, We have spoken of remission, Remissa, of sins. End quote. Cyprian says, quote, He who was to grant remission of sins did not disdain to be baptized. End quote. Again, quote, he who blasphemes against the Holy Ghost obtains no remission of sins, end quote. Hence, as the Latin fathers used the term remissa for remissio, so they also seem to have used missa for missio, which is derived from mitendo. But here again there is a great diversity of sentiment, for some will have it that missa is to be understood in the sense of missio from an ancient custom of ecclesiastical rites, which was introduced into the Latin churches from the Greek, that when the sermon and lecture were over, the deacon, before the consecration of the mysteries, sent away or commanded the catechumens, the demoniacs, and such as were excommunicated, to depart, saying, with a loud voice, If there be any catechumens still remaining in the church, let him depart. So that missa seems to be used in the sense of missio, sending away, because it was the last part of divine service. Others suppose that it is called missa in the sense of this missa, or this missio, from the manner in which the ecclesiastical assemblies, or congregations, were dismissed, because when the prayers and other services were ended, the deacon exclaimed, Ite missa est, that is, go, you may depart. Others again understand it thus, go, now is the collection of alms, which they say were called missa, from being sent or thrown in for the benefit of the poor. In short, it was that which was transacted in the church after the departure of the catechumens, or the collection of alms. Lombard has a different view of the subject. Quote, it is called Missa, says he, because a heavenly messenger comes for the purpose of consecrating the vivifying body of Christ, according to the prayer of the priest. Almighty God, command that this be carried by the hand of thy holy angel to the high altar, etc. Therefore, unless an angel come, it cannot be properly called a Mass. End quote. Lo, the folly of the man. Again, quote, it is called Mass either because the host is sent, of which mention is made in that service, where it is said, Ite, Missa est, that is, follow the host which has gone up into heaven, go after it, or because an angel comes from heaven to consecrate the Lord's body, by whom the host is carried to the heavenly altar, whence it is also said, Ite, Missa est. End quote. We reject the idea of the Mass and also the term itself for the reason that it does not belong to the Lord's Supper, which has nothing in common with the Mass, although some of the ancient writers employed the term. Nor is there any necessity that we should use this term inasmuch as we have other words which express this mystery in a more striking manner, which are extant in the Scriptures, which call it the Lord's Supper, the table of the Lord, the breaking of bread. We may now, from what has been said, perceive the difference between the Lord's Supper and the Popish Mass, which difference is so great as to require that the Mass be wholly abolished. 
The Catechism points out three things in which the Lord's Supper and the Popish Mass chiefly differ from each other. 1. The Lord's Supper testifies to us that we have a free pardon of all sin by the only sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which he himself has once accomplished on the cross, according, as it is said, the bread is the body of Christ given for us, the cup is the blood of Christ shed for you unto the remission of sins. This do in remembrance of me. Ye do show the Lord's death till he come. This he did once when he offered up himself. By his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, by the which will we are sacrificed through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin, forever sat down at the right hand of God, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. 1 Corinthians 11, Hebrews 7, verse 27, chapter 9, verse 12, and 26, chapter 10, verses 10, 12, and 14. The Mass, on the other hand, teaches that the living and the dead have not the pardon of sins through the sufferings of Christ, unless Christ is also daily offered for them by the priests. Their canon, which they call the less, thus teaches in reference to this subject, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, receive this immaculate host which I, thine unworthy servant, offer unto thee, the living and true God, for my innumerable sins, offences, and neglects, yea, and for all faithful Christians, living and dead, that it may result in salvation to me and them unto everlasting life. Their greater canon has the following, Remember, O Lord, thy servants and handmaidens in in, and all round about me, whose faith and acknowledged devotion are known unto thee, for whom we offer unto thee, or who present unto thee this sacrifice of praise for themselves and for all theirs, for the redemption of their souls, for the hope of their salvation and preservation, etc. What need was there that Christ should offer himself if the oblation of a sacrificing priest might avail for the redemption of souls? 2. The Lord's Supper testifies to us, according to the articles of our faith, that Christ, as to his human nature, is now in heaven at the right hand of the Father, and not concealed under the accidents of bread and wine, but that he exhibits to us in the supper his body and blood to be eaten and drunk by faith, and engrafts us into himself by the Holy Spirit, that we may abide in him and have him abide in us. As it is said, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. The bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of Christ. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 17, chapter 10, verse 16, Hebrews 8, verses 1 and 4. The Mass teaches, on the other hand, that the bread and wine, by virtue of the consecration, are changed into the body and blood of Christ, and that his body and blood, in the act of consecration, are brought down from heaven, that they are concealed after a bodily manner under the forms of bread and wine, that they are really handled by the hands of the minister, carried about and eaten and received with the mouth by the communicants. These figments of the brain are opposed to the incarnation, the ascension, the intercession, and return of Christ to judgment, all of which are important articles of our faith, and also to the nature of sacraments, in which these signs must necessarily remain, and not lose their nature, as we have already demonstrated. 3. The Lord's Supper teaches that Christ is to be worshipped by us in heaven at the right hand of the Father, for it does not overthrow but establishes the articles of our faith, and the doctrine of the whole gospel, which teaches that Christ is to be sought and worshipped above. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Colossians 3 verse 1. Stephen, when he was stoned, saw Christ and worshipped him above, standing at the right of God. Acts 7 verse 55. The ancient church also sang in her service or liturgy, Sor sum cor da habemus ad dominum. We lift up our hearts unto the Lord. The Mass teaches, on the other hand, that Christ is to be worshipped in the bread, which worship is, without doubt, idolatrous. For to worship Christ in the bread is to direct our worship in soul, mind, thought, and as much as may be, in the motion or gesture of the body, to the place where the bread is, and looking thither, pay homage and reference to Christ, as though he were there more especially than elsewhere. It was in this way that God was anciently worshipped at the ark, in which worship the mind was not only directed to the ark, but the body was also inclined to it as much as possible. That this is idolatry may be proven, one, from this, 
that no creature has the power to restrict the worship of God to any thing or place in which, or at which, God has not expressly commanded us to worship him, or in which he has not promised to hear us. From this it is easy to see the cause of the difference why the Jews, directing their worship to the mercy seat, did, nevertheless, at the same time, worship the true God in spirit, and were assured by the divine promise of being heard, whilst those who worshipped in Dan and Bethel, and upon the high places and in the temple of Samaria, were idolaters, worshipping what they knew not. The reason of this is explained more fully in 2 Kings 17 verse 9. 2. Because in the New Testament all worship which is tied or limited to any particular place is entirely abolished, whilst a spiritual worship is now required of us, kindled by the Holy Ghost and offered up in true knowledge and faith. Christ himself plainly teaches this in John 4 verses 22 and 23. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. When he says, That we shall worship in spirit, not in this mountain nor at Jerusalem, he abolishes all worship which is restricted to any particular place. Hence we must abolish and hold in abhorrence the wicked device of the corporal presence of Christ in the bread, which is the foundation of the idolatrous worship of the papists. For as long as Christ's bodily presence in the bread is retained, whether it be by tran or consubstantiation, so long the popish worship will remain. For as in former times, before the ascension of Christ into heaven, it was not only lawful but even necessary to worship Christ in whatever place he was, so now, if he is in the bread, he must be worshipped in the bread, whether we see him or not. Yea, we ought rather to believe the word of God than any of our senses, if it taught any such thing. But if, on the other hand, we reject the corporal presence of Christ in the bread, we also abolish by the command of God himself this shameful worship which the papists are wont to bestow upon the body of Christ, which, they say, lies concealed under the forms of bread and wine. The ubiquitarians take exception against us here, and say that Christ is in the bread, not to be adored, but to be eaten. Neither does he give any command that he should be adored in the bread, but that he should be eaten. This, however, which they assert, is a mere begging of the question, for Christ commanded neither. If he is in the bread, it is proper that he should be there worshipped, on account of the general command, Let all the angels of God worship him. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. Psalm 97 verse 7, Hebrews 1 verse 6, Deuteronomy 6 verse 13, chapter 10 verse 20. They imagine Christ therefore to be in the bread, and yet affirm that it is not lawful to worship him. Hence Musculus and others, to solve this difficulty, fall down before the bread and worship Christ in it. Hesus argues against what we have affirmed in this way, the divinity, although it is present in all creatures, is nevertheless not to be adored in them. Therefore, neither is it necessary that the humanity of Christ should be adored in the bread, although it is corporally present in it. But the cases are different, for the adoration of the divinity is not restricted to all creatures, but is joined to the humanity which he assumed, as to its own temple. Hence, wherever the humanity of Christ is, there the divinity will be worshipped in it, and with it, so that the ubiquity of Christ's humanity is entirely overthrown by this argument, upon which they are wont to lay so much importance. For, since the humanity of Christ is not to be worshipped in all creatures and everywhere, it follows that it is not present everywhere, in all pears, apples, ropes, cheese, etc., as the ubiquitarians write in reference to this subject. These differences were enlarged by the addition of the following particulars and delivered by Osinus in the year 1569. 1. The supper testifies that the sacrifice of Christ alone justifies. The popish priests affirm that the mass justifies according to the work which is done. 2. The supper teaches that Christ has redeemed us by offering himself for us. The priests affirm that we are justified by Christ offered by them. 3. The supper teaches that our salvation is accomplished by the one sacrifice which Christ offered for us upon the cross. The priests affirm that it is accomplished by the mass being frequently repeated. 4. The supper teaches that we are engrafted into Christ by means of the Holy Spirit through faith. The mass deceives when it teaches that Christ enters into us corporally, or that we are engrafted into Christ by his entering into us corporally. 5. The supper teaches that Christ ascended into heaven after having accomplished his sacrifice. The mass mongers will have it that he is upon the altar as to his body. 6. The bread and wine remain in the supper and are not changed as to their substance, but the sacraments retain and do not change the substance of the signs. The mass mongers teach that the substance of the bread and wine is annihilated and that the accidents only remain. 7. The design of the supper is the confirmation of our faith in Christ and of his only sacrifice. 
The design of the Mass is the confirmation of the opinion concerning works which are done, and a denial of the sacrifice of Christ. 8. The supper teaches that Christ is to be adored in heaven. The mass-mongers adore him under the forms of bread and wine. These differences prove that the popish mass is, in fact, nothing else than a denial of the one sacrifice of Christ, and an accursed idolatry. These differences, moreover, prove that there are many and weighty causes on account of which the popish mass ought to be suppressed, abolished, and entirely discarded from the church, viz. 1. The popish mass is a manifold corruption, or rather the abolishing of the whole rite instituted by Christ, that is, of the Lord's Supper. For it takes away the cup from the laity, and adds many foolish toys, unknown to the apostles, and never practised by the church in her early history, when nevertheless no creature has the power of instituting sacraments, or of changing or abolishing their divine constitution. 2. The Mass destroys the sign and the sacrament itself, inasmuch as it changes the sign into the thing signified. It denies that there is any bread and wine present, but declares it to be the flesh and blood of Christ substantially, which is repugnant to the nature of sacraments, which does not allow the substance of the signs to be destroyed. Neither does it require any physical connection between the signs and the things signified. So it does not require any transubstantiation or corporal presence in the supper but doubtless leads us to Christ crucified, and now reigning in heaven, and thence communicating himself unto us. 3. The opinion of merit attaching itself to that which is done is grounded in the Mass, because the priests feign that the Mass is a propitiatory sacrifice, which merits by its own dignity and virtue the remission of sins for them and for others by the work which is done. But this virtue did not even belong to the Mosaic sacrifices, it belongs only to the one sacrifice which the Son of God offered once for us upon the cross, to which the Lord's Supper leads and directs us, whilst the Mass withdraws and calls the mind away from it. It is true that the Fathers do sometimes call the Supper a sacrifice, but they meant a Eucharistical or Thanksgiving sacrifice, and not a propitiatory sacrifice, as the Papists maintain. And indeed the Supper is that sacrifice which Christ offered, as the bread is that body which he gave for us, which, however, is to be understood sacramentally. These mass-mongerers, however, make the mass not that very same sacrifice which Christ offered, but something different from it. For, say they, it is a sacrifice without blood, by which we obtain the forgiveness of sins. Hence they do in fact deny the sacrifice which Christ offered by the shedding of his blood, when they deny that Christ has perfectly merited the remission of sins, and imagine another sacrifice for sin, although they affirm that they offer no other sacrifice than that which Christ offered. For it is one thing to offer one sacrifice once, and that sufficient to atone for all sin, which the Scriptures declare to be true of the sacrifice of Christ. And it is another thing for the same sacrifice to be frequently offered, which does not agree with the sacrifice of Christ. They contradict themselves when they say that this sacrifice alone is sufficient for the remission of sins, and this sacrifice with others is offered for sins. For there is another error concealed under this, that they should imagine themselves able to obtain the forgiveness of sins and the deliverance of souls absent or dead and in purgatory, when the word of God declares, on the contrary, that we shall be clothed in heaven, if we are found clothed and not naked on earth, and that we shall be judged according to the characters which we have when we depart out of this life. Cyprian says, quote, When we have once departed this life, there is then no room for repentance and no effect of satisfaction. Here life is either lost or gained, here, eternal salvation is obtained by the worship of God and by the fruit of faith. End quote. 5. There is also here another error, because they feign that, by the offering of the sacrifice in the Mass, they do not only merit the forgiveness of sins, but also other benefits, as the healing of the sick, and of sheep, horses, cattle, swine, etc. They imagine, therefore, that benefits are conferred in the Mass of an entirely different character from those promised in the Gospel and sealed by the sacraments. 6. The Mass is opposed to the priesthood of Christ. Christ alone has the power of offering himself. These mass-mongerers, however, imagine that the Son of God may be offered not only by himself but by others also, and that they offer him unto God the Father, when there is, nevertheless, no creature of such dignity as to be able to offer the Son of God as a sacrifice. The priest is greater and more excellent than the sacrifice, hence, as they affirm that they are the priests who offer Christ, they exalt themselves above him. To this they are wont to object, saying that they do not slay, but only offer and exhibit the Son to the Father, that he may remit unto us our sins for the sake of Christ, 
so that they merely in this way apply that one sacrifice of the Son of God, but that which they affirm is sufficient to convict them of error, that they offer Christ with their hands. For it remains that they make themselves the priests who offer the Son of God as a sacrifice, and so exalt themselves above him. Nor does that which they affirm, when they say that they do not slay Christ, avail anything. For there were many things offered by the priests of old, which they nevertheless did not slay, but only sacrificed or offered, as cakes, burnt offerings, etc. The Jews slew Christ, but they did not sacrifice him, but Christ was willingly slain, and therefore sacrificed himself, who, through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without spot to God. Hebrews 9 verse 14. Christ verily offered himself once a sacrifice to the Father for us. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin, forever sat down on the right hand of God. Hebrews 9 verse 28, chapter 10 verse 12. The papists now, in opposition to these express declarations of Scripture, will have Christ offered often in the Mass. They maintain that they sacrifice him often, but do not slay him. A propitiatory sacrifice, however, cannot be offered without the death of the victim, for without the shedding of blood is no remission. 7. The Mass is in conflict with the articles of our faith respecting the true humanity of Christ, his true ascension into heaven, and his return to judgment, for it joins to Christ a body made of bread, and imagines that Christ is concealed corporally under the forms of bread and wine. 8. The Mass is opposed to the communion of saints with Christ, for it devises the horrible figment that Christ's body is made to enter into our bodies and to remain within us as long as the forms of bread and wine remain undigested. The Supper teaches, on the other hand, that we are members of Christ by the Holy Spirit and are engrafted into Him. 9. Finally, the Mass is repugnant to the true Word of God because it establishes the idolatrous worship of Christ in the bread, as we have already shown. The Papists restrict or bind the worship of Christ to a thing, to which Christ has not restricted it by any express command, and in this way they declare themselves idolaters no less than if they were to worship Christ at a wall, or if they were to adore him falling down before a pillar. From what has now been said, it is evident that the Mass is an idol, formed by Antichrist out of various accursed errors and blasphemies, and substituted in the place of the Lord's Supper, which for this reason is properly and necessarily abolished. Objection 1. The Mass is an application of the sacrifice of Christ, therefore it ought not to be abolished. Answer. We deny the antecedent for the reason that the merits of Christ are applied unto us by faith alone, as it is said, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Ephesians 3 verse 17. Objection 2. There must necessarily be a perpetual sacrifice in the church. Isaiah foretold that it should be from one Sabbath to another, and Malachi says, They shall offer a pure offering. Isaiah 66 verse 23, Malachi 1 verse 11. Answer. The sacrifices of the Christian church are eucharistical, and it is of such sacrifices that it is here declared that they shall be perpetual and pure. The fathers call such a sacrifice of thanksgiving eucharistical, one, because it is a remembrance of the sacrifice of Christ. Two, because in the primitive church, alms, which were a sacrifice, were offered and given to the poor after the observance of the Lord's Supper. But the fathers never dreamt that the supper was a propitiatory sacrifice. End of section 49. Section 50 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus Translated by G. W. Williard, this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lord's Supper, Part 5 Question 81. For whom is the Lord's Supper instituted? Answer. For those who are truly sorrowful for their sins, and yet trust that these are forgiven them for the sake of Christ, and that their remaining infirmities are covered by his passion and death, and who also earnestly desire to have their faith more and more strengthened, and their lives more holy. But hypocrites, and such as turn not to God with sincere hearts, eat and drink judgment to themselves. Exposition. There are three things to be explained in the exposition of this question. First, for whom has the Lord's Supper been instituted? Second, what do the wicked receive if they come to this supper? Third, what is the lawful use of the supper? 1. Who ought to come to the Lord's Supper? The questions who ought to come and who ought to be admitted to the supper are distinct and different. The former speaks of the duty of communicants, the latter of the duty of the church and ministers. The former is more restricted, the latter is broader and more general. 
for as touching the former none but the godly ought to come to the supper, whilst as it respects the latter not only the godly but hypocrites also, who are not known to be such, are to be admitted by the church. Hence all that ought to come ought also to be admitted, but not all who ought to be admitted ought to come, but only those, one, who acknowledge their sins and are truly sorrowful for them, two, who trust that their sins are forgiven them by and for the sake of Christ, three, who earnestly desire to have their faith more and more strengthened, and their lives more holy, that is, those only ought to come to the Lord's Supper, and they alone are worthy guests of Christ, who live in true faith and repentance. It is in these things that a true examination, in order to a profitable approach to the Holy Supper, consists. Paul speaks of this when he says, Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 28 to examine oneself is to see if we have faith and repentance, as it is said, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith, and whether Christ is in you. But how shall a man know that he possesses these things? 1. By having confidence in God and peace of conscience. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. Romans 5 verses 1 and 5. 2. From the effects of a true faith, or from the beginning of a true obedience, being both internal and external, and from a sincere desire and purpose to obey all the commandments of God. Those who have the consciousness that they possess these things, or, to express it in other words, those who have faith and repentance, not only in possibility but actually, ought to come to and partake of the Lord's Supper. Infants are not capable of coming to the Lord's Supper because they do not possess faith actually, but only potentially and by inclination. But here actual faith is required, which includes a certain knowledge of what God has revealed, and an assured confidence in Christ. It also requires the commencement of a new obedience and purpose to live godly, and also an examination of ourselves with a commemoration of the Lord's death. Hypocrites and such as have no true faith and repentance ought not to come to the Lord's Supper, one, because the sacraments were instituted merely for the faithful, and such as turned to God with sincere hearts, that they might seal unto them the promise of the gospel, and confirm their faith. The word is common both to the converted and the unconverted. It is preached to those who are converted, that they might be confirmed thereby, and to the unconverted, that they may be converted. The sacraments, however, belong to the faithful alone, and as to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, Christ instituted it in the presence of his disciples alone, as he said, With desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you. Luke 22, verse 15. We therefore conclude from the nature and subject of sacraments as follows. What God has instituted for his household and children, that hypocrites and aliens from the church ought not to receive. 2. Paul forbids hypocrites and all wicked persons to come to the Lord's table, in words which admit of no controversy when he commands that every one examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 28. 3. Because when hypocrites and such as turn not to God with sincere hearts come to the Lord's table, they eat and drink judgment to themselves, and are guilty of the body and blood of Christ. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 29. 4. To these considerations we may yet add the general testimony of Scripture, which forbids unbelievers to come to the Lord's Supper, and condemns the use of the sacraments on the part of those who are unconverted. Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother. He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. If thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Matthew 5 verse 24, Isaiah 66 verse 3, Romans 2 verse 25. Objection. But God commands all to observe the sacraments, and Christ says, Take, drink ye all of this. Therefore the ungodly do not sin by coming to the Lord's table. Answer, we reply to the antecedent that God does indeed command all to observe the sacraments, but then he requires that they be used lawfully, to do which there must be faith and repentance. God commands all to be baptized and to observe the supper, but he also commands them to repent and believe. Repent and be baptized, let a man examine himself, Acts 2 verse 38, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 28. Objection 2. We are all unworthy, therefore none ought to come to the Lord's table. 
Answer, we reply to the antecedent that we are all unworthy by nature and in ourselves, but we are made worthy by the grace of Christ if we come with faith and a good conscience. Augustine says, quote, Come with boldness, it is bread and not poison. End quote. No one ought, therefore, to absent himself because of his unworthiness, seeing that all who come with faith and penitence are counted worthy guests. To this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Isaiah 66, verse 2. Objection 3. Those who keep from profaning the supper act properly. Those now who stay away from the Lord's table, on account of being at enmity with someone and for other sins, keep from profaning the supper, therefore their conduct is such as is right and proper. Answer. We reply to the major proposition by making a distinction. Those who keep from profaning the Lord's table act properly, if they keep from it in such a way as they ought, viz. by repenting of those sins which render them unworthy. But they act unwisely and wickedly, who, when they absent themselves from the Lord's table, continue in sin, hypocrisy, and a state of enmity with their neighbour, for they add sin to sin, and contempt to profanation. We must not do evil that good may come. Second, what do the wicked receive in the use of the Lord's Supper? Hypocrites, and such as turn not to God with sincere hearts, coming to the Lord's Supper, receive not the things signified, viz. the body and blood of Christ, but the naked signs of bread and wine, and these to their condemnation. This is proven, one, from the definition of eating. To eat Christ is to be made a partaker of the substance, merit, efficacy, and of all the benefits of Christ, as it is said, He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him even he shall live by me. John 6 verses 56 and 57. But the wicked and unbelieving are not made partakers of Christ, therefore they do not eat Christ. 2. From the manner and means of eating. Christ's body is eaten by faith alone, because we receive him with all his benefits by faith only. The body of Christ is the food of the soul and not of the body, of the heart and not of the mouth, as it is correctly expressed in Luther's Catechism. Quote, these words for you require believing hearts, end quote. But the ungodly and hypocrites have no faith, therefore they do not receive the body of Christ. 3. Christ offers his body in the supper to be eaten by them alone, for whom he offered himself upon the cross. But he offered himself upon the cross only for those that believe, and not for the ungodly or for hypocrites. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. This is my body which is given for you. John 17, verse 9, Luke 22, verse 19. 4. The body of Christ is the vivifying bread, which whosoever receives, receives life at the same time. For Christ's spirit is not separate from his body. He that eateth my flesh dwelleth in me, and I in him. John 6, verse 56. But the ungodly, in receiving the signs, do not receive life. Therefore they receive the signs without the things signified. 5. The ungodly eat and drink judgment to themselves, therefore they do not eat and drink the body and blood of Christ. This argument is of force according to the rule of contraries. For to eat judgment to themselves is, through unbelief and abuse of the sacraments, to be driven from Christ and separated from him and all his benefits. Or it is grievously to offend God by abusing the sacraments by receiving them without faith and repentance, and so to bring upon themselves temporal and eternal punishment, if they do not repent. To eat Christ, on the contrary, is to be made a partaker of Christ and of all his benefits by faith, for no one can eat Christ and yet not be made at the same time a partaker of his merit, efficacy, and benefits. Hence no one can at the same time eat Christ and also condemnation to himself. 6. When Paul says, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 21, ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils, he affirms that there is something in the Lord's supper of which the ungodly cannot partake. But they do partake of the signs of bread and wine at the Lord's table, therefore he excludes them from a participation in the body and blood of Christ, the things signified in the supper. To this it is objected that when the apostle says ye cannot, he means ye cannot partake with a good conscience and unto salvation. But this is a false gloss, because the apostle does not reason from what is unprofitable, but from what is impossible. Ye ought not to partake with them that sacrifice to idols. Why? Because this is to partake with devils. But it is impossible that ye should at the same time be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Because it is impossible to serve two masters at the same time, as Christ says, 
No man can serve two masters. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Matthew 6, verse 24. It is in the same sense that the apostle here says, Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. 7. Christ says, Matthew 15, verse 26, It is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. The body of Christ is the children's bread. That is, it is the bread of the faithful. Therefore Christ does not cast his body to dogs, meaning the wicked, contrary to his own doctrine. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, etc. Matthew 7, verse 6. 8. From the authority of the fathers, who taught the same thing in reference to this subject. See Augustine, Liber 21, Caput 25, De Civitate Dei, and in Ioannum, Tractus 26 and 59, and in St. Prosperi, Caput 3 and 39. Ambrose says of the supper, quote, Although the sacraments suffer themselves to be taken or handled by those who are unworthy, yet those persons cannot be partakers of the spirit whose unbelief or unworthiness contradicts so great holiness. End quote. And a little farther on he says, quote, And as for those who are present at these sacred mysteries with cold hearts and souls, and who even partake of these gifts, they do indeed lick the rock, but they neither suck any honey or oil from it, because they are not enlivened by any sweetness of charity, nor by the sanctity of the Holy Spirit. They neither judge themselves nor make any distinction in regard to the sacraments, but use these holy gifts without any reverence, as if they were common food, and impudently push themselves to the Lord's table with unclean garments, for whom it had been better if they had been cast into the sea with a millstone tied about their neck, than to receive, with their unclean conscience, one morsel at the hands of the Lord, who even to this day creates, sanctifies, blesses, and distributes to godly receivers his most true and holy body. End quote. The reasons on account of which unbelievers and such as are ungodly bring upon themselves condemnation by eating and drinking are one, because they profane the signs, and by consequence the things signified, by taking to themselves those things which were not instituted for them, but for the disciples of Christ alone. 2. Because they profane the covenant of God, by taking to themselves the signs of the covenant, they desire to appear in covenant with God, when in fact they are in league with the devil and not with God, whom they endeavor as far as they can to make the father of the wicked. 3. Because they do not discern the Lord's body and trample his blood under their feet. God does indeed offer his benefits to them, but they do not receive them by faith, and so mock God, whilst they profess to receive the benefits of Christ inasmuch as they neither do nor will anything less, and thus they add this new offence to their other sins. 4. Because they condemn themselves by their own judgment, for in coming to the Lord's table they profess that they approve of this doctrine, and that they believe that there is no salvation out of Christ, and yet in the meanwhile they are conscious that they are hypocrites, and so condemn themselves. Those, therefore, who argue that if the ungodly eat to themselves condemnation, they must eat the body of Christ, reason falsely. Yet it may be said that the contrary is rather true, for if they eat to themselves condemnation, they do not eat the body of Christ, for to eat Christ and to eat condemnation are contraries, which cannot hold true at the same time. But, say our opponents, they eat unworthily, therefore they nevertheless eat. We grant that they do indeed eat, but they merely eat bread, and not the body of Christ. For it is expressly said, Whosoever shall eat this bread unworthily. But, say they again, Christ is not only a saviour, but also a judge. To which we reply, that he is not a judge of those by whom he is eaten, but of those by whom he is despised. For it is said of them that eat, He that eateth me, even he shall live by me. John 6, verse 57. And of those that despise Christ, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Matthew 7, verse 23. As the gospel is the savour of life unto life when it is believed, and is the savour of death unto death when it is despised, so Christ, when he is eaten, quickeneth, and when he is despised, judgeth. Christ now is despised when he is offered to the unbelieving in the word and sacraments, and is rejected by their unbelief. But it is still further objected, the ungodly are guilty of the body of Christ, and therefore must eat it. But the cause of their guilt is not the eating of Christ, but the eating of the bread without Christ, because it is said, Whosoever shall eat of this bread unworthily, etc. An abuse of the sign is a contempt cast upon Christ himself, as an injury done to the charter or seal of a king is an injury done to the king himself, and is an offence against his injured majesty. 
but how it is asked can the ungodly eat judgment to themselves and be guilty when it is a good work to receive the sacraments we reply that the receiving of the sacraments is in itself a good work and when it is accompanied with the true and lawful use thereof otherwise it is a work which god does not command but forbids as he himself says he that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man etc isaiah sixty six verse three so paul says this is not to eat the lord's supper etc if thou be a breaker of the law thy circumcision is made uncircumcision one corinthians eleven verse twenty romans two verse twenty five if this were not true we might thus conclude the receiving of the body of christ is a good work therefore the ungodly cannot by this receiving be guilty of the body of christ third what is the lawful use of the lord's supper the lawful use of the supper is when the faithful receive in the church the bread and cup of the Lord and show his death, so that this receiving may be a pledge of their union with Christ and an application of the whole benefit of our redemption and salvation. It consists in these three things. One, in retaining and observing the rites and ceremonies instituted by Christ. This too must be done not ludicrously, nor by one person privately, but in a regular assembly of the church, whether great or small. The rites which Christ has instituted are that the Lord's bread be broken, distributed, and received, and the Lord's cup be given to all the communicants in remembrance of his death. Two, when the rites are observed by those persons for whom they were instituted by Christ, that is, when the bread and wine are received by those whom Christ designed should receive them, which persons are not his enemies but his disciples, the faithful. The observance of these rites without faith and repentance is not the use but the abuse of them. Three, when the supper is received and the whole transaction is directed to the end for which it was instituted by Christ, viz. in remembrance of the Lord's death, which is for the confirmation of our faith and the rendering of true gratitude. End of section 50《Section 51 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lord's Supper, Part 6 Question 82. Are they also to be admitted to this supper, who, by confession and life, declare themselves infidels and ungodly? Answer. No, for by this the covenant of God would be profaned, and his wrath kindled against the whole congregation. Therefore it is the duty of the Christian Church, according to the appointment of Christ and his apostles, to exclude such persons by the keys of the kingdom of heaven, until they show amendment of life. Exposition. They are to be admitted to the Lord's Supper by the Church, one, who are of a proper age to examine themselves and to commemorate the Lord's death according to the command, This do ye in remembrance of me. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread. Ye do show the Lord's death till he come. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 25, 26, and 28. The infant children of the church are therefore not admitted to the use of the Lord's Supper, even though they are included among the number of the faithful. 2. Those who are baptized, and who by baptism are made members of the church, the covenant entered into with God in baptism is renewed in the observance of the Lord's Supper. It was for this reason that none except those who were first circumcised were permitted to eat the Passover. Therefore Turks, Jews, and all other aliens from the church are to be debarred from the use of the supper. 3. Those who profess true repentance and faith in word and in deed, or who exhibit a profession of faith and repentance in their deportment, whether it be made truly and sincerely, or by secret hypocrisy. The church is not to judge in regard to that which is secret and hidden. It therefore admits all whom it judges to be members of Christ, that is, all whom it hears and sees professing repentance and faith by confession, and the external deportment of the life, whether they be truly pious or hypocrites whose true character is not yet known. Those, however, are not to be admitted to the Lord's table who simply declare that they believe all these things, whilst they continue to lead ungodly and sinful lives, for he that says he believes and yet has not the fruits of faith, lies and denies indeed what he affirms in words, according to the declaration of the apostle where he says they profess that they know god but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate titus one verse sixteen so the apostle james declares chapter two verse twenty that faith without works is dead 
the reasons why only those are to be admitted to the lord's supper who by confession and life profess repentance and faith are one because the church would profane the covenant of god if it were to admit to the holy communion the unbelieving and impenitent for he that does a thing and he that consents to it are regarded in the same light by the law to profane the covenant of god is to commend and recognize those as the confederates or friends of god who are his enemies and to represent god as such an one as is in league with hypocrites and wicked men there are two ways in which the covenant of god is profaned the one is by administering the signs of the covenant to those to whom god promises nothing the other is by using these signs without repentance and faith for they do not only profane the covenant of god who take to themselves the signs of the covenant whilst they are impenitent but those also who knowingly and willingly administer the signs to such persons as god has excluded from his covenant those therefore who give the signs of the covenant to the ungodly make god the friend of the wicked and make the children of the devil the children of god two if the church were to admit to the lord's supper knowingly and willingly those who by confession and life declare themselves infidels and ungodly the wrath of god would be kindled against the whole congregation and that the wrath of god is in this way kindled against the church the apostle paul clearly affirms when he says for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep for if we would judge ourselves we should not be judged one corinthians eleven verses thirty and thirty one god is therefore angry with those who consent to or connive at the profanation of this sacrament and punishes them because he punishes the wicked who were admitted by their consent for the lord's supper is equally profaned by both three christ has given command not to admit such as are ungodly at his table if any one denies the existence of such a command in reference to the lord's supper the sense or substance of it may easily be proven since christ instituted his supper for his disciples and for them alone as may be inferred from what he said with desire have i desired to eat this passover with you take this and divide it amongst yourselves this cup is the new testament in my blood which is shed for you luke twenty two verses fifteen seventeen and nineteen the lord's supper was therefore instituted for the disciples of christ alone and so the command take this etc pertains to them all others for whom christ has not died are excluded to these reasons we may add the following four clear and forcible demonstration those who deny the faith are not to be regarded as members of the church no not even of the visible church all those now who refuse to repent deny the faith according to what the apostle says they profess that they know god but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate titus one verse sixteen therefore those who refuse to repent are not to be regarded even as members of the visible church and so are not to be admitted to the sacraments of the church but should be excluded from them as aliens so long as they continue to lead impenitent and ungodly lives as for those hypocrites however whose true character is not known by the church they are to be admitted to the lord's supper with the godly as those who by confession and life profess repentance and faith yet none should come except such as truly believe for all others including even those hypocrites whose true character is not known by men eat and drink judgment to themselves and profane the lord's supper objection the church does not profane the covenant of god by admitting hypocrites to the lord's supper therefore it does not profane it by admitting those who are known to be impenitent we reply to the antecedent as follows the church does not do wrong by admitting hypocrites that is such as are not known to be hypocrites because it is compelled to acknowledge them as sincere in view of the confession which they have made of their faith and the repentance which they have feigned but if the church were knowingly and willingly to admit known and avowed hypocrites or such as deny repentance and faith both in word and deed it would do wrong to this it is objected but there are many impenitent persons who intrude themselves and profane the covenant especially where the proper discipline of the church is not maintained and yet the church does no wrong in admitting them therefore it is not wrong that other persons denying repentance should be admitted to the lord's table answer the church in this case does no wrong not because it is no sin to admit such as are impenitent but because it admits them ignorantly not knowing that they are such but the impenitent who push themselves forward to the lord's table profane the covenant not to the condemnation of the church or of those who commune with them but to their own guilt for they by so doing bring judgment upon themselves 
Yet the church should carefully observe and inquire into the character of those who are admitted to the Lord's table, and the minister, where excommunication or church discipline is not exercised, is excused if he does not willingly administer the supper to those who abuse it, and if he is instant in admonishing and reproving them, and if he desires them to avoid these abuses, for blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. But the sin will rest upon others, viz. upon those who abuse the sacraments, and who connive at these things. Theses concerning the Lord's Supper. 1. The other sacrament of the New Testament is called the Lord's Supper, not because it should be celebrated in the evening or at the time of supper, but because it was instituted by Christ when he observed the Last Supper with his disciples before his death. It is called the Lord's Table because Christ feeds us in its proper use. It is called the Sacrament of the Body and Blood of Christ, because the body and blood of Christ are communicated to us in it. It is called the Eucharist, because there is in it a solemn thanksgiving for the death and benefits of Christ. It is called a covenant, because it should be celebrated in the public assemblies of the Church. It is also called by the Fathers a sacrifice, because it is a representation of the propitiatory sacrifice which Christ accomplished upon the cross, and because it is a sacrifice of thanksgiving. 2. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament of the New Testament in which, according to the command of Christ, bread and wine are distributed in the assembly of the faithful and received in remembrance of Christ, or that Christ may testify to us that he feeds us unto eternal life by his body and blood broken and shed for us, and that we may return thanks to him for his benefits. 3. The first and chief design or use of the Lord's Supper is that Christ may declare to us that he died for us, and feeds us with his body and blood unto everlasting life, that he may by this declaration establish and increase our faith, and so by consequence this spiritual food is in us. The second end is the giving of thanks for these benefits of Christ, and a public and solemn profession of our duty to him. The third is to distinguish the church from all other religions. The fourth, that it may be a bond of mutual love. The fifth, that it may be a bond of the public assemblies of the church. Four, the first end of this sacrament, which is a confirmation of our faith in Christ, the Lord's Supper has, because Christ himself gives this bread and wine by the hand of the minister in remembrance of himself. That is, that he may admonish us by this symbol, as by his visible word, that he died for us, and that he is to be the bread of everlasting life, whilst he makes us his members, and because he has added to this rite the promise that he will feed those who eat this bread in remembrance of him with his own body and blood, when he says, This is my body, and because the Holy Spirit, by this visible testimony, influences the minds and hearts of the faithful to believe with stronger confidence the promise of the gospel. 5. There is therefore a double meat and drink in the Lord's Supper, one external, visible, and earthly, which is the bread and wine, the other is internal. There is also a double eating and receiving, the one external and signifying, which is the corporal receiving of the bread and wine, accomplished by the hands, mouth, and senses, the other internal, invisible, and signified, which is the fruition of Christ's death and a spiritual engrafting into his body, accomplished not with the hands and mouth, but by the spirit and faith. There is, finally, a double dispenser of this meat and drink, the external of the external, which is the minister of the church, giving to us with his hand the bread and wine, the internal of the internal, which is Christ himself, feeding us with his body and blood. 6. The signs which serve for the confirmation of our faith are bread and wine, and not the body and blood of Christ, for the body and blood of Christ are received, that we may live for ever whilst the bread and wine are taken, that we may be confirmed in regard to that heavenly food, and enjoy it more and more. 7. The bread is not changed into the body of Christ, nor is the wine changed into the blood of Christ, nor are the bread and wine abolished to give place to the body and blood of Christ, nor is the body of Christ substantially present in the bread, or under the bread, or where the bread is, but the Holy Ghost employs this symbol, in the right use of the Lord's Supper, as a means for the purpose of stirring up our faith, by which he more and more dwells in us, inserts us into Christ, and brings it to pass that we are justified through him and draw from him everlasting life. 8. When Christ says this, that is, this bread is my body, and this cup is my blood, the form of speech is sacramental or metonymical, 
so that the name of the thing signified is attributed to the sign to teach that the bread is the sacrament or symbol of his body, that it represents him, and declares that the body of Christ was offered for us upon the cross, and is given unto us as the bread of everlasting life, and is therefore the means which the Holy Ghost employs for preserving and increasing this food in us. As Paul says, the bread is the communion of the body of Christ, by which it is meant that the bread is the thing by which we are made partakers of Christ's body, and in another place we have all been made to drink into one spirit. The same thing is also taught when it is said that the bread is called the body of Christ on account of the resemblance which there is between the sign and the thing signified, viz. that the body of Christ nourishes the spiritual life of the believer, as bread supports our natural life, and on account of the certain joint reception of the sign and the thing signified in the lawful use of the sacrament. This, too, is the sacramental union of the bread, which is indicated by the sacramental mode of speaking, common in relation to this subject, which is no local conjunction, as some imagine. 9. As the body of Christ is, therefore, both his natural and sacramental body, which is the bread of the Eucharist, so the eating of the body of Christ is twofold, the one sacramental of the sign, viz. the external and corporal receiving of the bread and wine, the other real or spiritual, which is the receiving of the very body of Christ. To believe, too, in Christ dwelling in us by faith, is to be engrafted by the power of the Holy Spirit into his body, as members to the head and branches to the vine, and so to be made partakers of the benefits of the life and death of Christ. It is therefore evident that those who thus teach are falsely accused and represented when it is said that they make the supper consist in the bare signs, or in a participation of the merits of Christ alone, or of his benefits, or of the Holy Spirit, whilst they exclude the true, real, and spiritual communion of the body of Christ itself. 10. The lawful use of the supper consists in this, that the faithful observe this rite instituted by Christ in remembrance of him, or for the purpose of stirring up their faith and gratitude. 11. As the body of Christ is eaten sacramentally in the right use of the supper, so without this use, as in the case of unbelievers and hypocrites, it is sacramentally eaten but not really, that is, the sacramental symbols or signs, which are the bread and wine, are indeed received, but not the things which the sacraments signify, viz. the body and blood of Christ. 12. This doctrine of the Lord's Supper is based upon many and most solid arguments. It is confirmed by all those passages which speak of the Lord's Supper. Christ, too, calling the visible and broken bread, and not something invisible in the bread, his body which was given or broken for us, which, as it cannot be understood properly or literally, himself adds the declaration that that bread is truly received in remembrance of him, which is as if he had said that the bread is a sacrament of his body. He also says that the supper is the New Testament which is spiritual, one, and everlasting. Paul, in like manner, says that it is the communion of the body and blood of Christ, because all the faithful are one body in Christ, who can have no fellowship or communion with devils. This same apostle also makes the same engrafting into Christ by one spirit in baptism and the Holy Supper. The same thing is confirmed by the entire doctrine and nature of sacraments, which exhibit in the eyes the same spiritual communion of Christ to be received by faith, which the word or promises of the gospel declare to the ear. It is for this reason that the signs are called by the names of the things signified, and have the reception of the things themselves joined with them in the lawful use of the sacraments. The articles of our common faith establish the same thing, which teach that the body of Christ is a true human body, not present in many places at the same time, but is now placed in heaven to remain there until the Lord come to judge the quick and the dead, and that the communion of saints with Christ is effected by the Holy Spirit, and not by an interpenetration of the body of Christ into the bodies of men, and is therefore the doctrine which has been held and professed with great agreement by the whole church in her earlier and purer days. The Lord's Supper differs from baptism, one in the rite and manner of signification. The dipping or washing in baptism signifies the remission and removal of sin by the blood and spirit of Christ, and our fellowship with Christ in his afflictions and glorification. The distribution of the bread and wine signifies the death of Christ to be laid to our account for the remission of sins, and our engrafting into Christ so as to be made his members. 2. They differ in their operation. Baptism is the testimony of our regeneration, of the covenant made with God, and of our reception into the church. 
the Lord's Supper testifies that we are to be perpetually nourished by Christ in dwelling in us, and that the covenant once entered into between God and us shall ever be ratified in regard to us, so that we shall forever remain united with the church and body of Christ. 3. They differ as it respects the persons to whom they should be administered. Baptism is administered to all who are to be regarded members of the church, whether they be adults or infants. The Lord's Supper is to be given to none except those who are able to understand and celebrate the benefits of Christ and to examine themselves. 4. Baptism is to be received but once, because the covenant once entered into with God is always ratified in the case of those who repent. The Lord's Supper is to be often received inasmuch as it is necessary for our faith that we frequently renew that covenant and call it to mind. 5. They differ in the order which is to be observed. Baptism precedes the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper should be given to none except those who are baptized. 14. Those who examine themselves and who are possessed of true faith and repentance are worthy guests at the Lord's table. Those who have not this testimony within themselves ought not to approach the Lord's table lest they eat and drink judgment to themselves, nor should they defer that repentance which is necessary in order that they may come and so bring upon themselves hardness of heart and everlasting punishment. 15. The Church ought to admit to the Lord's Supper all those who profess to receive the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith, and who have a purpose to live in conformity thereto, but should exclude all those who are unwilling to abandon their errors, blasphemies, or sins when they are properly admonished by the Church and convicted of their errors and sins. 16. The Pope is guilty of corrupting the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, in that he has removed from it the breaking of the bread, and refuses the cup to the laity. He is also guilty of the same thing in having charged the Lord's Supper, by the addition of so many ceremonies not delivered by the Apostles, into a theatrical mass. These innovations, however, are still more wicked and idolatrous. That the Mass is a propitiatory sacrifice in which Christ is offered to the Father by the sacrificing priests for the living and the dead, and is, by virtue of the act of consecration, substantially present, and remains as long as the forms of bread and wine continue uncorrupted, that the Mass confers the grace of God and other benefits upon those for whom it is offered, that Christ is eaten orally, even though those who approach the Lord's table are destitute of any good desires or purposes, and that he is concealed and carried under the forms of bread and wine for the purpose of being adored. In view of these base corruptions, the Mass ought to be abolished in all Christian churches. These corruptions may be included under these heads. 1. Transubstantiation. 2. The worship of the bread. 3. Making a sacrifice out of the Lord's Supper. 4. Mutilating the Lord's Supper by various human devices. Certain principal arguments of the consubstantialists against the sincere doctrines of the Lord's Supper and those whom they call sacramentarians, with a refutation of them. The errors of the sacramentarians, say they, are these. 1. That they make the Lord's Supper consist merely in naked signs and symbols. Answer. We teach that the things signified are, together with the signs, exhibited and communicated in the lawful use of the supper, although not corporally, but in a manner correspondent to sacraments. 2. The sacramentarians, say they, hold that Christ is present in the supper only according to his efficacy. Answer. We teach that Christ is present, and that he is united to us by the Holy Spirit, although his body is at a great distance from us, just as whole Christ is present in the ministry, although differently according to the one nature. 3. We, say they, believe that an imaginary, figurative, and spiritual body of Christ is present in the supper, and not his true essential body. Answer. We have never spoken of an imaginary body, but of the true flesh of Christ which is present with us, although it remains in heaven. We teach, moreover, that we receive the bread and body, but in a manner peculiar to each. 4. We, say they, hold that the true body of Christ which hung upon the cross, and his blood which was shed for us, is distributed, and that it is spiritually received only by those who are worthy guests, whilst such as are unworthy receive nothing but the bare signs, and these to their condemnation. Answer. We admit the whole as being in accordance with the word of God, with the nature of the sacraments, with the analogy of faith, and with the communion of the faithful with Christ. The general points in which the churches which profess the gospel agree and differ in the controversy respecting the Lord's Supper. They agree in these particulars. 
1. That the Lord's Supper, as well as baptism, is a visible pledge and testimony annexed by Christ himself to the promise of grace, chiefly to this end, that he may confirm and strengthen our faith in this promise. 2. That in the true use of the Supper, as well as in all other sacraments, two things are given of God and secured by us, viz. earthly, external, and visible signs, as the bread and wine, and heavenly, internal, and invisible gifts, as the true body of Christ, with all his gifts, benefits, and heavenly treasures. 3. That in the supper we are made partakers not only of the Spirit of Christ and his satisfaction, righteousness, virtue, and operation, but also of the very substance and essence of his true body and blood given for us upon the cross and shed for us, and that we are fed with the same unto eternal life, and that Christ declares and makes this known unto us by this visible reception of bread and wine in the supper. For that the bread and wine are not changed into the flesh and blood of Christ, but remain true and natural bread and wine, that the body and blood of Christ are not enclosed in the bread and wine, and therefore the bread and wine are called the body of Christ. His body and blood in this sense, that his body and blood are not only signified by these and set before our eyes, but also because as often as we eat or drink this bread and wine, in the true and lawful use, Christ himself gives us his body and blood to be the meat and drink of eternal life. 5. That without the lawful use, the taking of bread and wine is no sacrament, being nothing more than a vain, empty ceremony and spectacle, such as men abuse to their condemnation. 6. That there is no other lawful use of the supper except that which Christ instituted and commanded to be observed, viz., that which is in remembrance of him and which declares his death. 7. That Christ does not command a hypocritical remembrance of himself and declaration of his death, but such as embraces his sufferings and death, and all the benefits which he has obtained by these in our behalf, by a true faith and with sincere thankfulness. 8. That Christ will dwell in none but such as believe, and in them also who, not through contempt but through necessity, cannot come to the Lord's Supper. Yea, in all believers from the beginning of the world to all eternity, even as well and in the same manner as he will dwell in them who have observed the Lord's Supper. They disagree in these particulars, one, that one class contends that the words of Christ, this is my body, must be understood literally, which they, however, do not prove. Others again hold that these words are to be understood sacramentally according to the declaration of Christ and Paul, and according to the rule by which we are to judge of the truth of any articles of our faith. 2. The former class of persons will have the body and blood of Christ essentially present in or with the bread and wine, and so to be eaten, that together with the bread and wine received from the hands of the minister, it enters by the mouth of those who receive them into their bodies. The other class of persons believe that the body of Christ, which in the celebration of the first supper sat at the table with the disciples, now is and will continue, not on earth but in heaven, until Christ shall come again to judge the quick and the dead, and yet that we who are on earth notwithstanding, as often as we eat this bread with a true faith, are so fed with his body and made to drink of his blood, that we are not only cleansed from our sins through his sufferings and shed blood, but are also so united to him and incorporated into his true essential human body, by his spirit dwelling both in him and in us, that we are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone, and are more firmly and closely united to him than the members of our body are united with our head, so that we draw and have in and from him everlasting life. 3. The first class of persons referred to maintain that all who come to the Lord's Supper and eat and drink of the bread and wine, whether believers or unbelievers, eat and drink corporally, and with their bodily mouth the flesh and blood of Christ, believers to life and salvation, and unbelievers to damnation and death. The other class of persons believe that unbelievers abuse indeed the outward signs to their condemnation, whilst none but the faithful eat and drink by a true faith, and by the Spirit, the body and blood of Christ unto eternal life. This last paragraph is inserted with slight alterations from the Old English translation by Parry. End of section 51。Section 52 Section As the Lord's Supper has been substituted in the place of the Passover, of which mention has been made, it is proper that we should here introduce some remarks in reference to the Passover. 
The principal things in reference to the Passover are included in the following questions. First, what was the Passover? Second, what was its design or use? Third, what are the points of resemblance between the Paschal Lamb and Christ? Fourth, has it been abolished and what has succeeded it? First, what was the Passover? The Passover was the solemn eating of a lamb which God enjoined upon the Israelites in order that this rite, being annually observed in every family, might be a memorial to them of their deliverance from Egypt, and that it might especially declare to the faithful their spiritual deliverance from sin and death by Christ, who was to be slain upon the cross and to be eaten by faith. Or it was a sacrament of the ancient church, which was to be celebrated according to the command of God in every family of the Jews, by the yearly slaying and eating of a lamb a year old, that it might be a memorial to them of the great benefit of their deliverance from Egyptian bondage, and that it might also be a seal of the promise of grace, touching the forgiveness of sins on account of the sacrifice of the Messiah. The Greek Pascha is derived from the Hebrew Pesach, which means a Passover, derived from Pasach, which means to pass over. This sacrament and feast was so called from the passing over of the angel, who, seeing the blood of the lamb sprinkled upon the upper doorpost of the Israelites, passed over and spared their firstborn, whilst he slew all the firstborn of the Egyptians. The history of the institution of the Passover is contained in the twelfth chapter of the book of Exodus. God commanded that the slaying of the lamb should be accompanied with certain and various rites. The lamb had to be a year old, a male without blemish. It had to be separated from the flock by the family on the tenth day of the first month called Nisan or Abib. It was to be slain four days after, or in the evening of the fourteenth day of the same month. The blood was to be sprinkled upon the two side posts and on the upper doorpost of the houses of the Jews. Then it was to be roasted with fire and eaten whole, and in haste with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Those that ate it stood with their loins girt, their shoes on their feet, and with their staff in hand. Of this rite, the Lord said, It is the Lord's Passover. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are, that when I see the blood I may pass over you. Exodus 12, verses 11 and 13. This feast God commanded the Jews to celebrate with great solemnity every year, at which time seven days were devoted to its observance. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance for ever. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread, etc. Exodus 12, verses 14 and 15. See also Exodus 12, verses 17 and 18. Chapter 23, verse 15. Leviticus 25, verse 5. Deuteronomy 16, verse 1. Second, what was the design of the Passover? There are five ends specified in the twelfth chapter of Exodus on account of which the Passover was instituted. One, that the blood of the lamb sprinkled on the doorposts might be a sign of the angel passing over them, and of the preservation of their firstborn. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are, and when I see the blood I will pass over you. Exodus 12 verse 13. This end, after the first performance of the rite and the passing over of the angel, ceases, although the analogy of it remains forever, for God formerly spared and now spares the faithful for the sake of the blood of Christ, by which we mean that he remits their sins and is taught in the next object specified. 2. That it might be a type of the sacrifice of the Messiah, yet to be offered, or that it might be a sign of the deliverance which would be wrought out by Christ, and so be a sign of God's grace to the church. This was the chief end of the yearly Passover. This is proven by the following arguments. A bone of him shall not be broken, John 19, verse 36. This type, John declares, was fulfilled when Christ's bones were not broken upon the cross. Therefore the Lamb was a type of Christ and of his sacrifice. Again, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. The paschal Lamb, therefore, signified Christ, and the sacrificing of it signified the sacrificing of Christ. Again, the church understood the signification of other sacrifices, that they were types of the sacrifice of the Messiah, for the ancient fathers were not so destitute of reason as to seek the remission of sins by the blood of bulls. Much more, therefore, did they by faith behold in the paschal lamb the Messiah and his sacrifice. Lastly, John calls Christ the Lamb of God, and the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. John 3 verse 29, Revelation 13 verse 8 because he was adumbrated by that lamb which was slain at the Passover. 3. That it might be a memorial of the first Passover and deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt. 
God desired that the remembrance of such a great benefit should be preserved among his people, lest their prosperity might become ungrateful. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction, for thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, that thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. Deuteronomy 16, verse 3. 4. That it might be a bond which would unite public assemblies and perpetuate the ecclesiastical ministry. And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation, etc. 5. That it might be a sacrament which would distinguish the people of God from all other nations. There shall no stranger eat thereof, and when a stranger shall sojourn with you, and will keep the Passover of the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. Exodus 12, verses 43 and 48. Third, what are the points of resemblance between the Paschal Lamb and Christ? A consideration of the resemblance between the rites which God commanded to be observed in regard to the Paschal Lamb and Christ contributes very much to the confirmation and illustration of the chief end of the Passover. A comparison between the type and the thing signified. The type was, one, a lamb from the flock, two, without blemish, set apart, three, to be slain and roasted, four, no bone was broken, five, was slain in the evening, six, the posts were to be sprinkled with blood, seven, that the destroyer might pass over the houses of the Israelites, eight, it was to be eaten, and that in every family, nine, it was all to be eaten, ten, without leavened bread, eleven, with bitter herbs, twelve, with haste, and in the attire of travellers, 13. By the circumcised alone. The thing signified is, 1. Christ, a true man, Isaiah 53, verse 2 and 3, John 1, verse 14. 2. Without sin, Isaiah 53, verses 5, 7 and 8, Hebrews 7, verse 26. 3. Who suffered and died, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. 4. He died without having his bones broken, John 19, verse 36. 5. In the end of the world, Hebrews 1, verse 2, chapter 9, verse 26. 6. His satisfaction is imputed unto us. Isaiah 53, verse 5, Romans 3, verse 24. 7. That we might be delivered from eternal death. Hebrews 2, verse 14. 8. There must be an application of Christ to everyone by faith. Romans 1, verse 17. John 6, verse 47. 9. According to all the articles of our faith. 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. 10. Without hypocrisy. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 8. 11. With the endurance of the cross, Matthew 10, verse 38. 12. With a desire to progress in the Christian life and with the expectation of eternal life, Luke 8, verse 15, Hebrews 13, verses 9 and 15. 13. None but the regenerate eat him, and to these alone is he profitable, and they alone receive not the sacrament to their condemnation, John 6, verse 56, Hebrews 13, verse 10, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. Fourth. Has the Passover been abolished? That the ancient Passover, with all the other types which prefigured the Messiah which was to come, was abolished at the coming of Christ, is evident, one, from the whole argument of the Apostle in the Epistle to the Hebrews, respecting the abolishing of the legal shadows in the New Testament. The priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Hebrews 7 verse 12, chapter 8 verse 13. 2. From the fulfilment of these legal shadows, these things were done, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. John 19, verse 36, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. 3. From the substitution of the New Testament, for Christ, when he was about to suffer and die and sacrifice himself as the true Passover, closed the ordinance relating to the Paschal Lamb with a solemn feast, and instituted and commanded his supper to be observed by the church in the place of the old Passover. With desire I have desired to eat with you this Passover before I suffer. Do this in remembrance of me. Luke 22, verses 15 and 19. Christ here commands the supper, not the ancient Passover, to be celebrated in remembrance of him. As baptism has, therefore, succeeded circumcision, so the Lord's Supper has succeeded the Passover in the New Testament. End of section 52. Section 53 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard, 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Keys of the Kingdom of Heaven, Part 1. 31st Lord's Day, Question 83, What are the Keys of the Kingdom of Heaven? Answer, the preaching of the Holy Gospel and Christian discipline, or the excommunication out of the Christian Church. By these two, the kingdom of heaven is opened to believers and shut against unbelievers. Exposition. Having now shown who are to be admitted to the Lord's Supper by the Church, the doctrine respecting the power of the keys of the kingdom of heaven comes naturally next in order, which, in addition to other things, teaches, in an especial manner, how those who are not to be admitted to the Lord's table ought to be kept back and excluded from the sacraments, lest they profane them by coming. The things which claim special attention in regard to this subject are, first, what is the power of the keys given to the church, and what are the parts thereof? Second, is there any necessity for ecclesiastical discipline and excommunication? Third, to whom is this power committed, against whom and in what order is it to be exercised? Fourth, to what ends ought it to be directed, and what are the abuses to be avoided? Fifth, in what does the power of the keys differ from civil power? First, what is the power of the keys given to the church, and what are the parts thereof? The power of the keys which Christ delivered to the church is the preaching of the gospel and Christian discipline, by which the kingdom of heaven is opened to believers and shut against unbelievers. Or it is the office of the church, according to the command of Christ, to make known the will of God by the preaching of the gospel and ecclesiastical discipline, and to declare and publicly testify the grace of God, and the remission of sins to such as are truly penitent, that is, to those who live in true faith and repentance, and, on the contrary, to denounce upon the wicked the wrath of God and exclusion from the kingdom of Christ, and to exclude them from the church as long as they shall show themselves estranged from Christ in doctrine and life, and to receive them into the church again when they promise and show real amendment. It is called the power of the keys from a metaphor or form of speech borrowed from stewards, to whom are delivered the keys of the house in which they are stewards. The keys signify the office of the steward by a metonymy, or change of terms between the sign and thing signified, as we use the term scepter for kingdom. The church is the house of the living God. The ministers of the church are the stewards of God. For what a faithful steward is in his master's house, managing all things at his master's command, the same is a faithful minister in the church. The declaration of the will of God, therefore, in the church is accomplished by the ministers, as by stewards, in the name of God. Christ himself is the author of the ministry. He gave this power to the church, and designated it by the term keys, saying to Peter, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 16, verse 19, that is the office or power to open and shut the kingdom of God. At another time he said to all the disciples, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew 18, verse 18, The keys of the kingdom of heaven are therefore the power to open and shut, to bind and loose, and are so called from the efficacy of this power. For the church opens and shuts, binds and looses by the word of God and in the name of Christ, in whose stead ministers act, and the Holy Ghost works effectually by his word according to the promise of Christ, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. John 20 verse 23. The keys of the kingdom of heaven consist of two parts, the preaching of the gospel, or the ministry of the word, and Christian discipline to which excommunication belongs. By these two the church opens and shuts, binds and looses. It shuts and binds by the preaching of the gospel, when it declares and testifies to unbelievers and hypocrites that they stand exposed to the wrath of God and eternal condemnation so long as they are unconverted, and it opens and looses when it declares and testifies to the faithful and penitent the remission of sins and the grace of God for the sake of Christ's merits. It shuts and binds by Christian discipline when it excommunicates wicked and obstinate offenders, or forbids them the use of the sacraments by which they are excluded from the Christian church, and by God himself from the kingdom of Christ, and it opens and looses when it again receives the same persons if they repent as members of Christ and his church. This distinction, however, must be observed as it respects the order of those two parts, the keys by the preaching of the gospel first loose and then bind, 
but in Christian discipline they first bind and then loose. Again, the keys loose and bind the same or different persons by the preaching of the gospel, but they bind and loose the same persons only by Christian discipline. Excommunication is the rejection or the excluding of a gross offender, one that is openly wicked and obstinate from the society of the faithful by the judgment of the elders with the consent of the whole church, done in the name and by the authority of Christ and of the Holy Ghost, in order that the offender, being thus put to shame, may repent, and that such things as bring a reproach upon the cause of Christ may be carefully guarded against. This is not merely an exclusion from the sacraments, but from the whole communion of the faithful, with which the obstinate and disobedient have no connection. It is twofold, internal, which belongs to God alone, and external, which belongs to the church. The former is declared on earth by that which is external, whilst the latter is ratified in heaven by that which is internal, according to the promise of Christ, whatsoever ye shall bind in earth shall be bound in heaven. Matthew 18, verse 18. Second, is there any necessity for ecclesiastical discipline and excommunication? There can be no doubt, but that all the prophets as well as Christ and his apostles have preached respecting the ministry of the word, and as ecclesiastical discipline has a necessary connection with the ministry of God's word, there can be no doubt respecting this, since God himself and Christ and the apostle Paul have confirmed and established it, both by precept and examples. And surely, if no country or city can exist without discipline, laws, and punishments, then certainly the church, which is the house of the living God, also needs some form of government and discipline, although it differs widely from civil power or jurisdiction. The discipline of the church is therefore necessary, one, on account of the general command of God, with respect to guarding against the profanation of the sacraments, both in the Old and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God would not allow wicked and obstinate offenders to be included among the number of his people, but required them to be excluded from their fellowship. Much less would he permit them to come to the sacraments of his church. The soul that doeth aught presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Because he hath despised the word of God, and hath broken his commandment, that soul shall be utterly cut off. Numbers 15, verses 30 and 31. God did indeed desire all to come to the Passover, that is, all the members of his church, but he did not regard the rebellious and obstinate as included in the number of those who were in covenant with him. Hence he commanded them to be excluded from his people. The man that will do presumptuously, and will not hearken unto the priest, that standeth to minister there before the Lord thy God, even that man shall die, and thou shalt put away the evil from Israel. Deuteronomy 17, verse 20. From these two passages just quoted, it appears that God commanded such as were rebellious and wicked to be cut off from the Jewish commonwealth, and would not allow them to be received amongst the number of his people. Much less, therefore, would he allow them to be regarded as members of his visible church, and be admitted to her sacraments. It is true, indeed, that the judicial law has been abolished, as well as the ceremonies which belonged to the Jewish dispensation, but that great distinction which was observed between the members of the Jewish church and others has not been set aside. There is, in the prophecy of Isaiah, a whole sermon directed against the wicked who offer sacrifices unto God, nor did God desire that such persons should offer sacrifices unto him. Hence he does not desire that they should be admitted to the sacraments of his house. His language is, bring no more vain oblations, etc. Isaiah 1 verse 13. But it is said by way of objection, God desired, yea also commanded, all to celebrate the Passover. We reply that he did indeed command all those who were regarded as members of his people to observe the Passover, but not such as were rebellious, for he expressly commanded them to be excluded from the number of those who stood in covenant relations with him. Isaiah detests the hypocritical offerings of those who are presumptuous enough to sacrifice unto God, whilst living in the habitual and willful indulgence of sin. He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man, he that sacrificeth a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck, he that offereth an oblation as if he offered swine's blood, he that burneth incense as if he blessed an idol, etc. Isaiah 66 verse 3. Jeremiah severely reproves those who had the boldness to come into the temple whilst they were still defiled with their sins. Jeremiah 6 verses 7, 10, and 20. 
Ezekiel declares that God will not be inquired of by those who go after strange gods and then present themselves in his temple. Ezekiel 20 verse 31. And in the 20th verse of the same chapter, he says that those profane his Sabbaths and pollute his sanctuary, who come into his house defiled with their idols. The prophet Amos rejects the sacrifices and worship of wicked transgressors, saying, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Amos 5 verse 21. The prophet Haggai forbids, chapter 2 verses 13 and 14, the unclean in soul to touch that which is holy, where he speaks of moral and ceremonial uncleanness. And in Proverbs 15 verse 8, it is declared that the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. In the New Testament, John admitted none to his baptism but such as confessed their sins and repented. Bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Matthew 3 verse 8, chapter 5 verse 24. He therefore who does not first reconcile himself to his brother should be forbidden the use of the sacraments. Christ commands that all submit themselves first to God according to all his commandments before they approach any of the sacraments, for by the term altar, as here used, may be understood any of the sacraments. Repent and be baptized every one of you. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest be baptized. Acts 2 verse 37, chapter 8 verse 37. Therefore, if thou dost not believe, it is not lawful. The things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Whosoever shall eat unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10 verses 20 and 21, chapter 11 verse 27. The wicked, eating without faith and repentance, partake unworthily. Therefore, they are guilty of the body of Christ. We ought not to take part in the sins of others. Neither ought we to connive at or feign ignorance in regard to the destruction of any one. Hence we should not admit the wicked to the sacraments, lest they eat judgment to themselves. 2. On account of the special command of Christ and his apostles, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man, and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew 18, verses 15 to 19. The Lord now will not permit his sacraments, which he instituted for the faithful alone, to be administered to publicans and heathen. And lest any one should understand this command as spoken of private judgment, it is expressly added, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth, etc., which declaration cannot be understood in any other sense than as referring to the public power of the keys. I verily, as absent in body but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And with such an one eat not, therefore put away from yourselves that wicked person. And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. And if any man obey not our doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed, for he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. 1 Corinthians 5 verses 3, 4, 5, 11, and 13, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 15, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6 and 14, 2 John 10 and 11. 3. The power of the keys is necessary on account of the glory of God, for reproach is cast upon the name and cause of God if all, including blasphemers, and such as are notoriously wicked, are regarded as the children of God without any distinction, so as to confound the kingdom of God with that of Satan. 4. It is necessary in order that the sacraments may not be profaned, and that that may not be given to the wicked in the supper which is denied them in the word. 5. That the purity of doctrine and worship may be preserved. 
6. For the safety of the church, which God will punish, if it knowingly and willingly profane the sacraments, or permit them to be profaned. 7. For the salvation of sinners, in order that they, being frequently admonished and put to shame, may be brought to repentance. 8. That scandals may be prevented in the church, and that those who are weak may not be corrupted by the bad examples of others. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6. 9. That scandals may be prevented on the part of those who are out of the church, and that those who are not as yet members of the church may not come into connection with it until they repent of their sins. 10. That the name of God be not blasphemed and evil spoken of by others, and his covenant dishonoured. 11. That punishment may be averted from the wicked, for if the ungodly are permitted to come to the sacraments of the church, they bring upon themselves the judgments of God. That this may not therefore come to pass, the church is bound to take such measures as will prevent them from coming to the holy sacraments. 12. Those who deny the true faith and doctrine of Christ are to be excluded from the church, and from the use of the sacraments. The faithful are not to be confounded with those who are aliens from the church, as are those who are openly wicked, who are blasphemers, and who have fallen into such errors as Arianism, Mohammedanism, etc. But all those who refuse to repent deny the true faith and doctrine of Christ. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. Titus 1 verse 16. And he that denies the true faith is worse than an infidel. Therefore those who persevere in their wickedness and refuse to repent are to be excluded from the church and from the use of the sacraments. 13. The declaration of Christ, Matthew 7, verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, is also here in point. But those who persevere in their wickedness, casting reproach upon the church and even upon God himself, are indeed dogs and swine, and are therefore not to be admitted to the sacraments. For if Christ declares this of his preached word, which was instituted for the converted and unconverted, or such as would yet be converted, much more is it true of his visible word, the sacraments, which were instituted for none but those who are converted. 14. Avowed infidels, blasphemers, and such as are notoriously wicked are not to be baptized, for none but such as believe with all their heart ought to be baptized. Hence Philip said to the eunuch, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest be baptized. Acts 8 verse 37. Nor did John baptize any but such as confess their sins, Hence, if unbelievers and blasphemers ought not to be baptized, it follows that they must also be excluded from the church and not be admitted to the Lord's Supper. For those who ought not to be baptized ought not to be admitted to the Supper, because that which excludes them from the one sacrament excludes them also from the other. 15. Those who are not yet baptized are not to be admitted to the Supper, but those who fall from or live in willful neglect of their baptism to them baptism is no baptism, according to the declaration of the Apostle Paul. If thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision, that is, if thou persevere in thy transgression without repentance. Romans 2 verse 25. Therefore those who fall from their baptism are not to be admitted to the Lord's Supper. To this someone may object and say, therefore those who fall from their baptism are also to be rebaptized after their reception into the church. But we would reply that reception into the church by baptism is valid in the case of all those who repent, and that without any repetition of the sign, and inasmuch as baptism is the sacrament of our reception into the church, those who fall from it are not in the church, and hence as long as they remain such, they are not to be admitted to the church, nor to the Lord's Supper. 16. The sign of grace ought not to be granted unto those to whom the promise of grace does not belong. Otherwise the church would act wickedly in admitting those whom God excludes, and would contradict itself, for it would absolve by the visible word those whom it would condemn by the preached word. But the promise of grace does not extend to blasphemers, and such as are openly wicked, therefore the sign of grace ought not to be granted unto them. 17. Lastly, the institution of the sacraments, or the condition to be observed on our part in coming to the sacraments, demands repentance and faith. Therefore unbelievers, and such as do not repent, are not to be admitted to the sacraments. The force of this argument will be seen by stating it thus, Those are to be admitted to the sacraments who have repentance and faith, therefore those who have not these qualifications are not to be admitted. Third, by whom, against whom, and in what order is the power of the keys to be exercised? 
The declaration of the word of God is committed to those to whom the power of the keys is committed. The denunciation of the wrath of God and the declaration of his grace, which is accomplished by the preaching of the gospel, is committed to the ministers of Christ. The preaching of the gospel is committed to them alone, but the denunciation of the wrath of God included in Christian discipline belongs to the whole church, for the whole church exercises discipline and spiritual jurisdiction. Yet the denunciation which is included in the ministry of the word is after a different manner from what it is in Christian discipline. In the ministry of the word the wrath of God is by all and every minister and by them alone denounced, the word of God going before against all the impenitent and unbelieving viz. that they are excluded from the kingdom of Christ, so long as they do not repent, and live according to the teachings of the gospel. And if they repent, the grace of God and the remission of sins is declared and testified to them from the word of God by the same ministers. Objection. Therefore ministers have power to condemn. Answer. They have ministerial power, by which we mean the office to declare and testify to men according to the command of God, that God remits or does not remit their sins. This is done in two ways. First, and in general, when they declare that all those who believe are saved, and that all those who do not believe are condemned. Secondly, when in the person of this office they declare and testify privately to particular persons, and to everyone in particular, that their sins are forgiven them of God for the sake of Christ's merits, whenever they receive the promise of the gospel by a true faith, and that the wrath of God is denounced against everyone so long as he does not repent. So Peter declared to Simon Magus, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. Acts 8 verse 21. The same thing must be declared to everyone in particular, as often as there is a necessity for it, not indeed according to our own pleasure or will, but according to the command of God. This is the power of the keys granted to the pastors of the church and connected with the ministry of the word. The execution of this sentence, however, belongs to God alone. As it respects ecclesiastical jurisdiction or Christian discipline, the case is somewhat different, for the declaration of the favour and wrath of God is not made by anyone privately, but by the whole church, or at least in the name of the whole church, by those who have been chosen for this purpose by the common consent of all. This declaration is made for certain causes, and with reference to particular persons, and includes an exclusion from the use of the sacraments, when necessity requires it. But who are to be excluded from the Christian church and from the use of the sacraments? An answer to this question may be anticipated from what we have already said upon this subject, which is, that those who either obstinately deny some article of faith, or show themselves unwilling to repent, and to submit themselves to the will of God according to all his commandments, and who do not hesitate to declare their intention to persist in a cause of open wickedness, all such are not to be admitted to the church, and if they have been admitted into the church by baptism, they must nevertheless not be permitted to approach the Lord's Supper until they renounce their errors and show amendment of life. The order which is to be observed in executing the power of the keys is that which Christ himself has prescribed in Matthew 18. If anyone has committed a private offence, he must first be kindly admonished by someone, according to the command of Christ, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Matthew 18, verse 15. Then, if he does not repent after having been admonished by one, he must be again privately admonished by taking with thee one or two more. Such admonitions, however, must be delivered according to the word of God, and with proper evidence of good will towards the offender, and must also be based upon causes which are just, grievous, and necessary. And if he will not repent when thus admonished by one or two, he must then be corrected by the whole church, concerning which Christ has also given commandment, saying, If he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. When any one sins by committing an offence publicly against the whole church, he must also be publicly corrected by the church according to the nature of the offence. And if he will not repent when thus admonished and reproved by the church, whether it be he that committed a private offence, or he that committed a public offence, excommunication must at length be inflicted by the church as the last remedy for the purpose of correcting obstinate and unrepenting sinners, according to the command of Christ. If he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. This, therefore, is the course which should always be pursued for the purpose of correcting and reclaiming those who err and become refractory in the church, observing the different steps which Christ has prescribed in the passage just quoted. These steps to be taken are four in number. 1. Private brotherly admonition. 
two admonition by many three admonition by the church four the public sentence of the church the first and second steps are to be observed in private offences the third in notorious and grievous sins or offences the fourth in the case of contumacy or of obstinate and determined wickedness in which only the church proceeds to the act of excommunication regarding the offender as an heathen and publican an alien from the church and kingdom of christ until he repents of his wickedness hence before excommunication can be inflicted upon any one there must necessarily be a knowledge of some error or sin which is accompanied with obstinacy and determined wickedness on the part of the offender so that if any one becomes a papist or an arian or a davidian or any other apostate he must not be held and recognized as a member of the church even though he may declare himself to be such and may desire to remain in the church unless he renounce and detest his error and live according to the gospel the reason is because god will have his church separate and distinct from all the various sects and adherents of the devil those now who reverse or disregard their baptismal vows are members of the devil therefore they are to be cut off from the church even though they may declare that they are christians for they deny by their works what they profess with their mouths and so give plain evidence that they lie faith and a christian life cannot exist separately those therefore who separate them mock god and his church an apostate is not one who occasionally or even often offends in doctrine and life and repents again of his sin but is such an one who being convicted of error and open wickedness is still unwilling to abandon his sins and to renounce his errors yet if any one professes repentance and makes an outward declaration to this effect giving some evidence thereof in his life the church even though he be inwardly a hypocrite is bound to receive him until his true character becomes apparent for the church is not the judge of things secret and hidden fourth what is the design of christian discipline and what abuses are to be avoided in the exercise of it christ has given to the church the power of excommunication not for the destruction of the sinner but for his edification and salvation the design of ecclesiastical discipline is therefore not to establish the sovereignty and tyranny of the ministers of christ the kings of the gentiles exercise lordship over them but ye shall not be so luke twenty two verse twenty five ministers themselves ought most of all to be subject to this discipline and are especially to be kept within the proper bounds of their calling by this bridle because the keys do not belong to ministry only but to the whole church much less is it the design of christian discipline to torment oppress or drive to desperation those whose lives are of such a character as to require the exercise of the keys of the kingdom of heaven these are the foul slanders of those who are the enemies of proper discipline in the church the true ends of christian discipline are those which the apostle paul has specified among which we may mention the following one that the obstinate and disobedient may being put to shame and terrified in this way be led to proper reflection and repentance to deliver such an one unto satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the lord jesus christ one corinthians five verse five two that other christians may not become corrupted by the conversation and example of gross offenders one scabbed or diseased sheep may infect the whole flock unless it be cured or separated from the flock and a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump your glorying is not good know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump one corinthians five verse six three that others by this means may fear to offend then that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear one timothy five verse twenty four that the church may not be disgraced and evil spoken of on account of public scandals and that the profanation of the sacraments and the wrath of god may be prevented purge out the old leaven that he may be a new lump as ye are unleavened for even christ our passover is sacrificed for us one corinthians five verse seven these are the ends or designs of discipline the abuses to be avoided in excommunication are such as these first the different forms of admonition of which we have already spoken must not be neglected neither must the order be inverted by commencing with the last there should always be private admonition in the first place in which he who offends should be kindly admonished which admonition should include a clear statement of the error or offence in the case a reproof delivered according to the word of god and an exhortation to repentance secondly it should be attended to according to the word of god with proper evidence of brotherly love and of a desire to benefit those that err and to secure their salvation god will not be the executioner of the sentence of another but of his own the offending brother must not therefore 
at once be regarded as an enemy, but must be admonished as a brother, according to what the Apostle Paul says, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 15. Thirdly, it should be based upon just, weighty, and necessary causes, and not upon such as are unjust, doubtful, and of small importance. We should never rashly proceed to inflict excommunication upon any one from a slight suspicion, but only when driven to it by urgent necessity, just as physicians never resort to the use of the knife unless necessity compels. Such a necessity may be said to exist when errors are entertained, which subvert the very foundation of our faith, and when flagrant crimes are obstinately persisted in, so as to endanger the safety of the whole church, or at least certain members of it. Fourthly, the cause must be carefully and diligently considered by all the elders, and the decision must be approved of by the whole church. It must not be undertaken by the authority of any one person, nor even by the ministers alone, for Christ did not deliver this power to a few persons, or to the ministers alone. Although the execution is committed by the church to a few persons, or to the minister alone, but to the whole church. If he shall neglect to hear thee, tell it unto the church. The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, but ye shall not be so. Matthew 18, verse 17, Luke 22, verse 25. The consent and decision of the church is therefore to be obtained, one, on account of the command of God, two, that no one may be injured. 3. That the act may have greater authority and power. 4. That the ministry of the church may not be changed into an oligarchy, or into the tyranny practiced in the papal church. 5. That the condemnation of the offender may appear more in accordance with justice. Lastly, it should be so exercised as not to create any schism in the church, or be the occasion of any scandal, whilst good men see many at variance with each other, the church rent and evils follow each other in quick succession. If the minister see or fear these evils, he must not proceed, but warn and exhort both publicly and privately, and even though he may not be able to accomplish anything, he is still free from blame. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matthew 5, verse 6. The sin and punishment will, in this case, rest upon the obstinate. Fifth, in what does the power of the keys of the kingdom of heaven differ from civil power? The points of difference are many, and such as are apparent. 1. Ecclesiastical discipline is exercised by the church, civil power by the judge or magistrate. 2. In the state, judgment is passed according to civil and positive laws, in the church according to the divine law or word of God. 3. The power of the keys committed to the church depends upon the word of God, and the church exercises her power by the word, denouncing the wrath of God upon the impenitent punishes the obstinate with the word of God alone, yet in such a way that this punishment takes hold even upon the conscience. Civil power employs the sword, and compels the refractory to submit to its authority by temporal punishment alone. For the church has different steps of admonition, and if the offender is brought to acknowledge his sin and repents of it, it does not proceed to execute punishment in his case. The magistrate punishes the offender even though he repent. 5. The church is the exercise of discipline, looks to the reformation and salvation of the offender, the magistrate to the execution of justice and the public peace. Will der Dieb nicht zu unserem Herr Gott fahren, so fahre er zum Boden. 6. As the church exercises discipline in the case of none except the obstinate and disobedient, so it is bound to reverse its decision and to remove the punishment whenever there is sufficient evidence of repentance on the part of the offender. The magistrate, when he has once inflicted punishment, neither reverses the decision nor removes the punishment. The thief that repents upon the cross or in the hour of death is received by Christ into paradise. The magistrate proceeds to the execution of the punishment to which he is sentenced and sends him into exile. So Christian discipline often takes cognizance of things which the state does not notice, as when the church casts out of her communion those who do not repent, and refuses to recognize them as her members, whilst the magistrate nevertheless tolerates them. And so, on the contrary, the state may banish those whom the church receives. The magistrate may, for instance, inflict capital punishment upon adulterers, robbers, thieves, etc., and yet the church may receive them, if they give proper evidence of true repentance. The difference, therefore, between ecclesiastical and civil power is clear and apparent. 
It now remains for us to notice in a few words some of the objections which the opposers of Christian discipline are wont to bring forward. Objection 1. The Scriptures nowhere command us to exercise the office of the keys. Therefore no one ought to be excluded from the sacraments. Answer. We deny the antecedent because the Scriptures contain many declarations bearing directly upon this subject. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, etc. Matthew 16, verse 19. Here the power of the keys committed to all ministers of the word is declared in express terms. As to the manner in which the church ought to discharge the office of the keys, Christ commands and instructs us as follows. If he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglects to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew 18, verses 17 and 18. What Christ has here delivered in the form of a command, the Apostle Paul confirms as touching the thing itself, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. When ye come together into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5, chapter 11, verse 20, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 14, 1 Timothy 1, verse 20. There are also many clear testimonies found in the writings of the prophets, from which it is evident that God has commanded the exercise of discipline in his church. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams, etc. He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man, etc. I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. Unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldst take my covenant in thy mouth? Hence Christ also said, Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Isaiah 1 verse 11, chapter 66 verse 3, Jeremiah 7 verse 22, Psalm 50 verse 16, Matthew 5 verse 24. The scriptures also contain many other declarations in addition to these, which command that all those who are openly wicked be excluded from the church and the use of the sacraments, as where the unlawful use of the sacraments is condemned, and where ministers are commanded to receive none as members of the church, except such as profess repentance and faith. To this it is objected that whilst God forbids the ungodly to come to the sacraments, he does not command that the church should exclude them. But it is sufficient to reply that what God forbids to be done in the church, that he will have prohibited by the discipline of the church, and that God has commanded the church to exclude those who are openly wicked, is plainly declared in the passages of Scripture already cited. Objection 2. Men cannot distinguish the worthy from the unworthy, neither can they know who truly repent and who persist in wickedness, because they cannot look into the heart and are not able to cast any into hell. Therefore the church is not empowered with any discipline by which the godly may be discerned and separated from the ungodly. Answer. The church does not sit in judgment upon those things which are secret and hidden, but upon those which are manifest and which are apparent in the outward life and profession. The church does this when it subscribes to the judgment of God, with reference to the wicked, that is, when it judges of them according to the requirement of God's word, as when it declares and testifies according to the word of God, that obstinate offenders are condemned as long as they remain such, and when, according to the word of God, it absolves all those who truly repent. But as to discern from others those whose true character is not known, the church is not able, neither does it arrogate this to itself. Objection 3. Christ says in the parable of the wheat and tares, let both grow together until the harvest. Matthew 13, verse 30. Therefore none ought to be excluded. Answer. 1. Christ here speaks of hypocrites, who cannot always be discerned from those who are truly pious. Therefore the meaning is that hypocrites ought not to be cut off and separated from the church, when we do not certainly know them to be such. For the angels will do this at the last day. 2. Christ here distinguishes the office of ministers from that of the magistrate, let them grow, that is, do not put to death those that are estranged from the church, 
for the minister must not use temporal power against any man, as the magistrate does. If this difference now be properly considered, the difference which exists between the church and the kingdom of the devil will still remain. Objection 4. Men are to be urged to the performance of good works. The use of the sacraments is a good work. Therefore, none should be excluded from the sacraments, but all should be observed to the observance of them. Answer. 1. The minor proposition is not true unless it be understood to refer exclusively to the use which the faithful make of the sacraments. Otherwise, their use is not a good work when observed by the unbelieving. The use of the sacraments is a good work when works of a moral character precede their observance. When this is the case, it is correctly called the use of the sacraments, otherwise it is an abuse and profanation of these sacraments. For when the wicked observe the sacraments, they abuse them. It is for this reason that Christ expressly exhorts the wicked not to present their offering, saying, Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, etc. 2. The major must be distinguished. Men are to be urged to the performance of good works, but in their proper order. They should, in the first place, be urged to the performance of such works as are of a moral character, and then to those which are ceremonial. It is in this sense that we are to understand Christ when he says, Compel them to come in, etc. Luke 14, verse 23. If the objection were to be presented thus, good works are not to be forbidden, the use of the sacraments is a good work, therefore it is not to be forbidden. If thus stated, we grant the whole argument, for we do not forbid the use, but the abuse of the sacraments. But, it is said, God commanded all to celebrate the Passover. Answer. He commanded all, meaning not the wicked, but those who were members of his church, and who were to be retained as citizens of the Jewish commonwealth. For there was an express command that those who were disobedient should be cut off from the congregation of God's people. But, it is still further objected, that there are, nevertheless, many evils accompanying the use of the sacraments. These evils, however, are committed by the impenitent, those who are unwilling to conform to a proper use of these sacraments, and not by those who exhort them to their duty. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, etc., that is, who desire the performance of that which is good. But if these good works are not performed, it is not their fault. We may not do that which is evil, or omit the good which God commands, that good may result from such a course. We must do our duty and leave the event with God. By so doing, we shall always retain a good conscience, even though those good things which we desire are not realized. Objection 5. But neither the prophets, nor apostles, nor John the Baptist excluded any from the sacraments, nay, John baptized a generation of vipers. Therefore neither ought the ministers of the church now to exclude any. Answer. We deny what is affirmed in the antecedent, for although those who were baptized of John were from a generation of vipers, yet... They were no longer vipers after they were baptized, for he baptized none but those who confessed their sins. He preached the baptism of repentance unto the remission of sins, and required of those who were baptized to bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. The prophets, although they could not exclude the wicked from the sacrifices and sacraments of the old dispensation, nevertheless severely condemned the sins and abuses of those who offered sacrifices and often delivered long discourses as well against those who were presumptuous enough to come into the presence of God without having repented of their sins, as against the church which admitted them to her sacrifices. And that the apostles did exclude the openly wicked from the use of the sacraments is evident from the example of Paul, who commanded the incestuous man, of whom we have an account in the first epistle to the Corinthians, to be delivered unto Satan, and to be cut off from the church. Objection 6. John admitted by himself alone those who professed repentance and faith, and rejected the impenitent in the same way. Therefore it is lawful for one minister alone either to admit them that profess repentance and faith, or to exclude them that are obstinate, which has been denied, or the example of the Baptist proves nothing. Answer. The examples are not similar. John was endowed with prophetical and apostolic authority, which ministers of the present day have not. Again, there was at that time particular respect had to the gathering of the church, and not so much to the exclusion of those who were in the church, and had nevertheless forfeited all right to its privileges by their sins and obstinate perseverance in evil. End of section 53《54of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Asinus, translated by G. W. Williard.
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Keys of the Kingdom of Heaven, Part 2 A brief refutation of the sophisms by which certain persons attempted to overthrow ecclesiastical discipline in a public discussion held in Heidelberg, Dr. Perra Boquin presiding, and George Withers, an Englishman, replying, on the 10th of June, Anno Domini 1568, taken word for word as delivered by Dr. Z. Osinus, at the repetition of this discussion, which took place the next day privately in Collegium Sapiendiae, in which the two following theses were proposed with reference to church discipline. First, in connection with the sincere preaching of the word and the lawful administration of the sacraments, the office of government or discipline in the church must be maintained. Second, this office I thus state, that the ministers in connection with the elders should both have and exercise the power of convicting, reproving, excommunicating, and of executing anything else that pertains to ecclesiastical discipline upon any that offend, not even excepting princes themselves. Objection 1. Where the word and sacraments are rightly administered, there the office of discipline must be maintained. But in the primitive church, and in many well-ordered churches at the present, the authority of discipline is not maintained. Therefore the word and sacraments are not rightly administered in these churches, which is absurd. In replying to the major proposition, we make the following distinction. The phrase to administer rightly may be understood differently. It may signify or be understood as referring to that administration which agrees perfectly with the prescript of our Lord. Then it may again be understood of that administration which is not in perfect accordance with the rule which our Lord has laid down, but which is nevertheless administered in such a way as is pleasing to God and profitable to the Church. The sacraments are nowhere rightly administered according to the former signification, but according to the latter signification they may be and are. For, although there may be some irregularities or faults which cannot at once be corrected on account of human infirmity, yet the administration may, nevertheless, be pleasing to God, and profitable to the church. For blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Unless these things be granted, there will not be a single pure church in the world. This may be regarded as a sufficient refutation of the major proposition, we, in like manner, deny the minor proposition, for the authority of Christian discipline was maintained in the primitive church, and will remain in the church, even where it is imperfectly constituted, although with great abuse, as with the papists. To this it is objected, that in our, as well as in the Helvetic churches, which are properly constituted churches, excommunication is not attended to, so that what is affirmed in the minor proposition of the above syllogism remains true. But we would reply that, although we may grant that in some churches discipline is not put in force or badly exercised, yet still that which is affirmed by our opponents cannot be maintained, because the word and sacraments are rightly administered in these churches, according to the other signification of which we have spoken. Here, Osinus quoted a saying of Chrysostom, quote, If any wicked person come to the table of the Lord, do not give unto him the body and blood of the Lord. If he will not believe, declare it unto me. I would rather lose my life than admit him. End quote. Hence Christian discipline was maintained in the early church several centuries after Christ. Objection 2. That doctrine which is neither established by the word of God nor proven by examples must not be forced upon the church. This doctrine respecting excommunication is neither established by the word of God nor proven by examples. Therefore it must not be forced upon the church. Answer, we deny the minor proposition, for the word of God expressly declares, in Matthew 18, verse 17, Tell it unto the church, and if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. The same thing is also confirmed by examples, for proof of which, see 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5, Deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, also 1 Timothy 1, verse 20, whom I have delivered unto Satan. Objections against the word or those portions of scripture brought forward in support of the position here assumed. Objection 1. No mention is made in the 18th chapter of Matthew of the eldership, nor of excommunication. Therefore this passage proves nothing. Answer. We deny the antecedent, because, although the very same words are not used, yet the thing itself is taught in the passage referred to. The eldership is introduced where it is said, Tell it unto the church and excommunication, where it is said, Let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Objection 2. The eldership is not the church. 
Christ now commands that information be communicated to the church and that admonition be given by the church, therefore no mention is made of elders in the case. Answer, we deny the major proposition, although the whole argument may be conceded, viz. that Christ did not mean the eldership, but uses the term church in its proper sense, whether we refer it to the Jewish or Christian church. But yet there must be some order for the government of the church, there must be certain persons appointed and ordained by the church who may have the management of its affairs, or else there will be confusion. Objection 3. It is true indeed that information cannot be communicated to the whole church, but to a certain class of persons whose office is not ecclesiastical but civil, so that the senses tell it unto the church, by which is meant the senate of the city. Answer. It is here confessed that information cannot be communicated to the whole church, but to a certain class of rulers, which notwithstanding is not ecclesiastical but civil. The question now is whether this is to be understood of a civil council. This our opponents must prove, which they endeavour to do in this way. That council which punishes with temporal punishments is civil. The council which gave Paul power to put Christians to death inflicted temporal punishments, therefore it was a civil council. Answer, we reply to the major that that council which inflicts temporal punishments according to right is civil. But the high priests who gave this power to Paul did it wrongfully, because they had not the right which they usurped and arrogated to themselves. The same thing may also be said in reference to the death of Stephen, for he was slain by a tumult, whilst the priests themselves were consenting to it, but wrongfully. Objection 4. Augustine says, The Jews lied when they said, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. John 18, verse 31. Answer. These are the words of Augustine. Quote, we must not, however, understand them as saying that they might not put any to death on account of the sacredness of the day, which they now began to celebrate. Are ye so hard-hearted, ye treacherous Israelites? Have ye lost all sense by your inveterate malice, as to believe that ye are clear from the blood of the innocent, because ye delivered him into the hands of another for the purpose of being slain? End quote. Augustine, therefore, did not say that they lied, but only that they did that which they said it was not lawful for them to do. Objection 5. Chrysostom understands the words just referred to to mean, it is not lawful for us, viz. on account of the nearness of the feast. Answer. This is not true, even though it may be thus understood by Chrysostom, because history testifies that their civil jurisdiction and laws were taken from them by Herod the Great, and Josephus says that the council, excepting one Samias, was put to death by him and Hyrcanus. The Jews, therefore, designed to say this to Pilate, Thou hast the right or power of the sword, it is not lawful for us to put any man to death, which Pilate also bore testimony to when he said, Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? John 19 verse 10. Objection 6. But Pilate himself said, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. John 18 verse 31. Answer, but he meant the law of Moses, as if he would say, If he is a blasphemer, stone him to death, I give my consent thereto. Objection 7. But Josephus testifies that Claudius gave the Jews their laws. Answer, then, they had them not before, and still more Claudius is said to have granted them their ecclesiastical laws, by which nothing more is meant than that he gave them permission to observe their own laws and rights as it respects religion. Quote, I desire, says he, that their laws, which were violated by the folly of Caius, be no longer infringed upon, and that they be permitted to enjoy the rights of their fathers. End quote. Objection 8. The right of the sword was taken from them by Herod the Great, therefore they possessed this right before, and still further, at the time when Christ gave command to tell it unto the church, there was only the civil council, from which we may infer that he gave command to tell it unto this council. There were only three councils among the Jews. There was one, the great council, which was the senate of the entire nation. Two, the smaller council, which was the senate of the city of Jerusalem. Three, the triumvirate. These were all civil, hence the council of which Christ speaks must have been a civil council. In reply to this objection, we may turn the argument of our opponents and say that if the Jews lost their political power under Herod the Great, then they did not possess it in the time of Christ, for it is evident that Herod the Great died before Christ began to teach. And as to the argument that the council of which Christ speaks was civil, we reply that it was not only civil, for it also had ecclesiastical power and took cognizance of matters pertaining to religion. 
It consisted of Pharisees and scribes, of divines and lawyers, for they had moral and judicial laws. Hence the smaller council of which Christ speaks was not merely political but also ecclesiastical. The question now is, did Christ command to tell it to the council as to its civil or ecclesiastical character? We hold that it was in its ecclesiastical character, and prove it from the text itself, because we are commanded in the first place to regard the excommunicated person as an heathen man and publican, that is, as an alien from the kingdom of God. But to declare a man a publican and an alien from the kingdom of God does not belong to the civil magistrate but to the church, because a publican may be a member of the state but not of the church of Christ. And besides, Christ adds, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, etc. In these words Christ replies to him who may object as follows, What does it affect me, even though the church may regard me as an infidel or publican? I will nevertheless eat and drink. To such an one, Christ replies, The judgment of the church shall not be in vain, for I myself will execute it. He had said in the sixteenth chapter of Matthew, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, where he speaks of the common authority of the magistrate. But in the passage now under consideration, he speaks particularly of the authority of the church in this case. To bind and loose, therefore, does not belong to the civil magistrate, but to the church. Thus far we have spoken of the first member, or part of the proposition assumed, that the eldership is included in the term church. We must now proceed to speak of the other part, which is to show that the idea of excommunication is likewise contained in the declaration of Christ, Let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Objection 1. But to be regarded as an heathen and a publican is not the same thing as to be excommunicated, therefore excommunication is not included in the language which Christ employs. Answer, we deny the antecedent. But, say our opponents, in proof of the antecedent which we deny, let him be unto thee as an heathen does not refer to the public judgment of the church, but to the private judgment of each man. Therefore, he who is regarded as a heathen by persons privately is not at once excommunicated by the whole church. But it is sufficient to reply that he who is regarded as a heathen by persons privately is looked upon in the same light by the church. Hence Christ speaks of the public judgment of the church. Objection 2. But the passage under consideration does not say whom the church regards as an heathen, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Therefore every one regards him as an heathen man according to his own judgment, and not according to the judgment of the church. Answer, true, I regard him in this light because he neglects to hear the church, but not to hear the church and be a publican or an alien from the church, do not mean one and the same thing. We also add the following remark, less objectionable. Christ does not speak this of every man privately, but of the whole church, for to thee and to the church are equivalent, because when Christ commands that I shall regard any one as an heathen, he does not by any means desire that the church shall in the meantime look upon him as a Christian, for then he would desire contradictory things. He would will contrary judgments to be given at the same time by the same individual. Therefore, to be regarded as a publican by one is to be regarded as such by all, and so by the whole church, and if that denunciation were not made in particular, no one would be accounted as a publican. Hence to be accounted by the church as a publican is to be excommunicated, and to be without the communion of the church. So that what we have affirmed remains true, that mention is made in the scriptures of excommunication, and that it is committed to the church. Objection 3. The wicked may be regarded as publicans and heathens without the infliction of excommunication, Therefore, a publican and an excommunicated person are not the same. Answer, we deny the antecedent because to regard anyone as being without the communion of the church and as being excommunicated are the same. Objection 4. But we may regard anyone a publican, that is, we may think in our minds that he is such. Answer, Christ does not, however, speak of the thoughts but of the actions of the church. If he neglect to hear the church, it is necessary for thee to know that, and that thou mayest regard him as an heathen man and a publican, it is necessary for thee to know not what the church thinks of him privately, but what it resolves concerning him publicly. Paul, moreover, forbids us to eat or drink with the wicked. With such an one, no, not to eat. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 11. No one can now avoid connection with the wicked as it respects secret meditation. 
Hence, it must be according to the public decision of the church, from which it is easy to see that the apostle does not allude to the thoughts which we may secretly entertain. The apostle also in the same chapter commands the Corinthians to put away from among themselves that wicked person, by which he means declare him no longer a member of the church. Hence, to look upon any one as a publican is not only to think him such in the mind, but it is also to declare him to be such and to excommunicate him. Objections against the examples of excommunication as referred to by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 5, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 6, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 14, 1 Timothy 1 verse 20. Those who at this day oppose the exercise of discipline on the part of the church endeavor to evade the force of the examples recorded by the Apostle Paul in two ways. Some positively deny that the Apostle speaks of excommunication when he says, He that has acted thus, let him be delivered unto Satan. For, say they, to deliver unto Satan is not to excommunicate, but to remove from their midst by a miraculous punishment inflicted by the ministry of Satan. Or it is to utter direful imprecations, and to deliver to Satan to be punished, yet in such a manner that he remains a member of the church. Others again admit that Paul speaks of excommunication, but deny that his example has any force as far as we are concerned, inasmuch as we now have Christian magistrates, persons whose duty it is to maintain order, whilst the church was destitute of such guardians in the time of the apostles. But as it respects the former class of persons who deny that the apostle speaks of excommunication, they are evidently condemned by what he says, put away from among yourselves that wicked man, with such an one, no, not to eat. These declarations now cannot be understood of any miraculous punishment by death, such as that which was inflicted upon Ananias and Sapphira, but they speak of the ordinary duty and judgment of the church, as is evident one, because he recommends them to put him away from their midst, and reprove them because they had not already cut him off, saying, Ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 2 2. Because he requires the consent of the church, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 4 But there was no need of such a solemnity or gathering for the working of a miracle. 3. Because he desired that the incestuous man be delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 5 That is, he desired him to be dealt with in such a manner that notwithstanding his life might be prolonged, and he repent, his flesh might be subdued by sincere contrition, the old man mortified and the new man quickened. Hence he did not desire that he should be put to death. 4. The apostle speaks of separation and exclusion from the church when he says, Purge out the old leaven, keep no company with fornicators, with such an one, no, not to eat. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 11. All these expressions allude to separation and not to punishment by death. 5. A comparison of different passages of Scripture will show that all those who deny the doctrine of Christ, whether in word or deed, ought not to be regarded as Christians. Ambrose says that this incestuous man referred to in the fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians, when his offence was known, was to be separated from the assembly of the brotherhood or church. All those now who are excluded from the church are deservedly said to be delivered unto Satan, inasmuch as they are in his kingdom and led by him, as long as they do not repent. As it respects those who admit that the apostle speaks of excommunications in the places above referred to, they evidently reason falsely when they assign as a reason why he would have the incestuous man excommunicated, that there was then no Christian magistrate, for Paul adduces very different reasons, even such as are of force until this present time, among which we may mention the following. 1. The command of Christ. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit, that is, by the authority and command of Christ, tell it unto the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. 2. That the excommunicated person might repent and be saved. Deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. 3. That other members of the church might not become infected thereby. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? For Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, that we may live with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, and that we may now be made a new lump, let us cast out the old leaven of malice and wickedness, or, if we cannot altogether purge it out, let us not at least professedly tolerate it. 
These are the reasons on account of which Paul commands the incestuous man to be cast out of the church, and the scriptures nowhere teach that the early church did ever excommunicate any wicked persons because there were no magistrates. The duties of the church and of the magistrate always have been and still remain distinct. It is plain, therefore, that the apostle speaks of excommunication when he says, Deliver him unto Satan, put away that wicked person from among you, and gives command in respect to the ordinary power of the church against the disobedient and obstinate, whether it be accompanied with any miracle or not. Objection 1. Nathan did not excommunicate David, who was guilty of the sin of adultery. Therefore Paul did not excommunicate the incestuous man. Answer. David repented upon the first admonition, hence excommunication was not inflicted in this case. Paul also speaks with reference to the condition of repentance, saying, put him away, that is, if he does not repent, or has not already repented of his sin, upon the presence of which condition he commands him to be received again into the bosom of the church. This condition must be understood because Christ commanded that certain steps or degrees of admonition should first proceed, and God at all times receives those who are penitent. The thief upon the cross was not disregarded, but received by Christ as soon as he gave evidence of true repentance. If thy brother shall sin against thee, until seventy times seven thou shalt forgive him. Matthew 18, verses 21 and 22. Therefore not sinners, but such as are obstinate and continue impenitent, are to be excommunicated, in which number David cannot be included. Objection 2. Christ did not excommunicate anyone. Therefore Paul did not do it, neither ought the church now to excommunicate anyone. Answer. The consequence which is here drawn is not proper, because it proceeds from the denial of the fact to the denial of the right or lawfulness of the thing itself. It is the same as if any one were to argue, Christ did not baptize, therefore Paul did not baptize, neither ought the church to baptize. Christ baptized none, but he gave command to his disciples to baptize all nations. So likewise he excommunicated none, but commanded the church to excommunicate obstinate offenders. Let him be unto thee as a heathen man. Leave thy gift before the altar, etc. Philip said to the eunuch, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest be baptized. Therefore Philip would not have baptized him, had he not believed. Objection 3. Paul says, Ye have not mourned that he which hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 2. Therefore they should have prayed that God would, through Satan, remove the incestuous man in some miraculous way. Answer. The words which are translated, Ye have not mourned, mean, according to the original, Ye have not been earnest in removing that scandal which ought not to be found in your midst. From among you, I say, because in the thirteenth verse the apostle says, Put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Hence the words, That he ought to be taken from among you, signify that he was to be removed by the church and not by Satan. To this it is objected that Paul uses the same word in reference to himself, in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 21, where he says, I shall bewail many which have sinned already, and have not repented, etc. In this passage, the word bewail does not mean an anxiety to remove a scandal from the church. Therefore, neither does it in the above reference. But it is sufficient to reply that the Apostle says, 13th chapter and 2nd verse, If I come again, I will not spare, where he expresses the cause of his grief, that he might feel himself constrained to punish more severely the obstinate and impenitent, even to expel them from the church. Objection 4. Paul explains what he means, in that he declares that he did not command the Corinthian church to excommunicate the incestuous man when he says, Sufficient to such a man is the punishment which was inflicted of many. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 6. Therefore the declarations, Let him be unto you as a heathen man and a publican, and put him away from among you, mean nothing more than to rebuke. Answer. The consequence which is here drawn is false, because it seeks to establish a rule by one single instance. A reproof was all that was needed in the present case because he repented. But it does not follow from this that nothing more is required in other instances of a different character. To this it is objected, that which the Corinthians did, the apostle commanded. But they did nothing more than rebuke. Therefore the apostle meant nothing more than a rebuke when he commanded them to put him away from among them and to deliver him unto Satan. We reply to the major proposition that the apostle did indeed command them to reprove him, but not only to reprove, for he commanded them also to cast him out of their midst, if he would not repent of his sin. If he would, however, repent, a reproof would be sufficient in his case. It does not then follow 
they merely reproved him, therefore the apostle commanded them to reprove him. This may be regarded as a sufficient reply, yet we may add still further that the Greek word which is here used does not merely mean to disapprove of a thing or to reprove, but also to excommunicate, because excommunication is by word only. And that it may not only, but must be so understood, is evident, one, because, he says, so that, contrarywise, he ought to forgive him, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 7. Therefore he was now excommunicated, and not yet received, but to be received. Not only was he reproved, but he was also cast out. 2. It was inflicted of many. This is a confirmation of the explanation which we have given of the words of Christ, viz., that by the church we are to understand not the confused multitude but the elders of the church, for the reproof was given by the elders and chief men of the church. 3. The apostle also says, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 9, To this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you. He praises them, therefore, because they were obedient. 4. The apostle likewise says in verse 8, I beseech you that you would confirm your love towards him. The Greek word here translated to confirm means to declare pardon publicly. Therefore pardon had not been as yet granted unto him. It is used in this sense in Galatians 3 verse 15, where it is said, Though it be a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, that is ratified by public authority. The apostle's meaning then is that they should declare their love towards that man by public testimony. Hence to forgive, as the apostle here uses it, is to receive the excommunicated person into favour. This he often repeats. There was also some considerable time between the writing of the first and second epistles to the Corinthians. Therefore he stood excommunicated during that time. In the first epistle he says that he hears there were certain wicked persons amongst their number. These he commands to be excommunicated. It is probable that the Corinthians obeyed this command, excommunicated them, and wrote to the apostles that they had obeyed him, for in the second chapter of his second epistle he commends them for their obedience and commands them to receive again the incestuous person if he would repent. Objection 5. Excommunication does not require any excuse, but Paul excuses himself that he had commanded him to be delivered unto Satan, Therefore he did not command that he should be excommunicated, but that a more grievous punishment should be inflicted. Answer. We deny the major proposition because the exclusion from the church and kingdom of Christ, being the heaviest punishment, requires an excuse more than any punishment which may be inflicted upon the body. Objection 6. Ministers cannot exclude any one from the kingdom of God. Therefore Paul did not command the Corinthians to do this. We reply to the antecedent that ministers cannot, by their own authority, exclude any from the kingdom of God, but they can, in the name of Christ, according to the command of the apostle, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 4, when ye are gathered together and my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, they cannot cast any out of the kingdom of God, but they can and ought to declare the rejection of those whom God declares in his word that he has rejected. For to excommunicate is nothing else than to subscribe to the divine judgment by denouncing upon incorrigible offenders the judgment which God inflicts. This the church may not only do, but even ought to do. It is for this reason that the apostle reproves the Corinthians, because they did not excommunicate the incestuous man, but waited until they were admonished. Hence he reprimands them, because they had departed from the ordinary course which they ought to have pursued. They did not exercise the known and ordinary power of the church, and declare him, according to the command of Christ, a heathen man and publican. Objection 7. The apostle commands that the incestuous man should be delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 5. But the word which is here translated destruction signifies, as it is used in the scriptures, a violent death. Therefore it means in this place some miraculous death inflicted upon the body by Satan, that the soul might be saved. Answer. A careful examination of the circumstances connected with this case will show that we are to understand by the word destruction, as it is here used, the mortification of the old man, for the opposition of the flesh to the spirit, and indeed, this phrase itself is frequently used by Paul in this sense. The scope or design of the passage teaches the same thing, for the apostle desired that the man might be delivered unto Satan, that the flesh might be mortified and the spirit saved, or that he might be converted and saved in the life to come. Hence he did not desire him to be removed from this life by some miraculous agency of Satan. To this it is objected that no one can be delivered unto Satan for the conversion or mortification of the old man, to which we may reply that it is true that 
to be delivered unto Satan does not of itself produce such a result, but it accomplishes this by accident, by which we mean that it brings it to pass by the mercy of God that the faithful are reclaimed by these chastisements. We may also rebut the argument of our opponents by the same reason with which they hope to refute us by saying that Satan puts no one to death that he might save his soul. Objection 8. But if the apostle had willed the incestuous man to be excommunicated, he would have declared his desire more expressly. Answer, we must, however, not only have respect to the clearness, but also to the force and power of the language which is used in reference to any particular subject. Here there was no need of greater clearness inasmuch as the Corinthians understood what he desired, or else he would have reproved them unjustly. Objection 9. A brother is not to be excommunicated. Paul desired him whom he gave command by letter to be noted, to be counted as a brother. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 15. Therefore he did not desire that he should be excommunicated. The major proposition is proven thus. Things that are contrary cannot be regarded as synonymous. To excommunicate anyone, and to regard him as a brother, are contrary things, for to excommunicate is not to count as a brother. Therefore to count the same person as a brother and not as a brother is absurd. Answer. The phrase to count as a brother admits of different interpretations on account of the various degrees of brotherhood, so that the contrariety here spoken of has no force. All men are our brethren and neighbours, both Christians and Turks. Yet Christians, although they regard the Turks as brethren and desire their salvation, do nevertheless not count them as Christian brethren. If the Turks are therefore to be regarded as brethren, much more ought we to regard those who were formerly Christians as our brethren and desire their salvation. There is also here a fallacy in understanding that to be true in general, which is so only in part. Count him as a brother, viz. in love, desire, and hope of saving him, and not so as to enumerate him among the sons of God and members of the church until he repent. And still more, the apostle does not say, count him as a brother, but admonish him as a brother, that is, as one who was a brother, and who, if he repent, must again be viewed as a brother. For those who are excommunicated are not so entirely cut off from all hope of salvation, but that they may return to repentance and again be included in the fold of Christ. Paul uses this phrase because he desired that love and a hope of amendment might be the rule of all the reproofs given, for one brother admonishes another with the feelings of a friend, and with a view to promote his well-being. Objection 10. We are not to follow the example of the Apostle Paul in what he did. Paul excommunicated Hymenaeus and Alexander without the consent of the church, therefore no one must be excommunicated. Answer. The major proposition is false if understood generally. But, say our opponents, it is proven from the fact that what the Apostle did, he did by apostolic authority, which we are not required to follow. And the minor, say they, is proven from what the Apostle says, whom I have delivered unto Satan, 1 Timothy 1 verse 10. But our ministers and pastors cannot do this, therefore it must needs be that the apostle did this by some special authority. Answer, we grant the whole argument that we ought not to imitate the apostle if he did it alone. But admitting this argument, it nevertheless does not follow, therefore it is not lawful to excommunicate any one. for, if this were true, there would be more in the conclusion than in the premises. What was lawful for the apostle to do by apostolic authority, that is also lawful for the ministers of the church to do by ordinary power and authority. We may also deny the minor proposition, because this passage declares nothing more than what the apostle did. It says nothing as to the manner in which he did it, whether alone or in connection with others. End of section 54。Section 55 of Thankfulness. 32nd Lord's Day, the third general division of the Catechism of Thankfulness. Having now considered the misery of man and his deliverance through Christ, the doctrine of gratitude or thankfulness is necessary, one, on account of the glory of God, inasmuch as the chief end of our redemption is thankfulness, which comprehends acknowledgment and praise for the benefits of Christ. Two, on account of our consolation, which consists in our deliverance by the free grace of God, None now obtain this deliverance but those who desire to show their gratitude to God. 3. That we may render unto God such worship as is lawful and acceptable. 
God disapproves of all worship which grounds itself in self-will. We must therefore show from the word of God what is the nature of true thankfulness which is the worship due to God. For, that we may know that our good works are expressions of thankfulness and have no merit in the sight of God. Thankfulness in general is a virtue acknowledging and professing the person from whom we have received benefits, as well as the greatness of the benefits themselves, with a desire to perform towards our benefactor such reciprocal duties as are becoming and possible. It includes truth and justice, truth because it acknowledges and makes mention of the benefits received, and justice because it desires to return thanks equal to that which has been received. True Christian thankfulness, therefore, which is here taught, is an acknowledgment and profession of our gracious deliverance through Christ, from sin and death, and a sincere desire to avoid sin and everything that might offend God, and to conform the life according to His will, to desire, expect, and receive all good things from God alone by a true faith, and to render thanks for the benefits received. This thankfulness likewise consists of two parts, truth and justice. Truth acknowledges and professes the benefit of our free redemption, and renders thanks unto God for it. Justice offers unto God such a return as He requires from us, which is nothing else than a true worship of Him, consisting in obedience and good works. The doctrine of prayer belongs to truth, whilst that of good works to justice. That in which both these things root and ground themselves is the conversation of man to God, for the works of none but those who are regenerated are good and pleasing to God. Hence we must, under this division of the catechism, treat of man's conversion to God and of the law of God. There are therefore four principal commonplaces which belong to this general division of thankfulness, man's conversion, good works, the law of God, and prayer. The order and connection of these several parts may be thus explained. We have learnt, from what has been said upon the two former general divisions of the Catechism, that we are redeemed from sin and death, that is, from all the evils of guilt and punishment by no merit of ours, but only by the mere grace of God for the sake of Christ's merits. From this it follows that we ought to be thankful to God for this great benefit. We cannot, however, show and approve ourselves thankful to God, except we are truly converted, for whatever is done by those who are unconverted is done without faith, and is therefore sin and abomination in the sight of God. Hence those things which are to be spoken concerning man's conversion to God are first in order. Then follows the subject of good works, since true conversion cannot be without them, and we in this way especially show our gratitude to God. Afterwards there is subjoined the doctrine respecting the law of God, from which we learn what constitutes good works. Those now are in reality good works in which God is worshipped aright, and by which we declare our gratitude to Him, which are done by faith according to the command of God's law, and with the design that we may honour and glorify God thereby. And seeing that God desires to be chiefly honoured and praised by us, by invocation and prayer, it follows lastly that prayer is likewise necessary, in order that we may properly express our thankfulness to God. Question 86 since then we are delivered from our misery merely of grace, through Christ, without any merit of ours. Why must we still do good works? Answer, because that Christ, having redeemed and delivered us by his blood, also renews us by his Holy Spirit after his own image, that so we may testify by the whole of our conduct, our gratitude to God for his blessings, and that he may be praised by us. Also, that every one may be assured in himself of his faith by the fruits thereof, and that by our godly conversation others may be gained to Christ. Exposition. This question with respect to the moving cause of good works is placed first, even before the question relating to man's conversion, not because good works precede conversion, but because the things which follow are in this way more strikingly connected with what precedes. Human reason argues in this way from the doctrine of free satisfaction, he is not bound to make satisfaction for whom another has already satisfied. Christ has satisfied for us, therefore there is no need that we should perform good works. We reply that there is more in the conclusion than in the premises. All that legitimately follows is, therefore we ourselves are not bound to make satisfaction, which we grant, one, in respect to the justice of God, which does not demand a double payment, two, in respect to our salvation, which in other respects would be no salvation, Yet we are, nevertheless, bound to render obedience and perform good works for the reasons which are referred to and explained in the above question of the Catechism. 1. Because good works are the fruits of our regeneration by the Holy Spirit, which are always connected with our free justification. Whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. 
such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified, etc. Romans 8 verse 30, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11. Those, therefore, who do not perform good works show that they are neither regenerated by the Spirit of God, nor redeemed by the blood of Christ. 2. That we may express our gratitude to God for the benefit of redemption. Yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, etc. Romans 6, verse 13, chapter 12, verse 1. 3. That God may be glorified by us. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven, that they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Matthew 5, verse 16, 1 Peter 2, verse 12. 4. Because they are the fruits of faith, that by which our own faith as well as the faith of others is judged of, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, after which certain copies add the words, by good works. Every tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Faith worketh by love, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. 2 Peter 1 verse 10, Matthew 7 verse 17, Galatians 5 verses 6 and 22. 5. That we may bring others to Christ, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren, Ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of their wives. Let us follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. Luke 22, verse 32, 1 Peter 3, verse 1, Romans 14, verse 19. These causes now must be explained and urged with great diligence in our sermons and exhortations to the people, and here we may cite as being in point the whole of the sixth chapter and the first part of the eighth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans down to the sixteenth verse. For a further explanation of the first cause, we may remark that the benefit of justification is not given without regeneration. One, because Christ has merited both, viz. the remission of sins and the habitation of God within us by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now is never inactive, but is always efficacious, and so brings it to pass that those in whom he dwells are made conformable to God. Two, because the heart is purified by faith, for in all those to whom the merits of Christ are applied by faith, there is kindled the love of God and a desire to do those things which are pleasing in his sight. Three, because God bestows the benefit of justification upon none but such as render true gratitude, but no one ever renders true gratitude except those who receive the benefit of regeneration. Therefore, neither of these can be separated from the other. We must also observe the difference which exists between the first and second causes. The first shows what Christ effects in us by virtue of his death, whilst the second teaches to what we are bound in view of the benefits received. Question 87. Cannot they then be saved who, continuing in their wicked and ungrateful lives, are not converted to God? Answer, by no means, for the Holy Spirit declares that no unchaste person, idolater, adulterer, thief, covetous man, drunkard, slanderer, robber, or any such like, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Exposition. This question naturally grows out of the preceding one, for since good works are the fruits of our regeneration, since they are the expression of our thankfulness to God and the evidences of true faith, and since none are saved but those in whom these things are found, it follows, on the other hand, that evil works are the fruits of the flesh, that they are manifestations of ingratitude and evidences of unbelief, so that no one that continues to produce them can be saved. Hence all those who are not converted to God from their evil works, but continue in their sins, are condemned forever, according to the following declarations of the word of God. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, etc., shall inherit the kingdom of God of the which I have told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, Galatians 5, verse 21, Ephesians 5, verses 5 and 6, 1 John 3, verse 14. We may also observe that another reason for good works may be deduced from the consequence which results from evil works, 
viz. that all those who perform evil works and continue in their wicked and ungrateful lives cannot be saved inasmuch as they are destitute of true faith and conversion. End of section 55. Section 56 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Man's Conversion to God. 33rd Lord's Day. Question 88. In how many parts doth the true conversion of man consist? Answer in two parts, in the mortification of the old and in the quickening of the new man. Question 89. What is the mortification of the old man? Answer. It is a sincere sorrow of heart that we have provoked God by our sins, and more and more to hate and flee from them. Question 90. What is the quickening of the new man? Answer. It is a sincere joy of heart in God through Christ, and with love and delight to live according to the will of God in all good works. Exposition. The doctrine touching man's conversion to God now claims our attention, concerning which we must inquire, first, is conversion necessary? Second, what is it? Third, of how many parts does it consist? Fourth, what are the causes of it? Fifth, what are the effects of it? Sixth, is it perfect in this life? Seventh, in what does the conversion of the godly differ from the repentance of the wicked? First, is the conversion of man to God necessary? Man's conversion in this life is so necessary that without it no one can obtain everlasting life in the world to come, according to what the Scriptures teach. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If so be that, being clothed, we shall not be found naked, John 3 verse 5, Luke 13 verse 3, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 3. The example of the foolish virgins, Matthew 25 verses 1 to 10, who were excluded from the marriage because they had not their lamps burning and filled with oil, is here in point. We may also here cite the following declarations of Christ, Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. Be ye ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Luke 12, verses 35, 40, and 46. We may here also quote the notable saying of Cyprian against Demetrius, quote, When we have once departed this life, there is no more room for repentance or work of satisfaction. Here life is either lost or gained. Here we secure our eternal salvation by the worship of God and the fruit of faith. Nor let anyone be hindered, either by sin or external opposition, from coming to obtain salvation. No repentance is too late for anyone still remaining in the world, etc. From this it appears how necessary conversion is for those who are to be saved. Hence all our exhortations to repentance must be based upon the absolute necessity of conversion to God in all those who are to be justified. Second, what is man's conversion to God? The Hebrew expresses the idea of conversion by the word teschoba, the Greek by metanua and metamelia. There are some who affirm that these Greek words differ from each other in this, that the former is used only in reference to the repentance of the godly, whilst the latter is used also in reference to the repentance of the ungodly. Of Judas it is said that he repented himself, Matthew 27 verse 3, where the word metamelethis is used. Of Esau, it is said, he found no place of repentance, meta nuas. Hebrews 12, verse 17. Of God, it is said, Romans 11, verse 29, the gifts of God are without repentance, where the word a meta maleta is used, that is, they are of such a kind that he himself cannot repent of them. The Septuagint, in speaking of God, uses both words without making any distinction. It repents me, meta meloma, that I have set up Saul to be king, 1 Samuel 15, verse 11. The strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, or meta noesi. The difference, therefore, is either very small or none at all, unless that the former Greek word above mentioned properly signifies a change of the mind, whilst the latter expresses a change of the will or purpose. In conversion, however, there is a change both of the understanding and the will. The Latins have a number of words by which they express the same thing, they call it regeneratio, renovatio, 
recipicientia, confercio, poenitencia, recipicientia seems probably to correspond with the Greek metanoia, for as recipicientia is derived from recipisco, which means to become wise after having done a thing, so metanoia is from metanoeo, which means to become wise after having committed something wrong, to change the mind and to alter the purpose. Poenitentia is said to be derived either from poenitet or from poena, because the sorrow which is in repentance is, as it were, a punishment, or else, as Erasmus supposes, it is from poene tentendo, as if to repent were to lay hold of a later purpose, or to understand a thing after it is done. But whatever may be the derivation of the word poenitentia or repentance, it is more obscure than the term conversion. For repentance does not comprehend the whole extent of the subject, it does not express from what and to what we are changed, but merely signifies the sorrow which is felt after the commission of some sin. Conversion, on the other hand, embraces the whole, as it adds that which is the beginning of a new life by faith. The term repentance is, moreover, of a broader signification than conversion, for conversion is spoken of only in reference to the godly, who alone are converted to God. The same thing may be said of metanua and recipiciendia, that they refer merely to the godly, for by these three terms the new life of the godly is signified. But poenitentia is spoken of the ungodly also as of Judas, who did indeed repent of his wicked deed, but was not converted, because the ungodly, when they sorrow, are not converted or reformed. Thus far we have spoken of the terms which have reference to this subject, we must now proceed to inquire into the thing itself. A definition with respect to the parts of conversion may be obtained from the 88th question of the Catechism, where it is defined to be the mortification of the old and the quickening of the new man. It is more fully expressed in the following definition. Man's conversion to God consists in a change of the corrupt mind and will into that which is good, produced by the Holy Ghost, through the preaching of the law and the gospel, which is followed by a sincere desire to produce the fruits of repentance and a conformity of the life to all the commands of God. This definition is confirmed by the following passages of Scripture. If thou wilt return, return unto me. Wash you, make you clean. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Depart from evil and do good. Jeremiah 4 verse 1, Isaiah 1 verse 16, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11, Psalm 34, verse 14. The whole definition is expressed in Acts 26, verses 18 and 20. I will send thee to open their eyes, and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. But showed that they should repent and turn to God, and do works meet for repentance. Third, of how many parts does conversion consist? Conversion consists of two parts, the mortification of the old man and the quickening of the new man. We speak more properly in this way, using the language of Paul, than if we were, as some do, to make conversion consist in contrition and faith. By contrition they understand mortification, and by faith the joy which follows the desire of righteousness and new obedience, which are indeed effects of faith, but not faith itself. Contrition also precedes conversion, but is not conversion itself, nor any part of it, being only a preparation, or that which leads to conversion, and that only in the elect. The old man which is mortified is the sinner only, or the corrupt nature of man. The new man which is quickened is he who begins to depart from sin, or it is the nature of man as regenerated. The mortification of the old man, or of the flesh, consists in the laying off and subduing of the corruption of our nature, and includes 1. A knowledge of sin and of the wrath of God, 2. Sorrow for sin and on account of having offended God, 3. Hatred of sin and an earnest desire to avoid it. The scriptures speak of this mortification of sin in the following places, If ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us, he hath smitten and he will bind us up. Romans 8 verse 13, Joel 2 verse 13, Hosea 6 verse 1. From this it appears that mortification or conversion is very improperly attributed to the wicked, 
in whom there is no hatred or shunning of sin, nor sorrow for sin, all of which is embraced in the mortification of the old man. A knowledge of sin precedes sorrow, because the affections of the heart follow knowledge. Sorrow may follow a knowledge of sin on the part of the ungodly, from a sense of present and from a fear of future evil, viz. of temporal and eternal punishment, yet this sorrow is not properly a part of conversion, nor a preparation to it, but rather a flight and turning away from God, and a rushing into desperation, as in the case of Cain, Saul, Judas, etc. It is called a sorrow not unto salvation, the sorrow of the world working death, a sorrow not after a godly sort, etc. In the godly, however, this sorrow arises from a sense of the displeasure of God, which they sincerely acknowledge and lament, and is connected with a hatred and abhorrence of all past sins, and with a shunning or turning away from all present and future sin. This sorrow is a part of conversion, or at least a preparation to it, and is called a sorrow unto salvation, a sorrow which is after a godly sort, working repentance unto salvation. The knowledge of sin, sorrow for sin, and a flying from it, differ in their subject, or as it respects that part of our being, in which they have their proper seat. The knowledge of sin is in the mind, sorrow for sin in the heart, and fleeing from it in the will. The turning which is included in conversion is in the heart and will, and is a turning from one thing to another, from evil to good, according to what the psalmist says, depart from evil and do good. Psalm 34 verse 14. It is called in scripture mortification, one, because, as one that is dead cannot perform the actions of a living man, so our nature, when its corruption is once removed, no more performs the actions peculiar to it in its corrupt state. That is, it does not produce actual sin when original sin is once circumscribed and kept under proper restraint. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Romans 6 verse 7. 2. Because this mortification is not without wrestling and pain. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit. Galatians 5 verse 17. It is for this reason that this mortification is called a crucifixion of the flesh. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Galatians 5 verse 24. 3. Because it is a ceasing from sin. It is, moreover, not simply called mortification, but the mortification of the old man, because, by it, not the substance of man, but sin in man is destroyed. The expression old man is also added for the purpose of distinguishing between the repentance of the godly and ungodly, for in the godly not the man but the old man is destroyed, whilst in the ungodly it is not the old man but the man. The quickening of the new man is a true joy and delight in God through Christ, and an earnest and sincere desire to regulate the life according to the will of God, and to perform all good works. It embraces three things which are different from what is included in mortification. 1. A knowledge of the mercy of God, and an application of it in Christ. 2. Joy and delight arising from the fact that God is reconciled to us through Christ, and that obedience is begun in us and shall be perfected. 3. An ardent desire to perform new obedience, or to sin no more, but to render gratitude to God during our whole life, and to retain His love, which desire is itself new obedience according to the following declarations of Scripture. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. I dwell in the high and holy place with Him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Romans 5 verse 1, chapter 14 verse 17, Isaiah 57 verse 15, Romans 6 verse 11, Galatians 2 verse 20. This part of conversion is called quickening, one, because as a living man performs the actions of one that is alive, so this quickening includes the kindling of new light in the understanding and the producing of new qualities and activities in the will and heart, from which a new life and new works proceed. Two, because it includes, on the part of those who are converted, joy and delight in God, which affords great comfort and consolation. It is added through Christ, because we cannot rejoice in God, unless he be reconciled unto us. It is now only through Christ that God is reconciled unto us. Hence, we only rejoice in God through Christ. These two parts of conversion spring from faith. 
The reason is because no one can hate sin and draw nigh to God unless he loves God, but no one loves God who is not possessed of faith. Hence, although there is no express mention made of faith in either part of conversion, this is done not because faith is excluded from conversion, but because the whole doctrine of conversion and thankfulness presupposes it, as a cause is presupposed from the presence of its own peculiar effect. Objection. But faith produces joy, therefore it does not produce grief and mortification. Answer. It is not absurd to affirm that the same cause produces different effects by a different kind of operation and in different respects. So faith produces grief not of itself, but by an accident, which is sin, by which we offend God, our kind and gracious Father. Of itself it produces joy because it assures us of God's fatherly will towards us, by and for the sake of Christ. Reply, the preaching of the law precedes faith, since the preaching of repentance commences with the law, but the preaching of the law works sorrow and wrath, therefore there is a certain sorrow before faith. Answer, we grant that there is a certain sorrow before faith, but not such as constitutes a part of conversion, for the sorrow of the ungodly which is before and without faith is rather a turning away from God than a return to him, which, being contrary, cannot agree, neither wholly nor in part. But the contrition and sorrow which the elect experience is a certain preparation leading to conversion, as we have already shown. Fourth, what are the causes of conversion? The Holy Spirit, or God himself, is the chief efficient cause of our conversion. Hence it is that the saints pray that God would convert them, and that repentance is frequently called in the Scriptures the gift of God. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a saviour to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins, from which we may draw a most forcible argument in proof of the divinity of Christ, inasmuch as it is peculiar to God alone to grant repentance and forgiveness of sins. Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, etc. Jeremiah 31 verse 18, Lamentations 5 verse 21, Acts 5 verse 31, chapter 11 verse 18, 2 Timothy 2 verse 25. The means or instrumental causes of conversion are the law, the gospel, and again the doctrine of the law after that of the gospel. For the preaching of the law goes before, preparing and leading us to a knowledge of the gospel. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans 3 verse 20, hence there can be no sorrow for sin without the law. After the sinner has once been led to a knowledge of sin, then the preaching of the gospel follows, encouraging contrite hearts by the assurance of the mercy of God through Christ. Without this preaching there is no faith, and without faith there is no love to God, and hence no conversion to him. After the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the law again follows that it may be the rule of our thankfulness and of our life. The law therefore precedes and follows conversion. It precedes that it may lead to a knowledge and sorrow for sin. It follows that it may serve as a rule of life to the converted. It is for this reason that the prophets first charge sin upon the ungodly, threaten punishment and exhort to repentance, then comfort and promise pardon and forgiveness, and lastly again exhort and prescribe the duties of piety and godliness. Such was also the character of the preaching of John the Baptist. It is in this way that the preaching of repentance comprehends the law and the gospel, although in effect in conversion each has a part to perform peculiar to itself. The next instrumental and internal cause of conversion is faith. Without faith there is no love to God unless we know what the will of God towards us is, viz. that he will remit unto us our sins by and for the sake of Christ. Conversion will never be begun in us, neither as it respects the mortification of the old man, nor as it respects the quickening of the new. For by faith the heart is purified, Acts 15 verse 9. Without faith we can have no true joy or delight in God. Without faith we cannot love God, and whatsoever is not of faith is sin, Romans 14 verse 23. All good works proceed from faith as their fountain. Being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5 verse 1. The causes which contribute to our conversion are the cross, with the chastisements inflicted upon ourselves and others, also the benefits, punishments, and example of others, etc. Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. 
Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Jeremiah 31, verse 18, Psalm 119, verse 71, Matthew 5, verse 16. The subject or matter in which conversion is grounded is the understanding, the will, the heart, and all the affections of man in which a change is produced. The form of conversion is the turning itself, with all the circumstances that are connected with it, which includes, one, as it respects the mind and understanding, a correct judgment of God, together with his will and works. Two, as it respects the will, a sincere and earnest desire to avoid those falls and things which offend God, with a steady purpose to obey him according to all his commandments. Three, as it respects the heart, new and holy desires and affections, in accordance with the divine law. Four, as it respects the external actions and life, rectitude and obedience begun according to the law of God. The object of conversion is one, sin or disobedience, which is the thing from which we are converted. Two, righteousness or new obedience, which is the thing to which we are converted. The chief end of conversion is the glory of God. The next end, which is subordinate to the glory of God, is our good, which consists in our blessedness and enjoyment of eternal life. The conversion of others is another end, still less principal, than those just mentioned. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Luke 22, verse 32, Matthew 5, verse 16. The questions respecting Pelagianism are here properly in place whether a man can convert himself without the grace of the Holy Spirit, and whether a man can, by the exercise of his free power of choice, prepare himself for the reception of divine grace. Pelagius maintained the first in opposition to what the Scriptures most plainly affirm, Turn thou me, and I shall be turned. It is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. A corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Jeremiah 31 verse 18, Philippians 2 verse 13, Matthew 7 verse 18. The schoolmen and papists at this day defend the last proposition respecting Pelagianism, in opposition to the explicit declarations of the word of God just cited, and also in contradiction to what Christ himself affirms when he says, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me, draw him. John 6 verse 44. Thomas Aquinas attributes a certain preparation to the free will of man, but not conversion. He speaks, however, of this preparation as though it contributed to the grace of conversion which it does by the gracious aid of God, moving us inwardly. Vide summa theologica partis prime parte secunda questione 109 ad 6. Fifth, what are the effects of conversion? The effects of conversion are 1. A true and ardent love to God and our neighbor. 2. An earnest desire to obey God, without any exception, according to all His commandments. 3. All good works or new obedience itself. 4. A desire to convert others, and bring them in the way of salvation. In a word, the fruits of true repentance are the duties of piety towards God and of charity towards our neighbor. 6. Is conversion perfect in this life? Our conversion to God is not perfect in this life, but is here continually advancing until it reaches the perfection which is proposed in the life to come. We know in part, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 9, All the complaints and prayers of the saints are confirmations of this truth. Cleanse thou me from secret faults. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Psalm 19 verse 13, Romans 7 verse 24. The conflict which is continually going on in those who are converted bears testimony to the same truth. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, etc. Galatians 5 verse 17. The same thing may be said of the exhortations of the prophets and apostles, in which they exhort those who are converted to turn more fully unto God. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. Revelation 22 verse 11. We may also establish the same thing in the following manner. Neither the mortification of the flesh nor the quickening of the spirit is absolute or perfect in the saints in this life. Therefore neither is conversion which consists of these two parts perfect. As it respects the mortification of the old man, the case is clear and does not admit of doubt that it is not perfect in this life, because the saints do not only continually strive against the lust of the flesh, but they also often for a time yield and give over in this conflict. Often do they sin, fall, and offend God, although they do not defend their sins, but detest, deplore, and endeavor to avoid them. 
as it regards the imperfection of the quickening of the new man, the same conflict is a sufficient testimony, and surely, as our knowledge is now only in part, the renovation of the will and heart must also be imperfect, for the will follows the knowledge which we have. There are two plain reasons why the will, in the case of those who are converted, tends imperfectly to the good in this life. One, because the renovation of our nature is never made perfect in this life, neither as it respects our knowledge of God, nor the inclination which we have to obey Him. The single complaint and acknowledgment which the Apostle Paul made is a sufficient proof of what we have just said. I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, etc. Romans 7, verses 18 and 19. 2. Because those who are converted are not always governed by the Holy Spirit, but are sometimes for a season deserted by God, either for the purpose of trying or chastising or humbling them, yet they are nevertheless brought to repentance so as not to perish. Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Mark 9, verse 24. But why does God not perfect conversion in the case of his people in this life, seeing that he is able to effect it? The reasons are, one, that the saints may be humbled and exercised in faith, patience, prayer, and wrestling against the flesh, and that they may not boast of their perfection, thinking of themselves more highly than they ought, but daily pray, enter not into judgment with thy servant. Forgive us our sins. Psalm 143, verse 2, Matthew 6, verse 12. 2. That they may press forward more and more unto perfection, and desire it more earnestly that, trampling the world under their feet, they may run with greater alacrity in the Christian course, and aspire after those joys that are laid up in heaven, knowing that it will not be until then that they shall fully enjoy their promised inheritance. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Colossians 3, verses 2, 3, and 5. John 3, verse 2. Concerning this imperfection, Calvin writes in the following expressive language, quote, This restoration is not accomplished in a single moment or day or year, but by continued and sometimes even slow advances, the Lord destroys the carnal corruptions of his chosen, purifies them from all pollution, and consecrates them as temples to himself renewing all their senses to real purity, that they may employ their whole life in the exercise of repentance, and know that this warfare will be terminated only in death. End quote. Institutes, Liber 3, Caput 3, Section 9. The sections following the one from which we have quoted, down to the fifteenth, may also be read to advantage, in which there is a disputation learnedly set forth against the Cathari and Anabaptists, in reference to the remains of sin which cleave to the godly as long as they remain in the flesh. Seventh, in what does the conversion of the godly differ from the repentance of the ungodly? The term repentance is used in reference to the ungodly as well as to the godly, because there are certain things in which they agree, as in a knowledge of sin and sorrow on account of it. As it respects other things, however, there is a wide difference. They differ, one, in the moving cause of repentance, or in the sorrow which is felt. The wicked are sorrowful not on account of having offended God, but merely because of the punishment which they have brought upon themselves, and which necessarily attaches itself to the violation of God's law. If it were not for this, they would never manifest any sorrow for sin. So Cain was sorrowful merely on account of the punishment which God inflicted upon him for his sin. My iniquity, that is the punishment of my iniquity, is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, etc. The godly, however, do indeed dread the punishment of sin, but they are pained and grieved more particularly on account of sin itself and the offence which they have committed against God. So it was in the case of David, against thee, thee only have I sinned, my sin is ever before me. Psalm 51 verses 3 and 4. So it was also in the case of Peter, who wept bitterly on account of having offended Christ. The sorrow of Judas, however, did not arise on account of the evil of sin, but merely on account of the punishment which followed his crime. Horace expresses this distinction in the following language, Liber 1, Epistle 16. O derunt peccare boni, ver tutis amore, tu nihil admites in te, formidene poene. 2. The repentance of the godly differs from that of the ungodly as it respects the efficient cause of it, 
the repentance of the ungodly proceeds from distrust and despair, so that their despair, disquietude, and hatred to God increases. The repentance of the godly, however, proceeds from faith or the confidence which they have in the mercy of God, and in a gracious reconciliation with him by and for the sake of Christ. 3. They differ in form. The repentance of the godly is a turning to God from the devil, sin, and their old nature, because they do not only sorrow, but also encourage themselves by exercising confidence in the Mediator. They confide in Christ, rejoice in God, and trust in Him, saying with David, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Psalm 51 verse 7 The repentance of the ungodly is a turning away from God to the devil, to hatred and repining against God, and to despair. 4. They differ in their effects. The repentance of the godly is followed by new obedience, and in proportion to the depth of their repentance is the old man mortified in them, and the desire of righteousness increased. But the repentance of the ungodly is not followed by new obedience, but they continue in sin and return to their vomit, although for a time they feigned to repent of their sins as Ahab did. They are indeed mortified and destroyed, but the corruption of their nature is not subdued. Yea, by how much the more they repent, by so much the more is hatred, distrust, and aversion to God increased in them, so that they are continually being brought more and more under the power and dominion of Satan. End of section 56。section 57 of commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Concerning Good Works Question 91. But what are good works? Answer only those which proceed from a true faith, are performed according to the law of God and to his glory, and not such as are founded on our imaginations or the institutions of men. Exposition The doctrine concerning good works belongs properly to this question of the Catechism, concerning which we must inquire particularly, first, what are good works? Second, how may they be performed? Third, are the works of the saints pure and perfectly good? Fourth, how can our works please God, since they are only imperfectly good? Fifth, why must we perform good works? Sixth, do your good works merit anything in the sight of God? First, what are good works? Good works are such as are performed according to the law of God, such as proceed from a true faith, and are directed to the glory of God. Three things, therefore, claim our attention in the exposition of this question. 1. The conditions necessary to constitute a work good in the sight of God. 2. The difference between the works of the regenerate and the unregenerate. 3. In what respect or how far the moral works of the ungodly are sins. First, That a work may be good and pleasing in the sight of God, these three conditions are necessary. 1. It must be commanded by God. No creature has the right or power to institute the worship of God. But good works, we speak of moral good, and the worship of God are the same. Moral good differs widely from natural good, inasmuch as all actions, in as far as they are actions, including even those of the wicked, are naturally good, but all actions are not morally good, or in accordance with the justice of God. This condition excludes all will-worship as well as the figment of good intentions, as when men do evil that good may come, or when they perform works founded upon their own imaginations, which they endeavour to thrust upon God in the place of worship, which indeed are not evil in themselves, but yet are not commanded by God. It is not sufficient for the worship of God that a work be not evil or not prohibited. It must also be commanded by God according to what the Scriptures declare, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Walk in my statutes, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. 1 Samuel 15 verse 22 Ezekiel 20 verse 19, Matthew 15 verse 9. But someone may object and say that works of indifference, such as may be done or left undone, are not commanded by God, and yet many of them are pleasing to Him, to which we reply that they are not pleasing to God in themselves, but by an accident, in as far as they partake of the general nature of love, and in as far as they are performed for the purpose of avoiding offence, and for the sake of contributing to the salvation of our fellow men. In this respect they are commanded by God in general, although not specially. 2. That a work may be good, it must proceed from a true faith which rests upon the merit and intercession of Christ, and from which we may know that we, together with our works, are acceptable to God for the sake of the Mediator. 
to do anything from a true faith is, one, to believe that we are acceptable to God for the sake of the satisfaction of Christ, two, that our obedience itself is pleasing to God, both because it is commanded by Him, and because the imperfection which attaches itself to it is made acceptable to God for the sake of the same satisfaction of Christ, on account of which God is well pleased with us. Without faith it is impossible for anyone to please God, nor is the faith by which anyone may assure himself that God wills and commands any particular work sufficient, for if this were all that is necessary, then the wicked who know and do what God wills would also act from faith. To act from a true faith, however, includes much more than this, because it includes in itself historical faith, and what is the most important of all, it applies unto itself the promise of the gospel. The scriptures speak of this true faith in the following references. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Without faith it is impossible to please God. Romans 14 verse 23, Hebrews 11 verse 6. Nor is it difficult to perceive the reason and force of what is here affirmed, because without faith there is no love to God, and consequently no love to our neighbor. Every work now that does not proceed from love to God is hypocrisy, yea, a reproach and contempt of God, for he who has the presumption to do anything, whether it be pleasing to God or not, despises God, and casts a reproach upon him. Nor is it possible for us to have a good conscience without faith, and what is not done with a good conscience cannot please God. 3. That a work may be good, it must be referred principally to the honor and glory of God. Honor embraces love, reverence, obedience, and gratitude. Hence, to do anything to the honor of God is to do it that we may testify our love, reverence, and obedience to God, and that for the sake of showing our thankfulness for the benefits which we have received. There is a necessity that our works, in order that they may be good and acceptable to God, should be referred to the divine glory, and not to our own praise or advantage. Otherwise they will not proceed from the love of God, but from a desire to advance our own selfish interests, and will thus be mere hypocrisy. God must therefore be respected first whenever we do anything, nor must we care what men may say, whether they praise or reproach us, if we have the assurance that we please God in what we do, according to what the Apostle says, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 Yet we may at the same time lawfully and profitably desire and seek true glory, according as it is written, Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5 verse 16 Briefly, faith is required in good works, because if we are not firmly persuaded that our works are pleasing to God, they proceed from contempt of God. The divine command is necessary because faith has respect to the word of God. Inasmuch, therefore, as there cannot be any faith apart from the word, there can likewise be no good works independent of it. Finally, it is necessary that whatever we do be referred to the glory of God, because if we seek our own praise or advantage in what we do, our works cannot please God. By these conditions we exclude from the category of good works all those works, one which are sins in themselves, being contrary to the divine law and the will of God as revealed in his word. Two, also those which are not opposed to the divine law, which in themselves are neither good nor evil, being actions of indifference, but which may nevertheless become evil by an accident. For works which are not opposed to the divine law, and which are not commanded by God but by men, become evil and sinful, when they are done with the conceit and expectation of worshipping God, or with offence and injury to our neighbour. Works of this character are deficient, as it respects the first two conditions which we have specified as being indispensably necessary to constitute an action good in the sight of God. 3. Those works which are good in themselves, and which are commanded by God, but which nevertheless become sins by accident, in that they are not performed lawfully, not being done in the manner nor with the design which God requires, that is, they do not proceed from a true faith, and are not done with the end that God may be glorified thereby. Works of this character are deficient in the last two conditions specified as necessary in order that our action may be pleasing to God. Secondly, the works of the regenerate and the unregenerate differ in this, that the good works of the regenerate are done according to the conditions which we have here specified, whilst those of the unregenerate, although God may have commanded them, do nevertheless not proceed from faith, and are not joined with internal obedience, but are done without sincerity, and are therefore works of hypocrisy, and as they do not spring from a right cause, which is faith, so they are not directed to the glory of God, which is the chief end to which all our actions ought to be referred. 
The actions of the unregenerate do not, therefore, deserve to be called good works. Thirdly, the difference which exists between the works of the righteous and the wicked goes to prove that the moral works of the wicked are sins, but yet not such sins as those which are in their own nature opposed to the law of God. For these are sins in themselves and according to their very nature, whilst the moral works of the wicked are sins merely by an accident, viz. on account of some defect, either because they do not proceed from a true faith or are not done to the glory of God. This consequence, therefore, is of no force. The good works of the heathen, and such as are unregenerate, are sins. Therefore they are all to be avoided and condemned. This consequence, we say, is not legitimate because it is only the defects which attach themselves to these works that are to be avoided and guarded against, as we have shown in the former part of this work when treating the subject of sin. A table of good works. Of good works, some are one, truly good, which, according to the definition of good works, are done, one, according to the command of God, two, of faith, three, to the glory of God. These are either perfect, as of the works of angels, of man before the fall and in the life to come, or imperfect, as the works of the regenerate in this life, or two, apparently good, which include such as are, one, commanded by God, and are in their own nature good, but become evil by an accident, not being done in the manner, nor with the end with which they ought to be performed. Two, commanded by men for the sake of religion, such as the traditions, the counsels, and precepts of the Pharisees and Papists. Matthew 15, verse 9, In vain do they worship me, etc. Second, how may good works be performed? The explanation of this question is necessary on account of the Pelagians who affirm that the unregenerate may also, as well as the regenerate, perform good works and also on account of the papists and semi-Pelagians who imagine certain preparatory works of free will. Good works are possible only by the grace and assistance of the Holy Spirit, and that by the regenerate alone, whose hearts have been truly regenerated by the Spirit of God, through the preaching of the gospel, and that not only in their first conversion and regeneration, but also by the perpetual and constant influence and direction of the same Spirit, who works in them a knowledge of sin, faith, and a desire of new obedience, and also daily increases and confirms more and more the same gifts in them. St. Jerome endorses this doctrine when he says, quote, Let him be accursed, who says that it is possible to render obedience to the law without the grace of the Holy Spirit, end quote. Without the grace and continual direction of the Holy Spirit, even the most holy persons on earth can do nothing but sin, as is evident from the examples of David, Peter, and others. Yea, without regeneration, no part of any work that is good in the sight of God can ever be begun, inasmuch as we are all by nature evil and dead in sin. Matthew 7, verse 11, Ephesians 2, verse 1. All our righteousnesses, says the prophet Isaiah, in which declaration he comprehends both himself and the most holy amongst men, are as filthy rags. Isaiah 64, verse 6. Now if nothing but sin is found before God in the saints, what will that be which is found in those who are unregenerated? What good these are able to perform, the Apostle Paul describes in the most graphic manner in the first and second chapters of his epistle to the Romans, that the unregenerate are unable to perform such works as are acceptable to God, is also taught in the following passages of Scripture. A corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Without me ye can do nothing. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Matthew 7, verse 18, Jeremiah 13, verse 23, John 15, verse 5, Philippians 2, verse 13. Without the righteousness of Christ imputed unto us, we are altogether unclean and abominable in the sight of God, and all our works are as dung. But the righteousness of Christ is not imputed unto us before our conversion. It is impossible, therefore, either that we or our works should be pleasing to God before our conversion. Faith is the cause of good works. Faith comes from God. Therefore, good works, which are the fruits of faith, are from God. Neither can they be before faith and conversion, or else the effect would be before its cause. It is asked by some in connection with this subject, are there not works that are preparatory to conversion, to which we reply that if by preparatory works are meant such as are the occasion of repentance, or which God uses for the purpose of effecting repentance in us, which may be said to be true of the outward deportment and discipline of the life, in as far as it is in accordance with the divine law, hearing, reading, and meditating upon the word of God, also the cross and adverse circumstances, if such works as these are meant, we may admit that there are such works as are preparatory, 
But if by preparatory works are meant works which are performed according to the law before conversion, by which, as by men's good efforts, God is enticed and moved to grant true conversion, as well as his other gifts, to those who do these things we deny that there are any such works, because, according to the declaration of the Apostle Paul, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Romans 14 verse 23. The papists call such works merits of congruity, as if they would say that they are indeed such as are imperfect in themselves and deserve nothing, but on account of which it may seem proper for the mercy of God to grant unto men conversion and eternal life. But God hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, and not upon those who deserve mercy. Romans 9 verse 18. No one deserves anything of God but punishment and banishment from his presence. When ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants, for we have done that which was our duty to do. Luke 17 verse 10. Third, are the works of the regenerate perfectly good? The works of the saints are not perfectly good or pure in this life, one, because even those who are regenerated do many things which are evil, which are sins in themselves, on account of which they are guilty in the sight of God, and deserve to be cast into everlasting punishment. Thus Peter denied Christ thrice, David committed adultery, slew Uriah, attempted to conceal his wickedness, numbered the children of Israel, etc. The law now declares, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. 2. Because they omit doing many good things which they ought to do according to the law. 3. Because the good works which they perform are not so perfectly good and pure as the law requires, for they are always marred with defects and polluted with sins. The perfect righteousness which the law requires is wanting, even in the best works of the saints. The reason of this is easily understood inasmuch as faith, regeneration, and the love of God and our neighbor, from which good works proceed, continue imperfect in us in this life. As the cause is therefore imperfect, it is impossible that the effects which flow from this cause should be perfect. I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. Romans 7 verse 23. This is the reason why the works of the godly cannot stand in the judgment of God. Enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. Psalm 143 verse 2, Deuteronomy 27 verse 26. Inasmuch, therefore, as all our works are imperfect, it becomes us to acknowledge and lament our sinfulness and infirmity, and press forward so much the more towards perfection. From what has now been said, it is evident that the figment or conceit of the monks, in reference to works of supererogation, by which they understand such works as are done over and above what God and the law requires from them, is full of impiety, for it makes God a debtor to man. Yea, it is a blasphemous doctrine, for Christ himself has said, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants, for we have done that which was our duty to do. Luke 17 verse 10. Objection 1. But it is said, Luke 10 verse 35, Whatsoever thou spendest more, when I came again I will repay thee. Therefore there are at least some works of supererogation. Answer. It is a sufficient reply to this objection to remark that in the interpretation of parables we must be careful not to press every minute circumstance too closely, for that which is similar is not altogether the same. The Samaritan says, Whatsoever thou spendest more, not in reference to God, but to the man that was bruised and wounded. Objection 2. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 25, Concerning virgins I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment. Therefore judgment or advice may be given concerning things not commanded or required. Answer, but Paul's meaning is, I give my advice that it is suitable and profitable for this life, but not that it merits eternal life. Objection 3. But Christ said, Matthew 19 verse 21, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell what thou hast, etc. Therefore, there are certain directions which being followed make those who comply therewith perfect. Answer, this is a special command by which Christ designed to call this proud young man to humility, to the love of his neighbor, and to the office of an apostle in Judea. We may also remark that Christ did not require from him supererogation, but perfection, which requirement he made in order that he might bring him to see his great deficiency. Fourth, how can our good works please God, since they are only imperfectly good? If our works were not pleasing to God, they would be performed to no purpose. We must therefore know in what way it is that they please God. 
as they are imperfect in themselves and defiled in many respects they cannot of themselves please god on account of his extreme justice and rectitude yet they are nevertheless acceptable to god in christ the mediator through faith or on account of the merit and satisfaction of christ imputed unto us by faith and on account of his intercession with the father in our behalf for just as we ourselves do not please god in ourselves but in his son so our works being imperfect and unholy in themselves are acceptable to god on account of the righteousness of christ which covers all their imperfection or impurity so that it does not appear before god it is necessary that the person who performs good works should be acceptable to god then the works of the person are also accepted otherwise when the person is without faith the best works are but an abomination before god inasmuch as they are altogether hypocritical as now the person is acceptable to god so are the works but the person is acceptable to god on account of the mediator that is by the imputation of the merit and righteousness of christ with which the person is covered as with a garment in the presence of god hence the works of the person are also pleasing to god for the sake of the mediator god does not look upon and examine our righteousness and imperfect works as they are in themselves according to the rigour of his law in respect to which he would rather condemn them but he beholds and considers them in his son it is for this reason that god is said to have had respect to abel and his offering viz in his son in whom abel believed for it was by faith that he presented his sacrifice genesis four verse four hebrews eleven verse four so christ is also called our high priest by whom our works are offered unto god he is also called the altar on which our prayers and works being placed they are acceptable unto god which otherwise would be detestable in his sight it follows therefore that every defect and every imperfection respecting ourselves and our works is covered and as it were repaired in the judgment of god by the perfect satisfaction of christ it is in view of this that paul says that i may be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of christ the righteousness which is of god by faith philippians three verse nine fifth why good works are to be done or why are they necessary we have already under the eighty-sixth question enumerated certain moving causes of good works which properly belong here such as the connection which holds necessarily between regeneration and justification the glory of god the proof of our faith and election and a good example by which others are won to christ these causes may be very appropriately dwelt upon to a much greater extent if having reduced them to three principal heads we say that good works are to be performed by us for the sake of god ourselves and our neighbour first good works are to be done in respect to god one that the glory of god our heavenly father may be manifested the manifestation of the glory of god is the chief end why god commands and wills that good works should be performed by us that we may honour him by our good works and that others seeing them may glorify our father which is in heaven as it is said let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven matthew five verse sixteen two that we may render unto god the obedience which he requires or on account of the command of god god requires the commencement of obedience in this life and the perfection of it in the life to come this is my commandment that ye love one another this is the will of god even your sanctification being then made free from sin ye became the servants of righteousness yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto god john fifteen verse twelve one thessalonians four verse three romans six verses eighteen and thirteen three that we may thus render unto god the gratitude which we owe unto him it is just and proper that we should love worship and reverence him by whom we have been redeemed and from whom we have received the greatest benefits and that we should declare our love and gratitude by our obedience and good works god deserves our obedience and worship on account of the benefits which he confers upon us we do not merit his benefits by anything that we do hence our gratitude which shows itself by our obedience and good works is due unto god for his great benefits i beseech you brethren by the mercies of god that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto god which is your reasonable service ye are an holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to god by jesus christ romans twelve verse one one peter two verses five nine and twenty second good works are to be done on our own account one that we may thereby testify our faith and be assured of its existence in us by the fruits which we produce in our lives every good tree bringeth forth good fruit being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by jesus christ unto the praise and glory of god 
Faith without works is dead. Matthew 7, verse 17, Philippians 1, verse 11, James 2, verse 17. It is by our good works, therefore, that we know that we possess true faith, because the effect is not without its own proper cause, which is always known by its effect, so that if we are destitute of good works and new obedience, we are hypocrites and have an evil conscience instead of true faith. For true faith, which is never wanting in all the fruits which are peculiar to it, as a fruitful tree produces good works, obedience, and repentance, which fruits distinguish true faith from that faith which is merely historical and temporary, as well as from hypocrisy itself. 2. That we may be assured of the fact that we have obtained the forgiveness of sins through Christ, and that we are justified for his sake. Justification and regeneration are benefits which are connected and knit together in such a way as never to be separated from each other. Christ obtained both for us at the same time, viz. the forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit, who through faith excites in us the desire of good works and new obedience. 3. That we may be assured of our election and salvation. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. 2 Peter 1 verse 10. This cause naturally grows out of the preceding one, for God, out of his mercy, chose from everlasting only those who are justified on account of the merit of his Son. Whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified. Romans 8 verse 30. We are, therefore, assured of our election by our justification, and that we are justified in Christ, which benefit is never granted unto the elect without sanctification. We know from faith, of which we are, again, assured by the fruits of faith, which are good works, new obedience, and true repentance. 4. That our faith may be exercised, nourished, strengthened, and increased by good works. Those who indulge in unclean lusts and desires against their consciences cannot have faith, and so are destitute of a good conscience and of confidence in God, as reconciled and gracious. For it is only by faith that we obtain a sense of the divine favor towards us, and a good conscience. If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. I put thee in remembrance, that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee. Romans 8 verse 13, 2 Timothy 1 verse 6. 5. That we may adorn and commend our profession and life and calling by our good works. I beseech you, that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Ephesians 4 verse 1. 6. That we may escape temporal and eternal punishment. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. If ye live according to the flesh, ye shall die. Thou with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity. Matthew 7 verse 19, Romans 8 verse 13, Psalm 39 verse 11. 7. That we may obtain from God those temporal and spiritual rewards which according to the divine promise accompany good works both in this and in a future life. Godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come, 1 Timothy 4 verse 8. And if God did not desire that the hope of reward and the fear of punishment should be moving causes of good works, he would not use them as arguments in the promises and threatenings which he addresses unto us in his word. Third, good works are to be done for the sake of our neighbor. 1. That we may be profitable unto our neighbor, and edify him by our example and godly conversation. All things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God, etc. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 15, Philippians 1 verse 24. 2. That we may not be the occasion of offences and scandal to the cause of Christ. Woe to that man by whom the offence cometh. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. Matthew 18 verse 7, Romans 2 verse 24. 3. That we may win the unbelieving to Christ. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Luke 22, verse 32. The question whether good works are necessary to salvation belongs properly to this place. There have been some who have maintained simply and positively that good works are necessary to salvation, whilst others again have held that they are pernicious and injurious to salvation. Both forms of speech are ambiguous and inappropriate, especially the latter, because it seems not only to condemn confidence, but also the desire of performing good works. It is therefore to be rejected. The former expression must be explained in this way, that good works are necessary to salvation, not as a cause to an effect, nor as if they merited a reward, but as a part of salvation itself, or as an antecedent to a consequent, or as a means without which we cannot obtain the end. In the same way, we may also say that good works are necessary to righteousness or justification, or in them that are to be justified, viz. as a consequence of justification, with which regeneration is inseparably connected. 
but yet we would prefer not to use these forms of speech one because they are ambiguous two because they breed contentions and give our enemies room for cavilling three because these expressions are not used in the scriptures with which our forms of speech should conform as nearly as possible we may more safely and correctly say that good works are necessary in them that are justified and that are to be saved to say that good works are necessary in them that are to be justified is to speak ambiguously because it may be so understood as if they were required before justification and so become a cause of our justification augustine has correctly said quote, good works do not proceed them that are to be justified but follow them that are justified End quote. we may therefore easily return an answer to the following objection that is necessary to salvation without which no one can be saved but no one who is destitute of good works can be saved as it is said in the eighty seventh question therefore good works are necessary to salvation we reply to the major proposition by making the following distinction that without which no one can be saved is necessary to salvation viz as a part of salvation or as a certain antecedent necessary to salvation in which sense we admit the conclusion but not as a cause or as a merit of salvation we therefore grant the conclusion of the major proposition if understood in the sense we have just explained it for good works are necessary to salvation or to speak more properly in them that are to be saved for it is better thus to speak for the sake of avoiding ambiguity as a part of salvation itself or as an antecedent of salvation but not as a cause or merit of salvation sixth do our good works merit anything in the sight of god this question naturally grows out of the preceding one as the fourth grew out of the third for when we say that we obtain rewards from god by our own good works men immediately conclude that our good works must merit something at the hands of god we must know therefore that our good works are necessary and that they are also to be done for the rewards which are consequent thereon but that they are nevertheless not meritorious by which we mean that they deserve nothing from god not even the smallest particle of spiritual or temporal blessings the reasons of this are most true and evident one our works are imperfect both in respect to their parts and degrees as it respects the parts of our works they are imperfect for the reason that we omit many good things which the law prescribes and do many evil things which the law prohibits and always mingle much that is evil with the good we do as both scripture and experience testify the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other so that he cannot do the things that he would galatians five verse seventeen works now that are imperfect not only merit nothing but are even condemned in the judgment of god cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them deuteronomy twenty seven verse twenty six our works are also imperfect in degree because the best works of the saints are unclean and defiled in the sight of god not being performed by those who are perfectly regenerated nor with that love to god and our neighbor which the law requires the prophet isaiah declares even in reference to good works we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags isaiah 64 verse 6 so the apostle paul passes the same judgment in regard to his own works saying i count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of christ jesus my lord for whom i have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that i may win christ philippians three verse eight it is in this way now that all the saints speak and judge concerning their own righteousness and merits two no creature performing even the best works can merit anything at the hand of god or bind him to give anything as though it were due from him and according to the order of divine justice the apostle assigns the reason of this when he says who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again is it not lawful for me to do what i will with mine own romans eleven verse thirty five matthew twenty verse fifteen we deserve our preservation no more than we did our creation god was not bound to create us nor is he bound to preserve those whom he has created but he did and does both of his own free will and good pleasure god receives no benefit from us nor can we confer anything upon our creator now where there is no benefit there is no merit for merit presupposes some benefit received three our works are all due unto god for all creatures are bound to render worship and gratitude to the creator so that if we were even never to sin yet we could not render unto god the worship and gratitude which is due from us when you have done all those things which are commanded you say we are unprofitable servants we have done that which was our duty to do luke seventeen verse ten 
For if we do any works which are good, these works are not ours, but God's, who produces them in us by his Holy Spirit. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. What hast thou that thou didst not receive? Philippians 2, verse 13, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7. We are by nature the children of wrath, dead in trespasses and sins, evil trees which cannot produce good fruit. Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 3, Matthew 7, verse 18. If we are by nature evil trees, God must by his grace make us good trees and produce good fruit in us, as it is said, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2, verse 10. Hence, if we perform anything that is good, it is the gift of God, and not any merit on our part. It would indeed be foolish on the part of any one, if, when he were to receive a hundred florins as a present from a rich man, he should think he deserved a thousand for receiving the hundred, seeing that he is under obligations to the rich man for the gift which he has received, and not the rich man to him. 5. There is no proportion between our works, which are altogether imperfect, and those exceedingly great benefits which the Father freely grants unto us in his Son. 6. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 31. But if we deserve the remission of our sins by our good works, we should then have something whereof to glory. Nor should we attribute the glory of our salvation to God. As it is said, If Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Romans 4 verse 2. 7. We are justified before we perform good works. For the children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Romans 9, verses 11 to 14. We are, therefore, not justified before God at the time when we do good works, but we perform good works when we are justified. 8. The conceit of merit and justification by our good works is calculated to shake true Christian consolation, to disturb the conscience and lead men to doubt and despair in reference to their own salvation. For when they hear the denunciation of the law, cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and consider their own imperfection, their conscience tells them that they can never perform all these things, so that they are continually led to cherish doubts and to live in dread of the curse of the law. Faith, however, imparts sure and solid comfort to the conscience, because it grounds itself in the promise of God, which cannot disappoint the soul. The inheritance is of faith, that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all his seed. Romans 4, verse 16. 9. If we were to obtain righteousness by our own works, the promise would then be made of none effect, and Christ would have died in vain. 10. If the conceit concerning the merit of good works be admitted, then there would not be one and the same method of salvation. Abraham and the thief on the cross would have been justified differently, which might also be said of us. But there is only one way of salvation. I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is one mediator between God and men. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. John 14, verse 6, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, Ephesians 4, verse 5, Hebrews 13, verse 8, Acts 4, verse 12. 11. Christ would not accomplish the whole of our salvation, and thus would not be a perfect Saviour, if anything were to be added by us to our righteousness by way of merit. For there would be as much detracted from his merit as would be added thereto from our merit. But... Christ is our perfect Saviour, as the Scriptures sufficiently testify, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. By grace are ye saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Neither is there salvation in any other. Ephesians 1 verse 7, chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, 1 John 1 verse 7, Acts 4 verse 12. Objection. Reward presupposes merit. God also calls those things which he promises, and grants unto them that perform good works, rewards. Therefore good works presuppose merit, and are meritorious in the sight of God. Answer. The major proposition sometimes holds true among men, but never with God, because no creature can merit anything at the hands of God, seeing that he is indebted to no one. Yet they are, nevertheless, called the rewards of our good works in respect to God, because he, out of his mere grace, recompenses them. 
This recompense, however, is not due, for we can add nothing to God, neither does he stand in need of our works. Yea, something is rather added unto us by our good works, because they are a conformity of ourselves with God and his benefits, by which we are bound to render gratitude to God and not God to us. It is therefore not less absurd to say that we merit salvation at the hands of God, than if a certain one should say, Thou hast given me one hundred florins, therefore thou oughtest to give me a thousand florins. Yet God commands us to perform good works, and promises a gracious reward to those who do them, as a father promises rewards to his children. End of section 57 Section 58 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Asinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Law of God. 34th Lord's Day of the Ten Commandments. Question 92. What is the law of God? Answer. God spake all these words, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. First commandment, Thou shalt have no gods before me. Second commandment, Thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven image, nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or in the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Third commandment, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Fourth commandment, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do no manner of work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. The fifth commandment, Honour thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Sixth commandment, Thou shalt not kill. Seventh commandment, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Eighth commandment, Thou shalt not steal. Ninth commandment, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbour. Tenth commandment, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's house, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbour's. Exposition The doctrine concerning the law, which is the rule of good works, next claims our attention, in relation to which we shall inquire, first, what is the law in general, second, what are the several parts of the divine law, third, to what extent has Christ abrogated the law, and to what extent is it still in force, Fourth, in what does the moral law differ from the gospel? Fifth, how is the Decalogue divided? Sixth, what is the true meaning of the Decalogue and of every commandment separately considered? Seventh, to what extent can those who are regenerated keep the law? Eighth, what is the use of the law? We shall now proceed to the consideration of the first four questions here proposed. The fifth belongs to the ninety-third question of the Catechism, the sixth to the ninety-fourth, and those which follow down to the hundred and fourteenth, the seventh to the hundred and fourteenth, and the eighth to the hundred and fifteenth question. First, what is the law in general? The term law, lex, is derived from lego, which means to read, to publish, or from lego, which means to choose. The Hebrew Torah, which means doctrine, agrees with the former derivation of the term because laws are published in order that everyone may read and learn them. It is for this reason that ignorance of the law does not excuse anyone. Yea, those who are ignorant of the laws which have respect to them, sin in that they are ignorant. The Greek nomos, which comes from a word that means to distribute, to divide, agrees with the latter derivation of the term law, because the law imposes particular duties upon everyone. Law now in general is a rule or precept, commanding things honest and just, requiring obedience from creatures endowed with reason, with a promise of reward in case of obedience, and with a threatening of punishment in case of disobedience. It is a rule or precept commanding things honest and just, otherwise it is no law. Requiring obedience from creatures endowed with reason, 
the law was not made for those who are not bound to obedience. With a promise of reward in case of obedience, the law graciously promises blessings to those who perform acceptable obedience, because no obedience can be meritorious in the sight of God. Objection. But the gospel also promises blessings freely, therefore the law does not differ from the gospel. Answer. The law promises freely in one respect, and the gospel in another. The law promises freely upon the condition of obedience on our part. The gospel, on the other hand, promises freely without the works of the law. The gospel does not indeed promise blessings freely, independent of any condition whatever, but only without such a condition as that which the law lays down, and with a threatening of punishment in case of disobedience, otherwise the law would be an empty sound and of no effect. Plato says, quote, The law is a right form of government which is directed to the best end, by means that are adapted thereto, threatening punishment upon transgressors, and promising rewards to the obedient, end quote. The term law is also frequently improperly used to designate the course and order which God has established in nature. In this sense, the law, meaning the order of nature, requires that fruit be produced by a tree. And Paul still more improperly calls original sin the law of sin, because as a law it leads to the commission of sin. Second, what are the parts of the law and what their differences? Laws are divine and human. Human laws are such as are instituted by men, which bind certain persons to certain external duties concerning which there is no express divine precept, or prohibition with a promise of reward and threatening of punishment, corporal and temporal. Human laws are either civil or ecclesiastical. Civil are such positive laws as are instituted by magistrates, or by some corporation or state, in reference to a certain order or class of actions, to be observed in the state of contracts, trials, punishments, etc., Ecclesiastical or ceremonial laws are those which the Church institutes in reference to the order which is to be observed in the ministry of the Church, and which lay down certain prescriptions in reference to those things which contribute to the divine law. Divine laws are those which God has instituted, which belong partly to angels, partly to men, and partly to certain classes of men. These do not only require external actions or obedience, but they also require internal qualities, actions, and motives, nor do they merely propose temporal rewards and punishments, but also such as are spiritual and eternal. They are also the ends for which human laws are instituted. Of divine laws there are some that are eternal and unchangeable, whilst there are others that are changeable, yet only by God himself who has instituted them. The divine law is ordinarily divided or considered as consisting of three parts, the moral, the ceremonial, and the judicial the moral law is a doctrine harmonizing with the eternal and unchangeable wisdom and justice of God, distinguishing right from wrong, known by nature, engraven upon the hearts of creatures endowed with reason in their creation, and afterwards often repeated and declared by the voice of God through his servants the prophets, teaching what God is and what he requires, binding all intelligent creatures to perfect obedience and conformity to the law, internal and external, promising the favor of God and eternal life to all those who render perfect obedience, and at the same time denouncing the wrath of God and everlasting punishment upon all those who do not render this obedience, unless remission of sins and reconciliation with God be secured for the sake of Christ the Mediator. Harmonizing with the eternal and unchangeable wisdom of God. That the law is eternal is evident from this, that it remains one and the same from the beginning to the end of the world. We were also created and have been redeemed by Christ and regenerated by the Holy Spirit that we might keep this law, or love God and our neighbours as it requires, both in this and in the life to come. I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which he had from the beginning. 1 John 2 verse 7. Afterwards often repeated. God repeated the law of nature which was engraven upon the mind of man, one, because it was obscured and weakened by the fall, Two, because many things were entirely obliterated and lost. Three, that what was still left in the mind of man might not be regarded as a mere opinion or notion, and so at length be lost. Ceremonial laws were those which God gave through Moses in reference to ceremonies, or the external solemn ordinances which were to be observed in the public worship of God, with a proper attention to the circumstances which had been prescribed, binding the Jewish nation to the coming of the Messiah, and at the same time distinguishing them from all other nations, and that they might also be signs, symbols, types, and shadows of spiritual things to be fulfilled in the New Testament by Christ. Ceremonies are external solemn actions, 
which are often to be repeated in the same manner and with the same circumstance, and which have been instituted by God or by men to be observed in the external worship of God for the sake of order, propriety, and signification, the ceremonies which have been instituted by God constitute divine worship absolutely, whilst those which have been instituted by men, if they are good, merely contribute to divine worship. The judicial laws were those which had respect to the civil order or government and the maintenance of external propriety among the Jewish people according to both tables of the Decalogue, or it may be said that they had respect to the order and duties of magistrates, the courts of justice, contracts, punishments, fixing the limits of kingdoms, etc. These laws God delivered through Moses for the establishment and preservation of the Jewish commonwealth, binding all the posterity of Abraham and distinguishing them from the rest of mankind until the coming of the Messiah, and that they might also serve as a bond for the preservation and government of the Mosaic polity until the manifestation of the Son of God in the flesh, that they might be certain marks by which the nation which was bound by them might be distinguished from all other nations, and might at the same time be the means of preserving proper discipline and order, that so they might be types of the order which should be established in the kingdom of Christ. All good laws, which alone deserve the name of laws, are to be traced to the moral law as their source, which agrees in every respect with the Decalogue, and may also, by necessary consequence, be deduced from it, so that he who violates the one violates the other likewise. As it respects ceremonial and judicial laws, however, whether they be divine or human, if they are only good, they do, indeed, agree with the Decalogue, but cannot be deduced from it by necessary consequence, as the moral law, but are subservient to it as certain specifications of circumstances. From this we may easily perceive the difference which exists between these laws, for it is one thing to flow out of the Decalogue necessarily, and another thing to agree with it and contribute to its observance. Yet this difference varies because the government of the church and the state is not the same, nor do these have the same end, nor are they abrogated in the same way. But the chief difference between these laws lies in their obligation, manifestation, duration, and use. The moral law is known naturally, binds all men, and that perpetually. It is different, however, with the ceremonial and judicial law. The moral law requires obedience which is both internal and external. The others merely require that which is external. The precepts of the moral law are general, having respect to all men, whoever they may be. The others are special, and do not thus apply to all men. The precepts of the moral law are the ends of the others, whilst they again are subservient to those which are moral. The ceremonial and civil laws were also types and figures of other things for which they were instituted. It is different, however, with the moral law. The moral law does not give place to the ceremonial it, on the other hand, gives place to the moral. We must also observe in passing along the difference which exists between the moral law, the natural law, and the Decalogue. The Decalogue contains the sum of the moral laws which are scattered throughout the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. The natural and moral law were the same in man before the fall, when his nature was pure and holy. Since the fall, however, which resulted in the corruption and depravity of our nature, a considerable part of the natural law has become obscured and lost by reason of sin, so that there is only a small portion concerning the obedience which we owe to God still left in the human mind. It is for this reason that God repeated and declared to the church the entire doctrine and true sense of his law as contained in the Decalogue. The Decalogue is, therefore, the renewal and reinforcing of the natural law, which is only a part of the Decalogue. This distinction, therefore, which we have made between the several parts of the divine law, must be retained both on account of the difference itself, that so the force and true sense of these laws may be understood, and that we may also have a correct knowledge and understanding of the abrogation and use of the law. Third, to what extent has Christ abrogated the law, and to what extent is it still in force? The ordinary and correct answer to this question is that the ceremonial and judicial law, as given by Moses, has been abrogated in as far as it relates to obedience, and that the moral law has also been abrogated as it respects the curse, but not as it respects obedience. That the ceremonial and judicial laws have been so abrogated by the coming of Christ, that they no longer bind any to obedience, 
and that they have not the appearance and force of laws in respect to the present time, is proven, one, from the fact that the prophets even declared and foretold this abrogation in the Old Testament. Christ shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Thou art a priest for ever after the order of Melchizedek. Daniel 9 verse 27, Psalm 110 verse 4. 2. Christ and his apostles in different places in the New Testament expressly assert this abrogation. See Acts 7 verse 8, Hebrews 7 verses 11 to 18, chapter 8 verses 8 to 13. Instead of adducing a number of testimonies in confirmation of this point, we shall merely cite the decree passed by the apostles when assembled in Jerusalem. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, etc. Acts 15, verses 28 and 29. 3. When certain causes are once changed, the laws which are based upon these causes are also changed. One cause now of the ceremonial and judicial law was that the form of worship and civil polity which existed among the Jews, from whom the Messiah was to be born, might distinguish them from all other nations until the Messiah would come. Another cause was that they might be types of the Messiah and of his benefits. These causes, now since the coming of the Messiah, have been done away with, for the Apostle declares that the middle wall of partition between the Jews and other nations has been broken down. He is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Ephesians 2 verse 14, Galatians 6 verse 15. It is also everywhere taught in the New Testament scriptures that the rites and ceremonies of the old dispensation have been fulfilled in Christ. The Holy Ghost thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing. The law and the prophets were until John. Let no man judge you in meat or in drink, etc. Hebrews 9 verse 8, Luke 10 verse 16, Colossians 2 verse 16. The Jews are wont to bring forward the following objections against the abrogation of the law. 1. The Mosaic ritual and the Jewish kingdom were to last forever, the former according to the command, the latter according to the promise of God. Circumcision is an everlasting covenant. The Passover was to be observed for an ordinance forever. This is my rest forever. The Sabbath is a perpetual covenant. Thy throne shall be established forever. Genesis 17, verse 13, Exodus 12, verse 24, Psalm 132, verse 14, Exodus 31, verse 16, 2 Samuel 7, verse 16. Therefore, the form of religion and civil polity instituted by Moses has not been abrogated by Christ. Answer. The chain of reasoning in this syllogism is incorrect, for it proceeds from that which is declared to be true in a certain respect to that which is absolutely true. The major proposition speaks of an absolute perpetuity, whilst the minor speaks of a perpetuity that is limited, inasmuch as an unlimited continuance of the Jewish rites and kingdom is not promised in the above references, but one that was merely to continue until the coming of the Messiah, who was to be heard after Moses. For the particle holam signifies everywhere in the scriptures not eternity, but the continuance of a long, though definite, period of time. Thus it is said in Exodus 26 verse 6, and he shall serve him forever, meaning until the year of jubilee, as we may easily prove by a comparison of this declaration with the law respecting the jubilee, as recorded in Leviticus 25 verse 40. Again, we may also grant what is affirmed in the minor proposition, that an absolute perpetuity is promised, but this is a continuance not of the types and shadows, but only of the things signified thereby, which are spiritual, the truth of which will continue forever in the church, even though the types and signs themselves be abolished by Christ. In this respect, the signification of circumcision remains in force even to this day. So there is also a perpetual Sabbath in the church, and it shall be perpetual in everlasting life. So also the kingdom of David is established forever in the throne of Christ. Objection 2. The worship which Ezekiel describes from the 40th chapter to the end of his prophecy has respect to the kingdom of the Messiah and is to be retained in it. But that worship is merely typical and ceremonial, therefore a typical and ceremonial worship is to be retained in the kingdom of the Messiah, from which we may infer that the Jewish religion and polity was not to be done away with, but restored by the Messiah. Answer. 
the major of this syllogism, if understood absolutely, is not true, because whilst the prophet speaks of the kingdom of the Messiah, he does not prophesy concerning this alone, for he at the same time speaks of the restitution of the ceremonial worship in Judea after their return from Babylon, and foretells that it would continue until the Messiah would come. We also deny the minor proposition, for the prophet, under the description of types, did not only promise the restoration of Jewish types, but he more particularly foretold and promised the spiritual condition and glory of the church under the reign of the Messiah, which should be commenced in this life and perfected in the life to come, which may be proven by the following considerations. 1. The history of Ezra teaches that this restoration would not take place before the coming of Christ, neither will the other prophecies which are contained in the Old Testament respecting the coming and reign of the Messiah in this world allow us to believe that there will ever, even after the manifestation of the Son of God in the flesh, be such a glorious state and condition of the church on earth as the Jews dream of. Hence this restoration of Jerusalem, or the church, must be understood spiritually, or else we shall be compelled to admit, what is absurd, that this prophecy never has been, nor will be fulfilled. 2. The promise in which the prophet declares that neither the house of Israel nor their kings would any more defile the holy name of God, must necessarily be understood in a spiritual sense as referring to the perfection of the life to come. Ezekiel 43 verse 7 and it is by no means uncommon for the prophets to connect the commencement of the reign of Christ with the perfect establishment of it. 3. The waters issuing out of the temple cannot be understood of elementary water, but shadow forth and signify the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which were to be poured out in large measures in the kingdom of Christ. Ezekiel 47 verse 1. 4. Lastly, we have for our interpreter the Apostle John, who in the 21st and 2nd chapters of the book of Revelation describes the spiritual and heavenly Jerusalem, by which is meant the glorified church of the New Testament, in words taken, as it were, from the description given by the prophet Ezekiel. This prophecy, therefore, affords no proof whatever in favor of the observance of Jewish rites in the kingdom of Christ. Objection 3. The best and most wholesome form of government is always to be retained. The form of government established among the Jews was the best and most wholesome for the reason that it was instituted by God. Therefore, it is to be retained. Answer. There is here a fallacy in taking that to be absolutely true, which is true only in a certain respect. The form of government established among the Jews was the best, not absolutely, but only for that time, that country and nation, for there were many things in it adapted to the state and condition of that nation, country, time, and ceremonial worship, the observance of which would now neither be proper nor profitable, because the causes on account of which those laws were given to the Jews are now changed or removed, as giving a writing or bill of divorcement, marrying the widow of one's kindred, etc. God did not for this reason institute this form of government, that all nations and ages might be bound by it, but only that his own people might, by this discipline, be separated for a time from the surrounding nations. If anyone should object and say that if Christians are permitted to observe and conform to the laws of other nations, such as the Greeks or Romans, etc., much more ought we to observe those which were given by Moses, the servant of God. We readily grant the argument, if this observance is rendered without attaching to it the idea of necessity, or if these laws are observed not because Moses commanded and enjoined them upon the Jewish nation, but because there are good reasons why we should now comply with them, and if these reasons should be changed to retain the liberty of changing these enactments by public authority. We have thus far spoken merely of the abrogation of the ceremonial and judicial law. We must now proceed to speak of the moral law. The moral law has, as it respects one part, been abrogated by Christ, and as it respects another it has not. It has been abrogated, as it respects the faithful, in two ways. One, the curse of the law has been removed, as it respects those who are justified by faith in Christ, in consequence of having his merits imputed unto them, or it may be said that the law has been abrogated as touching justification, because judgment is not pronounced in reference to us according to the law, but according to the gospel. The sentence of the law would condemn and give us over to destruction. Its dreadful language is, In thy sight shall no man living be justified. Psalm 143 verse 2. The sentence of the gospel is different. Its language is, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. John 3 verse 36. 
This abrogation of the law is the first and principal part of Christian liberty, of which it is said there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Ye are not under the law, but under grace. Romans 8 verse 1, chapter 6 verse 14. 2. The law has been abrogated in reference to Christians as it respects constraint. The law no longer forces and rests obedience as a tyrant, or as a master compels a worthless servant to render obedience to his behests, because Christ commences in us by his Spirit a free and cheerful obedience, so that we willingly comply with whatever the law requires from us. The Apostle says concerning this part of Christian liberty, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law but under grace. Romans 6 verse 14 what this liberty is, the Apostle explains in the seventh chapter of his epistle to the Romans. The law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, etc. Against such there is no law. 1 Timothy 1 verse 9, Galatians 5 verse 23. Objection. The law and the prophets were until John. Matthew 11 verse 13. Hence, if the law was then first abrogated, as it respects condemnation, when Christ appeared in the flesh, it follows that the faithful who lived before the coming of Christ must have been under condemnation. Answer. The law was abrogated as touching condemnation, no less to the faithful under the Old Testament than to those who live under the New Testament, to the former as to efficacy and power, to the latter as to fulfillment and manifestation. But the moral law or decalogue has not been abrogated in as far as obedience to it is concerned. God continually, no less now than formerly, requires both the regenerate and the unregenerate to render obedience to his law. This may be proven, one, from the end for which Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. This was that he might make us, who were delivered from sin and the curse of the law, the temples of God, and not that we should persist in sin and hatred to God. Two, we are bound to render obedience and gratitude to God in proportion to the number and greatness of the benefits which he confers upon us, but those who are united to Christ by faith receive from the hands of God more and greater benefits than all others, for they do not merely enjoy, in common with others, the benefit of creation and preservation, but enjoy in addition to this the grace of regeneration and justification. Therefore we are more strongly bound to render obedience to the divine law than others, and that more after our regeneration and justification than before. 3. From the testimony of Scripture Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, I am not come to destroy but to fulfill, Matthew 5 verse 17. This is spoken indeed of the whole law, but with a special reference to the moral law which Christ has fulfilled in four respects. 1. By his own righteousness and conformity with the law, it behooved him to be perfectly righteous in himself and to be conformable to the law according to each nature, that he might make satisfaction for us, as it is said, for such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners, etc. Hebrews 7 verse 26. 2. By enduring a punishment sufficient for our sins. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Romans 8 verse 3. 3. Christ fulfills the law in us by his Spirit, by whom he renews us in the image of God. Our old man is crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. If the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Romans 6 verse 6, chapter 8 verse 11. 4. Christ fulfilled the law by teaching it and restoring its true meaning and sense, which he did by freeing it from the corruptions and glosses of the Pharisees, as appears from his Sermon on the Mount and from other portions of his teaching. If Christ therefore teaches and restores in us obedience to the law, he does not abolish the law in respect to obedience. Paul teaches the same thing when he asks, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Romans 3 verse 31 the law now is established by faith in three ways. 1. By confessing and approving the sentence which it passes in reference to ourselves, that we do not render the obedience which is due from us to the law, and are therefore deserving of eternal condemnation. We also confess the same thing by seeking righteousness without ourselves in Christ. 2. By satisfaction. 
by faith we apply unto ourselves the satisfaction of christ which is equivalent to everlasting punishment which the law requires from us in case we do not render a full and perfect obedience to its claims it is by means of this satisfaction now that we are justified not indeed by the law nor yet contrary to the law but with the law which christ has fully satisfied by his perfect obedience in our room and stead three by new obedience this obedience is commenced in us in this life by the spirit of christ and will be perfected in the life to come the same thing may be expressed more briefly thus the law is established by faith both because the doctrine concerning the righteousness which is by faith teaches that we are righteous not in ourselves, and that we cannot be justified unless the perfect satisfaction which the law requires intervene, and also because the restoration of obedience to the law in us is brought about by faith. The sum of what we have now said, touching the abrogation of the law, is this, that the ceremonial and judicial laws instituted by Moses have been entirely abolished and done away with by the coming of Christ, as far as it relates to obligation and obedience on our part. The moral law, however, has not been abolished as it respects obedience, but only as it respects the curse, justification, and constraint. The objections of the antinomians, libertines, and others of a similar cast, who contend that the moral law has no respect to Christians, and that it ought not to be taught in the Church of Christ, will be noticed when we come to the exposition of the 115th question of the Catechism, where we shall speak of the use of the law. Fifth, in what does the law differ from the gospel? The exposition of this question is necessary for a variety of considerations, and especially that we may have a proper understanding of the law and the gospel, to which a knowledge of that in which they differ greatly contributes. According to the definition of the law, which says that it promises rewards to those who render perfect obedience, and that it promises them freely, inasmuch as no obedience can be meritorious in the sight of God, it would seem that it does not differ from the gospel, which also promises eternal life freely. Yet notwithstanding this seeming agreement, there is a great difference between the law and the gospel. They differ, one, as to the mode of revelation peculiar to each. The law is known naturally, the gospel was divinely revealed after the fall of man. Two, in matter or doctrine, the law declares the justice of God separately considered, the gospel declares it in connection with his mercy. The law teaches what we ought to be in order that we may be saved. The gospel teaches, in addition to this, how we may become such as the law requires, viz. by faith in Christ. 3. In their conditions or promises. The law promises eternal life and all good things upon the condition of our own and perfect righteousness and of obedience in us. The gospel promises the same blessings upon the condition that we exercise faith in Christ, by which we embrace the obedience which another, even Christ, has performed in our behalf, or the gospel teaches that we are justified freely by faith in Christ. With this faith is also connected, as by an indissoluble bond, the condition of new obedience. 4. In their effects. The law works wrath, and is the ministration of death. The gospel is the ministration of life and of the spirit. Romans 4 verse 15, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 7. Question 93. How are these Ten Commandments divided? Answer. Into two tables, the first of which teaches us how we must behave towards God, the second what duties we owe to our neighbor. Exposition. This question concerning the division of the Decalogue is necessary and profitable, one, because God himself expressed a certain number of tables and commandments in the Decalogue, two, because Christ divided the sum of the whole law into two commandments, or into two kinds of commandments, 3. Because a correct division of the Decalogue contributes much to a proper understanding of the commandments. It teaches and admonishes us in reference to the degrees of obedience required by each table, and shows that the worship of the first table is the most important. There is a threefold division of the Decalogue. First, it is divided into two tables by Moses and Christ. The first table comprehends the duties which we owe to God immediately, the second the duties which we owe to Him immediately, or, it may be said that the first table teaches us how we ought to behave towards God, whilst the second teaches us what duties we owe towards our neighbor. This division is based upon the word of God clearly expressed. Hew thee two tables of stone, Exodus 34, verses 1, 4, 29, Deuteronomy 4, verse 13. So Christ and Paul refer the whole law to the love of God and our neighbor. 
Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Matthew 22, verses 37, 38, and 39. This division is profitable, one, that we may the better understand the true sense and design of the whole law, and the perfect obedience which it required of us. Two, that we may observe the common rule to yield the precepts of the second table to those of the first in the same kind of worship, or that we should prefer the love and glory of God to the love and salvation of all creatures, according as it is written, we ought to obey God rather than men, Acts 5 verse 29. Second, the Decalogue is divided into ten commandments, of which the first four belong to the first table, the rest belong to the second table. God enumerated or included ten commandments in the Decalogue, not because he was delighted more with this number than any other, but because the substance and reasons of these things were comprehended in this number. For all that we owe to God and our neighbour is contained in these ten precepts or laws, so that nothing is omitted, nor is there anything superfluous. The four commandments of the first table comprise everything which we owe to God immediately, whilst the remaining six which make up the second table contain everything which has respect to the manner in which this life should be spent, so as to result in happiness and peace. There is, however, much diversity of sentiment and disagreement in the relation to the enumeration of the commandments. Some enumerate only three, others five, and others four commandments in the first table. But that that division which attributes four commandments to the first table, in such a way that the first includes what is said in reference to having no other gods beside Jehovah, the second, what is said of not making graven images, the third, of not taking the name of God in vain, the fourth, of hallowing the Sabbath, thus referring the other six to the second table, that this division is the best and most correct, we prove by the following considerations. 1. According to this division, each commandment expresses something distinct and separate from the rest, so that it may easily be distinguished from all the others, according to its true sense and meaning. When God himself divided the Decalogue into ten commandments, he doubtless designed that these precepts should differ from each other, so that each one should contain and express something peculiar to itself. Hence, if these commandments have not a different signification, they are not different, but one and the same. The commandments now which forbid our having strange gods and making graven images are different in their meaning and signification. The former forbids any other god to be worshipped besides him who alone is the true god. The other forbids that this true god should be worshipped in any other way than that which he has prescribed. So, on the other hand, the commandment concerning concupiscence or lust, out of which some make the ninth and tenth commandments, is but one as to its meaning as the very persons themselves who make this division testify, whenever they, in their expositions, join together this, their ninth and tenth commandments. The Apostle Paul also teaches the same thing when he speaks of lust as though it were but one commandment, saying, I had not known lust, to be sin, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet, Romans 7 verse 7. Hence the first and second commandments, of which we have spoken, are two different commandments, whilst this last, which some divide into two, is but one commandment. Moreover, if the tenth commandment concerning lust is to be divided into two, because it distinctly forbids coveting or lusting after one's neighbour's house and wife, then it would also follow, according to this reasoning, that it would have to be divided into more, yea, into as many commandments as there are things specified which we are not to covet. 2. Those commandments are, without doubt, different, and not the same, which Moses has separated by different periods and verses, whilst those which he has expressed in one sentence or verse are not different, but constitute only one commandment. The commandment now which forbids our having strange gods, and that which forbids our making graven images, are distinguished and separated by Moses into different verses or sentences. They are therefore not the same, but different commandments. It is different, however, as it respects the commandment which forbids the coveting of our neighbour's house and wife, for this is not separated into distinct verses by Moses, as in the former case, but is comprehended in one sentence. Hence it constitutes only one commandment, and not two, as some will have it. 3. Moses, without doubt, observed and retained the same order in rehearsing the commandments, both in Exodus and Deuteronomy. But the words of the tenth commandment, respecting the coveting of our neighbour's house and wife, are not in these places rehearsed in the same, but in a different order. In Exodus the words, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's house, precede those which declare, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's wife. 
but in Deuteronomy the order is different, for here the words, Thou shalt not desire thy neighbor's wife, precede those which declare, Thou shalt not desire thy neighbor's house. Therefore these sentences are part of one and the same commandment, or else there will be no ninth commandment, and we will be driven to the necessity of maintaining that Moses in one place confounded the ninth commandment with the tenth, and substituted a part of the tenth in the place of the ninth, which absurdity we dare not charge upon him. This transposition of the words in the instances to which reference is here had clearly proves that God designed that that portion of the Decalogue which is comprehended in one period should constitute but one commandment, and that the tenth. 4. This division of the commandments of the Decalogue is supported and sustained by the best and most weighty authority. The ancient Jewish writers distinguish the first and second commandments, and include in the tenth the same portion of the Decalogue which we have, as may be seen by a reference to the Antiquities of Josephus, the third book, and to the exposition of the Decalogue by Philo. It is in the same way that the Grecian fathers and writers divide the Decalogue, as Athanasius, Origen, Gregory Nazianzen, Chrysostom, Zonaris, and Nicephorus. The same thing may be said of the Latin fathers, Jerome, Ambrose, Severus, and Augustine. This distinction of the Decalogue was, therefore, at a very early period regarded as the most correct, and was received in the Greek and Latin churches. That Josephus, Philo, and some of the Grecian writers make each table of the Decalogue consist of five commandments, does not prove anything against what we have here said, for although they do this, they nevertheless all agree that the words respecting the worship of the one true God, and those which prohibit the making of graven images, constitute two distinct commandments, whilst that portion of the Decalogue which has respect to lust or coveting constitutes only one commandment and not two. There is also another division of the Decalogue in the writings of Augustine, Epistle 119, Ad Januà, Caput, 11, and Questiones Super Exodum, Caput, 7, according to which the first table consists of only three commandments and the second of seven, but the allegory of the Trinity upon which Augustine bases this division is too weak to give any countenance to it. We may remark, however, in this connection that, if only the doctrine and true sense of the Decalogue concerning the true God and his worship be retained, there ought to be no bitter or angry contention about the division of the words and sentences. Third, the Decalogue is divided according to its matter, or according to the things which are commanded or forbidden therein, into the worship of God as immediate and mediate. The worship of God is commanded in the Decalogue generally, whilst that is forbidden which is contrary thereto. The worship of God, now, is either immediate when moral works are performed to him immediately, or it is immediately when moral works are performed towards our neighbour on God's account. The immediate worship of God is contained in the first table, and is either internal or external. The internal consists in this, partly that we worship the true God, and that we render unto him that which is required in the first commandment, and partly that we worship him in the manner prescribed in the second commandment, whether it be in respect to the worship which is internal or external. The immediate external worship of God is either private or public. That which is private includes the private moral works of every one, the works which every man ought at all times to perform as it respects acknowledging and confessing God, both in word and deed, which worship is taught in the third commandment. The public worship of God consists in the sanctification of the Sabbath, which is contained in the fourth commandment. The worship of God which is immediate and which consists in the duties we owe towards men or our neighbour is contained in the second table and is likewise external and internal. That which is external consists partly in the duties of governors, parents, etc., to those under them, and contrariwise, which duties are comprehended in the fifth commandment, and partly in the duties which one man owes to another, which are taught and enforced in the other commandments. These are either the preservation of life and safety, whether of ourselves or of others, which is enjoined in the sixth commandment, or the preservation of chastity and marriage, which is taught in the seventh commandment, or the preservation of goods and possessions, which is comprised in the eighth commandment, or the preservation of truth, which is enforced in the ninth commandment. The immediate worship of God, which is internal, or the internal duties of that worship which is immediate, consist in the proper moderation and regulation of all the affections which we are to cherish towards our neighbour, which worship must be included in all the preceding commandments, and is prescribed in the tenth. 
we may now easily return an answer to the following objection. The duties which we owe towards our neighbour are not the worship of God. The second table prescribes the duties which we owe towards our neighbour, therefore the obedience of the second table does not constitute the worship of God. Answer. The major proposition is true only of the immediate worship of God, in reference to which we admit the conclusion, for the obedience of the second table is not the immediate worship of God, as is the obedience of the first table. But it is that which is mediate, or which we perform towards God in our neighbour, or by our neighbour, coming between God and us. For the duties of love to our neighbour ought to proceed from the love of God, and when they are performed in this way they please God, and have respect to him no less than the obedience which is required by the first table of the Decalogue. These duties are, therefore, in respect to God, on account of whom they are performed, called, and are in fact the worship of God, but in respect to our neighbours, towards whom they are directly performed, they are called duties. Hence the worship which each table enjoins differs as to the object towards whom it is performed. The first table has only an immediate object which is God, the second has an immediate object which is our neighbour, and at the same time a mediate object which is God. A table of the third division of the Decalogue A description of the table The Decalogue commands the worship of God in general, which is divided into immediate or towards God alone, mediate or towards our neighbour on account of God. This is either immediate is divided into internal and external, mediate is divided into external and internal, internal which consists in a proper moderation and regulation of the desires of the heart that no one desire or think anything contrary to all or any of the former commandments, immediate internal divided into concerning the one true God as in the commandment one, concerning the worship of God under a proper form, as in commandment 2. Immediate external is divided into private, as in commandment 3, public, as in commandment 4. Mediate external is divided into the duties of superiors to those who are under them, and contrarywise, as in commandment 5. And preservation, which is divided into of life and safety, whether of ourselves or of others, as in commandment 6, of chastity, as in commandment 7, of goods and possessions, as in commandment 8, of truth, as in commandment 9. End of table. General rules. Before we proceed to the exposition of each commandment singly, it is proper that we should lay down certain general rules necessary to the understanding of the Decalogue as a whole, and of each commandment in particular. 1. The Decalogue must be understood according to the interpretation of Scripture, or according to the explanation which the prophets, Christ, and his apostles have incidentally given, and not merely according to human judgment or philosophy. We must unite or bring together the explanations found in different portions of Scripture, and not adhere slavishly to the simple letter of the commandments expressed in such a brief form. Nor is moral philosophy sufficient for a full interpretation of the Decalogue, inasmuch as it contains only a small portion of the law. This, too, is one great difference between philosophy and the doctrine delivered and taught in the Church. 2. The Decalogue demands in every commandment internal and external obedience in the understanding, will, heart, and actions of the life, perfect not only as to the parts but also as to the degrees of this obedience, or what is the same thing, it requires that we obey God perfectly, not only in the duties enjoined, but also in the degrees of these duties. For cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. The law is spiritual. Whosoever is angry with his brother, without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment, etc. Galatians 3 verse 10, Romans 7 verse 14, Matthew 5 verse 22. 3. The first commandment must be included in all the rest, or what is the same thing, the obedience which it requires must be the constraining and final cause of obedience to all the other precepts of the Decalogue, or else that which we do is not the worship of God, but hypocrisy. Yea, all the duties which are enjoined in the other commandments must be performed from and on account of the love of God, or because we love him above everything else and desire to glorify and praise him. 4. That we may form a correct judgment, or come to a proper understanding of every commandment, 
it is above all things necessary that we consider the design or end of each precept of the decalogue for the end of the law shows its meaning and from the object which god intends and wills to accomplish by each commandment we may easily and correctly judge concerning the means which lead to the attainment of this end this rule is also of great importance in the interpretation of human laws five the same virtue or the same work may for different ends and in different respects be enjoined in more than one commandment because the end for which anything is done gives character to the action and the same virtue may contribute to different objects as fortitude is a virtue of the sixth commandment and of the fifth at the same time because it is also required of the magistrate who is to undertake the defence of others the observance of this rule is important therefore that we may not give ourselves unnecessary trouble in distinguishing and comparing the different virtues six negative precepts are contained in those which are positive or affirmative and contrarywise for when the law enjoins anything it at the same time forbids that which is contrary thereto and when it prohibits anything it at the same time enjoins the opposite in this way the law enjoins the practice of virtue in forbidding vice and contrarywise for where any good is enjoined there the evil which is particularly opposed to this good is prohibited for the reason that the good cannot be put into practice without an omission of the evil at the same time and by evil we do not mean the doing of that which is evil but also the omission of that which is good seven care must be taken that we do not understand the commandments in too restricted a sense commandments which are particular must be comprehended in the general the general must be understood in the particular the cause in the effect and the correlative in the relative thus when murder or adultery is prohibited every injury and every lust which men may wickedly cherish is at the same time condemned so when the law enjoins chastity it at the same time enforces temperance without which there can be no chastity and when it requires subjection it at the same time recognizes its correlative viz the magistracy eight the commandments of the second table yield to those of the first so the commandments respecting ceremonial worship give place to those respecting moral worship objection but the second commandment is like unto the first answer there is here in this argument a fallacy in understanding that simply and absolutely which is declared to be similar only in certain respects the second is like unto the first not in every point of view but as we have explained in the former part of this work one in the kind of worship which it requires which is moral and always to be preferred to that which is ceremonial ceremonies should always give place to the duties of charity prescribed in the second table two it is like unto the first in the kind of punishment which is eternal and which is inflicted upon all those who violate either table three it is like unto the first in respect to the connection which exists between the love of god and our neighbour as between cause and effect by which it comes to pass that obedience cannot be rendered to one table of the decalogue whilst the other is disregarded god is not loved except our neighbour be loved neither is our neighbour truly loved when god is not loved if a man say i love god and hateth his neighbour he is a liar for he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen how can he love god whom he hath not seen one john four verse twenty this was also the design of christ's discourse in matthew twenty two verses thirty eight and thirty nine for the pharisees placed divine ceremonies and their own superstitions upon an equality with the obedience of the second table it was now for the correction of this error that christ declared that the second table is like unto the first that is as the obedience of the first is moral spiritual and most important so also is the obedience of the second and as the ceremonial enactments give place to the duties of the first table so do they in like manner unto the second there is however notwithstanding these points of similarity a very great difference between the precepts of the first and second table they differ one in their objects the object of the first table is god himself the object of the second is our neighbour by as much therefore as god is greater than our neighbour by so much the greater and more important is the obedience of the first table than the second and by as much as our neighbour is inferior to god by so much does the obedience of the second table fall under that of the first two they differ in respect to order or consequence the obedience of the first table is chief and supreme the obedience of the second falls beneath that of the first and is depending upon it nay it is only because we love god that we love our neighbour 
obedience to the first table is the cause of obedience to the second love to our neighbour grounds itself in love to god but not contrarywise so christ says if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters yea and his own life also he cannot be my disciple luke fourteen verse twenty six it is now on account of these two chief points of difference that the precepts of the second table may correctly be said to give place to those of the first but someone may still further object and say the duties which love to our neighbour requires do not yield to the ceremonies commanded by the first table according as it is said i will have mercy and not sacrifice hosea six verse six matthew twelve verse seven the duties of love to our neighbour constitute the obedience of the second table therefore this obedience does not yield to the obedience of the first table we may reply to this objection by denying the conclusion inasmuch as it contains more than follows legitimately from the premises all that follows legitimately is therefore the duties of the second table do not yield to the ceremonies commanded by the first which is true and does not contradict the rule here laid down which is to be understood of moral and ceremonial duties if therefore the necessity and safety of our neighbour require the omission of any ceremony this should rather be omitted than that the safety of our neighbour should be disregarded it is in this way that we are to understand the declaration i will have mercy and not sacrifice theses concerning the decalogue one the first table enjoins the duties which we owe to god the second the duties which we owe to our neighbour yet in such a way that the former are referred immediately the latter immediately to god two the first commandment seeing that it commands us to have no other god beside the true god the god revealed to us in the church comprehends chiefly the internal worship of god which has its seat in the mind will and heart three the principal parts of this worship are the true knowledge of god faith hope the love of god the fear of god humility and patience four god may be known by rational creatures in as far as he has been pleased to reveal himself to every one five there is a knowledge of god which is simply and absolutely perfect which is the knowledge that god has of himself the eternal father son and holy ghost know themselves and each other and understand wholly and perfectly their infinite essence as well as the mode of existence peculiar to each person for no one but a being of infinite understanding can have a perfect knowledge of that which is infinite there is also a knowledge of god which belongs to creatures according to which angels and men have a knowledge of the whole and perfect nature and majesty of god as being most simple but they do not know it wholly but merely in as far as god has revealed it unto them six the knowledge of god which creatures possess if it be compared with that which god has of himself may be said to be imperfect but if we consider the degrees of this knowledge we may view it as perfect or imperfect yet not absolutely but comparatively that is in respect to the higher and lower degrees of this knowledge that knowledge of god is perfect which the blessed angels and saints have in the heavenly world by which they have a most clear perception of god or at least as much as is necessary for the conformity of rational creatures with god that knowledge of god is imperfect which men possess in this life seven the knowledge of god which is imperfect or which we have in this life is of two kinds christian or theological and philosophical the former is obtained from the writings of the prophets and apostles the latter is known from the principles and general truths known by men naturally and from a contemplation of the works of god eight the knowledge of god which is theological or christian consists of two kinds the one spiritual or true living effectual and saving the other is according to the letter the former is that knowledge of god and of his will which the holy ghost kindles in our minds according to and by the word producing in the will and heart an inclination and desire more and more to know and do those things which god commands to be done that knowledge of god which is according to the letter is that which has been in the mind of man either from the creation or has been kindled subsequently in the mind by the holy ghost through the word which is however accompanied with no desire of conformity with the requirements of the divine law nine the knowledge of god which is spiritual and literal is in one respect immediate being produced by the influence of the holy ghost without ordinary means in another respect it is mediate being produced by the holy ghost through the doctrine which has been divinely revealed as heard read or meditated upon ten 
the way by which we ordinarily obtain a knowledge of God is that which God himself has prescribed unto us, which is by study and meditation upon his word. We should therefore in this way strive to obtain a knowledge of God, and not require or look for any extraordinary and immediate revelation, unless God of his own accord offer it unto us, and confirm it with certain and satisfactory evidences. 11. But although God has sufficiently declared unto us in his word, as much as he would have us know concerning himself, yet the demonstrations which nature furnishes respecting God are not superfluous, seeing that they reprove the wickedness of ungodly men, whilst they establish the faithful in piety and godliness, and are therefore commended by God himself in various places in the scriptures, and are to be considered by us. 12. Yet we must hold, respecting these demonstrations which nature furnishes of God, that they are indeed true and in harmony with his word, but that they are nevertheless not sufficient to a true knowledge of God. 13. Furthermore, although natural demonstrations teach nothing concerning God that is false, yet men, without the knowledge of God's word, obtain nothing from them except false notions and conceptions of God, both because these demonstrations do not contain as much as is delivered in his word, and also because even those things which may be understood naturally, men nevertheless on account of innate corruption and blindness receive and interpret falsely, and so corrupt it in various ways. 14. Ignorance of these things which God will have known by us concerning himself, revealed to the church in his word and works both of creation and redemption, is therefore here condemned in the first commandment of the Decalogue. So likewise, there is a condemnation of the errors of those who imagine that there is no God, as the Epicureans, or that there are many gods, as do the heathens, the Manichaeans, and those who offer prayers to the angels, the spirits of the departed or other creatures. The same thing may be said of the vain confidence of superstitious men who put their trust in creatures and in things different from God who has revealed himself in the church, as do the Jews, Mohammedans, Sibelians, Samosartinians, Arians, and such like, who do not acknowledge God to be the Eternal Father, with the Son and Holy Ghost co-eternal. Having now laid down certain general rules necessary for a proper understanding of the Decalogue, we shall now proceed to give the true sense of each commandment in particular. End of section 58section 59 of commentary on the heidelberg catechism by zacharias osinus translated by g w williard this librivox recording is in the public domain the first commandment question 94 what doth god enjoin in the first command answer that i as sincerely as i desire the salvation of my own soul avoid and free from all idolatry sorcery soothsaying superstition invocation of saints or any other creature and learn rightly to know the only true God, trust in Him alone, with humility and patience submit to Him, expect all good things from Him only, love, fear, and glorify Him with my whole heart, so that I renounce and forsake all creatures, rather than commit even the least thing contrary to His will. Exposition The first commandment consists of two parts, a preface and a precept. The words of the preface are, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. This preface belongs to the whole Decalogue. It describes and distinguishes God, the lawgiver, from all creatures, human legislators, and false deities, and contains three reasons why the obedience of the first and following commandments should be performed to God. The first is because God declares himself to be Jehovah, by which he distinguishes himself, the true God, from all creatures, that he may show that he has the supreme right and authority to rule. I, said he, whom thou hearest speaking, and announcing the law unto thee, I am Jehovah, the true God, who exists of and by himself, giving life and being to all things, and having therefore supreme authority to govern and rule all things, the creator of all things, being eternal and almighty, the author and preserver of all good things. Therefore thou shalt obey me. 2. He says that he is the God of his people, that he might thus, by the promise of his bountifulness, constrain us the more effectually to render obedience to him. God is indeed the God of all creatures by creation, preservation, and government, but he is the God of his church by the special manifestation and communication which he has made of himself, for he is properly the God of those whom he loves and delights in above all others. 
It is for this reason that David calls that nation happy, whose God is the Lord, saying, Blessed is the nation, whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Psalm 33, verse 12. God is now our God, when we acknowledge him to be such an one as he has revealed himself in his word, viz. as one who directs and devotes his power, justice, wisdom, and mercy to our salvation, and who offers with singular love to be gracious to us in his Son. 3. He adds, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, that he might, by bringing them to recollect the recent and wonderful deliverance wrought in their behalf, show and admonish them that they were bound to render gratitude and obedience to him. It is as if he would say, I am he who is thy God, I have manifested myself to thee, and drawn thee to myself by such singular benefits. This has respect to us as well as to the Jews, because by the mention of this one deliverance, so wonderful in its nature, there is figuratively comprehended all the deliverances of the church, and amongst them that which has been accomplished by Christ, of which the deliverance from Egyptian bondage was a type. Hence, when God in this preface declares that he is Jehovah, the deliverer of the church, he opposes himself to all creatures and idols, and challenges for himself universal obedience, honour, and worship. There have been some who have considered this preface as the first commandment, and have taken the words, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, as the second commandment. But it is plain that the words, I am the Lord thy God, etc., are not the words of one commanding anything, but of one affirming something with reference to himself. As to the words, however, which follow, saying, Thou shalt have, etc., they evidently have the form of a commandment. The first commandment, then, is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The end of this commandment is the immediate internal worship of God, which is, that we acknowledge the only true God revealed in the church, and render unto him with all our heart, soul, and mind such honour as is due him. This commandment, moreover, is negative in such a way that it contains in it an affirmative, Thou shalt have no other gods, but thou shalt regard me, that Jehovah revealed in the church, as thy God alone. To have God is to know and acknowledge that he is God, that he is one, that he is such an one as he has revealed himself in the church, and that he is also such a God to us. Then it is to trust him alone with the greatest humility and patience, to submit ourselves to him with fear and reverence, to love him and to expect all good things from him alone. It is in these things that the obedience of this commandment consists, whose parts are the virtues of which we shall presently speak. Another God is any and everything to which we may attribute the properties, attributes, and works of the true God, even though the thing itself does not possess them, and even though they are inconsistent with its nature. To have other gods is not to have the true God, which is to have no God or many gods or another God besides him that has been revealed unto us, or not to acknowledge God to be unto us such as he has made himself known to be, or not to trust in him not to submit ourselves to him in true humility and patience, not to expect all good things from him alone, and not to love or revere him. The different parts of this impiety constitute those vices which are the opposite of the virtues of which we shall speak in the exposition of this commandment. Before me, or in my sight, as if he would say, Thou shalt have no other gods, not only in thy words and actions in the sight of men, but thou shalt have none beside me in the secret chamber of thy heart, for nothing is concealed from my view. I am the searcher of hearts and the trier of the reins of the children of men, and all things are naked and open to my view. The easiest method of explaining each commandment is to make a division of the obedience which each precept requires into the virtues that are peculiar to it as parts, and then take up and consider the vices which are opposed to these virtues. According to this method, the parts of the obedience required by the first commandment consist of seven in number, the knowledge of God, faith, hope, the love of God, the fear of God, humility, and patience. First, the knowledge of God includes such a conception of the being and character of God as agrees with the revelation he has been pleased to make of himself in his works and word, and to be moved and stirred by this knowledge to trust, love, fear, and worship this one true God, concerning which it is said, how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Romans 10, verse 14, John 17, verse 3. The vices opposed to this virtue are many, of which we may mention the following. 
one ignorance of god and of his will which is not to know concerning god or to doubt in reference to those things which we ought to know from the works of creation and the divine revelation which has been made unto us this ignorance is either innate by which we mean an ignorance of those things of which we have no knowledge and which we cannot understand on account of the depravity of our nature or it is a feigned and studied ignorance of those things which our conscience tells us should be inquired into but which we nevertheless do not seek to become acquainted with from any desire of knowing or obeying god it is said of both forms of this ignorance of god there is none that understandeth there is none that seeketh after god the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of god romans three verse eleven one corinthians two verse fourteen two errors or false notions of god as when some imagine that there is no god or that there are many gods as do heathen nations and the manichaeans or if they do not profess this in word they nevertheless in fact make many gods by ascribing to creature those properties which are peculiar to god alone as the papists do who make angels and the spirits of men which have departed this life gods inasmuch as to address any one in prayer is to attribute infinite wisdom and power to the person thus invoked hence paul declares that those who pray to creatures change the glory of the incorruptible god into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things they also change the truth of god into a lie whilst they worship and serve the creature more than the creator romans 1 verses 23 and 25 the angel of the lord forbade john to worship him assigning this reason i am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of jesus worship god etc revelation 19 verse 10 those in like manner entertain incorrect ideas of god and wander from him who acknowledge one god but not the true god who has made a revelation of himself in the gospel as the wiser philosophers the mohammedans etc the same thing may be said of those who profess that they know the true god but yet depart from him and worship instead of him an idol which they make for themselves because they imagine the true god other than he has made himself known in his word as do the jews the samosartinians the arians etc he that honoureth not the son honoureth not the father whosoever denieth the son the same hath not the father john five verse twenty three one john two verse twenty three three magic sorcery and soothsaying everything of this kind is in direct opposition to a proper knowledge of god for it consists in a covenant or agreement entered into with the devil the enemy of god accompanied with certain words or ceremonies by the repeating or doing of which they shall receive things promised of the devil and these such as should be sought and received from god alone as that by the help and assistance of the devil they shall know and accomplish things not necessary with a view either to gratify their wicked lusts or to make a display or for the purpose of obtaining the commodities of life magus is a persian word signifying a philosopher or teacher men feeling their own ignorance called in the assistance of satan it was by this means that the term came into reproach so that magic which we call tsarban began to be used in the place of it enchantments belong to magic and consist in the use of certain words and ceremonies according to an agreement entered into with the devil according to which he affects what the enchanters ask at his hands when the words and signs have been gone through with there is no efficacy or power in the words and ceremonies which are used but the devil himself accomplishes what he has promised with the design that these persons may fall from god to himself and that they may worship him instead of god the scriptures now do not only condemn magicians and enchanters themselves but all those who countenance them by seeking their direction and assistance for god includes both in his law when he says the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards i will set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people there shall not be found among you a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer for all that do these things are an abomination unto the lord etc leviticus twenty verse six deuteronomy eighteen verses eleven and twelve four superstition this is to attribute effects to certain things or to particular signs and words which do not depend upon any physical or political causes nor upon the word of god and which would not take place were it not for the devil and other causes besides those which are supposed and although it may not include any covenant with the devil yet it is nevertheless idolatry 
There is included in this vice, soothsaying, special attention to and interpretation of dreams, divinations, with the signs and predictions of diviners and wizards, all of which the scriptures condemn in the most expressed terms. 5. All confidence reposed in creatures, which is evidently opposed to a correct knowledge of God, since he who places his trust in creatures makes for himself many gods. Hence God expressly condemns in his word all those who repose their confidence either in men, or in power and riches, or in any created object. Avarice or covetousness is included in this vice and condemned. 6. Idolatry, which is defined in the 95th question of the Catechism. There are two forms or species of idolatry. One is when another beside the true God is professedly worshipped, or when that is worshipped for God which is no God. The first is the more apparent and gross form of idolatry, and belongs properly to this first commandment. The other form of idolatry is when we do not professedly worship another God, but err in the kind of worship we render unto him, or when the true God is worshipped in a manner different from that which he has prescribed in the second commandment, and in various other portions of his word. This species of idolatry is more subtle and refined, and is condemned in the second commandment. Those who worship God in statues and images are idolaters, notwithstanding they deny that they worship any other being beside the true God, for they imagine God to be such an one as will be worshipped in images, and so change the will of God, which, being done, God himself no longer remains the same. 7. Contempt of God, which is to have a correct knowledge of God without being moved and excited thereby to love and worship him. Or it is to have a knowledge of the true God revealed in the church, and yet not to be led by it to love, worship, fear, and confide in him. The knowledge of the true God is not of itself sufficient. It must also be accompanied with suitable affections, or else the devils and the Gentiles would likewise have a true knowledge of God, which the apostle denies when he says, they are without excuse, because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, etc. Romans 1, verses 20 and 21. Second, faith is a firm persuasion by which we assent to everything which God has revealed to us in his word, and by which we rest fully assured that the promise of the free mercy of God extends to us for Christ's sake, and is also an assured confidence by which we receive this benefit of God and rest upon it, which confidence the Holy Ghost works by the gospel in the minds and hearts of the elect, producing in them delight in God, prayer and obedience according to all the commandments of God. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. 2 Chronicles 20 verse 20. There is opposed to faith on the side of want, one, unbelief, which includes a rejection of what is heard and known respecting God, two, doubt, which is neither firmly to assent to the doctrine concerning God, nor yet wholly to reject it, but consists in wavering and vacillating, so as now to incline a little this way and then a little that way. 3. Diffidence or distrust. This does not apply to itself the knowledge which it has of God and his promises, but, through fear of being forsaken of God, flies from duty and seeks protection out of God. It is said in reference to all these things, He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. John 5 verse 10 4. Hypocritical and temporary faith, resulting from a knowledge of this doctrine, but it does not apply to itself with full confidence the divine promise, and is also without regeneration, on account of which it is soon overcome by the force of temptation and other causes, and so casts away again the profession of piety which is made. He that received the seed into strong places, the same he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it, yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. Then Simon himself believed also, etc. Matthew 13, verse 20, Luke 8, verse 13, Acts 8, verse 13. Those things, on the other hand, which are opposed to faith on the side of excess, include 1. Tempting God, which consists in departing from the word and order of God, and so to presume upon or to make trial of his truth and power, and to provoke him to anger, proudly and presumptuously by unbelief or distrust or contempt of God, and by a vain confidence and conceit of our own wisdom, righteousness, power, and glory. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? 
Matthew 4, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 9 and 22. 2. Carnal security, which is to live without any thought of God and His will, or of our own infirmity and danger, without acknowledging and deploring our sinfulness, and without the fear of God, and yet to expect and hope at the same time for deliverance from punishment and the wrath of God. This state of carnal security is often spoken of and condemned in the Holy Scriptures, as when it is said, As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, verses 37 to 40. Third, hope. This is a sure and certain expectation of eternal life, to be given freely for the sake of Christ, with the expectation of a mitigation of present evils, with a deliverance from them, according to the counsel and will of God. Concerning this it is said, Be sober and hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hope maketh not ashamed. 1 Peter 1 verse 13, Romans 5 verse 5. Hope springs from faith, because he who has the assurance that he now enjoys the good will of God may be certain of it also in time to come, inasmuch as God is unchangeable. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Romans 11 verse 29. These two graces, however, are not the same. Faith embraces the present benefits of God and His will towards us, whilst hope includes and has respect to the fruits of the present and unchangeable good will of God, which are still future. Hence it is said, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Hebrews 11 verse 1, Romans 8 verse 24. That which is opposed to hope, as it respects the want thereof, is one, despair, which is to regard one's sins as being greater than the merits of the Son of God, and therefore not to accept of the mercy of God offered in His Son, our Mediator, and so not to look for the benefits promised to the faithful, but to be tormented by a sense of the dreadful wrath of God, and by the fear of being cast into everlasting punishment, and so to dread the mention of the name of God, and to hate Him as cruel and tyrannical. It was under a sense of despair that Cain exclaimed, My sin is greater than can be pardoned. Genesis 4 verse 13. Paul also exhorts in view of this, not to sorrow as those who have no hope. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13, Romans 5 verse 20. 2. Doubt in reference to future benefits, such as eternal life defense and deliverance from temptations, and final perseverance, which are all promised in the word of God. As it regards the opposite side of hope, or that which is opposed thereto by reason of excess, we may mention of carnal security, of which we have just given a definition. And as carnal security is everywhere condemned in the word of God, so spiritual security is everywhere commended and required in all the godly, this spiritual security assures us of the grace of God against all the reproofs and accusations of conscience, and is nothing else than faith and hope joined with true repentance, which does not fear being deserted and rejected of God, because it is fully persuaded that His will and favour are unchangeable. Hence it is said in reference to this, If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Romans 8, verse 31 and 32. Fourth, the love of God consists in acknowledging Him to be good and merciful in the highest degree, and that not only in Himself but also towards us, and therefore to love Him supremely, to desire more earnestly to be united and conformed to Him, and to have His will accomplished in us, than to enjoy all things beside, and to be willing to suffer the loss of all things which we have, sooner than be deprived of His favour. Or, it is from a knowledge of the infinite goodness of God, so to love Him, that we would rather suffer the loss of all things than to be deprived of communion with Him, or offend Him in anything. True love comprehends two things, first a desire of the safety and preservation of that which we love, and secondly a desire to be united with the object of our love, or to have it united to us. In reference to this it is said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. 
If any man come to me, and hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, Luke 14, verse 26. There is opposed to the love of God on the side of want, one, a rejection of the love of God, or a contempt and hatred of God, which is to flee from God, who accuses and punishes the wicked for their sins, and to indulge enmity towards him, arising from the aversion which our nature has to God and his justice, and the propensity which it has to sin. It is said of this sin, the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Romans 7 verse 7. 2. An inordinate love of self and of other creatures, which is to prefer our own lusts, pleasures, life, honour, and other things to God, and his will and glory, and to disregard and offend him, rather than to suffer the loss of those things which we love. Whosoever loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, verse 37. 3. A feigned, hypocritical love of God. In regard to this virtue there can be no excess, for the reason that we can never love God as strongly as we ought. Fifth, the fear of God is to acknowledge his infinite wrath against sin, his power to punish it and to regard an offence against God, accompanied with aversion to him, the greatest evil, and for this reason to hate and detest sin, and to be willing to suffer all other things sooner than offend God in the smallest matter. Or it is an unwillingness to offend God, resulting from submission to God and a knowledge of his wisdom, power, justice, and the right which he has over all creatures. Thou shalt fear thy God, I am the Lord. Who would not fear thee, O King of nations? For to thee doth it appertain, forasmuch as among all the wise men of the nation and in all their kingdoms there is none like unto thee. Leviticus 19 verse 14, Jeremiah 10 verse 7. Objection. The highest good cannot be feared, because fear includes the shunning of evil. God is the highest good. Therefore, he cannot be feared. Answer. The highest good cannot be feared, in as far as it is such, but in this respect, as it is also something else. So God is feared, not as he is the highest good, for in this respect he is loved, but as he is just and able to punish, or he is feared in respect to the evil and punishment of destruction which he is able to inflict. The love and fear of God differ from each other in the following respects. 1. Love follows the good, even God, and desires to be united to them. Fear turns away from the evil, even the displeasure and wrath of God, and dreads a separation from him. Or we may express it thus. Love is unwilling to be deprived of the highest good, whilst fear dreads to offend the highest good. 2. Love arises from a knowledge of the goodness of God fear from a knowledge of the power and justice of God, and from the right which he has over all creatures. The fear of God which man had before the fall was different from that which is now in the regenerate in this life. The fear of God, as it was in man in his state of original holiness, or as it now is, and will be in the blessed angels and man in eternal life, is a strong aversion to sin, and to the punishment of sin, which, however, is without grief or pain, because they have neither sin in them, nor experience the punishment of it, and have the assurance that they never will sin or be punished of God. He will swallow up death in victory. The Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. Isaiah 25 verse 8. The fear of God, which is in the regenerate in this life, is an acknowledgment of sin, and the wrath of God, and a sincere sorrow, arising from a view of the sins we have committed, from the offence we have offered God by our sins, and from the miseries we and others endure in consequence of sin, accompanied with a fear of future sins and punishment, and an ardent desire to escape these evils, by reason of the knowledge of the mercy of God made known to us in Christ. It is said in reference to this fear, Dost not thou fear God? Fear him that is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Luke 23 verse 40, Matthew 10 verse 28. This fear is usually called filial fear because it is such as children cherish towards their parents, who are sorry on account of a father's anger and displeasure, and fear lest they should again offend him and be punished, and are nevertheless continually assured of the love and good will of the father towards them. Hence they love him and are more deeply grieved on account of the love which they cherish towards him whom they have offended. Thus it is said of Peter that he went out and wept bitterly. Matthew 26 verse 75 Servile fear, 
such as the slave has for his master, which consists in fleeing punishment without faith and without a desire and purpose of changing the life, being accompanied with despair, flight, and separation from God, such a servile fear differs greatly from that which is filial. One filial fear arises from confidence and love to God, that which is servile arises from a knowledge and conviction of sin, and from a sense of the judgment and displeasure of God. Two, filial fear does not turn away from God, but hates sin above everything else, and fears to offend God. Servile fear is a flight and hatred, not of sin, but of punishment and of the divine judgment, and so of God himself. Three, filial fear is connected with the certainty of salvation and of eternal life. Servile fear is a fear and expectation of eternal condemnation and rejection of God, and is great in proportion to the doubt and despair which it entertains of the grace and mercy of God. This is the fear of devils and wicked men, and is the commencement of eternal death, which the ungodly experience already in this life. I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. The devils believe and tremble. Genesis 3 verse 10, James 2 verse 19. We must here observe that the love and fear of God are frequently taken in the scriptures for the whole worship of God, or for universal obedience to all the commandments of God. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Now the end of the commandment is charity, out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. 1 John 5 verse 2, 1 Timothy 1 verse 5, Proverbs 1 verse 7. The reason of this arises from the fact that the love and fear of God constitute the cause of our entire obedience inasmuch as they spring from faith and hope. For those who truly love and fear God will not willingly offend Him in anything, but will endeavor to do whatever will be pleasing to Him. There is opposed to the fear of God on the side of want, profanity, carnal security, and contempt of God, and on the side of excess, servile fear and despair, of which we have already spoken. Sixth, humility is to acknowledge that all the good which is in us and done by us does not proceed from any worthiness or excellency which we possess, but from the free goodness of God, and so by an acknowledgment of the divine majesty and our own weakness and unworthiness to submit ourselves to God, to ascribe the glory of all the good which is in us to him alone, and so to fear God, to acknowledge and deplore our imperfections and faults, and not to desire any higher position for ourselves than that which God has assigned to us, nor to be dissatisfied with our gifts, but by the help of God to remain contented and satisfied with our calling and position in life, and not to despise others who are placed in more desirable situations than ourselves, nor to hinder them in the discharge of their duty, but to acknowledge that others are and may also become profitable instruments of God, and therefore to attribute and yield to them willingly the place and honour due them, and not to attribute to ourselves or attempt that which it is not in our power to accomplish, nor claim for ourselves a higher degree of excellence than others possess, but to be contented with the gifts and position which God has assigned us, and so to devote all our gifts and endeavours to the glory of God and the salvation of our fellow men, even of those who are of the lower and more unworthy class, and not to murmur against God if our hopes are disappointed, or we are despised, but in all things to attribute to God the praise of wisdom and righteousness, who maketh thee to differ from another, and what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory, as if thou hadst not received it? God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7, 1 Peter 5 verse 5, Matthew 18 verse 4, Philippians 2 verse 3. The opposite of humility as it respects the want of this virtue is pride or arrogance. Pride consists in attributing the gifts which we possess not to God but to our own worthiness and natural powers, and so includes an admiration of self and our gifts. He who is possessed of pride does not fear God, neither does he acknowledge or deplore his imperfections. He is continually aspiring after a more elevated position and calling in life, and attributes to himself, not in the strength of God, but in that of his own powers, what he does not possess attempts things beyond his strength and foreign to his calling, despises those who are above him in life, 
yields to none but desires to go before and excel others and directs his gifts and counsels to his own praise and glory is displeased with god and man and frets and speaks against god when his desires and projects are not realized and even accuses god of error and injustice when the divine arrangements do not fall in with the opinions and wishes of men or to express it more briefly we may say that pride consists in an admiration of self and of one's own gifts and attainments attributing these gifts to itself attempting things that do not properly fall within its sphere and fretting against god when disappointed in the gratification of its own wishes and desires of this vice it is said god resisteth the proud every one that is proud in heart is an abomination to the lord one peter five verse five proverbs sixteen verse five a feigned modesty or humility is the opposite of this virtue as it respects the other extreme this affected modesty consists in courting the praise of humility by denying those things which any one in his own mind attributes to himself whether he really possesses them or not and by refusing those things which he desires and endeavours to obtain secretly moreover when ye fast be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast verily i say unto you they have their reward matthew six verse sixteen aristotle terms it affected niceness as though he would call it a feigned fastidiousness some translate the words used by aristotle vainglorious dissemblers the words of aristotle ethics book four chapter seven may be rendered thus quote, those who dissemble in things that are small and manifest are called skilful dissemblers and are generally despised and sometimes it consists in pride as the wearing of a lacedaemonian attire End quote. this counterfeit humility is therefore a pride that is twofold seventh patience consists in obeying god and submitting to him under the various evils and adversities which he sends upon us and desires us to endure arising from a knowledge of the wisdom providence justness and goodness of god does not murmur against god on account of the sufferings to which these evils expose us and does nothing contrary to his commands but in the midst of our sufferings retains confidence and hope in god that he will afford us his grace and help seeks deliverance from god and by this knowledge and confidence mitigates the griefs and sufferings to which we are exposed or we may define it more briefly thus patience is to obey god in submissively enduring the various evils which he sends upon us from a knowledge of the divine majesty and from an assurance of god's assistance and deliverance according as it is said rest in the lord and wait patiently for him wait on the lord and keep his way and he shall exalt thee psalm thirty seven verses seven and thirty four humility and patience belong to the first commandment not only because they are parts of that internal obedience which god requires us to render immediately to him but also because they follow or grow out of the true knowledge confidence love and fear of god as necessary effects the opposite of patience on the side of want is impatience which is an unwillingness arising from an ignorance and distrust of the divine wisdom providence justice and goodness to obey god by enduring the evils and adversities which he requires us to suffer and to speak against god on account of the sufferings to which we are subject or to violate his commands and not to seek or expect help and deliverance from god and so not to assuage or moderate our grief by the knowledge and assurance which we have of the divine will but to indulge in it and being broken thereby to be driven to despair saul and judas are examples of this impatience job also gave evidence of it in the complaints which he uttered in his distress which may also be true of the godly in their sufferings thoughtlessness or rashness is the opposite of patience on the side of excess and consists in rushing unnecessarily into danger from imprudence ignorance or inconsiderateness as it respects the danger or our own calling and the will of god or from a vain and presumptuous confidence he who loves danger will perish in it we may here remark that often in this and other commandments the same vices are opposed to many and different virtues so in this commandment carnal security stands opposed to faith hope and the fear of god tempting god is opposed to hope the love of god humility and patience whilst idolatry is utterly at variance with a true knowledge of god and faith 
the same may be seen and should be observed in the virtues and vices of other commandments. End of section 59. Section 60 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Second Commandment. 35th Lord's Day. Question 96. What does God require in the Second Command? Answer. That we in no wise represent God by images, nor worship Him in any other way than He has commanded in His Word. Exposition. Two things are comprehended in this commandment, the commandment itself and an exhortation to obedience. The end or design of this commandment is that the true God, who in the first precept commanded that he alone should be worshipped, be worshipped under a proper form, or with such worship as is right and proper, that intelligent creatures should pay unto him, such as is pleasing to him, and not with such worship as that which is according to the imagination and device of man. Or, we may say that the design of this commandment is that the worship of God as prescribed be preserved pure and uncorrupted and not be violated by any form of superstitious worship. The true worship of God is therefore here enjoyed and a rule at the same time given that we sacredly and conscientiously keep ourselves within the bounds which God has prescribed and that we do not add anything to that worship which has been divinely instituted or corrupted in any part, even the most unimportant which the scriptures also expressly enjoin in many other places. The true worship of God now consists in every internal or external work commanded by God, done in faith, which rests fully assured that both the person and work please God, for the mediator's sake and with the design that we may glorify God thereby. To worship God truly is to worship Him in the manner which He Himself has prescribed in His word. This commandment forbids, on the other hand, every form of will-worship, or such as is false, requiring that we neither regard or worship images and creatures for God, nor represent the true God by any image or figure, nor worship Him at or by images, or with any other kind of worship which He Himself has not prescribed. For when God condemns the principal, the grossest and most palpable forms of false worship, which is that of worshipping him at or by images, it is plainly manifest that he also condemns at the same time all other forms of false worship, inasmuch as they all grow out of this. He forbids this most shocking kind of idolatry, not that he would overlook or exclude other forms of worship opposed to that which he has prescribed, but because this is the root, the foundation of all the rest. Hence all kinds of worship not instituted by God but by men, as well as those which contain the same reason why they should be prohibited, are forbidden in this precept of the Decalogue. All those things, therefore, which are opposed to the true worship of God are contrary to this second commandment, such as 1. Idolatry, which consists in a false or superstitious worship of God. There are, as we have already remarked, two principal kinds of idolatry, the one is more gross and palpable, as when worship is paid to a false god, which is the case when, instead of, or beside the true god, such worship as that which is due to him alone is given to some thing or object, whether imaginary or real. This form of idolatry is particularly forbidden in the first commandment, and also partly in the third. The other species of idolatry is more subtle and refined, as when the true god is supposed to be worshipped, whilst the kind of worship which is paid unto him is false, which is the case when any one imagines that he is worshipping or honouring God by the performance of any work not prescribed by the divine law. This species of idolatry is more properly condemned in the second commandment, and is termed superstition, because it adds to the commandments of God the inventions of men. Those are called superstitious who corrupt the worship of God by their own inventions. This will-worship or superstition is condemned in every part of the word of God. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Beware lest any man spoil you, through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Let no man judge you in meat or in drink, etc., which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will-worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honour to the satisfying of the flesh. Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9, Colossians 2, verses 16, 22 and 23. We may now easily return an answer to the following objection. Idolatry is forbidden in the first commandment, 
In the second also, therefore, they constitute only one commandment. Answer. The first commandment forbids one form of idolatry, as when another god is worshipped. The second forbids another species of idolatry, as when the true god is worshipped differently from what he ought to be. Reply. But still, there is always idolatry and another god worshipped. Answer. There is indeed always an idol, but not always in the intention and profession of men. Hence those who sin against the second commandment sin also against the first, because those who worship God otherwise than he will be worshipped imagine another God, one differently affected from what the true God is. And in this way they do not worship God, but a figment of their own brain, which they persuade themselves is affected in this manner. 2. Hypocrisy, which consists in putting on the appearance of true piety and the worship of God, doing such external works as God has commanded, whether moral or ceremonial, without true faith and conversion, or inward obedience. The prophet Isaiah describes and condemns this sin in these words, Forasmuch as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honour me, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men, therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvellous work among this people, etc. Isaiah 29, verses 13 and 14. 3. Profanity. This includes a voluntary renunciation and contempt of all religion and of the worship of God, both internal and external, or of some portions of it, and is therefore not only in opposition to this commandment, but to the whole worship of God as prescribed in the first and second tables. There are some who object to what we have here said, and affirm in support of will-worship, that those passages which we have cited as condemning it speak only in reference to the ceremonies instituted by Moses, and of the unlawful commandments of men, such as constitute no part of the worship of God, and not of those precepts which have been sanctioned by the church and bishops, and which command nothing contrary to the word of God. But that this argument is false may be proven by certain declarations connected with those passages of Scripture to which we have referred, which likewise reject those human laws which, upon their own authority, prescribe anything in reference to divine worship which God has not commanded, although the thing itself is neither sinful nor forbidden by God. So Christ rejects the tradition which the Jews had in regard to washing their hands, because they associated with it the idea of divine worship, although it was not sinful in itself, saying, Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and platter, but within ye are full of extortion and excess, Matthew 15, verse 11, verses 23 and 25. The same thing may be said of celibacy, and of the distinction of meats and days, of which the Apostle Paul speaks, Romans 14, verse 6, 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 to 3, and which he calls doctrines of devils, although in themselves they are lawful to the godly, as he in other places teaches. Wherefore, those things also which are in themselves indifferent, that is neither commanded nor prohibited by God, if they are prescribed and done as the worship of God, or if it is supposed that God is honoured by our performing them, and dishonoured by neglecting them, it is plainly manifest that the Scriptures in these and similar places condemn them. Such works, therefore, as are indifferent, must be carefully distinguished from those in which we worship God. One, because to imagine a different worship of God from that which he has prescribed is to imagine another will of God, and so another God. And those who do this, as Aaron and Jeroboam formerly did, are no less guilty of idolatry than those who professedly worship another god, beside that Jehovah revealed in the church. Two, because by such a mingling of the true worship of God with that which is false, the true God is confounded with idols, which are honoured in the forms of worship invented by men. Three, because whatsoever is not of faith is sin, Romans 14 verse 23. But he who does anything in order that he may worship God by it, his conscience not knowing or doubting whether God will be worshipped in this way or not, does it not of faith, because he is ignorant whether his work pleases or displeases God, and so does not regard him, inasmuch as he presumes to do it, notwithstanding it is displeasing to him. But since those who defend the forms of worship invented by men also bring forward various declarations in which the scriptures require us to yield obedience to the commandments of men, and maintain that they have the same force and authority which divine precepts have, and so have the nature of divine worship. It is therefore necessary that we should here say something in reference to human precepts and their differences. Concerning human precepts and the authority of ecclesiastical traditions, 
There are four classes of things concerning which men give commandment. These are first divine precepts which God desires that men should propose unto themselves for their observance, not, however, in their own name, but by the authority of God himself as being the ministers and messengers, and not the authors of these precepts. It is in this way that the ministers of the gospel declare the doctrine revealed from heaven to the church, parents to their children, teachers to their pupils, that magistrates make known to their subjects the precepts of the Decalogue. Obedience to these commandments is, and is called, the worship of God, because they are not human but divine precepts, to which it is necessary to yield obedience, even though the authority or command of no creature accede thereto, yea, even if all creatures should enjoin the contrary. The scriptures speak of these commandments in the following places, My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. The man that will do presumptuously, and will not hearken unto the priest that standeth to minister there before the Lord thy God, or unto the judge, even that man shall. If he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Proverbs 6 verse 20, Deuteronomy 17 verse 12, Matthew 18 verse 17, see also Luke 10 verse 17, 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 2 and 8, Exodus 16 verse 8, Matthew 23 verses 2 and 3, Hebrews 13 verse 17, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 21, 2 Corinthians 13 verse 10, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 14. All these declarations teach that we ought to yield obedience to men as the ministers of God, in those things which properly belong to the ministry, but they do not grant the power to any one to institute new forms of divine worship at their own pleasure, according as it is written, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. As I besought thee, that thou mightest charge some, that they teach no other doctrine. Proverbs 30, verse 6, 1 Timothy 1, verse 3, See also 1 Timothy 6, verses 2 to 5, chapter 4, verse 11, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. Secondly, there are civil ordinances prescribed by men, which include the arrangement or fixing of those circumstances which are necessary and useful for securing the observance of the moral precepts of the second table. Such are the positive laws of magistrates, parents, teachers, masters, and all those who are placed in positions of authority. Obedience is the worship of God, in as far as it has respect to the general which is moral and commanded by God, and includes obedience to the magistrate and others in authority, but not in as far as it pertains to that which is special in regard to the action, or to the circumstances connected with it. In this respect it is not the worship of God, because only those works constitute divine worship which it is necessary to do on account of the commandment of God, even though no creature had given any precept respecting them. But these, were it not that the magistrate commands them, might be done or omitted without any offence to God. But yet these civil ordinances prescribed by magistrates and others bind the conscience, that is, they must necessarily be complied with, and cannot be disregarded without offence to God, even though it might be done without being connected with any public scandal, if we would keep our obedience pure and unsullied. So to bear or not to bear arms is not the worship of God, but when the magistrate commands or prohibits it, the obedience which is then rendered constitutes divine worship, and he who acts contrary to this command or prohibition sins against God, even though he might so conceal it as to offend no man, because the general, viz. obedience to the magistrate, which is the worship of God, is then violated. Yet these actions do not in themselves constitute the worship of God. It is only by accident, on account of the command of the magistrate. If this were not to intervene, obedience would not be violated. The following passages of Scripture are here in point. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Whosoever resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, etc. Romans 13, verses 1, 3, and 5, Titus 3, verse 1, also Ephesians 6, verse 1, Colossians 3, verses 22 and 23. Thirdly, there are ecclesiastical or ceremonial ordinances prescribed by men, which include the determinations of circumstances necessary or useful for the maintenance of the moral precepts of the first table, of which kind are the time, the place, the form and order of sermons, prayers, reading in the church, fasts, the manner of proceeding in the election of ministers, in collecting and distributing alms, and things of a similar nature, concerning which God has given no particular command. That which is general in regard to these laws is moral, 
as in the case of civil enactments, if they are only correctly and profitably made, and is therefore the worship of God. But as to the ceremonies themselves, which are here prescribed, they neither constitute the worship of God, nor bind men's consciences, nor is the observance of them necessary, except when a neglect of them would be the occasion of offence. So it is not the worship of God, but a thing indifferent, and not binding upon men's consciences to use this or that form of prayer, to pray at this or at that time, at this or at that hour, in this or in that place, standing or kneeling, to read and explain this or that text of scripture in the church, to eat or not to eat flesh, etc., nor does this power and authority to establish, abolish, or change these ordinances belong merely to the church, as she may think it best for her edification, but the consciences of particular individuals also retain this liberty, so that they may either omit or do these things differently without offending God, if no one take offence at it, that is, if they do it neither from contempt or neglect of the ministry, nor from wantonness or ambition, nor with a desire of contention or novelty, nor with an intention of offending the weak. And the reason is that these laws are observed properly when they are observed according to the intention and design of the lawmaker. The church, however, ought to see to it that such ordinances, as are established concerning things which are indifferent, be observed not out of regard to her authority or command, but only for the sake of observing order and avoiding offence. As long, therefore, as the order of the church is not violated and offence is not given, the conscience of every one ought to be left free. For it is sometimes necessary, not on account of the command of the church, or of the ministry, but for just causes to do, or to omit, things which are indifferent. We may here quote the language of Paul as in point, If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but the other, for why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I, by grace, be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? 1 Corinthians 10, verses 28 to 31. See also Acts 15 and 1 Corinthians 11. Objection. But if the edicts of magistrates bind the consciences of men, why do not the traditions of the church also? Answer. The cases are not the same. God has given to the magistracy the authority to frame civil laws, and has threatened to pour out his wrath upon all those who violate these laws, but he has given no such authority to the church, or to her ministers, but requires merely that their laws and ordinances be observed according to the rule of charity, that is, with a desire of avoiding offence, and not as if there were any necessity in the case, as though the conscience were bound thereby. The scriptures expressly teach this difference. You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them, but it shall not be so among you. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, let no man judge you in meat or in drink, or in respect of an holy day. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Matthew 20 verse 25, 1 Peter 5 verse 3, Colossians 2 verse 16, Galatians 5 verse 1. The reasons of this difference are evident. 1. Because there is a great difference between the civil magistrate, whose province it is to exercise authority over his subjects, and to compel such as are obstinate to yield obedience by corporal punishment, and the ministry of the church, to whom no such power is granted, but who are entrusted with the office of teaching men in reference to the will of God. 2. Because when ecclesiastical ordinances are violated without any offence being given thereby, there is no violation of the first table of the Decalogue, to which they ought to contribute, but, when civil enactments are violated, even though there may be no offence, there is a violation of the second table, inasmuch as this cannot occur without detracting something from the commonwealth, or giving some occasion of injury to it. To this it is replied, obedience ought rather to be rendered to that office which is the greater and more honourable, therefore those things which have been instituted by the ministers of the church bind more strongly the consciences of men than civil laws. We reply to the antecedent, that greater obedience is due to that office which is the more honourable in those things which belong properly to the office itself, but it is the proper office of the civil magistrate to make laws which are to be observed out of regard to the command itself, whilst it belongs properly to the ecclesiastical ministry to observe ceremonial precepts which shall be observed not on account of the command of men, but for the sake of avoiding offences. Fourthly, there are human enactments which are in opposition to the commands of God. 
These God forbids us to comply with, whether they may be enjoined by the civil magistrate or by the church and her ministry, according, as it is said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Why do ye transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Acts 5, verse 29, Matthew 15, verse 3. From what has now been said, we may easily answer the following objections. 1. God commands us to yield obedience to the enactments of men. Answer. God requires us to comply with 1. Such as are good and not opposed to his word. 2. Such as he himself has commanded by men, that worship may be thus paid unto him. 3. Such civil enactments as depend upon the authority of men, to which we render obedience not for the sake of divine worship, but for conscience' sake. 4. Such ecclesiastical ordinances as those which we observe, not for the sake of worship, nor for conscience' sake, but that we may avoid giving any offence. Objection 2. Those things which the Church commands under the influence of the Holy Spirit are divine ordinances having respect to the worship of God. But the Church, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, institutes ordinances which are good and profitable. Therefore these ordinances bind the consciences of men and have respect to the worship of God. Answer. That which is general in regard to the things which the Church prescribes under the influence of the Holy Spirit pertain to the worship of God. This comprehends the divine laws which require a proper regard to charity, avoiding offences, with the preservation of order and propriety in the Church. The ordinances or institutions which have respect to what is general, being prescribed by the Church under the influence of the Holy Spirit, are also divine, inasmuch as they form a part of those laws, the care and keeping of which God has committed to us in His Word. But the good prescriptions of the Church are human, or they are the prescriptions of men in as far as they particularly designate what is declared, rather than what is expounded generally in these divine laws. Hence those ordinances do not constitute the worship of God, which the Church by her own authority and in her own name advises, determines, and commands, even though she be directed by the influence of the Holy Spirit in choosing and determining them. For the Holy Spirit declares to the Church both what is profitable for the purpose of avoiding offences, and also that these things which are enjoined for the sake of avoiding offences are neither the worship of God nor necessary to be observed, except for the purpose of avoiding every occasion of offence, as appears from the following declarations of Holy Writ. I speak this by permission, and not of commandment. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 6 and 35. So Paul also forbids us to eat of things offered in sacrifice to idols, if by so doing we give offence to a weak brother. Under other circumstances he leaves every one free to act as he chooses. So the apostles also, when assembled in Jerusalem, commanded, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, abstinence from things strangled and from blood, and yet they granted liberty to the church to act with freedom in this matter, where no offence would follow. Objection 3. God is worshipped in those things which are done to his glory. Those things which the church decides upon are done to the glory of God. Therefore they also constitute the worship of God. Answer. Those things are indeed the worship of God which are done to his glory, and which he has commanded to this end, that we may declare our obedience to him by these works, but not those which contribute to the glory of God by an accident, that is, which lead sometimes to the performance of the things commanded by God on account of accidental causes, which, if they do not concur, God may still be honoured, as well by those who do these things as by those who omit them, if they only be done or omitted of faith. Objection 4. But certain of the saints have worshipped God with acceptance, without any express commandment of his. So Samuel offered sacrifices in Ramah, Elijah in Mount Carmel, Manoah in Zorah, etc. 1 Samuel 7 verse 17, 1 Kings 18 verse 19, Judges 13 verse 19. Therefore there are certain works which constitute the worship of God, although not expressly commanded by him. Answer. These examples establish nothing conclusively in reference to will worship, for, in the first place, as it respects these sacrifices, they were the worship of God, because they were works commanded by Him. And then, as it regards the place appointed for offering sacrifices, the saints of old were free before the erection of the temple. Samuel fixed upon the place where he lived, as the one in which he would offer sacrifices, this being the most convenient. And the prophets very well knew that the worship of God did not consist in the circumstance of place, in respect to which the godly were left free, while as yet the Ark of the Covenant had no fixed place. And then finally, as it respects the persons themselves who offered these sacrifices, they had extraordinary power conferred upon them, 
being prophets, as Samuel and Elijah were, and as it respects Manoah, the father of Samson, he either did not sacrifice himself, but delivered the sacrifice over to the angel, whom he supposed to be a prophet, to be offered up, or else he himself offered it, being commanded by the angel, so that nothing was done contrary to the law. So we may also easily return an answer to the other examples which are adduced by our opponents. Abel and Noah say they offered sacrifices, Genesis 4 and 8, but they did not do it without a command from God, for they offered their sacrifices in faith, as Paul affirms in Hebrews 11. Faith now cannot be without the word of God, but the Rechabites, say they, of whom we have an account in the 35th chapter of Jeremiah, abstained from the use of wine and from agriculture, according to the command of their father, Jonadab, and were commended by God. But Jonadab did not design to institute any new worship of God, but merely desired, by this civil command, to do away with drunkenness and such sins as accompany it. So it was not the kind of food and raiment which John the Baptist ate and wore that commended him to the divine favour, but his sobriety and temperance and worship of God. Nor was it the raiment made of sheep and goatskins, nor their wandering in mountains, dens, and caves that made the saints of old, Hebrews 11, approved before God, but their faith and patience in enduring afflictions and trials. Objection 5. Whatever is done of faith and is acceptable to God constitutes divine worship. The works which men perform voluntarily are done of faith and so please God, therefore they constitute his worship. Answer. The major proposition is particular. To say, moreover, that a thing pleases God is not a sufficient definition of divine worship, inasmuch as actions which are indifferent may also be done of faith and so please God, although in a manner different from what his worship properly so called pleases him. For this pleases God in such a way that the opposite of it displeases him and so cannot be done of faith whilst actions of indifference are approved of in such a way that their opposites may not be displeasing to God, and hence both may be done of faith, which rests assured that the work and person both please God. Thus far we have spoken merely of the command itself. The exhortation contained in this second commandment remains to be explained. Before proceeding to this, however, we shall first give an explanation of the doctrine respecting images, which belongs properly to this commandment, and is contained in the two following questions of the Catechism. Question 97. Are images, then, not at all to be made? Answer. God neither can nor may be represented by any means, but as to creatures, though they may be represented, yet God forbids us to make or have any resemblance of them, either in order to worship them or to serve God by them. Exposition. We may here remark that the words of the second commandment forbid two things. They first forbid us to make and to have images, saying, Thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven image, nor the likeness of anything, etc. Then they forbid us to worship images and likenesses with divine honour, saying, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. In speaking of the first thing which is here forbidden, we must inquire, Are all images and likenesses prohibited? And if not all, what, and in how far, are they lawful or unlawful? In speaking of the second thing forbidden by this commandment, we must inquire, Is all adoration or bowing to images forbidden? and can it by any means be defended. Concerning images and pictures in Christian churches, the things to be considered in connection with this subject may be comprehended under the following heads. First, whether and how far images are forbidden in churches by this commandment. Second, whether the worship of images can be defended. Third, why images are to be removed out of Christian churches. Fourth, how and by whom they are to be removed. The first and second of these propositions belong here, the third and fourth belong to the ninety-eighth question of the Catechism. First, whether and how far images are forbidden in churches by this commandment. The Hebrew words zelem and demona usually signify an image, pesel signifies a graven image, whilst chazeb signifies an idol or statue from chazab which signifies to trouble, to lament, to grieve because an idol disturbs and agitates the conscience. The Greeks express the word image by ikon, and by idolon they express any likeness, and especially that which men make unto themselves for the purpose of representing and worshipping God, be it a solid statue or a mere naked image or picture. Among the Latins, imago signified any likeness represented or painted. Statua signified a solid image, either graven or cast. Simulacrum signified the same thing, so also idolum borrowed from the Greek. 
the papists that they may defend with greater plausibility their worshipping of images make a distinction between idolum and simulacrum the latter they contend signifies the image of something really existing whilst the former is the image of something imaginary from which they conclude that idols and their worship are prohibited but not images that this distinction however is vain and of no force is apparent one from the etymology of both words according to which it appears that they do not differ any more than banis and artos both of which signify bread the only difference is that the one is a latin the other a greek root as for idolon which means a form is derived from the latin formando which means to form or fashion so simulacrum is derived from simulando which means to counterfeit according to the testimony of lactantius two the interpreters of the scriptures use both words indiscriminately for the septuagint everywhere translates the hebrew chezeb by idolon whilst the latin interpreters translated by simulacrum two both words are used indiscriminately by good and standard writers cicero in his first book de finibus uses these words in the same sense euripides calls the shades or ghosts of palladorus and achilles idolon which means an idol an idol is therefore not only an image of something imaginary but also of something real so simulacrum is also used for the image of something imaginary pliny for instance calls the idol of ceres an imaginary god simulacrum and vitruvius calls the image or idol of diana simulacrum hence the distinction which is made between these words is ungrounded so much concerning the words which express what we call an image we must now proceed to the question itself in regard to which we may remark that this commandment does not absolutely forbid us to make or to have images likenesses and statues because the art of painting sculpture casting and embroidery is reckoned among the gifts of god which are good and profitable to human life and god himself had certain images placed in the tabernacle exodus thirty one verse three chapter thirty five verse thirty and solomon had upon his throne images of lions and had figures of palm trees and cherubims carved upon the walls of the temple by the command of god one king six verse twenty three and twenty nine chapter ten verses nineteen and twenty the reason of this is plain and easy to be perceived inasmuch as writing and painting are profitable for reviving a recollection of something done for ornament and for the enjoyment of life the law does not therefore forbid the use of images but their abuse which takes place when images and pictures are made either for the purpose of representing or worshipping god or creatures hence all images and likenesses are not simply and wholly forbidden but only such as are unlawful among which we may include first all images or likenesses of god which are made for the purpose of representing or worshipping god that these are all positively forbidden in this commandment may be argued one from the design of this commandment which is the preservation of the worship of god in its purity two from the nature of god god is incorporeal and infinite it is impossible therefore that he should be expressed or represented by an image which is corporeal and finite without detracting from his divine majesty according as it is said who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with a span etc to whom then will ye liken god or what likeness will ye compare unto him to whom will ye liken me or shall i be equal saith the holy one who changed the glory of the incorruptible god into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things isaiah forty verses twelve eighteen and twenty five romans one verse twenty three three from the command of god take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the lord spake unto you in horeb out of the midst of the fire lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image the similitude of any figure the likeness of male or female the likeness of any beast that is etc deuteronomy four verses fifteen and sixteen for from the cause of this prohibition which is that these images do not only profit nothing but also injure men greatly being the occasion and cause of idolatry and punishment in short god ought not to be represented by any graven image because he does not will it nor can it be done nor would it profit anything if it were done this is a memorable saying which plutarch records of numa in his life in these words quote, numa forbade the romans to have images of any of the gods which had the form of man or beast nor was there in former times among this people any image of god either painted or graven for the first one hundred and seventy years although they had temples and sacred places which they had built yet there was no image or picture of god formed and that because it was regarded as a great crime to represent heavenly things by earthly 
inasmuch as a knowledge of God can only be attained by the mind, end quote. Damascenus writes, quote, that to attempt to represent God is a foolish and wicked affair, end quote, although he elsewhere evidently defends the worship of images. He is therefore condemned with other defenders of images in the seventh council, held by Constantine and his son Leo, which council decreed, among other things, that no images of Christ should be painted or graven, not even as it respects his human nature, because nothing but his humanity could be expressed by art, and those who make such images seem to establish again the error of Nestorius or Eutyches. Secondly, those images and likenesses of creatures are unlawful, which are set up in churches at the corners of the streets, and elsewhere for the worship of God, or for a perilous ornament. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, etc. Keep yourselves from idols. 1 John 5 verse 21 those images of creatures, however, may be lawful, which are made and kept away from the churches, which are without danger and appearance of idolatry, superstition, or offence, and which are for some political benefit, such as is historical or symbolical, or for some becoming ornament. The images of the lions upon the throne of Solomon, the image of Caesar stamped upon the coin, etc., were of this kind. Objection 1. Thou shalt make no graven image, therefore God forbids the art of sculpturing, Answer, he forbids the abuse which occurs when we would make a representation of God, and bind the worship of God to images. Objection 2. The holy scriptures attribute to God the different members of the human body, and thus declare his nature and properties. Therefore, it is also lawful to represent God by images. Answer, there is a difference between these figurative expressions used in reference to God and images, because in the former case there is always something connected with those expressions which guards us against being led astray into idolatry, nor is the worship of God ordinarily tied to those figurative expressions. But it is different in regard to images, for here there is no such safeguard, and it is easy for men to give adoration and worship to them. God himself, therefore, used those metaphors of himself figuratively, that he might help our infirmity, and permits us in speaking of him to use the same forms of expression, but he has never represented himself by images and pictures, nor does he desire us to use them for the purpose of representing him, but has, on the other hand, solemnly forbidden them. Objection 3. God formally manifested himself in bodily forms, therefore it is lawful for us to represent him by similar signs or forms. Answer. God did indeed do this for certain considerations, but he has forbidden us to do the same thing. Nor is it difficult to perceive the reason of this prohibition, God may manifest himself in any way in which he may please to do so, but it is not lawful for any creature to represent God by any sign which he himself has not commanded. The examples are therefore not the same. Furthermore, those forms in which God anciently manifested himself had the promise of his presence in them, and that he would hear those to whom he revealed himself in this way. But this cannot be said of those images which are representations of God without palpable idolatry. The saints of old, therefore, acted properly in adoring God at or in those forms as being present in a special manner in them, but to act thus in reference to images is wicked and idolatrous, seeing that it is done out of presumption and levity, without any divine command or promise. Lastly, those visible appearances in and through which God was pleased to reveal himself to his people of old, continued as long as God desired to make use of them, and as long as they did contribute to idolatry. But the images and pictures which men make in imitation of these ancient manifestations of God have not been devised for the purpose of revealing God, nor are they representations of those ancient manifestations of God, and are therefore the object and occasion of idolatry. A table of images according to their distinctions. Images are some natural, some artificial, of which some are graven, cast, or painted. These are distinguished by their matter, object, and end, and are either images of God, which are positively condemned in this commandment and throughout the whole scriptures, and that because they detract from the divine majesty and make an idol of God, or creatures, which are either lawful, which are not set up in churches, etc., which do not lead to idolatry, which are for civil purposes or ornaments, or unlawful, such as are set up in churches and lead to idolatry. Second, is all worshipping of images forbidden, or can this worship be defended? We return an answer to this question from the second part of this commandment, which positively forbids us to give divine worship or honour to images and pictures, including not only that which is given to creatures, but that also which is given to the true God. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. Objection 1. But we do not worship the images, say these advocates of images among the papists, but God, of whom they are signs, according to what the Council of Nicaea teaches, 
quote, that which the image exhibits is God, the image itself, however, is not God. Look thou upon the image, but worship in thy mind what thou seest therein, end quote. And according to the following sentiment expressed by Thomas, quote, when thou passest an image of Christ, always pay homage unto it, yet worship not the image, but that which it shadows forth, end quote. Answer 1. We deny that images are signs of God, for the reason that God cannot be truly represented by them, inasmuch as he is immense, and even though he could be represented in this way, yet he ought not, because he has forbidden us to make images representing him, and because it is in the power of no creature to institute signs by which he may be represented. This power belongs to God alone. 2. The cause which is here assigned is of no force, for not only is the worship of images the cause and form of idolatry, but even the worship of God himself, which is paid to images or creatures, is in contradiction to what he in his word requires. This is taught with sufficient clearness in the case of Aaron and Jeroboam, who had images of calves made. For although they said in both instances, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, etc., Tomorrow is a feast of the Lord, yet God abhorred and severely punished those who were engaged therein as being guilty of horrible idolatry. Exodus 32, verses 4 and 5, 1 Kings 12, verse 28. Hence, although those who worship images pretend to honor God in this way, yet it is not God but the devil that is worshipped, according to what Paul says of the Gentiles. The things which the Gentiles sacrifice to idols they sacrifice to devils and not to God. Notwithstanding, they also pretend to honor the name of God by these things. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 20 Objection 2. The honor of the sign is the honor of the thing signified. Images are signs of God, therefore the honor which is paid to images is also paid to God. Answer. Here again, the minor proposition must be denied, or else the major distinguished thus. The honor of the sign is the honor of the thing signified. Only in case the sign is a true sign, and has been instituted by him who has the power to do so, and in case that honour be given to the sign which the proper author commanded to be given. For it is not the will of him that honours, but of him that is honoured, that is the rule according to which we are to pay our respect. Wherefore, inasmuch as God has forbidden both that images should be made of him, and that he should be worshipped at images which are made for him, or for creatures, it is manifest that he is not honoured but disgraced, whenever it is attempted to worship him against his will, at and under images. But someone may perhaps say, the contempt which is cast upon the sign, even though it may not have been instituted at the command of God, falls back upon God himself. Therefore the honour also that is paid to the sign is given to God. Answer, we deny the consequence which is here deduced, because contrary results are attributed to things that are contrary only when the opposition of the things which are affirmed depends upon that according to which the subjects are opposed, but not when it depends upon something else, as here, when contempt of God follows that of the sign, be it divinely instituted or not, because an intention to depart from the commandment of God is sufficient to cast dishonour and contempt upon him. But the honour of God does not follow the honour of the sign, unless both the sign and the honour thereof be ordained of God, seeing that the intention to honour God is not of itself sufficient to constitute acceptable worship, unless the manner also be such as God himself has prescribed. Objection 3. But, if it is lawful to honour the images and monuments of renowned and well-deserving men, it is much more lawful to honour the images of blessed angels and saints. Answer, it is lawful to honour the monuments of great and distinguished men with such respect as that which constitutes a grateful and becoming remembrance of them and their deeds, which they have left behind them as their own monuments, in case it be directed to that use which they themselves would desire it, and, on the other hand, it would be lawful to demolish them if necessity demanded such a thing, provided it were done without any wish or desire to cast any disrespect upon those whose monuments they are. But it is by no means lawful to attribute divine worship to them, such as that which the papists pay to their idols, whether it be under the name of worship or service. Again, the monuments of great and good men should be such as do not lead to idolatry, for if this should be the case we must not honour them, but utterly abolish them, after the example of Hezekiah who broke in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made, 2 Kings 18 verse 4, when it was turned into idolatry, although it had been formerly preserved as a monument of the goodness of God, which he had showed to the children of Israel in the wilderness, when they were bitten of fiery serpents. Question 98. But may not images be tolerated in the churches as books to the laity? Answer, no, for we must not pretend to be wiser than God, who will have his people taught not by dumb images, but by the lively preaching of his word. Exposition 
This is the objection of those who grant, indeed, that images and statues of God and the saints are not to be worshipped, but maintain that they should be tolerated in the churches of Christians as books to the laity, and for other causes, if only they be not worshipped. We must, however, maintain the opposite, which is that images and likenesses of God or of the saints are not to be tolerated in Christian churches, but abolished and removed from the sight of men, whether they be worshipped or not. Third, why images and pictures are not to be tolerated in churches. The reasons on account of which images and statues are not to be tolerated in our churches, but removed, are principally these— one, because it is contrary to the express command of God, that images should be made and set up in churches. Thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven image, nor the likeness of anything that is, etc., seeing now that God will not allow images to be made by which he is to be represented, or at which he is to be worshipped. He, in like manner, will not permit those which are made by others to be tolerated or retained. Two, because they have been the occasion and means of horrible idolatry in the papal church, three, because God expressly commanded that idols should be removed, as well as every corruption of the true doctrine and worship of God, that he may in this way declare his displeasure against idolatry. Exodus 33, verse 24, chapter 34, verse 13, Numbers 33, verse 52. Four, for our confession of the sincere worship and our hatred to idolatry, which confession consists not only in words, but also in outward actions, appearance, and signs, ye shall destroy their altars, and break down their images, and cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art an holy people to the Lord thy God. Little children, keep yourselves from idols, viz. in heart, in profession, and signs. Deuteronomy 7, verse 5, 1 John 5, verse 21. 5. Because the scriptures speak in commendation of certain pious kings, such as Asa, Jehu, Hezekiah, Josiah, etc., for having destroyed the images and idols which had been set up. 1 Kings 15, verse 13, 2 Kings 10, verse 30, chapter 18, verse 4, chapter 23, verse 24. 6. For the purpose of avoiding offence and preventing superstition and idolatry, so that, by not tolerating ancient images or substituting new ones, the church and ignorant souls may be preserved from the danger and sin which formerly fell upon our forefathers for countenancing idols. 7. That the enemies of the church may not, by this spectacle, which looks so very much like idolatry, be driven farther from a profession of the truth, and be led to cast reproach upon it. God speaks of this in the following language, Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. Judges 2 verse 3. So the Jews, when they see statues and images in the churches of those who profess Christianity, are so much offended at the sight that they are led to hate more inveterately the Christian religion. 8. Lastly, images have never resulted in any good to those who have had them. The people of God, the Jews, were for the most part seduced by them, as sacred history abundantly testifies, especially in the books of the judges, kings, and prophets. We are therefore prone by nature to the sin of idolatry, which is followed by those dreadful punishments which God in many instances threatened through Moses. I will destroy your high places, and cut down your images, and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. Leviticus 26 verse 30. The angel of the Lord, in reproving the Israelites, because they had made a league with the Canaanites, said, Wherefore I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. Judges 2 verse 3. For these reasons, therefore, images and statues are not to be tolerated in the churches of those who profess Christianity, but they must be removed, even though they be not adored. Fourth, how and by whom are images to be abolished? Two things must be carefully observed in removing images. One, that the doctrine concerning the true worship of God be preached before the idols and images are removed. It was in this way that Josiah proceeded. He first commanded the law of God to be read to all the people, and then proceeded to remove and destroy the images which had been set up. A change in external matters, without showing and explaining the causes on account of which it is effected, will either lead to hypocrisy, or else it will excite and alienate the minds of the people from those who effect this change. Let the true doctrine of God's word therefore be preached, and the idols will fall to the ground of their own accord. 2. Images and their altars, and all that pertains to idolatry, must be removed, not by private individuals, but by public authority, whether of the magistrates or of the people, if they have the sovereign power, and in those places in which the church holds the chief sway. 
It was in this way that God commanded the children of Israel to proceed in reference to this matter, and so we read that they and their pious kings acted. Paul, on the other hand, being only a private individual, seeing and disapproving of the idols of the Athenians, Ephesians, and others, did not himself break them down, nor did he exhort Christians to do so, but to flee from and avoid them. The reason why the apostle acted thus arose, no doubt, from the fact that he himself was no magistrate, and that the church had not in those places the chief sway. He therefore gives this rule, What have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. 1 Corinthians 5 verses 12 and 13. Objection 1. But books are retained in the churches and are useful to the laity. Images and statues are books to the laity, therefore they may be retained in the churches with profit. Answer. Such books only are useful to laymen which God has delivered to them, but God has prohibited images. We also deny the minor proposition, for the prophets teach very differently. What profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it, the molten image and a teacher of lies? The idols have spoken vanity. Habakkuk 2 verse 18, Zechariah 10 verse 2. We may deduce this argument from what has now been said. We ought not to speak vain things of God, nor to lie of him, either in word or deed. But wood or graven images are lies of God, seeing that they cannot represent God. Yea, by as much as they depart from God, and at the same lead us from him, by so much is their figure unlike God, and, as a matter of consequence, they bring it to pass that we lie concerning God. If we would not therefore lie, it is necessary that we should neither make nor have graven images by which to represent God. For, as Jeremiah saith, the stock is a doctrine of vanities. Jeremiah 10 verse 8. In this sense now we grant that images and pictures are books for the laity, viz. that they partly teach and signify what is not true of God, and partly because by reverencing the thing signified, and the place, when they stand in the church and elsewhere, they easily lead some to superstition and teach the people idolatry, as experience abundantly testifies. We also deny the consequence of the above syllogism, because, although images might teach the unlearned, yet it does not follow from this that they should be retained in the churches as books that are useful, for God will have his people taught not by dumb images, but by the lively preaching of his word. Neither does faith come from the sight of images, but by the hearing of the word of God. Objection 2. The command which respects the abolishing of images is ceremonial, therefore it does not pertain to Christians, but only to Jews. Answer. We deny the antecedent, for it is no ceremonial requirement to abolish those things which are the instruments, occasions, and signs of idolatry nor are the causes on account of which this commandment was formerly given altered, so that the glory of God should not be vindicated against idolaters and enemies of the church, and that he should be tempted by our giving to those who are weak and ignorant occasions and inducements to superstition and idolatry, to which they are naturally inclined. This commandment, therefore, which forbids our not having images, is moral and of perpetual force. Objection 3. Solomon, by the command of God, placed in the temple images of cherubim, lions, oxen, palm trees, etc. Therefore images may also be tolerated in the church. Answer. The cases are not similar. 1. The figures of the various things and living creatures, such as oxen, lions, palm trees, cherubims, and such like, which Solomon caused to be placed in the temple, were ordered by the special command of God. The case, however, is different with images which are set up in the church at the present day. 2. The images which Solomon had placed in the temple were of such a character that they could not easily lead to superstitious practices, but images of God and the saints may not only lead to superstition, but, alas, they have hitherto been the cause of most shameful idolatry in the papal church. 3. The reason on account of which God commanded Solomon to have the images here alluded to in the temple was that they might be types of spiritual things, but this cause is now done away with in Christ. Hence images which are now set up in the churches cannot be defended by this example, and it becomes us to obey the general commandment, which forbids us to have and to set up in such places images which are offensive either to the members or the enemies of the church. Objection 4. But pictures and images are not worshipped in the reformed churches, therefore they may be tolerated. Answer 1. God does not only forbid images to be worshipped, but also forbids them from being made, and to have them when made. Thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven image, etc. They are always an occasion of superstition and idolatry to the ignorant, as the experience of the past and present abundantly testifies. 3. They give to the Jews, Turks, pagans, and other enemies of the church occasion of offence and matter for blaspheming the gospel. 
Objection 5. Images and statues are ornaments in our churches, therefore they may be tolerated. Answer. 1. The best and true ornament of our churches is the pure and unadulterated doctrine of the gospel, the lawful use of the sacraments, true prayer and worship in accordance with the word of God. 2. Churches have been built, that lively images of God may be seen in them, and not that they should be made the abode of idols and dumb images. 3. The ornament of the church ought not to be contrary to the command of God. 4. It must neither be ensnaring to the members nor offensive to the enemies of the church. But, someone may perhaps reply, the thing itself and the lawful use of it must not be taken away merely because it may be abused. Images are ensnaring and offensive merely by accident, therefore they are not to be removed from the churches. Answer, the first proposition is true, provided the thing be good in its own nature, and the use of it be lawful, and the accident, inseparably connected with it, be not condemned of God. If this be not the case, the thing and the use of it are both unlawful, and therefore to be avoided, but the images of God and the saints which are placed in our churches for the sake of religion are neither good, nor is the use of them lawful, but expressly forbidden by the command of God. And not only so, but the accident, which is superstition or idolatry, invariably accompanies the use of these images, notwithstanding the vain pretenses of those who are more fully established, and of their knowledge, and is equally condemned by the commandment of God. Objection 6. All that is necessary is that men should not, by the preaching of the gospel, have images in their hearts. Therefore, it is not necessary that they should be removed from our churches. Answer. We deny the antecedent, because God not only forbids us to have idols in our hearts, but also before our eyes, seeing that he does not merely desire us to be no idolaters, but to avoid even the appearance of idolatry, according, as it is said, abstain from all appearance of evil. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22. Again, such is the depravity of the human heart and its propensity to idolatry, that idols well polished and adorned, being left before the eyes of men, very soon and readily become seated in the heart, and lead to false notions of religion, whatever may be said by some to the contrary. We may therefore invert the argument and reason thus. Images are to be rooted out of the hearts of men by the preaching of the gospel, therefore they are also to be cast out of our churches, for the doctrine revealed to us from heaven does not merely command us not to worship and adore them, but likewise not to make or have them. So much concerning the commandment itself. The exhortation which is added to the second commandment. The exhortation added to this commandment, For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments, contains five attributes of God, which ought to constrain us to render obedience to him. 1. He calls himself our God, that is, our Creator and Preserver, the Giver of all good things which we have enjoyed. In this way he would teach us what base ingratitude it is not to render obedience to him, our Benefactor, and what an aggravated thing it is to fall from him into idolatry. 2. He calls himself a mighty God, one that is able to punish the wicked as well as to reward the obedient. He is therefore to be feared and worshipped above all others. 3. A jealous God, that is, a most rigid defender and vindicator of his honour, terribly displeased with those who depart from him, or infringe upon his honour or worship, inasmuch now as jealousy or indignation on account of an injury or baseness proceeds from love on the part of him who is injured, God here signifies how ardently he loves those that are his. 4. A God that visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate him. In these words, God reveals the greatness of his wrath and punishment, in that he threatens unto the children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren's children of his enemies to punish in them the sins of their fathers, in case they also imitate and approve of the sins of their fathers by committing them over again. Objection. But it is said, Ezekiel 18, that the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Answer. It is, however, also said in the fourteenth verse of the same chapter, by way of reconciliation, that if a wicked man beget a son that seeth all his father's sins which he hath done, and doeth not such like, he shall surely live. Hence God threatens that he will punish the sins of the father in their children, meaning those who persevere in the sins of their fathers, whom it is just and proper should be made partakers of their punishment. Should any one reply that in this way posterity do not suffer for the sins of their fathers, but only for their own, we answer nay, for there may be many impelling, moving causes of the same effect, and the cause of one punishment may be many sins, and these of different individuals, besides those who bear the punishment. 
and if someone should object still further and say that the sins of the fathers are not punished in their children because the punishment which the children suffer does not reach to the sins of their fathers we reply the children are a part of their fathers so that they feel in themselves as it were in some part of themselves what their children suffer five he declares that he is a god who showeth mercy unto thousands of them that love him and keep his commandments by this promise god would magnify his mercy that so he might the more strongly invite us to obedience by a consideration of the greatness of his mercy and by the desire of our own salvation and that of our children and whereas he threatened punishment only to the fourth generation he here extends his mercy to thousands that so he might declare that he is more inclined to show mercy than wrath and in this way constrain us to love him objection one but the children of many pious persons perish answer the promise is conditional for god declares in the eighteenth chapter of ezekiel that he will be merciful to the children of the godly if they persevere in the obedience of their fathers and that he will punish them if they turn away from it if any one should ask why does god not convert all the children of the godly since they cannot follow the holy example of their fathers without his mercy we reply that he will not bind or restrict his mercy to any single individuals included among the posterity of the righteous but will reserve his election free to himself that as he converts and saves some from the posterity of the wicked so he will leave some of the posterity of the righteous in their natural corruption and misery which all deserve by nature and this he does that he may show that his own mercy is free as well in choosing the posterity of the godly as the posterity of the wicked again god does not convert all the posterity of the godly because he has not bound himself to bestow mercy on all or the same benefits on all the posterity of the godly he therefore makes good this promise when he bestows temporal blessings upon the wicked descendants of the godly lastly god does not convert all the children of the godly because he promises this happiness to those who diligently keep his commandments or to those who are truly godly but inasmuch as the love of god and the obedience which is in the most holy are imperfect in this life the reward which is promised to them is also imperfect and joined with the cross and chastisements among which the wickedness and unhappiness of their posterity is not the least as may be seen in david solomon and josiah objection to those who keep the commandments of god obtain mercy therefore we merit something from god by our obedience answer the contrary follows for god says i will show mercy unto them therefore it is not according to merit for that which is done out of mercy is not out of merit and contrarywise the argument is therefore false in assigning that for a cause which is none objection three this promise and threatening belongs to the whole decalogue why is it therefore annexed to this commandment answer it is joined to the second commandment not that it belongs to it alone but that we may know that the first and second commandments are the foundation of all the others and that god might declare that he is especially displeased with those who corrupt his worship and that he will punish this kind of sin both in them and their posterity and on the other hand that he will also bless the posterity of them who keep his religion pure and undefiled end of section sixty section sixty one of commentary on the heidelberg catechism by zacharias ursinus translated by g w williard this librivox recording is in the public domain the third commandment thirty sixth lord's day question ninety nine what is required in the third command answer that we not only by cursing or perjury but also by rash swearing must not profane or abuse the name of god nor by silence or connivance be partakers of those horrible sins in others and briefly that we use the holy name of god no otherwise than with fear and reverence so that he may be rightly confessed and worshipped by us and be glorified in all our words and works question one hundred is then the profaning of god's name by swearing and cursing so heinous a sin that his wrath is kindled against those who do not endeavour as much as in them lies to prevent and forbid such cursing and swearing answer it undoubtedly is for there is no sin greater or more provoking to god than the profaning of his name and therefore he has commanded this sin to be punished with death exposition god in the first and second commandments framed the mind and heart for his worship in the third and fourth the external members and actions the third commandment consists of two parts a prohibition and threatening it first prohibits a rash and inconsiderate use of the name of god yea every abuse of the name of god in whatever false vain or trifling thing which tends to cast a reproach upon god or which does not at least have respect to his glory 
The name of God signifies in the scriptures, one, the attributes of God. Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name for ever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. The Lord is a man of war, the Lord is his name. Genesis 32 verse 29, Exodus 3 verse 15, and chapter 15 verse 3. 2. It signifies God himself. Let them that love thy name be joyful in thee. I will take the cup of salvation, and call upon the name of the Lord. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Thou shalt sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God, of the flock and the herd, in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. I purpose to build an house unto the name of the Lord my God. Psalm 5 verse 11, Psalm 116 verse 13, Psalm 7 verse 17, Deuteronomy 16 verse 2, 1 Kings 5 verse 5. 3. It signifies the will or commandment of God, and that either revealed and true or feigned by men. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. Deuteronomy 18 verse 19, 1 Samuel 17 verse 45. 4. It signifies the worship of God, confidence, prayer, praising, and professing God. All the people walk every one in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God for ever and ever, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Micah 4 verse 5, Acts 21 verse 13. Take the name of the Lord. God does not forbid us to take or to use his name, but he forbids us to do it rashly, which is to use it lightly, falsely, and reproachfully. To use the name of the Lord lightly is to make use of it, as in ordinary talk and conversation, contrary to what Christ says, let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. Matthew 5 verse 37. Falsely, as in unlawful oaths and perjury, reproachfully, as in cursing, blasphemy, and sorcery, in which the works of the devil are cloaked under the name of God. The sense, then, is, Thou shalt not use the name of the Lord thy God rashly, that is, Thou shalt not only forswear, but Thou shalt not make any mention of the name of God that would not be honourable to him. This negative precept has an affirmative included in it, for in prohibiting the wrong use of the name of God, it at the same time enjoins upon us that use which is lawful and honourable, which consists in using the name of God reverently, religiously, and honorably, and in making no mention of God or of his works and revelations in our conversation, but such as comports with his divine majesty. Hence the end of this third commandment is that we all render unto God, both publicly and privately, that immediate external worship which consists in confessing and praising his name. God adds a threatening to this commandment to declare thereby that this part of obedience is also one of those things, the violation of which is peculiarly displeasing to him, and which he will severely punish. For since praising and glorifying God is the chief and ultimate end for which man was created, God justly demands in the most rigid manner from us that, on account of which he commands all other things, and since man's chief good and enjoyment consists in glorifying God, it follows that the greatest evil consists in reproaching God, and taking his name in vain, and so merits the heaviest punishment, according as it is said, because that when they knew not God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, etc. Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin, and he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. Romans 1 verse 21, Leviticus 24 verses 15 and 16. The virtues of this commandment consists in the lawful and honourable use of the name of God, of which these are parts. First, the propagation of the true doctrine respecting the essence, will, and works of God, not indeed that which belongs to the office of teaching publicly in the church, of which mention is made in the fourth commandment, but that by which every one in his own peculiar sphere is bound to instruct others privately, and which contributes to the true knowledge and worship of God, as it is said, Teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. Wherefore comfort yourselves together, and edify one another. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. 
Deuteronomy 4, verse 9, chapter 11, verse 19, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11, Luke 22, verse 32, Colossians 3, verse 16. That which is opposed to the propagation of the doctrine concerning the true God includes, one, an omission or a neglect to instruct others, especially our children, and to spread a knowledge of the true doctrine according to our ability, and as opportunity presents itself, I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth, etc. Matthew 25, verse 25. 2. Abstaining or refraining from conversation respecting God and divine things. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they seek not thy statutes. Psalm 119, verse 155. 3. Corrupting religion and the doctrine revealed from heaven, which consists in asserting and propagating what is false concerning God, his will and works. The prophets prophesy lies in my name. Jeremiah 14, verse 14. Second, praising and glorifying God, which consists in an acknowledgment of the divine attributes and works, joined with approbation and admiration thereof in the presence of God and creatures, with the design that we may declare our love and reverence to God, in order that he may be exalted above all things, and that our subjection to him may be made manifest. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth! Let the heavens and the earth praise him, etc. Psalm 22, verse 22, Psalm 8, verse 1, Psalm 69, verse 34. Those things which are opposed to this virtue are, one, contempt of God, a neglect of his praise, worship, and divine works. They glorified him not as God. Romans 1, verse 21. Two, blasphemy, which is to speak such things of God as are opposed to his nature and will, either through ignorance or through hatred to the truth and to God himself, Whosoever shall curse his God shall bear his sin. Leviticus 24, verse 15. 3. All cursing by which men speak and ask wicked things of God against their neighbor, as if God were their executioner to carry into effect their desire of vengeance upon those with whom they are at variance. To curse is to ask and desire evil to any one from God. All cursing now which proceeds from hatred and from a desire of private revenge leading to the destruction of our neighbor, is unbecoming and wicked, because it desires that God should be made the executioner of our corrupt wishes and passions. Certain imprecations of the saints against their enemies are indeed found in the Psalms and elsewhere, but these are not to be positively condemned, because they are in a great measure prophetical denunciations of punishment against the enemies of God. From these examples we may infer that execrations are at particular times lawful, but with these conditions— 1. If we desire evil things to come upon those upon whom God denounces them, viz. his enemies. 2. If it is done on account of God without any private hatred or desire of revenge. 3. If we ask it upon the condition that these things come upon them only in case they remain incorrigible. 4. If we so desire these things as not to rejoice in their destruction, but merely to desire that the divine glory be vindicated and the church delivered. 3 the confession of the truth known concerning God, which consists in declaring what we know with certainty from the holy scriptures of God and his will, because we declare and make known from a consideration of duty our knowledge of God, that so we may glorify him and advance the salvation of our fellow men. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. Romans 10, verses 10 and 11, 1 Peter 3, verse 15. To this confession of the truth, there is opposed, one, a denial of the truth, or an unwillingness on the part of anyone to declare what he knows concerning religion for fear of hatred or the cross or reproach. This denial is of two kinds. The first is an entire apostasy from true religion, which is to cast away the profession of the truth to whatever extent it may have been known and received, which is done with the determined counsel and desire of the heart opposed to God, and which is also accompanied with no grief or sorrow for having rejected the truth, and without any purpose to obey God, by individually applying the promise of grace or showing signs of repentance. Such a denial of the truth is that of which hypocrites and the reprobate are guilty, concerning which it is said, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. Which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away, 1 John 2, verse 19, Luke 8, verse 13. 
If this denial be made after the truth has once been certainly known, it becomes the sin against the Holy Ghost, of which none repent, so that no forgiveness is obtained, neither in this nor in the life to come. The other denial of the truth is particular. It is that which is committed by those who are of a weak faith, and results either from error, without being willful and intentional, or from fear of the cross, whilst there is still remaining in the heart an inclination to cleave to God, and a sorrow on account of this wickedness and denial, to a certain purpose to struggle out of it, and to assent to and obey God by applying individually the promise of grace and showing signs of true penitence. The regenerate and elect may be guilty of this denial of the truth, but they struggle out of it and return again to the confession of the truth in this life. So Peter denied Christ through weakness, but repented of his sin before God. 2. Dissembling or keeping back the truth, where the glory of God and the salvation of our neighbor require a confession of it, which is necessary when false views of God, of his word, and of the church seem to be confirmed in the minds of men by our silence, or when those things remain unknown which God will have known for the purpose of vindicating his glory against the calumnies of the wicked, for convincing the obstinate and instructing those who are disposed to learn, or when our silence lays us open to the suspicion of approving what is said and done by the wicked. It was in this way that the parents of the man born blind, of whom we have an account in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John, dissembled, and also those chief rulers who would not confess Christ for fear of the Jews, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, John 12, verse 42. 3. An abuse of Christian liberty, or giving offence in things which are indifferent, which is done when by the use of such things we confirm the adversaries of God in error, or alienate them from true religion, or by our example provoke them to an imitation accompanied with an evil conscience, of which Paul treats largely in the fourteenth chapter of his epistle to the Romans, and also in the eighth and tenth chapters of his first epistle to the Corinthians. 4. All scandals and offences in morals, as, for instance, when those who profess the true religion lead shameful and offensive lives, denying in works what they profess in words, and so laying the church open to reproach, and the name of God to the foul blasphemies of unbelievers. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, as if he would say they pretend a knowledge of God without faith. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. Titus 1 verse 16, Romans 2 verse 24, see also Psalm 50 verse 16, Isaiah 52 verse 5, 2 Timothy 3 verse 5. 5. An untimely or unseasonable confession of the truth, by which men stir up and excite the enemies of religion, either to contemn or revile the truth, or to bitterness and cruelty against the godly, without advancing the glory of God and the salvation of any one, and without any necessity demanding a confession of the truth at the time and under the circumstances under which it was made. Such an untimely confession Christ prohibits when he says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pills before swine. Matthew 7 verse 6. Paul also says, A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. Titus 3 verse 10 and 11. Nor is the declaration of the Apostle Peter, chapter 3 verse 15, in which he commands us to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh a reason of the hope that is in us, with meekness and fear, at variance with what we have just said, as though no confession were untimely. For the Apostle commands us always to be ready and well prepared to give an answer concerning the sum and foundation of the doctrine of the Church, and to repel the calumnies and sophisms by which this doctrine is perverted and evil spoken of by the enemies of religion, but he does not command us to profess and declare all things at all times and before every one, but merely before those who ask a reason or a defence of the hope that is within us, for the purpose of learning, knowing, or judging in reference to it. Hence, if any one should make a mock of religion or deride the doctrine of the gospel after it has once been sufficiently declared and explained to him, and should ask a reason of our hope, we should not return an answer to him, but leave him to himself. So Christ himself, after he had sufficiently confessed and confirmed his doctrine, made no reply to the high priest and Pilate with reference to the false witnesses, and gave as a reason of his silence, If I tell you, ye will not believe. Luke 22, verse 67. Fourth, gratitude, which consists in acknowledging and confessing what and how great benefits we have received from God, and to what obedience we are bound in view of these blessings, 
and that we will therefore cheerfully and heartily yield it unto god to the extent of our power according as it is said whatsoever ye do in word or deed do all in the name of the lord jesus giving thanks to god and the father by him in everything give thanks for this is the will of god in christ jesus concerning you o give thanks unto the lord for he is good for his mercy endureth for ever Colossians 3, verse 17, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18, Psalm 107, verse 1. There is opposed to this virtue one in gratitude, which is when any one either seldom or never thinks and talks of the benefits of God, or if he does think and speak of them, he does it with coldness and dissimulation, so that there is no love to God or desire of gratitude kindled in his heart. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. Romans 1 verse 21. 2. The want of a proper appreciation of the benefits of God, or not placing such a value upon them as we ought. This occurs whenever any one regards himself or others as being the authors of his mercies. What hath thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7. 3. A neglect of the gifts of God which occurs whenever they are not so employed as to promote the divine glory. The same may also be said of the abuse of these gifts. Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest, that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, etc. Matthew 25, verses 26 and 27. 5. Zeal for the glory of God, which is an ardent love of God, and sorrow on account of any reproach or contempt cast upon God, with an attempt to throw it from him, and to vindicate the honour of his name. Phineas hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them. I have been very zealous for the Lord of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, etc. Numbers 25 verse 11, 1 Kings 19 verse 10 timidity or a want of firmness is opposed to this zeal for god on the side of want and consists in not being affected with grief on account of reproach cast upon god and so not caring for the divine glory and in not having or showing any desire in word and deed to prevent this reproach those are guilty of this sin who when they might prohibit cursing and foul blasphemies by which the name of god is dishonoured do nevertheless not prevent them not being led to it by any zeal for the glory of god an erring false zeal is opposed to this virtue as it respects the opposite extreme, viz. that of excess. This Paul calls a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Romans 10 verse 3. It consists in being displeased with such words and actions as are erroneously conceived to impair the glory of God. This now may take place whenever we suppose that to be the glory of God and attempt to defend it, which is not the glory of God, and ought not to be defended, or when we regard that as detracting from the glory of God, and endeavour to repel it, which is not inconsistent with the divine glory, and ought not to be repelled, or still further, when it is attempted to prevent an offence or injury to the divine glory in a way different from that in which it ought to be done. Sixth, calling upon the name of the Lord, which consists in asking of the true God those things which he has commanded us to ask at his hands. It proceeds from a sense of want on our part, and from a desire to share in the divine bounty, and commences with true conversion to God and faith in the divine promises, for the Mediator's sake. O give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, ask, and it shall be given you. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Psalm 105 verse 1, Matthew 7 verse 7, 1 John 5 verse 14. There is opposed to this invocation, one, a neglect of calling upon the name of the Lord, which the scriptures represent and condemn as the fountain of all ungodliness, and call not upon the name of the Lord, Psalm 14, verse 4. 2. All unlawful calling upon God, which is the case whenever any condition necessary to acceptable prayer is wanting, under which may be comprehended idolatrous invocation, which is either directed to some imaginary deity or to creatures, or else it restricts the divine presence and an answer to our prayers to a certain place or thing without any command and promise from God. Such are the prayers of the heathen, Turks, Jews, and all others who imagine unto themselves another God beside the true God revealed unto us in his word and works. Ye worship, ye know not what. John 4 verse 22. The same thing may also be said of those among the papists who pray to the angels and to the saints who have departed this life, because in so doing they attribute to them the honour due to God alone. 3. The asking of such things as are contrary to the will and law of God. 
ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. James 4, verse 3. 4. A mere lip service for such prayers as consist merely in words, or in the motion of the body, without enlisting the feelings of the heart, and in which there is no real desire to obtain the blessing of God. Prayers which are without true repentance, without any assurance of being heard, without a subjection of the will to the will of God, without any reference to or thought of the divine promise, without any confidence in Christ, the only mediator, and without any true sense or acknowledgement of unworthiness in the sight of God. When ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. When ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you, yea, when ye make your prayers, I will not hear. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Matthew 6, verse 7, Isaiah 1, verse 15, James 1, verse 7. The objections which the papists bring against us in favour of the invocation of the saints. Objection 1. The saints, on account of their virtues, are to be honoured with the worship either of adoration, latria, or of veneration, lulia. But it is not in the former sense that they are to be worshipped, because this form of worship is due to God alone, inasmuch as it attributes to him universal power, providence, and dominion, which can be ascribed to God alone. Therefore veneration is due to the saints, or such worship as that which we ascribe to them for their holiness. Answer. We deny the consequence, because the major proposition is incomplete. For besides the worship of adoration and veneration, which is the distinction here made, there is another kind of veneration, such as is proper to the saints, which is the acknowledgement and celebration of the faith, holiness, and gifts, for which they were distinguished, obedience to the doctrine which they taught, and an imitation of their lives and piety, concerning which Augustine says, quote, They are to be honoured by imitation, but not by adoration, end quote. This veneration is due to the saints, and we have no desire to take it from them, whether living or dead, but, on the other hand, willingly attribute it to them according to the command of the Apostle, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation, Hebrews 13, verse 7. We also deny the minor proposition because the distinction which they make between the worship of adoration and veneration is of no force, inasmuch as these are not different forms of worship, but one and the same. Neither do they belong to the saints, or to any creature, but to God alone, because he knows and hears in all places, and at all times, the thoughts, the groans and desires of those who call upon him, and relieves their necessities. No one but God can hear those who call upon him. Therefore this honour must be ascribed to him alone, because he hears them that pray. This honour belongs also to Christ, because it is on account of his merits and intercession that God grants unto us the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and all other good things. Hence this honour cannot be transferred to the saints without manifest sacrilege and idolatry, whether it be under the name of adoration or veneration or whatever name it may be. This distinction too which they make is of no account, since the words are used indifferently in the original to signify the same thing, both in the scriptures and in profane writers. Concerning God it is said, Matthew 4 verse 10, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Here the Greek word latarephsis is used. And in Matthew 6 verse 25 it is said, He cannot serve God and mammon, in which place the word lulevin is used. Which word is also used in the following places where it is said, Ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. They that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9, Romans 16 verse 18. Paul also everywhere calls himself the servant of God, Dolon Theu. In the Greek text, servile or slavish work is everywhere termed la tarefton. Suidas writes that la tarevin means the same thing as to serve for wages. Vala shows that this same word signifies to serve man as well as to serve God, adducing a passage from Xenophon, where a man says that he is ready to risk his life sooner than his wife should be made to serve. And the wife, on the other hand, says that she would rather lose her life than that her husband should serve, where the word luleve is used. Hence these words upon which the papists base the above distinction do not differ, but express one and the same thing. Objection 2. We ought to honour those whom God honours. God honours the saints. You shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Matthew 19, verse 28. Therefore they are to be honoured by us. Answer, we admit the argument in as far as it has respect to the honour which God attributes to the saints. 
In this, however, invocation is never included. God himself says, I am the Lord, that is my name and my glory, I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Isaiah 42, verse 8. Objection 3. The hearing of our secret sighs and groans, which belongs to God by nature, is through grace communicated to the saints, therefore they are to be invoked. Answer. We deny the antecedent, for God does not communicate those properties by which he desires to be distinguished from creatures, such as immensity, omnipotence, infinite wisdom, seeing and knowing the heart, hearing prayer, etc. These are properties which God communicates to no creature, neither by nature nor by grace. For thou only knowest the hearts of the children of men. 2 Chronicles 6 verse 30 Objection 4. God has communicated to the saints the power of working miracles, which is nevertheless a property belonging to himself alone. Therefore he communicates to the saints at least some of the properties by which he is distinguished from creatures, so that they may have a knowledge of the thoughts and desires of those who pray unto them. Answer 1. The consequence which is here drawn is of no force, for it does not follow, even though it were true, which we do not admit, that God had communicated some of his properties to the saints, and that the hearing of prayer is included amongst them, if the scriptures do not teach the fact. 2. Nor is the reason, which is assigned of any force, that the saints have a knowledge of the desires of those who invoke them, because they have been endowed with the gift of working miracles. For the power of working miracles is not transfused into the saints, nor do they perform these miracles by their own power, but merely as ministers. Hence the saints are said to do these things in a figurative sense, when God employs them as ministers, and joins the working of a miracle, as the sign of his presence, power, and will. Objection 5. Some prophets seemed to know the thoughts and counsels of other men, so Ahijah knew the thoughts of the wife of Jeroboam, Elisha knew the thoughts of the king of Syria, Peter knew the thoughts of Ananias and Sapphira, etc., 1 Kings 14, verse 6, 2 Kings 6, verse 12, Acts 5, verse 3. Therefore God has communicated to the saints a knowledge of the hearts of men. Answer 1. Examples that are few in number and of an extraordinary character do not constitute a general rule. 2. These persons knew these things by the gift of prophecy with which they were endowed, but yet they did not know them always, but only at that time when the good of the church required it, nor was it by any power lodged within them by which they were enabled to know the heart, but by a divine revelation, nor did they know all things but only such as God was pleased to reveal to them. Hence it does not appear that the saints, after death, are also endowed with the gift of prophecy, since there is no need of it in eternal life. Objection 6. The angels in heaven rejoice over the repentance of sinners. Luke 15 verse 10. Therefore they know when men exercise true penitence, and must also have a knowledge of the desires of those who call upon them in prayer. Answer. A cause that is inferred from an effect, which may result from other causes, is not of much force or consequence. For it is not necessary that the angels should know the repentance of the sinner by looking into the heart, inasmuch as they may know it either from the effects and signs which accompany it, or from a divine revelation. Objection 7. The soul of the rich man, when in hell, saw Abraham in heaven, and addressed prayer to him, whom Abraham also heard. The rich man likewise knew the state and condition of his five brethren, who are still on earth. Therefore the saints in heaven see and know the desires and condition of those who are upon the earth, and are to be invoked. Answer. No doctrine can be established from allegories and parables, that that now is an allegory by which Christ desired to express the thoughts, torments, and condition of the ungodly who are suffering punishment is evident from this, that it possesses all the parts of a parable. Hence it establishes nothing in favor of the invocation of the saints, and even though all these things had been done as they are represented, yet they prove nothing as it respects the doctrine of the invocation of the saints, since Abraham is said to have known these things by speech, and not because he had a knowledge of these secret thoughts of the heart. Objection 8. Christ knows all things according to his human nature, therefore these saints also have a knowledge of all things. Answer. The examples are not the same. Christ's human understanding perceives and knows, and his bodily eyes and ears hear and see all things which he, according to his human nature, desires to perceive, either with his mind or external senses, on account of its personal union with the divine nature which reveals these things, or on account of his office as mediator. But it cannot be proven from the scriptures that all things are revealed to the angels and saints, which are made known to the human understanding of Christ by his divinity. Objection 9. 
the images of all things are reflected or appear in the vision and face of the Trinity. The holy angels and blessed men who have departed this life see the face of the Deity, as it is said, In heaven the angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 18, verse 10. Therefore they, in this way, see and know all that we do, suffer, think, etc. Answer 1. The major proposition is uncertain and cannot be proven from the Scriptures. 2. Nor can the minor be established, for it is said, No man hath seen God at any time. John 1, verse 18. 3. Although the angels and saints in heaven have a clear knowledge of God, yet we are not to suppose that they naturally know all things which are in God, for if this were the case, their knowledge would be infinite, or in other words, it would be equal to the knowledge of God, which is absurd, and contrary to the testimony of Scripture, which declares that the angels are ignorant of the day of judgment. God reveals to everyone, both in heaven and on earth, as much as he will, according to his own good pleasure. Objection 10. The friendship and intercourse of the saints with God and Christ is so great that it is not possible that a revelation of those things which we ask at their hands should be withheld from them. Answer, that consequence which is drawn from an insufficient cause is of no force, for this friendship and intercourse will continue, although God does not reveal to the saints as much as they desire, but merely those things which it is profitable for them to know, for his glory and for their own happiness. Objection 11. Christ is the mediator of redemption. The saints are mediators of intercession. Therefore, there is nothing detracted from Christ if the saints are invoked as intercessors and as those who plead with God in our behalf. Answer. We deny the distinction that is here made, because the scriptures teach that Christ is the only mediator, and that he has not only redeemed us by once offering himself for us upon the cross, but that he also continually appears before the Father and makes intercession for us. See Hebrews 5, verses 7 and 9, chapter 7, verse 27, John 19, verse 9, Romans 8, verse 34, Hebrews 9, verse 24, 1 John 2. Objection 12. Christ alone is mediator by virtue of his own merit and intercession. The saints are mediators and intercessors by virtue of the merit and intercession of Christ, that is, their intercessions with God in our behalf avail for the sake of the merit and intercession of Christ, Therefore that which is peculiar to Christ is not transferred to the saints. Answer. Those who make intercession in this way detract from the honor of Christ as much as in the former case, which will appear by making in the antecedent a full enumeration of the ways in which the honor of Christ is transferred to others. For not only those who by their own virtue, but even those who by the virtue of Christ are said to merit for us from God those good things promised for the sake of Christ's merits alone are substituted in the place of Christ, and again, if the prayers of the saints are pleasing to God, and heard on account of the merit and intercession of Christ, they cannot please God, nor obtain anything for us in their own holiness and merits, as the papists teach. For he who stands in need of a mediator and intercessor cannot appear as an intercessor for others, although he may pray for others. Hence our adversaries overthrow by their own argument the doctrine which they vainly attempt to establish. Objection 13. Those who pray for us in heaven are to be invoked. The saints offer prayers in our behalf in heaven, therefore they are to be addressed in prayer. Answer. There is here an error in taking that as a cause which is none, for the mere fact that anyone prays for another is not a sufficient reason why we should address prayer to him. We readily grant that the saints in heaven do ardently desire the salvation of the church militant, and that their prayers are heard according to the counsels of God, but that the saints know the misfortunes and business of every one in particular, and that they hear the prayers which may be addressed to them, we deny. Objection 14. God said, Jeremiah 15, verse 1, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be towards this people. Therefore the saints stand before God and make intercession for us. Answer 1. But even though we were to grant the whole argument, yet it does not therefore follow, as we have already shown, that we ought to pray unto them. 2. The language which is here quoted is figurative. It introduces the dead and represents them praying as though they were living, so that the sense is if Moses and Samuel were yet living, and would pray for this wicked people as they prayed for them and were heard when they lived upon earth, yet they could not obtain grace and pardon for them. There is a similar passage found in Ezekiel 14 verse 4, which must be explained in like manner. Objection 15. The Lord said through Isaiah, I will defend this city and save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. 2 Kings 19 verse 34. 
Therefore God confers benefits upon men, upon the earth, for the sake of the merits and intercessions of David and of other saints after death. Answer. But it was not in respect to the merits of David, but in respect to the promise of the Messiah, who was to be born from the house of David, that God promised to protect and defend the city referred to. And if any one should object and say that the deliverance of the city of David from the assault of the Assyrians might have been effected without the benefit and promise of the Messiah, and was therefore promised on account of the merits of David, we reply that they err who imagine that the benefits of Christ extend merely to those things or promises upon the performance of which the promises made to David with reference to the Messiah could only be preserved and receive their fulfillment, for all the benefits of God, including those that are temporal as well as those that are spiritual, those that were granted before the coming of the Messiah as well as those which have been granted since, those without which the promise of the Messiah could, as well as those without which it could be fulfilled, are all conferred upon the church for the sake of Christ. For the promises of God in him, Christ, are yea, and in him, amen, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20. Objection 16. Jacob said of the sons of Joseph, Let my name be on them, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. Genesis 48 verse 16. Therefore it is lawful to call upon the saints who have departed this life. Answer. This is to misunderstand the figure of speech which is here employed, which is a Hebrew phrase, meaning not adoration, but an adoption of the children of Joseph, so that the sense is, Let them be called after my name, or let them take their name from me, that is, let them be called my sons and not my grandchildren. The phrase is similar to that found in Isaiah 4 verse 1, where it is said, And on that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, Let us be called by thy name, that is, let us be called thy wives. Objection 17. Eliphaz says to Job, chapter 5 verse 1, Call now, if there be any that will answer thee, and to which of the saints wilt thou turn? Therefore Job is commanded to implore help from some one of the saints. Answer. This passage is evidently at war with the doctrine of the invocation of the saints, for it affirms that the angels so far excel men in purity that they will not make answer or appear when addressed or invoked by men. Objection 18. Christ says, Matthew 25 verse 40, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Therefore the invocation of the saints is an honour which is showed to Christ himself. Answer, Christ does not speak of the invocation of the saints, but of the duty of love which it becomes us to perform towards the afflicted members of his church in this life. The passage therefore furnishes no proof in favour of the invocation of the saints. Objection 19. The angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast indignation these threescore and ten years? Zechariah 1 verse 2. Therefore the angels pray for men in their times of need and distress, and so are to be prayed unto. Answer 1. But this passage furnishes no proof that all the angels know the wants and afflictions of all men. The calamities of the Jews were manifest not only to the sight of angels, but also to men. 2. We deny the consequence which is here drawn from the angels to the saints who have departed this life. For the care and defence of the church in this world has been committed to the angels. They are therefore conversant with the things of this world, and see our wants and necessities, which the saints do not, inasmuch as this charge is not committed to their care. 3. The consequence which is here drawn, that we must pray unto the angels because they pray for us, is in like manner of no force, as we have already shown. Objection 20. Judas Maccabeus saw in a vision the high priest Onias and Jeremiah the prophet praying for the people. Second Maccabees 15 verse 14. Therefore the saints who have departed this life pray for us and are to be invoked. Answer. No doctrine can be established by the authority of an apocryphal book. We also deny the consequence, which is here deduced, for not every one that prays for us is to be prayed to by us. Objection 21. Baruch says, Hear now the prayers of the dead Israelites. Baruch 3 verse 4. Therefore the saints pray for us and are to be invoked. Answer. We may return the same answer to this objection that we did to the preceding one, that an apocryphal book proves nothing. There is also a misunderstanding of the figure of speech here used, for... Those who are called the dead Israelites are not such as had departed this life, but such as were living and calling upon God, but who on account of their calamities were similar to those who were dead. Objection 22. It is not permitted to come into the presence of a prince without the intercession of someone. Therefore much less can we come into the presence of God without someone to appear before him as our intercessor. 
Answer, we grant the whole argument for without Christ, the mediator, no one can have access to God, as Christ himself says, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, verse 6. Ambrose, very appropriately and forcibly answers the above objection in his commentary on the epistle to the Romans, where he thus writes, quote, Some men are wont to use a miserable excuse, saying that we obtain access to God through his righteous saints in the same way in which any one comes into the presence of a prince, which is through his attendants. Well, is any one so mad and unmindful of his own safety as to transfer the honour of the king to any of his attendants, since those who have been found to do this have been condemned as guilty of treason? And yet these persons suppose that those are not guilty of treason against God, who transfer the honour of his name to creatures, and forsaking their lord, worship their fellow servants, as if this accomplished anything in the way of assisting them in the service of God. We come into the presence of a king through his nobles and attendants because he is a man as we are, and does not know to whom he ought to entrust the affairs of his kingdom. But as it respects God, from whom nothing is concealed, and who knows the merits of all, we need no one to secure us an access to him but a devout mind. For wherever such an one speaks, he will answer nothing, etc. End quote. Chrysostom writes, quote, The Canaanitish woman did not ask of James, nor did she beseech John nor did she go to Peter, nor did she come to the whole corps of the apostles, nor did she seek any mediator, but instead of all these she took repentance for her companion, which repentance supplied the place of an advocate, and in this way she went to the chief fountain." End quote. So much concerning the sixth virtue comprehended in this commandment, which virtue we have defined as invocation or calling upon God. Seventh, lawful or religious swearing which is comprehended in calling upon God. By this, the person who takes an oath desires that God would be a witness to what he affirms, that he has no desire to deceive in the thing concerning which he makes oath, and that God may punish him if he practices any deception. This form of swearing is authorized by God, who designs that it may be a bond of truth between men, and a testimony that he is the author and defender of truth. That which is opposed to swearing religiously includes one, a refusing to take an oath when the glory of God and the safety of our neighbor require it at our hands. An oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Hebrews 6 verse 16. 2. Perjury or forswearing, as when any one knowingly and willingly deceives by an oath, or does not keep a lawful oath. For to forswear is either to swear to that which is false, as for instance, that thou art not guilty of murder when thou hast slain a man, or not to perform a thing lawfully sworn. 3. An idolatrous oath which is taken not by the true God alone. 4. An oath taken in regard to that which is unlawful, as the oath of Herod. 5. Oaths which are made rashly, and from levity without any necessity or sufficient cause. It is of this that the scriptures speak when they forbid swearing. See Matthew 5 verse 23, James 5 verse 12. The doctrine respecting the oath is contained and explained in the following questions of the Catechism. End of section 61. Section 62 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Doctrine of the Oath. 37th Lord's Day, Question 101. May we then swear religiously by the name of God? Answer. Yes, either when the magistrates demand it of the subjects, or when necessity requires us thereby to confirm fidelity and truth, to the glory of God and the safety of our neighbor, for such an oath is founded on God's word, and therefore was justly used by the saints both in the Old and New Testament. Question 102. May we also swear by saints or any other creatures? Answer. No, for a lawful oath is a calling upon God as the one who knows the heart, that he will bear witness to the truth and punish me if I swear falsely, which honor is due to no creature. Exposition. In these two questions, the doctrine respecting the oath is explained at large. The doctrine of the oath. Concerning this, we must inquire, first, what is an oath? Second, by whom are we to swear? Third, is it lawful for Christians to make oath? Fourth, what are the things concerning which we are to make oath? Fifth, are all oaths to be kept? First, what is an oath? An oath is often used in the scriptures for the whole worship of God, as thou shalt swear by his name. In that day shall five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan, and swear to the Lord of hosts. Every knee shall bow unto me, every tongue shall swear. 
Deuteronomy 10, verse 20, Isaiah 19, verse 18, chapter 45, verse 23. Concerning the worship of the New Testament, it is said, He who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth, and he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth. If they will diligently learn the ways of my people to swear by my name, then shall they be built in the midst of my people. Isaiah 65, verse 16, Jeremiah 12, verse 16. The reason of this is that we profess him as our God by whom we swear, an oath, properly speaking, is a calling upon God as the one who knows the heart, that he will bear witness to the truth and punish me if I swear falsely. It is in this way that the Catechism defines a lawful oath, which definition is taken from the form of swearing which the Apostle Paul uses, when he says, I call God for a witness upon my soul, that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 23 it is said in the definition just given that God will bear witness, viz. by preserving and doing good to him that swears, if he swear religiously, and by punishing and destroying him if he swear falsely. For the oath was instituted by God that it might serve as a bond of truth between men, and be a testimony that God is the author and defender of truth. Second, by whom are we to swear? We must swear by the name of the true God alone. 1. Because God has commanded that we swear by him alone, as he alone is to be feared and worshipped. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave, and shalt swear by his name. Deuteronomy 10 verse 20. 2. God positively forbids us to swear by any other name. Make no mention of the names of other gods. Exodus 23 verse 13. 3. God wills that the worship of invocation be given to him alone, and condemns those who, in their oaths, join creatures with himself. The oath now, according to the definition, is one of the ways in which we call upon God, being comprehended in it. 4. An oath ascribes to him by whom it is taken a knowledge of hearts, omniscience, omnipresence, etc., and it is indeed necessary that he by whom we swear should be possessed of infinite wisdom, and have a knowledge of the heart, because when oaths are taken, it is not concerning things which are manifest and of which there is no doubt, but of things unknown and uncertain, and of which he only, who has a knowledge of all hearts, can judge whether men speak the truth or that which is false. But God alone knows the heart, is omniscient and everywhere present. And as Christ and the Holy Ghost are God, and know all things, as the following passages of Scripture sufficiently testify, we are also to swear by them. He knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. The Spirit searcheth all things. John 2, verses 24 and 25, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11. 5. We commit the execution of punishment to him by whom we swear, and also attribute such power to him as is necessary to maintain the truth, and punish those who are guilty of perjury. But God alone is possessed of such power, and inflicts punishment upon the wicked. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10 verse 28. Men cannot be the avengers of those who are guilty of perjury, inasmuch as those who swear falsely may escape the judgment of men, either because they do not know the heart, so as to see whether those who swear are practicing a deception or not, or because those who perjure themselves are too powerful to be punished by men. It follows, therefore, that we must not take an oath except by the name of God alone. It is apparent, from what has now been said, that oaths which are taken by the saints and other creatures are idolatrous and prohibited by God. Objection. But Joseph swore by the life of Pharaoh, Genesis 42, verse 15, therefore it is lawful to swear by men and creatures. Answer. There are some who admit that Joseph sinned in following the custom of the Gentiles, who were wont to swear by things, that his brethren might not by this means recognize him, but we may give a different reply to the objection, by maintaining that his language does not properly contain an oath, but merely a strong affirmation, so that the sense is as truly as Pharaoh lives, or is in safety, or as truly as I desire him to be in safety, so truly do I affirm these things. The same interpretation must be given to all other asseverations of a similar character, instances of which may be found in 1 Samuel 1 verse 27, chapter 15 verse 55, chapter 20 verse 3, chapter 25 verse 26. These forms of speech are not properly oaths, but strong declarations, made for the sake of placing something in the clearest light by comparing it with something known and manifest, 
so that we are to understand them as meaning that those things which are affirmed are as certain as that he liveth who is named by the person making the declaration. Third, is it lawful for Christians to take an oath? That it is lawful to swear religiously by the name of God, when the magistrates demand it, or otherwise, when necessity requires, may be proven by these four arguments. One, that the glory of God may be promoted. Truth with its manifestation is glorious to God. Two, that it may contribute to the safety of others. Our safety consists in the maintenance of truth, especially heavenly truth. Three, the word of God authorizes and sanctions lawful swearing. Four, the saints have at different times taken oaths under a religious form. The Anabaptists take exceptions to what we have here taught respecting the oath, and maintain that whilst it was lawful for the fathers who lived under the Old Testament to swear, we who live under the New Testament are prohibited. Hence, in order to meet their objections, we must add to the reasons already given the following additional considerations. 5. Christ says, I am not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Matthew 5, verse 17. This now was spoken with reference to the moral law, to which the oath had respect. Hence, Christ had not prohibited those who live under the New Testament to swear religiously, when necessity demands it. 6. The moral worship of God is perpetual. A lawful oath forms a part of the moral worship, being one of the ways in which we call upon God. Therefore, it is perpetual. 7. The prophets, in describing the worship of the Christian church, call it a swearing by the name of God. He that sweareth in the oath shall swear by the God of truth. Isaiah 65, verse 16. Therefore those who live in the Christian church are not prohibited from swearing religiously. 8. The same thing may be argued from the design of the oath, which is a confirmation of fidelity and truth, and a removal of strife, which design is profitable, lawful, and necessary for the church and the state, and at the same time honorable to God. An oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Hebrews 6 verse 16. Such now being the design of the oath, it is manifest that it is not only lawful but even necessary for Christians to take it. 8. From the examples of Christ and the saints in the New Testament, Christ on more than one occasion used a form of swearing for the confirmation of his doctrine. Verily, verily, I say unto you, etc. John 3 verse 3. Paul says, God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. I call God for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Romans 1 verse 9, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 23, Romans 9 verse 1, Philippians 1 verse 8, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 16. These and similar arguments and examples clearly demonstrate that it is lawful for Christians and the New Covenant also to swear religiously. The Anabaptists bring forward by way of objection to what has now been advanced, the declaration of Christ found in Matthew 5 verses 34 to 38, where it is said, I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. They also bring forward for the same purpose the following passage from the epistle of James, chapter 5, verse 12, Above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay, lest ye come into condemnation. But that these declarations do not forbid all oaths, but only such as are rash and unnecessary, is evident both from a comparison of other passages of the Old and New Testaments, and especially from the design of Christ, who, in the first passage referred to, removing the corruptions thrown around the law and giving its true sense, and at the same time reproving the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, teaches that the third commandment of the Decalogue does not only condemn perjury, but also such oaths as are unnecessary and rash, and... Among these, not only such as are direct, in which there is an express mention of the name of God, but also such as are indirect, in which, when creatures are named, the name of God is dissembled and understood thereby. Which kind of oaths were then common in ordinary conversation? Hypocrites, or those who were in the habit of using these indirect forms of swearing, such as swearing by the temple, by the altar, by heaven, etc., excused these oaths, 
as if they did not profane the name of God when they swore in this way, inasmuch as they did not expressly mention the name of God, and did not suppose that they had perjured themselves if they violated the oath which they had taken in this indirect form. Christ, now in the passage referred to, shows that men swear also by the name of God, when heaven and earth are named, because there is no creature nor any part of the world upon which God has not stamped some mark of his glory. And when any one swears by heaven and earth in the sight and hearing of his Maker, the religious character of the oath which he takes is not in the creatures by whom he swears, but God himself alone is called upon to witness what is said, by the mention of those things which are the signs of his glory. Nor does God tenaciously cling to the words which are uttered, but looks more particularly to the mind and intention of him that swears, neither does the honour or dishonour of the name of God consist so much in the syllables or forms of expression used, as in the meaning and sense which they bear, as Christ elsewhere, Matthew 23, verses 16 to 23, teaches in express terms, which passage should be compared with the one now under consideration. The same interpretation must be given to the passage quoted from the epistle of James. Objection 1. But Christ says, Swear not at all, and James says, Nor by any other oath. Therefore Christians are not allowed to swear under any form. Answer. There is here a fallacy of composition, for when Christ says, Swear not at all, we are not to refer this language to the oath itself, but to the various forms of rash swearing which the Pharisees imagined lawful. It is therefore as if he would say, Swear not falsely or rashly at all, whether it be in a direct or indirect way. So when the Apostle James says, Nor by any other oath, we must understand him also as referring to such oaths as are rash and false, of which kind he furnishes some specimens, and forbids all of a similar character. If this be not the proper interpretation of these passages, Christ himself has violated his own precept, which he here lays down, saying, Let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay. For he frequently, in his discourses, used this most emphatic form of expression, Verily, verily, I say unto you. And James would in this case condemn Paul, who called God for a record upon his soul, and the Holy Ghost would contradict himself by condemning all oaths by James, and commending them by another apostle, as a remedy useful and necessary to the preservation of society, for the purpose of putting an end to strifes and controversies, from which human life in this state of frailty and imperfection cannot be free. Objection 2. But such oaths as were permitted, together with the examples which are found in the Scriptures, have respect to public oaths, such as were exacted or given in the name of the public and for the public good. Therefore, at least private oaths, or such as pass between private individuals, are entirely prohibited. Answer 1. We deny the antecedent, because there is not only no such restriction as that which is here maintained, specified in the instances recorded in the Scriptures, where the saints make oath to God, but it is impossible to interpret them in this way, as a careful examination of the passages themselves will prove. 2. There are many oaths recorded in the Scriptures, the private character of which cannot be doubted, such as that of Jacob and Laban, that of Boaz, Abida, Abigail, and David, Genesis 31, verse 53, Ruth 3, verse 13, etc. 3. The same thing may be proven by the design of the oath, which is a confirmation of fidelity and truth amongst men, and the putting an end to strife. These things now have respect to Christians also as private individuals, and hence the oath itself by which we establish truth and fidelity likewise has respect to them. Fourth, what are the things concerning which we are to make oath, or what oaths are lawful and what unlawful? Only such oaths are lawful, as are evidently not opposed to the word of God, and which are made concerning things true, certainly known, lawful, possible, weighty, necessary, useful, and worthy of such and so great a confirmation, or of such things as require a confirmation for the glory of God and the safety of our neighbour. It is only in reference to such things that it is lawful for us to make oath. Unlawful oaths are such as are plainly in opposition to the word of God, and made in reference to things which are either false, uncertain, unlawful, impossible, or light and trifling. Of such things no one should make an oath, for he who makes oath in reference to things which are false calls God to witness a lie. He who swears concerning things uncertain makes oath with an evil conscience and with contempt of God, inasmuch as he has the presumption to make God a witness of something of which he has no certain knowledge whether it be true or false. He who swears in this way has but little concern whether he makes God a witness of what is truth or falsehood, and yet, at the same time, he desires that God will either give testimony to a lie, or, if he will not be a witness of what is false, 
that he will punish him, making an oath. He who makes oath concerning things unlawful calls upon God to approve and sanction what he has forbidden in his law, and so makes God contradict himself, because he desires that God may punish him if he does what he commands, or if he does not do what God has forbidden. And still further, he who swears in this way either purposes to act contrary to the command of God, or, if he swears sincerely, he calls God to witness a falsehood. He who swears in reference to things impossible is either beside himself or else trifles with God and men, since he cannot have a sincere purpose to do what he takes an oath to, or he swears hypocritically concerning a lie, viz. that he will do that which he neither will nor can do. Lastly, he who swears with levity is devoid of all proper reverence to God, and he who swears readily and thoughtlessly also readily forswears, or takes oath to what is false. The principal cause of an oath should be glory of God, and the public and private safety of our neighbor. Objection. We should not make oath concerning things that are uncertain, but future contingencies, such as those which men promise themselves that they will perform, are uncertain. Therefore we should not swear in reference to things still future. Answer. As it respects future things, no one does, neither should he swear, respecting the event which is beyond our control. But, of our present will and purpose to do what is just and lawful, either now or hereafter, and of obligation, present and future, to do a certain thing, in reference to which every one may and ought to be certain. It was in this way that Abraham, Isaac, Abimelech, David, Jonathan, Boaz, etc., made oath, binding themselves to perform certain duties. Fifth, should all oaths be kept? Oaths which have been properly made concerning things lawful, true, certain, weighty, and possible, should necessarily be kept. For if any one once acknowledges and declares that he is justly bound to keep what he made oath to, and calls God to testify thereto, if he afterwards willingly or knowingly violates his faith or breaks his oath, he in so doing breaks a lawful bond, and so becomes guilty of perjury. The case, however, is different as it respects oaths which have been made unlawfully, either concerning things unlawful, or by error, or by infirmity, or against the conscience. These are not to be kept, but retracted and amended by repentance, and by not persisting in an evil purpose, and so adding sin to sin. He that sweareth to his own hurt, and changeth not. Psalm 15 verse 4 He who keeps an unlawful oath sins twice. He sins in the first place by making an oath wickedly, and in the second place by keeping that which was done unlawfully, according to the rule that which is sworn to wickedly, is worse when kept. What God forbids, that he will not have us to keep, whether sworn to or not, and what he forbids us to promise, or to swear to, that he the more strictly forbids us to do, by as much as doing surpasses permitting. Those, therefore, who keep such oaths as have been wickedly made at sin to sin as Herod did, who put John the Baptist to death upon the pretext of keeping his oath, the same thing may also be said in reference to the vows of monks who have sworn to that which was idolatrous, or to an unholy single life. Objection 1. He who swears that he will do something which he has the power to do, and yet does it not, makes God the witness of a falsehood. He now who makes oath that he will kill a certain person swears to what he has the power to execute. Therefore, he who takes an oath that he will kill anyone, and yet does it not, makes God witness what is false and as this ought not to be done, he should perform what he has sworn to do. Answer. We reply to the major proposition that it is true if it has respect to things which are lawful and possible, but it is false if it be understood of things which are unlawful, even though we may have the power to do them. The breaking of an oath which is unlawful is by no means making God witness a falsehood, inasmuch as it is right and becoming to retract or to refrain from doing what is evil, as is evident from the example of David who revoked the oath which he had made to destroy Nabal with his family, 1 Samuel 25 verse 22. Objection 2. The oath of peace which was made with the Gibeonites was contrary to the command of God, Joshua 9 verse 15. Therefore it is lawful to keep oaths which have been taken in reference to things which are unlawful. Answer 1. We deny that the oath which the princes of the children of Israel made was unlawful, for they were not forbidden to make peace with any of the nations which God had commanded to be destroyed. If it was desired by any of these nations, and they were willing to embrace the Jewish religion, which was the case as it respects the Gibeonites. 2. The objection also contains the fallacy of making that a cause which is none. The Israelites kept this oath, not because they felt themselves bound to do so, having been deceived when they made it, 
supposing that the Gibeonites had come from a far country, but one, that they might avoid offence, so that the name of God might not be reproached or evil spoken of among heathen nations, which might have been the case, had they not kept the oath which they had made. Two, because it was lawful and proper to save those that sought peace and embrace the Jewish religion, even though there had been no oath taken in the case. From what has now been said in reference to keeping such oaths as are lawful, we may easily return an answer to the question, are such oaths as are extorted from persons by tortures, etc., to be kept? They are to be kept if they contain nothing that is unlawful, or if they have the conditions which we have already specified as necessarily required in oaths that are proper, even though they may be disadvantageous and injurious to us. But no one should feel himself bound to keep such oaths as are evidently wrong, nor should we suffer such oaths to be extorted from us by any tortures, we should rather suffer death. Yet if such unlawful oaths are extorted from any one by fear, or by infirmity against the conscience, they bind no one to keep them, and should be retracted, because what it is wrong for us to do, that it is wicked to swear to, nor must we add sin to sin. But if such oaths as are lawful are extorted from any one, that is, if they be concerning things lawful and possible, even though they be burdensome and disadvantageous to us, yet they should be kept. Should any impossibility, however, afterwards arise, they should in that case not be kept, but be revoked. But if no such impossibility arise, they should be kept, that so the greater evil may be avoided, for we are bound by the law of God to choose that evil which is less. If it is just for any one to do what he has promised, being compelled thereto, it is in like manner just to promise by oath to do it. For what it is lawful for any one to do, that it is also lawful for him to promise to do by oath, as if any one falling into the hands of a robber should find himself compelled to promise by oath a sum of money, and in addition to this take oath to keep the matter secret as a ransom for his life, here it is not only lawful but also proper, if the thing is at all possible to be done, to make oath of both to the robber and to keep the oath that he may save his life. For what is lawful to take an oath in regard to, the same is also lawful to be done, and contrarywise. Objection. No one should take an oath in regard to what would be injurious to the commonwealth, and if such an oath be taken, it should not be kept. But to make oath of secrecy to a robber is injurious to the commonwealth, therefore such an oath should not be made, and if made, should not be kept. Answer. 1. What is injurious to the commonwealth should not be promised, in case the withholding of such a promise do not endanger our lives, and in case the person placed in such circumstances of danger be not rather bound to consult his own personal safety than to come to such a decision. 2. We also deny the minor proposition, because to make such a promise to a robber and to keep it when made is rather profitable than injurious to the commonwealth, inasmuch as the life of him who promises secrecy by an oath under such circumstances is by this means preserved, which is an advantage to the commonwealth, whereas, if he had not by an oath promised secrecy to the robber threatening him with death, he might have been slain, and so have been lost both to the commonwealth and himself. Hence to promise secrecy by an oath to a robber should rather be preferred inasmuch as this is a less evil to the state than that a member thereof should be slain. End of section 62 Section 63 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Osinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fourth Commandment. 38th Lord's Day, Question 103. What doth God require in the Fourth Command? Answer, first, that the ministry of the Gospel and the schools be maintained, and that I, especially on the Sabbath, that is, on the day of rest, diligently frequent the Church of God to hear His word, to use the sacraments, publicly to call upon the Lord and contribute to the relief of the poor as becomes a Christian. Secondly, that all the days of my life I cease from my evil works and yield myself to the Lord to work by His Holy Spirit in me, and thus begin in this life the eternal Sabbath. Exposition. The fourth commandment consists of two parts, a commandment and a reason of the commandment. The commandment is, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In it thou shalt do no manner of work, etc., of this again there are two parts, the one moral and perpetual, as that the Sabbath be kept holy, the other ceremonial and temporary, as that the seventh day be kept holy. That the first part is moral and perpetual is evident from the end and the causes of the commandment which are perpetual in their character. The end or design of the commandment is the maintenance of the public worship of God in the church. 
or the perpetual preservation and use of the ecclesiastical ministry. God designs that there should at all times be a public ministry of the church, and that there should be assemblies of the faithful to which his doctrine may be preached. The objects which God designs by this means to accomplish are, one, that he may be publicly praised and worshipped in the world, two, that the piety and faith of the elect may be stirred up and confirmed by these public services, three, that men may by this means mutually strengthen each other in the faith of the gospel and provoke one another to love and good works, four, that agreement in the doctrine of the church and in the worship of God may be preserved and perpetuated, five, that the church may be visible in the world and be distinguished from the rest of mankind. Inasmuch now as these reasons do not have respect to any particular time, but to all times and conditions of the church and world, it follows that God will always have the ministry of the church preserved, and the use thereof respected, so that the moral part of this commandment binds all men from the beginning to the end of the world to observe some Sabbath, or to devote a certain portion of their time to sermons, public prayers, and the administration of the sacraments. That the other part of the commandment is ceremonial and not perpetual is evident from the fact that the Sabbath of the seventh day was, in the promulgation of the law, instituted of God for the observance of the Mosaic worship, and given to the Jews as a sacrament, or a type of the sanctification of the church, by the Messiah who was to come. As it is said, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you, throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify them. Exodus 31 verse 13 Ezekiel 20, verse 12. Hence the Sabbath, in as far as it has respect to the seventh day, was, together with other ceremonies and types, fulfilled and abolished by the coming of the Messiah. So much briefly concerning the commandment itself. The reason of the commandment is contained in these words, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, the reason which is here given is drawn from the example of God's resting on the seventh day from the work of creation which he had accomplished in six days. It has respect, therefore, properly to the circumstance of the seventh day, or to that part of the commandment which is ceremonial. Yet the intimating of that rest to which God invites us is not only ceremonial, and so having regard to the Jews, but also moral or spiritual, being signified by the ceremonial, in which respect it belongs to all men that the commandment itself, together with the reason that is annexed to it, may be better understood, we shall now explain very briefly the words of both, after which we shall explain those subjects which fall naturally under this part of the Catechism. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What and how manifold the Sabbath is will hereafter be explained. The language which is here used is most emphatic. God speaks as if the thing concerning which he gives a command were of the greatest importance. Remember that thou keep holy, as if he would say, Thou shalt observe the Sabbath day with great care and conscientiousness. God commands elsewhere that he who would violate the Sabbath should be put to death. The reasons on account of which God commands such a careful observance of the Sabbath are, one, because a violation of the Sabbath is a violation of the whole worship of God. A neglect of the ministry of the church leads most easily and directly to a neglect and corruption of the doctrine and worship of God. 2. God, in exacting such a rigid and careful observance of the Sabbath, which was typical, would indicate thereby the greatness and necessity of the thing signified, which was the spiritual Sabbath. 3. Because God will have the external Sabbath to contribute towards beginning and perfecting in us that rest which is spiritual. Keep holy. To keep holy the Sabbath is not to spend the day in slothfulness and idleness, but to avoid sin and to perform such works as are holy. God is said to sanctify the Sabbath differently from what men do. God is said to sanctify the Sabbath because he institutes it for divine worship. Men are said to sanctify it when they devote it to the purpose for which God instituted it. Six days shalt thou labor. God allots six days for labor, the seventh he claims for divine worship, not that he would teach that the worship of God and meditation upon divine things is to be omitted on all other days beside the Sabbath, but one that there might not only be a private worship of God on the Sabbath, as at other times, but that public worship might also be observed in the church. 2. That all those other works which men ordinarily perform on the other days of the week might give place to the private and public worship of God. Thou shalt do no manner of work. 
when god forbids us to work on the sabbath day he does not forbid every kind of work but only such works as are servile such as hinder the worship of god and the design and use of the ministry of the church that this is the true sense of the command is evident from what is expressly said in other portions of the scripture you shall do no servile work therein leviticus twenty three verse twenty five it is therefore only servile works which are prohibited by this commandment hence christ in the twelfth chapter of matthew vindicates his disciples from the charge of breaking the sabbath day when they plucked the ears of corn as they passed through the fields and ate being unhungered and also himself healed on the sabbath day the man who had a withered hand and in another place luke fourteen verse five says that if an ox or an ass fall into a pit there is no sin in drawing them out on the sabbath day maccabeus also carried on war on the sabbath day and in the first book of maccabees chapter two verses forty and forty one there are reasons given in justification of this and similar works on the sabbath day if we all do as our brethren have done and fight not for our lives and laws against the heathen they will now quickly root us out of the earth at that time therefore they decreed saying whosoever shall come to make battle with us on the sabbath day we will fight against him neither will we die all as our brethren that were murdered in secret places so christ defended his disciples and himself in the place already referred to citing a passage out of the book of hosea if he had known what this meaneth i will have mercy and not sacrifice you would not have condemned the guiltless again the sabbath was made for man and not man for the sabbath matthew twelve verse seven mark two verse twenty seven christ here teaches that ceremonial works must yield to such as are moral so that ceremonies should rather be omitted than works of love which our own necessity or that of our neighbour requires hence he says have ye not read in the law how that on the sabbath day the priests in the temple profane the sabbath and are blameless but i say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple ye on the sabbath day circumcise a man if a man on the sabbath day receive circumcision that the law of moses should not be broken are ye angry at me because i have made a man every whit whole on the sabbath day matthew twelve verse five john seven verses twenty two and twenty three these declarations teach that such works as do not hinder or interfere with the proper use of the sabbath but which on the other hand rather carry out its true intention and so establish it as all those works do which pertain to the worship of god or religious ceremonies or to the duty of love towards our neighbour or to the saving of our own or the life of another as that necessity will not allow them to be deferred to another time do not violate the sabbath but are especially required in order that we may properly observe it neither thou nor thy son nor thy daughter god will have our children and families to cease from labor on the sabbath for two reasons one chiefly that they may be instructed and trained up by their parents in the worship of god and may be admitted to the privileges of the church for god will have them also to be members of his church two because he designs that love and benevolence towards our neighbor should especially be exercised and shown on the sabbath day nor thy stranger that is within thy gates god commands that even the strangers who might be found among the israelites should not work on the sabbath day and this he does upon the ground that if they were converted to the true religion they were members of the church and if they were unbelievers he commands it not on their own account but on account of the israelites lest by their example they should give offence to the church or lest their liberty might be an occasion to the jews to accomplish through them the things which they themselves were not permitted to do on the sabbath day and in this way practise deception in relation to the law of god we may here return an answer to the three following questions one were other nations also bound to observe these ceremonies which were instituted particularly for the jews if any of them lived among the israelites two was it possible or proper to constrain those who were aliens from the church to embrace the jewish religion three were the sacraments among which the sabbath was enumerated to be given in common to the unbelievers and the church to the first and second of these questions we reply that the strangers who lived among the jews were not bound or compelled to conform to all these ceremonies nor to the jewish religion itself but only to such external discipline as was necessary for the purpose of avoiding offence to the church in which they lived a magistrate ought to be a defender of order and discipline among his subjects as it respects both tables of the decalogue and to guard against and prohibit open idolatry and wickedness and ought also to avoid as far as it is possible all offences and occasions to sin that may be given to his subjects by foreigners and sojourners furthermore there was a peculiar reason calling for a particular observance of the sabbath 
inasmuch as it was not then for the first time given to the Israelites, when God gave them the law by Moses, but had been enjoined upon all men from the very beginning of the world by God himself, although this precept had been lost sight of by other nations, so much so that it was regarded as the greatest reproach which they could cast upon the Jews to term them Sabbatarians, which appellation was given to them on account of the rigid and exact observance which they paid to the Sabbath. We replied to the third question proposed, that the Sabbath was no sacrament to unbelievers, although they ceased from labor as well as those who worshipped God according to the Jewish faith, because the promise that Jehovah would be their sanctifier did not pertain to them nor were they required to abstain from their ordinary labor for an acknowledgment and confession of this promise, but merely for the sake of avoiding offense and cutting off all occasion to sin which might be given to the people of God by their laboring on the Sabbath day. Nor thy cattle. This furnishes still stronger proof that the Sabbath was no sacrament for such as did not believe, because even the cattle were required to have rest. This rest, however, as far as it has respect to cattle, is neither the worship of God, nor is it a sacrament, but it was commanded in respect to men, one, that every occasion for working on the Sabbath day might be cut off from men by forbidding them to have their cattle at work on that day, two, that in sparing their dumb beasts they might also learn how God would have them to possess and exercise kindness and equality towards their fellow men. For in six days the Lord made... The reason which is added to this commandment is drawn from the example of God's resting from the work of creation, and has respect to the ceremonial part of the commandment concerning the seventh day, as we have shown before, and rested on the seventh day. This means that God ceased to create any new works, the world being now perfect, and such as God desired it to be. God set apart this day to divine worship, one, that the rest of the seventh day might be a monument of the creation which he had accomplished, and of the constant care, preservation, and government which he has exercised of the works of his hands from that day, for his own glory and for the salvation of his people, and so might excite us to a consideration of these his works, and to praise and glorify his name for his benefits to mankind, on whose account God created and preserves all things. Two, that by the example of himself resting on the seventh day, he might exhort men, as by a most effectual and constraining argument, to imitate him, and so abstain on the seventh day from the labors to which they were accustomed during the other six days of the week. This imitation of God resting on the seventh day is twofold, ceremonial and moral, as has been shown. So our works also, from which we are required to abstain on the Sabbath, are of two kinds. Some are indeed commanded by God, but are, nevertheless, not to be done when their performance would interfere with or hinder the worship of God. The labors and duties which belong to the peculiar callings of men are of this sort. Others again are prohibited by God as sins. These works are all prohibited on the Sabbath, but by a difference which is threefold. One, works are forbidden in respect to something, viz. in as far as they hinder the ministry of the church or give offense. Sins are positively forbidden. Two, works are required to be omitted only on the Sabbath day, sins at all times. Three, resting from labor is a type of resting or ceasing from sin, which is the thing signified. Of the Sabbath, having now given a brief explanation of the words of the commandment, that the doctrine of the Sabbath and its true sanctification may be better understood, we must still further consider, first, what and how manifold is the Sabbath, second, in what respect does it belong to us, third, why was it instituted, fourth, how is it kept holy and how profaned, first, what and how manifold is the Sabbath, the word Sabbath in the Hebrew Shabbat, Shebet, and Shabbaton means quietness, rest, or ceasing from labor. God so called the day which he set apart to his own public worship, one, because he himself rested on this day, or ceased to create any new works, although he did not cease to preserve that which he had created. Two, because the Sabbath is an image or type of the spiritual rest from sin which the faithful shall enjoy in the life to come. 3. Because we also ought on this day to cease from all servile work that God may perform in us his works. 4. Because our family and cattle ought also to rest. The Sabbath is therefore a time appointed for rest from external works, whether morally or ceremonially forbidden, that is, from sins, and from the labors of our callings which have respect to this life, and is also a time set apart for the performance of those things which belong to the worship of God. The Sabbath may be viewed in a twofold aspect, either as moral and internal, or as ceremonial and external. 
the moral and internal or spiritual Sabbath includes the study of the knowledge of God and of his works, with a careful shunning of sin and worshipping God by confession and obedience. Or we may define it more briefly as a ceasing from sin and a giving of ourselves to God to do such works as he requires from us. The Sabbath, although it ought to be perpetual in those who are converted, is nevertheless only begun in this life, and is called the Sabbath both because it is even now a true rest from the labours and miseries of this life, with a consecration of ourselves to the service of God, and also because it was formerly signified by the ceremonial Sabbath. I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Ezekiel 20 verse 12 But in the life to come this Sabbath will be enjoyed perfectly and forever, and will consist in perpetually praising and glorifying God, being entirely freed and released from the cares and labours with which we are now perplexed and occupied. And it shall come to pass, that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Isaiah 66 verse 23. The ceremonial or external Sabbath is a certain time set apart in the church for the preaching of the word, and for the administration of the sacraments, or for the public worship of God, during which time there is a suspension or abstinence from all other works. This external Sabbath possesses likewise a twofold character, being immediate and mediate. The former or immediate Sabbath was that which was instituted immediately by God himself, and enjoined upon the church under the Old Testament dispensation. This Sabbath was again viewed in different aspects, as one, the Sabbath of days. This was every seventh day of the week, which was more particularly and properly called the Sabbath, on account of God's resting from the work of the creation of the world, and on account of the rest which the people of God were required to observe on that day. Hence the Hebrews were accustomed to call the whole seven days or week the Sabbath or Sabbaths by a synecdoche. Matthew 28 verse 1 So it was also in regard to other festival days, as the Feast of the Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, Trumpets, and Fasts, etc., because the Jews upon these days were required to abstain from labor, and rest as much so as on the seventh day. 2. The Sabbath of months were the new moons. 3. The Sabbath of years was every seventh year in which the Jews were required to intermit the tillage of their fields, during which time they neither sowed their fields nor pruned their vineyards. Here also, as in the former instance, the whole seven years were by a synecdoche called Sabbaths, Leviticus 25 verse 4, chapter 26 verse 35, chapter 25 verse 8. The immediate external Sabbath is that which God has instituted through the Church under the New Testament dispensation which belongs to the first day of the week, which is called Sunday, or more properly the Lord's Day, which the Christian Church has observed in the place of the seventh day from the time of the Apostles, in view of the resurrection of Christ, as appears from what the Apostle John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Revelation 1 verse 10 or to express it more briefly, we may say that the ceremonial Sabbath is twofold, the one belonging to the Old, the other to the New Testament. The Old was restricted to the seventh day, its observance was necessary and constituted the worship of God. The New depends upon the decision and appointment of the Church, which, for certain reasons, has made choice of the first day of the week, which is to be observed for the sake of order and not from any idea of necessity, as if this and no other were to be observed by the Church, concerning which we shall presently speak. A table respecting the distinction of the Sabbath. The Sabbath, or an abstinence from work, is either 1. Internal, moral, and spiritual as rest from sin, or 2. External and ceremonial, instituted by God, either 1. Immediately in the Old Testament, as the Sabbath, 1. Of days, as the seventh day, or feast days, as the Passover, Pentecost, etc., or two of moons, as the new moons, or three of years, as every seventh year, or two immediately through the church in the New Testament as the Lord's Day. Second, in how far does the Sabbath belong to us? The Sabbath of the seventh day was appointed of God from the very beginning of the world to declare that men, after his example, should rest from their labors and especially from sin. This commandment was subsequently repeated in the law as given by Moses, at which time the ceremony, which had respect to the observance of the seventh day, as a day of rest, was made a sacrament of sanctification, by which God declared that he would be the sanctifier of his church, or that he would pardon the sins of such as would believe, and receive them into favor on account of the Messiah promised to the fathers, and who would, at the appointed time, make his appearance in the world. 
the reason why the ceremonial Sabbath of the seventh day is now abolished is because it was typical, signifying the benefits of the Messiah, and admonishing the people of God of their duty. It was for the same reason that all the other sacraments, sacrifices, and ceremonies instituted before and after the giving of the law were abolished by the coming of Christ, who fulfilled all that was signified by these things. But although the ceremonial Sabbath has been abolished in the New Testament, yet the moral still continues and pertains to us as well as to others, for there is now just as much necessity for a certain time to be set apart in the Christian church for the preaching of God's word and for the public administration of the sacraments as there was formerly in the Jewish church. Yet we must not suppose that we are restricted or tied down either to Saturday, Wednesday, or any other day. The apostolic church, to distinguish itself from the Jewish synagogue, chose in the exercise of the liberty conferred upon it by Christ the first day of the week in the place of the seventh, because on that day the resurrection of Christ took place, by which the internal and spiritual Sabbath is begun in us. In a word, we are bound to the Sabbath, whether considered morally or ceremonially, as it respects that which is general, but not as it respects that which is particular. Or, in other words, there is a necessity that we should have a certain day on which the church should be instructed and the sacraments administered, yet we are not bound or tied down to any particular day. The Jews present the following objections against the abrogation of the ceremonial Sabbath. 1. The Decalogue is a perpetual law. The commandment respecting the Sabbath is a part of the Decalogue, therefore it is a perpetual law and should not be abolished. Answer: The Decalogue is a perpetual law in as far as it is moral, but those things which were added to it for the sake of signification, or which may be viewed as limitations of the moral precepts of the Decalogue, were to be preserved merely to the coming of the Messiah. Objection 2. The commandments of the Decalogue pertain to all men. This commandment is one of the precepts of the Decalogue, therefore it pertains to all men, and so ought not to be abolished. Answer. The Decalogue is a perpetual law in as far as it is moral, but those things which were added to it for the sake of signification, or which may be viewed as limitations of the moral precepts of the Decalogue, were to be preserved merely to the coming of the Messiah. Objection 2. The commandments of the Decalogue pertain to all men. This commandment is one of the precepts of the Decalogue, therefore it pertains to all men, and so ought not to be abolished. Answer, we grant the argument in as far as it respects that which is moral, but this commandment is in part ceremonial, and in this respect does not pertain to us, although that which is general does. The reasons of this are evident. 1. Paul says, Let no man judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day. Colossians 2, verse 16. 2. The apostles themselves changed the Sabbath of the seventh day. 3. From the design of the law, it was a type of things that were to be fulfilled by Christ, viz. of sanctification, etc. Every type now must give place to its antitype, or to that which is signified by it. Again, the Jewish nation was by this means separated from the other nations of the earth, which separation was removed or taken away by Christ. Objection 3. The Lord says of the Sabbath, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, and an everlasting covenant. Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17. Therefore the Sabbath of the seventh day is perpetual, and never to be abolished. Answer 1. The ceremonial Sabbath was perpetual until the coming of Christ, who put an end to ceremonies by fulfilling them. 2. The Sabbath is to continue forever, as it respects the thing which is signified, which is a ceasing from sin and a rest in God. In this sense, all the types of the Old Testament are perpetual, even the kingdom of David itself, which was, nevertheless, overthrown before the coming of Christ. We may here refer the reader to what has already been said respecting the abrogation of the law under the third general division of the law, particularly the first and second objections. Objection 4. The laws which were given before the time of Moses were unchangeable. The precept respecting the setting apart of the seventh day as the Sabbath was given before the time of Moses, therefore it is unchangeable, even though we may grant that the Mosaic ceremonies were to be changed. Answer. The major proposition is particular, being true only as it respects those laws which are moral and not concerning those which are ceremonial, for even the ceremonies which were instituted by God before the time of Moses, which were types of the benefits which the Messiah was to procure, have been abolished by the coming of Christ, as is true of circumcision given to Abraham, and of the sacrifices which our first parents were commanded to offer. 
Objection 5. The laws which God gave before the fall are binding upon all men, and were not types of the benefits of the Messiah, inasmuch as the promise respecting the Messiah was not then given, and there was one and the same condition pertaining to the whole human race. But God had already set apart the seventh day as a day of rest, before the fall of our first parents, therefore this commandment is universal and perpetual. Answer. The major proposition is true as it respects the moral law, some natural conceptions and principles of which were impressed upon the mind of man in his creation, but not as touching the observance of the seventh day, which after the fall was made in the law of Moses a type of the benefits of the Messiah, and was therefore, as other ceremonies which were then instituted or instituted at an earlier period, made changeable by the coming of Christ, for God will not permit the types and shadows of certain things to remain any longer in force, when the things which they signify become real. Hence, although we grant that the exercises of divine worship were to have been observed upon the seventh day, according to the command of the Decalogue, as well as if men had never sinned, as now since they have sinned, yet after God had placed the observance of this particular day among those things which were shadows of the benefits of the Messiah which was to come, by the new law which was given to Moses it became changeable with other ceremonies, Objection 6. If the cause of any law be perpetual, the law itself must be perpetual. The remembrance and celebration of the creation of all things, together with meditation upon the works of God, is a perpetual cause, calling for the observance of the seventh day as the Sabbath. Therefore the law respecting the observance of the seventh day as the Sabbath is unchangeable, even after the coming of Christ. Answer. We must here again make a distinction in replying to the major proposition that law is indeed unchangeable by reason of an immutable cause, provided that cause or end necessarily and constantly requires this law as an effect or as a means, but not if at other times the same end may be more successfully reached by other means, or in case the lawgiver may accomplish it as well by another law. But we may meditate upon the works of God and magnify his power and goodness as they appear in them upon any other day, as well as upon the seventh day. Therefore this cause does not demand a perpetual law respecting the observance of the seventh day as the Sabbath. The Anabaptists bring as an objection against the observance of the first day of the week or the Lord's Day those passages of Scripture which forbid any distinction being made between days under the New Testament. Let no man judge you in respect to an holy day. Ye observe days and months and times and years. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it, etc. Colossians 2 verse 16, Galatians 4 verse 10, Romans 14 verse 6. Therefore, say they, the observance of the first day is as much condemned as that of the seventh. We reply to the antecedent that the scriptures do not simply or absolutely forbid Christians to make a distinction between days, but only when it is done with an idea of establishing ceremonial worship or of necessity. But it is not in this way that the church observes the Lord's Day or the first day of the week. The observance of the first day of the week on the part of Christians differs in two respects from the observance of the Jewish Sabbath. One, it was not lawful for the Jews, on account of the express command of God, to alter or change the Sabbath of the seventh day as being a part of the ceremonial worship, but the Christian church, in the exercise of her own liberty, sets apart the first or any other day to the ministry, without connecting with it any opinion of necessity or worship. 2. The ancient Sabbath was a type of things in the Old Testament which were to be fulfilled by Christ. But in the New Testament that signification has ceased, whilst respect is had merely to order and propriety, without which the ministry of the church would either be no ministry or at least not a properly constituted one. Third, for what was the Sabbath instituted? The ultimate ends for which the Sabbath was instituted are chiefly these. 1. The public worship of God in the church. 2. The preservation of the ecclesiastical ministry, which is an office divinely instituted, to give instructions to the church concerning God and His will, out of the holy scriptures delivered by the prophets and apostles, and to administer the sacraments according to divine appointment. This is a most important end, on account of which the Sabbath was instituted, inasmuch as the public and ordinary preaching of the gospel, in connection with the offering up of prayer, thanksgiving, and the use of divine rites, are public exercises, exciting and cherishing faith and repentance in the elect. 3. That it might be in the Old Testament a type signifying the spiritual and eternal Sabbath. 
I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Ezekiel 20 verse 12 4. That the circumstance of the seventh day might remind and admonish men of the creation of the world, and of the duty of meditating upon the works which God made in six days. 5. That works of charity, liberality, and kindness might especially be performed towards our neighbor on this day. 6. For the sake of bodily rest, both to man and beasts, to beasts for the sake of man. 7. That men might by their example provoke one another to piety and the worship of God. I will declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Psalm 22, verse 22. 8. That the church might by this means be visible in the world, and be distinguished from idolaters and blasphemers, so that those who are yet out of the church may know to what communion they ought to attach themselves. The Sabbath now was a mark under the Old Testament by which the people Israel were distinguished and separated from other nations. Fourth, how is the Sabbath kept holy and how profaned, or what are the works commanded and forbidden on the Sabbath? The sanctification of the Sabbath consists in performing such holy works as God has commanded to be done on this day. So, on the other hand, the Sabbath is profaned either when holy works are omitted, or when such works are performed as hinder the ministry of the church, and as are contrary to the things which belong to the proper sanctification of the Sabbath. The works by which the Sabbath is sanctified, and those which are contrary thereto, being the ones by which it is profaned, are chiefly these. First, rightly to teach and instruct the church concerning God and His will. The teaching which is here enjoined is different from that required by the third commandment, for there the propagation of the doctrine of the church is made the duty of every one privately, whilst here the office of teaching is committed to certain persons who, being divinely furnished with the gifts necessary for this calling, are lawfully called by the church to act in the capacity of teachers. This commandment now requires all those who are called to teach in the church, faithfully to deliver and expound sound doctrine, both publicly to those who assemble together for the purpose of receiving instruction, and to everyone privately, as occasion and necessity may admit and require all of which is done for public edification and for the salvation of each one individually. The following and similar passages of Scripture may here be appropriately cited. Leviticus 10 verse 11, Acts 13 verse 15, chapter 17 verse 2, 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, etc. The opposite of this includes one, an omission or neglect of the duty of teaching, whether privately or publicly, concerning which God complains through the prophet when he says, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Isaiah 56 verse 10, Ezekiel 34 verse 2. Second, to administer the sacraments according to divine appointment. This should likewise be performed by the ministers of the church, lawfully called for the purpose of attending to this duty. Yet we must not suppose that the administration of the sacraments is any more restricted and tied down to certain days and times than the preaching of the word. All that is necessary is that the administration should be public, that it should be done by the ministers of the church who bear a public character and represent God speaking with men. So circumcision was administered on any day which might be the eighth day after the birth of the child, whether it was the Sabbath or not. So baptism may be administered at any time, though the administration of the sacraments should take place chiefly on the Sabbath day. When ye come together in one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and prayers. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 20 and 33, Acts 2, verse 42. To the lawful administration of the sacraments is opposed an omission of this duty, or a neglect to exhort the church to a proper use of the sacraments. The same thing is also true in regard to such an administration of the sacraments as is unlawful, which is the case whenever anything is taken away from or added to those ordinances which have been divinely instituted, or when there is any change made in them, or when those are excluded from the sacraments who ought to be admitted and others are admitted who ought to be excluded, or when the people are not properly instructed in relation to their lawful use. Third, diligently to learn the doctrine of the church, which is to frequent the public gatherings of the saints for the purpose of hearing and learning the doctrine delivered from heaven, and having heard it, to meditate seriously upon it and inquire into its truth, 
but more especially to devote those days which have been set apart to the ministry and service of God, in reading, in meditating, and discoursing upon divine things. These things are evident and follow naturally from their correlatives, for if God will have those whose duty it shall be diligently to teach on the Sabbath day, he also requires men diligently to hear and learn this doctrine which he reveals unto them through his servants, and to accompany this hearing with private meditation, as in the case of the Bereans, of whom it is said, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. Acts 17, verse 11. Such a study of the doctrine of the church is, however, especially necessary for those who either now or hereafter may be called to minister to the church in the capacity of teachers. Hence it is that the apostle exhorts Timothy to give attendance to reading, to exhortation and doctrine. 1 Timothy 4, verse 13. The opposite of such a diligent study of the doctrine of the church shows itself in the lowest and most common form, one in a contempt and neglect of this doctrine, which may be said to take place whenever men absent themselves from the public assemblies of the church without any just hindrance or excuse, and attend to such things on the Sabbath day as could easily be deferred, or when they appear in the church among the worshippers of God without giving a proper hearing or attention to the sermons which are delivered, or when they do not meditate upon and inquire into the truth of the doctrine of God's word. 2. A neglect to obtain a knowledge of the teachings of the church from those who are called of God to the study of this doctrine, or who may hereafter devote themselves to the work of spreading a knowledge of God and His will, and who may have a greater opportunity and ability of imparting a knowledge of this doctrine than others, for unto whomsoever much is given, of him much shall be required. Luke 12, verse 48. 3. Curiosity, which is a desire to know or hear those things which God has not revealed, which are unnecessary and new. For men to search their own glory is not glory. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. Proverbs 25 verse 27 2 Timothy 2, verse 23, chapter 4, verse 3. See also 1 Timothy 4, verse 7, Titus 3, verse 9. Fourth, to use the sacraments according to divine appointment. Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, etc. Acts 20, verse 7. So God commanded that the Passover should be observed in a solemn assembly of the people, and assigned certain sacrifices to the Sabbath and other holy days and as God will have his word publicly preached and heard, so he will also have the true and lawful use of the sacraments observed and seen in the public assemblies of the church, inasmuch as both are marks by which the true church may be known and distinguished from all other religions and people. The sacraments also, just as the word, constitute a part of the public worship of God in the church, and are means to stir up and cherish faith and godliness in the faithful, Hence the use of the sacraments is most intimately connected with a proper observance and sanctification of the Sabbath. To such a lawful use of the sacraments there is opposed, 1. A neglect and contempt of the sacraments, 2. A profanation of the sacraments, as when they are observed in a manner different from what God has commanded, or by those for whom they were not instituted. 3. A superstitious use of the sacraments, as when salvation and the grace of God are tied to the observance of the rites, or when they are directed to such ends as God has not appointed, the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man, he that sacrificeth a lamb is as if he cut off a dog's neck, etc. Genesis 17, verse 14, Isaiah 66, verse 3. Fifth, a public calling upon God in which we unite our own confession, thanksgiving, and prayer with the church, for God will not only be invoked by every one privately, but also publicly by the whole church, for his own glory and our comfort. It is for this reason that Christ has added a special promise to such prayers as are offered up publicly. If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Matthew 18 verses 19 and 20. It is not public prayer, but ostentation and hypocrisy, 
the counterfeit of true piety that Christ condemns when he says, When thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Matthew 6, verse 6. That this is the true sense of these words is evident from what immediately proceeds, where Christ says, When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the street, etc., the difference between the invocation which is here enjoined and that which is enjoined in the third commandment consists in this, that this is public, having respect to the whole church, whilst that is private, having respect to each one individually. The extremes of this virtue are, one, a neglect or want of attention to the prayers of the church, two, a hypocritical offering of prayer with the church when there is no heartfelt devotion, three, a mere repetition of prayers without any edification to the church, for thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 17. Sixth, charity and liberality to the poor, which consists in giving alms and performing works of love to the needy to sanctify the Sabbath in this way by showing our obedience to the doctrine of Christ. We may here appropriately cite the discourse of Christ concerning the Sabbath, in which he asked the Jews, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil? Mark 3, verse 4. And although God will have us to observe this Sabbath during our whole life, yet he desires that we give an example and evidence of it, especially at such times as are allotted for teaching and studying his word. For if anyone shows no disposition to obey God when the doctrine of God's word sounds in his ears, and when, free from other cares, God commands us to give ourselves to the contemplation of godliness and repentance, he declares by such indifference that he will much less do it at other times. Hence it has always been the practice of the church to bestow alms upon the Sabbath day, and to perform acts of charity towards those who need our help and sympathy. Send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy unto the Lord. Nehemiah 8 verse 10 The opposite of this virtue shows itself in a neglect and contempt of the poor, and in giving our alms for the sake of being seen of men, which Christ condemns. Seventh the honour of the ecclesiastical ministry which embraces many particulars, among which we may mention one reverence, which consists in an acknowledgment of the divine order and will in the institution and preservation of the ministry, in gathering the church by means of it, and in the declaration of this our judgment concerning the ministry both in word and deed. Let a man so account of us, as of the ministers of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20. 2. Love by which we willingly frequent the gatherings of the church, hear and study the doctrine of Christ, and desire and pray for every needful blessing to rest upon the faithful ministers of the church, not merely in view of the duty of love which we owe to them, but also on account of the office which they discharge. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even thirsteth for the courts of the Lord. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go unto the house of the Lord. Psalm 84, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 122, verse 1. 3. Obedience in those things which belong to the ministry. Obey them that have the rule over you. Hebrews 12, verse 17. The works of love to God and our neighbor, including the entire life of the Christian, which is the spiritual Sabbath, fall properly under this head, for to observe the spiritual Sabbath is nothing else than to obey the voice of God, speaking to us through the ministry of the church, in regulating and directing the life. 4. Gratitude, which includes such duties as pertain to the preservation of the ministry and of ministers, for if God designs that there should be a ministry, he also designs that it should be perpetuated, and that every one contribute to the extent of his ability to the accomplishment of this object. We may here appropriately cite the laws of Moses respecting the firstborns, the firstfruits, tithes, and many other offerings which were given to the priests and Levites, by way of compensation, that so they might give themselves wholly to their work without any distraction, and although the circumstances of these laws have been abolished, yet the general principle which lies at the bottom will continue forever, because God will have the ministry of the church maintained to the end of the world. Take heed to thyself, that thou forsake not the Levite as long as thou livest upon the earth, who goeth a warfare at any time at his own charges, who planteth a vineyard, and eateth not of the fruit thereof, who feedeth a flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock, etc. 
Deuteronomy 12, verse 19, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 7, see also Galatians 6, verse 6, 1 Timothy 5, verse 17, Matthew 10, verse 14. The maintenance of schools may be embraced under this part of the honour which is due to the ministry, for unless the arts and sciences be taught, men can neither become properly qualified to teach, nor can the purity of doctrine be preserved and defended against the assaults of heretics. 5. Moderation and allowance in bearing such infirmities and imperfections of ministers as do not greatly and evidently corrupt and impede the objects of the ministry and injure the church by giving offence. Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. 1 Timothy 5, verse 19. The opposite of all this is embraced in a contempt of the ministry of the church, which takes place when this ministry is abolished, or is committed to persons unworthy of such a trust, or when it is not acknowledged as the means which God will employ for gathering the church. The same thing is likewise true when the ministers of the church are treated with contempt and reproach, when their teachings are heard but not practised in the life, when acts of charity are overlooked, and when it is made ineffectual by things of a trifling and wicked character. So there is a contempt of the ministry of the church when a sufficient and necessary support is withheld, or when it is not protected and defended, and when other duties of gratitude are not performed towards the ministers of Christ, when schools are not maintained and supported, when learning is neglected, and when, instead of making proper allowance for such defects of ministers as result from our natural weakness and imperfection, they are treated with contempt and derision. It is also in opposition to the use of the ministry, and at the same time a contempt thereof, whenever any one, by his advice, example, or other means, prevents his own family or others from attending upon the public instructions of the sanctuary. End of section 63《Section 64 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Osinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ecclesiastical Ministry Concerning the Ministry of the Church Having now seen that this fourth command sanctions and authorizes the public worship of God, and so by consequence the ministry of the Church, together with the honour and use connected with it, it is necessary that we should here make some remarks in reference to the ministry, and in so doing we shall inquire, first, what is the ministry of the church, second, for what end has it been instituted, third, what are the grades of ministers, fourth, what are the duties devolving upon the ministers of the church, fifth, to whom should the ministry be committed, first, what is the ministry of the church, the ecclesiastical ministry is that office which God has instituted in his church, to which he has committed the preaching of his word and the administration of the sacraments according to divine appointment. The ministry of the church includes, therefore, these two things, the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments. Second, for what has the ministry of the church been instituted? The reasons for which God instituted the ministry of the church are, one, the glory of God, God will not only be praised and called upon by men privately, but also by the public voice of the whole church. Bless ye God in the congregations, Psalm 68, verse 26. 2. That it may be a means or instrumentality by which men may be converted to God. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, etc. 3 that God might in this way accommodate himself to our weakness and infirmity in teaching men by men. 4. That men might provoke one another by their example to godliness and to the praise and worship of God. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. Psalm 22, verse 22. 5. That God may thus show his mercy, in that he commits to the hands of men that great work, the ministry of reconciliation, which the Son of God himself discharged. 6. That the church may be visible in the world, that so the elect may know to what they ought to attach themselves, and that the reprobate may be rendered perfectly inexcusable in that they despise and endeavour to make ineffectual the voice and call which God addresses in their hearing. But, I say, have they not heard? 
Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. Romans 10, verse 18. See also 2 Corinthians 2, verses 14, 15, and 16. Third, what are the grades or degrees of ministers? Some ministers are called immediately by God, whilst others, again, are called immediately by the church. Prophets and apostles have been called in the way first mentioned. Prophets were ministers called immediately by God for the purpose of teaching and expounding the doctrine of Moses and the promises respecting the Messiah, to reprove and do away with the corruptions and errors in the church and state, and to utter predictions respecting the church and the world, having the testimony and assurance that they could not err in the doctrines which they delivered in the name of God. Apostles were ministers called immediately by Christ to publish the doctrine respecting the Messiah already come in the flesh, and to spread it throughout the whole world, having a similar testimony from God that they could not err in the doctrine. Ministers, called immediately, are one evangelists, who were assistants to the apostles, and were sent by them to teach and establish various churches. Two, bishops or pastors are ministers called by the church to teach the word of God and to administer the sacraments in particular churches. Three, doctors or teachers are ministers called by the church to teach in certain churches. Four, governors are ministers chosen by the judgment of the church for the purpose of exercising discipline and for managing those things necessary for the order and prosperity of the church. Five, deacons are ministers chosen by the church to take care of the poor and to attend to the distribution of the alms of the church. Fourth, what are the duties devolving upon the ministers of the church? The duties of the ministers of the church include in general, one, a faithful and correct exposition of the true and uncorrupted doctrine of the law and gospel, so that the church may be able to understand it. Two, a lawful administration of the sacraments according to divine appointment. Three, to give the church a good example of what constitutes a Christian life and godly conversation. In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. Titus 2 verse 7. 4. A diligent attention to their flocks. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. Acts 20 verse 28. 5. To give proper respect and submission to the decisions of the church. 6. To see that proper respect and attention be given to the poor. 5. To whom should the ministry be committed? The Apostle Paul plainly teaches in his epistles to Timothy and Titus to whom and to what persons the ministry ought to be committed by the church. To sum up the whole, in a few words we may say that the ministry of the church should be committed, one, to men and not to women, I suffer not a woman to teach, 1 Timothy 2 verse 12, two, to such as have a good report within and without the church. A bishop must be blameless, have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. 1 Timothy 3 verses 2 and 7. 3. To such as are able to teach, having a proper understanding of the doctrine, and possessed of such gifts as are necessary for its exposition, a bishop must be apt to teach. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Holding fast the faithful word, as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. 1 Timothy 3 verse 2, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, Titus 1 verse 9. End of section 64. Section 65 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Asinus. Translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Concerning Ceremonies A part of this fourth commandment being ceremonial, as has been shown in the remarks we have made, it seems proper that we should here make some remarks respecting ceremonies, and for a better understanding of the whole subject we shall inquire, first, what are ceremonies, second, in what ceremonies differ from moral works, third, how many kinds of ceremonies are there, Fourth, is it lawful for the church to institute ceremonies? First, what are ceremonies? The Romans were wont to call every form of divine worship by the name of ceremony, from the town Sere, 
in which the images of the gods were kept from the Gauls, as Livy testifies in his fifth book. Macrobius derives the term from carenda, as understood by the church, all external and solemn actions instituted by the ministry for the sake of order or signification are termed ceremonies. Second, in what do ceremonies differ from moral works? Ceremonies differ from moral works in the following particulars. 1. Ceremonies are temporary, moral works are perpetual. 2. Ceremonies are always observed in the same way, moral works are not always performed in the same way. 3. Ceremonies signify, moral actions are signified. 4. The moral is to be viewed as the general, the ceremonial as the particular. 5. The moral is the end and design of the ceremonial, the ceremonial contributes to the moral. We may here refer the reader to what has already been said in regard to these differences under the subject of the law. Third, how many kinds of ceremonies are there? There are two kinds of ceremonies, some that are commanded by God himself, and others that are instituted by men. Ceremonies which have been instituted by God are such as constitute his worship, and can only be changed by God himself. Sacrifices, by which we offer and render obedience to God, are ceremonies of this sort, being divinely instituted. So the sacraments, by which God testifies and bestows his benefits upon us, are also divinely instituted. Ceremonies instituted by the church are not the worship of God, and may be changed by the advice of the church, if there are sufficient causes to demand a change. Fourth, is it lawful for the church to institute ceremonies? The church may and ought to institute certain ceremonies inasmuch as the moral worship of God cannot be observed without defining and fixing the various circumstances connected with it. We may therefore say that it is proper for the church to institute ceremonies when the following conditions are observed. 1. They must not be unholy, but such as are agreeable to the word of God. 2. They must not be superstitious such as may easily lead men astray, so as to attach to them worship, merit, or necessity, and which may occasion offence when observed. 3. They must not be too numerous, so as to be oppressive and burdensome. 4. They must not be empty, insignificant, and unprofitable, but tend to edification. End of section 65section 66 of commentary on the heidelberg catechism by zacharias osinus translated by g w williard this librivox recording is in the public domain the fifth commandment thirty-ninth lord's day question what doth god require in the fifth command answer that i show all honour love and fidelity to my father and mother and all in authority over me and submit myself to their good instruction and correction with due obedience and also patiently bear with their weaknesses and infirmities, since it pleases God to govern us with their hand. Exposition. The laws of the second table of the Decalogue now follow, the obedience of which has respect to God as well as the commandments of the first table. The works, however, which are here enjoined are performed immediately towards men. The immediate object of the second table is our neighbor, whilst God is the immediate object. Christ embodies the sum of the obedience required by the second table of the Decalogue in these words, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself, and lays down this rule for the better understanding of the precepts of this table, All things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Matthew 7 verse 12. Christ also says in reference to the whole second table, and the second is like unto the first, Matthew 22 verse 39, which must be understood, one, of the kind of worship which is enjoined in each table, which is spiritual and more important than that which is ceremonial, two, of the same kind of punishment which is threatened and inflicted upon all those who violate the commandments of either table, which punishment is eternal, three, of the inseparable connection which exists between the love of God and our neighbour, which connection is like that of cause and effect, so that the one cannot be without the other. Obedience to the second table is therefore necessary and exacted from us by God, just as much as obedience to the first table. The reasons of this are such as these. 1. That God himself may be worshipped by this obedience, and that our love to him may be manifested by the love which we cherish towards our neighbour on God's account. 
two, that our conformity with God may be made manifest by the love which we have towards our neighbour, three, that human society may be preserved, which was formed and constituted by God for the praise and glory of his name. This fifth commandment, moreover, respecting the honour due to parents, which Jerome expressly calls the fifth in order, is placed first in the second table, one, because it is the foundation, cause, and bond of obedience to all the other commandments belonging to this table, for if the obedience can be maintained and enforced, which is due from those who are placed in subjection to their superiors, who should command and preserve in the name of God, obedience to the commandments which follow this precept of the Decalogue, then will obedience to all the other precepts necessarily follow. Two, because God has connected with this commandment a special promise of long life, which is always regarded as a great blessing to those who render obedience to this precept of the Decalogue. This commandment consists of two parts, a command and a promise. The command is honour thy father and thy mother. The design or end of this commandment is the preservation of civil order, which God has appointed in the mutual duties between inferiors and their superiors. Superiors are all those whom God has placed over others for the purpose of governing and defending them. Inferiors are those whom God has placed under others that they may be governed and defended by them. Superiors are included in this commandment under the terms father and mother, and are 1. Parents themselves, from whom we have proceeded, 2. Tutors and guardians of children, 3. Schoolmasters, teachers and ministers of the gospel, 4. Magistrates, whether high or low, 5. Elders. All these persons now, together with all others, who may be placed in positions of authority, are comprehended under the term parents, as used by this commandment, and are to be honoured by us because God gives them all to us in the place of parents, whose duties they discharge and are, so to speak, God's vice-regents in ruling and defending us, having been substituted by God in the room of parents, when the wickedness of men began to increase in the earth. God, in this commandment, makes mention of parents in preference to other governors, and requires that they should be honoured, one, because the paternal power and government was the first that was established among men, two, because this is, as it were, the rule and pattern according to which all other forms of government should be formed and exercised, three, because this form of government is the most agreeable to men, so that they readily submit themselves to it, four, because any and every contempt or disrespect shown to parents is a sin of the most grievous and aggravated character, and therefore condemned by God and punished most severely, inasmuch as the obligation to honour and obey them is of peculiar force and strength. This commandment, therefore, does not merely require that we honour and respect our parents, but all who are in authority over us, and requires also, on the other hand, obedience not merely from children, but from all inferiors of whatever rank or grade. So the duties which these two classes of persons owe respectively to each other are in like manner enjoined in this precept of the Decalogue, for when God requires parents to be honoured, he at the same time demands that they so discharge the duties of parents as to be worthy of honour. And in thus enjoining the duties which are devolving upon parents, he also enjoins the duties of all others in authority, inasmuch as they are all comprehended in the term parents as here used. So God in like manner enjoins the duties of children when he commands them to honour their parents, and not only of children, but of all others in subjection, since God will have all those who are in positions of authority honoured by those who are under them. We may now, in view of what has just been said, easily return an answer to this objection. God in this commandment merely requires that parents should be honoured, which is the duty of inferiors. Therefore he here commands nothing respecting superiors. Answer, we deny the consequence, for we may retort the argument of our opponents and say, because God commands parents to be honoured, he also enjoins the duties which are devolving upon all those who are in authority. For when God gives the name to those who occupy positions of authority, he also grants them that from which they have the name, and if he desires them to be honoured, he also requires them to do such things as entitle them to honour and respect. And although it may sometimes be the case that wicked men are elevated to positions of authority who are not worthy of honour, yet the office must be distinguished from the persons who are invested with it, so that whilst we detest the wickedness of the men, we should nevertheless honour their office on account of its divine appointment. And as they are to be honoured on account of their office, which is to rule their subjects according to the will of God, whose ministers they are, it is manifest that we must obey them only in as far as they do not go beyond the proper limits of their office. 
The promise annexed to this commandment is that thy days may be long in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. God added this promise, one, that he might invite and urge us the more strongly to obey this precept by placing before us so great a benefit as a reward. Two, that he might in this way declare how highly he esteems those who honour their parents, and how severely he will punish all those who withhold this honour and respect. Three, that he might teach us how necessary obedience to this commandment is, inasmuch as it is a preparation and constraining motive of obedience to all the commandments which follow. Hence Paul, in referring to this promise, says that it is the first commandment with promise, by which he means that it is the first commandment which has the promise of any special or certain benefit, which God promises to bestow upon those who render the obedience which it requires. The blessing which God here promises is a long life upon earth. Objection 1. The first table has also a promise annexed to it. Therefore this commandment is not the first with promise. Answer. This commandment has a special promise, whilst the promise of the first table is general. Objection 2. But a long life does not seem to be a blessing in view of the miseries which are connected with this present state of being. Therefore it is a useless promise. Answer. That a long life seems not to be a blessing comes to pass by an accident, for in itself it is a great blessing, although it is connected with much misery and suffering. To this the following objections are brought forward. 1. A good connected with great evils is rather to be deprecated than desired. A long life now is connected with great evils. Therefore it seems, on account of this accident, rather to be deprecated than to be desired. We reply that a good is to be deprecated if the evils connected with it are greater than the good itself, but God promises to the godly in connection with a long life a mitigation of the calamities to which we are here subject, and a long enjoyment of his blessings even in this life. Then, too, the constant worship and praise of God in this life is a blessing of such great value that the various calamities to which we are here subject are not worthy to be compared with it. Objection 2. But the wicked and disobedient are also often blessed with a long life, therefore it is not a blessing peculiar to the godly. Answer. A few exceptions do not overthrow a general rule for the wicked and disobedient, for the most part, perish prematurely and suddenly. The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pluck it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. Whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. Proverbs 30 verse 17, chapter 20 verse 20. Again, temporal blessings are bestowed upon the godly for their salvation, and are therefore evidences of God's favour towards them, whilst they are conferred upon the ungodly partly that they may be rendered inexcusable, inasmuch as they have been in this way called to repentance, and partly that the godly and the elect, who are mixed with them, may enjoy these things. Objection 3. But many obedient and godly children die at an early age and do not live to enjoy the blessing of a long life, therefore the promise is not universal. Answer. We may here reply, as we did to the former objection, that a few exceptions do not destroy the force of a general rule. The godly, for the most part, have the truth of this promise verified in their case. Promises of temporal blessings, too, must be understood as making an exception respecting chastisements and the cross, and still further, an early translation to another and better life, even a heavenly life, is a most ample recompense for a long life. The obedience required by this commandment comprehends three parts. 1. The proper virtues of superiors, or those who are placed in authority. 2. The proper virtues of inferiors, or those who are in subjection. 3. The virtues common to both. The proper virtues of superiors distinguished according to their respective offices. The office and duties of parents require 1. That they should nourish and cherish their children. Matthew 7 verse 9. 2. That they should defend their children from injuries. 1 Timothy 5 verse 8. 3. That they should instruct or give them over to others, that they may be instructed and properly educated. Ephesians 6 verse 4. Deuteronomy 4 verse 9. 4. That they should govern them by such discipline as belongs to the domestic constitution. Proverbs 13 verse 1, chapter 19 verse 18. The same duties are devolving upon guardians or tutors who occupy the place of parents. The faults or sins of parents in opposition to the duties just enumerated are 1. Not to seek or provide the support and nourishment necessary for their children, or to bring them up in luxury and extravagance. 2. Not to protect them from injuries, or not to accustom them to patience and gentleness, 
or to sin by manifesting an imprudent zeal and passion when small, or even no injuries are inflicted upon our children. 3. Not to educate their children, or to have no care to have them educated according to their own or their children's ability, or to corrupt them by their own evil example or bad instruction. 4. To raise their children in idleness and licentiousness, or not to correct them when necessity requires it, or to chastise them with greater severity than duty or the nature of the offence demands, and so to alienate their affections by too great severity and cruelty. The office of schoolmasters or teachers requires them, one, faithfully to teach and instruct the pupils committed to their care, seeing that they occupy the place of parents in this respect, two, to rule and govern them with proper and suitable discipline, the same faults and sins which we have just enumerated as often attaching themselves to parents in the education and government of their children are the ones which are found in connection with schoolmasters and teachers. The duties of magistrates may be reduced to these heads, one, to require from their subjects obedience and external propriety according to both tables of the Decalogue, two, to enforce the precepts of the Decalogue by defending those who yield obedience to it and punishing those as are disobedient, three, to enact certain positive laws for the maintenance of civil order. By positive laws we mean such as determine and prescribe those circumstances which are necessary for the preservation of the order and honour of the state, and which contribute to the obedience which the law of God requires. four, the execution of the laws which they prescribe from time to time. There are two extremes in opposition to the duties of magistrates. The first is remissness, or a want of proper attention to their duties, which shows itself either in not requiring from their subjects obedience to the whole decalogue, or in not enacting such things as are necessary for the preservation and order of civil society, or in not defending the innocent from the wrongs which may be inflicted upon them, or in not enforcing or punishing too lightly those who violate the law of God, or such positive laws as have been enacted from time to time. The other extreme is tyranny, which consists either in demanding from their subjects what is unjust, or in not punishing those who sin, or in punishing them more severely than the offence which they have committed calls for. The duties of masters are, one, to enjoin upon their servants such things as are just and possible, or to command such works as are becoming and lawful, and not such as are unlawful, impossible, oppressive, and unnecessary. 2. To afford them proper food and reward for their labour. 3. To rule and govern them with such discipline as is suited to their case. The whip, fodder, and burdens belong to the ass, bread and correction to the servant. The faults of masters are 2. To indulge their slaves in idleness, slothfulness, and licentiousness. 2. To command things which are unjust, and to oppress them by exacting too much from them. 3. To withhold from them proper food and wages. 4. To exasperate their household by the exercise of too much rigour and severity. The duty of elders and others who excel in wisdom and authority is to govern and assist others by their examples, counsels, and admonitions. These persons sin and act contrary to the duties of their calling. 1. When they are guilty of folly or of giving improper counsels. 2. When they show levity and a want of gravity in their manners and present a bad example to others. 3. When they neglect by their counsels and authority to reprove and correct others who are under them when they see them sin and do that which is wrong. The virtues proper to inferiors, or such as are in subjection. The commandment which we are now considering comprehends the duties which are proper to inferiors under the term honour, which includes first reverence to those who are over them, which is one, an acknowledgment of the will of God, who has been pleased to institute such an office, and to endow those who are invested with it with necessary gifts. To an approbation of this divine order, and of the gifts which God confers upon those whom he calls to serve him in this capacity, for if we are not convinced of the excellency of this order, we will not honour it. 3. Subjection to this order, on account of the will of God. 4. An outward declaration, both in word and deed, of this judgment and approbation. Secondly, love to those who are over us in view of the office which they fill. This love is closely connected with reverence inasmuch as we cannot reverence those whom we do not love. Thirdly, obedience to what those in authority command by reason of their office and calling, which obedience should be voluntary, as children delight to do those things which are pleasing to their parents. 
fourthly gratitude to superiors which requires that every one in his appropriate sphere aid and promote the interest of those over him according to his ability and as occasion presents itself fifthly moderation and forbearance which shows itself in bearing with the faults and infirmities of parents and superiors which may be done without any reproach to the name of god or which are not in direct opposition to the divine law from these things we may easily infer what duties are enjoined upon inferiors and what things in accordance with their own callings they owe to the different grades or ranks of those who are in authority inferiors or those who are in subjection violate the honour which is due to those who are over them either when they do not regard them as occupying the place to which they have been called of god or when they ascribe to them more honour than is becoming to men or when they hate them for executing that which their office requires them to do or when they esteem them more highly than they do god or when they refuse to yield obedience to their just and lawful commands or when they obey them only in appearance and also when they command things which are unjust and wicked or when they heap upon them injuries and reproaches and do not aid them in such ways and by such means as are in their power or when they entertain them with flattery and in other ways which are unbecoming or when they magnify their infirmities and faults or when they flatteringly praise their faults and misdeeds and do not admonish them with becoming reverence according to the position which they occupy of their pernicious and aggravated sins the virtues which are common to superiors and inferiors or to those who are in authority and in subjection the duties which are devolving upon all men or the virtues which are here required of all the different grades and ranks of men whether they be in authority or not with the vices which are opposed to these virtues are first universal justice which shows itself in obedience to all the laws pertaining to us in our respective callings that this virtue is here enjoined is evident inasmuch as those who are in authority should demand it from their subjects and provoke them to such obedience by their own example whilst those who are in subjection are commanded to yield obedience to all those commands which are just and proper the opposite of this universal justice includes one every neglect of such duties as just and wholesome laws require from every one whether he be a ruler or subject two all obstinacy disobedience and sedition three hypocrisy and eye service second particular distributive justice which is a virtue contributing to and preserving a just proportion in the distribution of offices rewards and punishment or it is a virtue giving to every one that which rightfully belongs to him that now which belongs to every one is the office the honour or reward which is suited to him and for which he is adapted rendered to all their dues tribute to whom tribute is due custom to whom custom fear to whom fear honour to whom honour romans thirteen verse seven the opposite of this virtue includes error want of judgment and particularity in distributing offices or conferring honours and in bestowing rewards third laboriousness diligence and fidelity which consists in correctly understanding those parts which properly and perpetually belong to every man's calling in life and in performing them according to the command of god cheerfully constantly diligently and with the attempt to discharge properly every known duty omitting whatever is foreign to any one's appropriate calling and whatever is unnecessary with this chief design that whatever is done may be pleasing to god and contribute to the salvation of our fellow-men and that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you he that ruleth let him do it with cheerfulness be obedient as the servants of christ doing the will of god from the heart whatsoever thy hand findeth to do do it with all thy might 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 11, Romans 12 verse 8, Ephesians 6 verse 6, Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10. It is also proper that we should here remark that this virtue does not merely consist in knowing what are the different parts of our calling and duty, but also in inquiring continually whether there be not something still required of us in which we are ignorant, for he who is ignorant of his duty, and yet does not seek to know it, is guilty of neglecting his duty inasmuch as his ignorance does not excuse him being voluntary and coveted there is opposed to this virtue one negligence or slothfulness which shows itself either in not endeavouring to find out what is duty or in willingly omitting what is plainly required in our calling in life or in discharging the duties of our respective callings unwillingly only in part and without becoming diligence 
too, a mere show of diligence or dissembled assiduity which consists in doing that which belongs to anyone's calling in life from selfish motives or for the sake of our own praise and benefit. 3. Curiosity which shows itself in meddling with and attempting things which do not properly belong to anyone's calling. 4. Love to those who are joined to us by consanguinity as parents, children, and relatives, for when God command that parents should be honoured, he also desires that they should be loved, and that as parents. And so, on the other hand, when he blesses persons with children, he designs that they should love them, and that not as strangers, but as children. The opposite of this virtue includes, one, unnaturalness, which either hates or does not cherish those who are allied to us by the ties of nature, or is not concerned for their safety. Two, excessive indulgence, which shows itself either in winking at the sins and follies of our children and friends, injurious alike to themselves and others, on account of the love which we have towards them, or in gratifying them in things prohibited by God. Fifth, gratitude, which is a virtue consisting of truth and justice, acknowledging from whom, what, and how great benefits we have received, and at the same time having a desire or will to perform in return such things and duties as are becoming and possible. Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. Proverbs 17, verse 13. The opposite of this virtue includes one ingratitude which either does not acknowledge or does not profess the author and the greatness of the benefits received, or which has no desire to make suitable returns for the same. Two, such returns or acknowledgments of benefits as are unlawful. Sixth, gravity, which is a virtue arising from a knowledge of our calling and rank in society, observing what is becoming and proper to the person, and maintains a constancy and evenness in the words, carriage, and actions of the life, that so we may preserve the authority and good report which we have, and not bring a disgrace upon our calling, for seeing that God desires that those placed in authority should be honoured, he at the same time desires that they themselves should guard and maintain their own honour. Now glory, being that of which our own conscience and that of others approves, judging correctly, since it is a virtue necessary for the glory of God and the salvation of men, is greatly to be desired when these ends are regarded. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. A good name is better than precious ointment. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. Proverbs 21 verse 1, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 1, Galatians 6 verse 4, Titus 2 verse 7. We may mention, as opposed to this virtue, one levity, which shows itself in a want of regard to what is becoming and of good report in the words, carriage, and actions of the life, and which has no desire to retain a good name and opinion amongst men. Two, haughtiness or ambition, which consists in being elated and filled with pride on account of the office and gifts which any one possesses and holds, so as to despise and overlook others, and to aspire after still higher offices and greater honour and applause from men, being actuated thereto merely by a desire to excel and be above others, and not to advance the glory of God and the welfare of our fellow men. Seventh, Modesty is a virtue closely allied with gravity, which, from a knowledge of our own weakness, and from a consideration of the office and position which we occupy by divine appointment, maintains a consistency and propriety in the actions and deportment of the life, regardless of the opinions and remarks which men may make and entertain respecting us, with this design that we do not arrogate to ourselves more than is becoming, or defraud others of the respect and honour due them, that we do not make a greater display of our apparel, walk, conversation, and life, than is proper and needful, that we do not esteem ourselves more highly than others, or oppress them, but maintain a deportment according to our ability and strength, with an acknowledgment of God's gifts in others, and of our faults and imperfections. This and the former virtue are, as has just been remarked, closely allied, for gravity, without being joined with modesty, soon degenerates into ambition and haughtiness. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Galatians 6 verse 3 Humility and modesty differ from each other in this, that modesty is directed towards men and consists in acknowledging our own faults and the gifts of which others are possessed, whilst humility has respect to God. The following vices are opposed to this virtue. 1. Immodesty, which transcends the bounds of propriety in the words, actions, and deportment of the life, 
both as it respects ourselves and those with whom we hold daily intercourse. Two, arrogance, which, in conceit and outward declaration, takes to itself more than it really possesses, or admires its own gifts and attainments more than there is any necessity of doing, and so extols and boasts of them beyond measure. Three, a counterfeiting, or mere show of modesty, which evinces itself in the admiration which any one has of himself, whilst he, nevertheless, feigns to be backward in accepting of honours and offices, which he all the while desires in order that he may advance his own praise and conceit of modesty. Eighth, equity, which is a virtue that mitigates, in view of some just and probable cause, the rigour of strict justice in punishing and correcting the errors of others, and which endures with patience such defects as do not seriously injure and endanger the safety of our fellow men, whether publicly or privately, and which studiously covers and corrects such vices whenever they are found in others. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. 1 Peter 2 verse 18. We may here also appropriately cite the example of the sons of Noah, as recorded in the ninth chapter of Genesis, and likewise the commandment of the Apostle Paul, respecting the moderation and gentleness which, par which parents should exercise towards their children in correcting them. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Ephesians 6 verse 4, Colossians 3 verse 21 and 4 verse 1. The opposite of this virtue embraces one, immoderate rigor in censuring and reproving those faults which proceed for the most part from infirmity without any serious injury, either to their own or others' safety. 2. Too great lenity which shows itself in not punishing or reproving great and aggravated sins. 3. Flattery, which, for the sake of gaining popularity or advancing personal interests, praises that which ought not to be praised or attributes more to a certain one than is becoming. End of section 66「Section 67 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sixth Commandment. Fortieth Lord's Day. Question 105. What doth God require in the Sixth Command? Answer. That neither in thoughts, nor words, nor gestures, much less in deeds, I dishonour, hate, wound, or kill my neighbour, by myself or by another, but that I lay aside all desire of revenge, also that I hurt not myself or willfully expose myself to any danger. Wherefore also the magistrate is armed with the sword to prevent murder. Question 106. But this command seems only to speak of murder. Answer. In forbidding murder, God teaches us that he abhors the causes thereof, such as envy, hatred, anger, and desire of revenge, and that he accounts all these as murder. Question 107. But is it enough that we do not kill any man in the manner mentioned above? Answer. No, for when God forbids envy, hatred, and anger, he commands us to love our neighbour as ourselves, to show patience, peace, meekness, mercy, and all kindness towards him, and prevent his hurt as much as in us lies, and that we do good even unto our enemies. Exposition. The end or design of this commandment is the preservation of the life and health of the body, and so of the safety both of ourselves and of others. All those things, therefore, which have respect to the safety and preservation of our own life and the lives of others, are here enjoined, whilst on the other hand everything is prohibited which tends to the destruction of life, which may be said to include every unlawful injury and every desire of inflicting a wrong which any one may cherish, with every expression of this desire. It is called murder in this prohibition or commandment, not because God prohibits this alone, but that in removing the effect he may at the same time remove all the causes which contribute to it, and that embracing under the term murder all the sins which are connected with it, he may, by showing its aggravated character, the more effectually restrain us from these sins according to the rule that when any particular virtue is commanded or vice forbidden, the general virtues and vices, or whatever is connected with it, is at the same time commanded or forbidden. 
We must here show, one, that this commandment enjoins and forbids not only what is external, but also what is internal. Two, that it prohibits any injury done to ourselves or others. Three, that it requires us to defend ourselves and others. One, that this commandment prohibits and requires what is internal is proven, one, by this rule that when an effect is commanded or forbidden, the cause is also understood as being commanded or forbidden. Two, from the design of the commandment, God does not will that we should injure any one, therefore he also forbids the means by which we might inflict a wrong upon any one. Three, from the interpretation of Christ, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Matthew 5 verse 22, hence the external murder there is prohibited, at the same time every wrong inflicted upon our neighbor, together with all the causes, occasions, and signs of these injuries, such as anger, envy, hatred, and desire of revenge. 2. This commandment prohibits every injury or neglect, not only to the lives of others, but also to our own life, inasmuch as the same causes are found in us, on account of which God will have us to regard the lives of others. These causes are 1. The image of God, which we may not destroy either in ourselves or in others. 2. The likeness of nature, and our common origin from our first parents, for as our neighbor must not be injured and hurt by us because he is bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh, so we are to inflict no wrong upon ourselves, for the reason that no man ever yet hated his own flesh. 3. The greatness of the price by which Christ has redeemed us and others. 4. The union or conjunction which there is between those who are members of Christ. Inasmuch now, as these causes are in like manner found in us, it follows that this commandment forbids every injury, or neglect which any one may inflict upon himself. 3. The commandment requires us to protect and defend our neighbor, for seeing that the law commands us not only to shun and avoid sin of every description, but also to practice that which is opposite thereto, it is evident that God does not only here forbid us to injure the life and safety of any one, but commands us at the same time, as far as it is in our power, to cherish and defend our neighbor. The sum and substance of this commandment is that we neither hurt by any external act our own life or the life of another, nor practice any injury upon our own or the bodily safety of another, neither by force, nor treachery, nor negligence, and that we do not desire, either in thought or will, any injury to ourselves or others, nor signify the same by any signs or words, but that we, on the other hand, as much as in us lies, preserve and protect our own, as well as the lives of others, and so prove ourselves a blessing to all. Hence, when this commandment declares, Thou shalt not kill, it signifies, 1. Thou shalt cherish no desire to kill either thyself or others, for what God does not will us to do, that he does not permit us to wish or desire. 2. Thou shalt not express or signify any desire to murder either thyself or others, for when God forbids any particular desire, he also forbids every expression of this desire, whether it be in the words, gesture, or countenance of the person. 3. Thou shalt not put this desire into execution, for what God forbids any one to desire, or to signify by external signs, that he much more forbids to be executed. The opposite now of all this is, Thou shalt aid and assist thyself and others, one, in desire or heart, two, in the signification of this desire, three, in the execution of this desire. From this, all the virtues of this commandment, as well as all the vices which are opposite thereto, take their origin. The vices which are forbidden in this precept of the Decalogue tend to the destruction of life, whilst the virtues which it enjoins tend to the preservation of life or the safety of men. There are two ways in which we may contribute to the preservation of life, either by not injuring or by rendering assistance to men. Hence there are two classes of virtues growing out of this commandment, the former including those which do not injure the lives and safety of men, the other including those which contribute to the preservation of life and the safety of men. The virtues included in the former class consist of three kinds, for we may not injure anyone, viz. either being not injured or provoked, or being provoked, or in both respects, whether provoked or not. Particular justice, which does wrong to no one, is included in the first. In the second, gentleness and equity. In the third, peaceableness. The virtues contributing to the safety of man are twofold, 
for we may be said to aid either by repelling evils and dangers or by doing good the first method includes commutative justice fortitude and indignation the other includes humanity mercy and friendship the virtues which do not injure the safety of men first particular justice injuring no one is that which does not injure the life or body of any one neither from design nor from negligence by whom we have not been injured unless god require it at our hands or it is a virtue which carefully avoids every injury which might be inflicted upon our own or upon the safety of our neighbour whether it be by violence deceit or negligence this is expressed in the words of the commandment thou shalt not kill that which is opposed to this virtue and condemned by this commandment includes one every injury which may be inflicted either by design or by negligence upon our own or upon the life and body of another two excessive lenity by which it comes to pass that they are not punished who ought to be punished by those who are vested with the power to do so second gentleness or placability and readiness to forgive which is a virtue governing and controlling anger is not provoked without any cause nor by one that is trifling in its character and where there is a cause of just displeasure it does not desire the destruction of the person inflicting the wrong but is indignant at the reproach which is cast upon the name of god or at the injustice and injury inflicted upon our neighbour it indulges no desire of revenging any injury however great it may be but heartily desires the safety and well-being even of enemies and those who deserve ill at our hands and endeavours to contribute thereto according to its own ability and their necessity or it is a virtue which moderates anger and shows itself in shunning all unlawful excitement and so moderates that anger which is lawful that it does not pass beyond the limits which god has prescribed and does not burn with a desire of revenge but extends pardon even to enemies notwithstanding their offences and provocations have been great and heavy so that the anger which is felt is not directed to the persons but to the sins of the wicked and that too in such a way that it desires the safety even of those who transgress under the most aggravated form blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth matthew five verse five the opposite of this virtue comprises one undue lenity which is not to be indignant in view of shocking injuries and which does not restrain or punish them or is at least too remiss in prohibiting and suppressing them two hastiness of temper with every form of unlawful and immoderate anger three desire of vengeance grudging and animosity third equity is a virtue closely allied to gentleness it is the governess of stern justice preserves a just proportion between punishment and crime upon just and probable causes as when in view of the crime itself or our own duty or the public and private safety of those who sin or for the sake of avoiding offence we yield somewhat of our right in punishing sins or in demanding satisfaction for injuries received let your moderation be known unto all men philippians four verse five the first thing which we may mention as opposed to this virtue is immoderate severity or cruelty as when there is no proper regard to the circumstances under which men do wrong concerning which it is said extreme right is extreme wrong two too great lenity which shows itself in not being influenced by those things which ought to influence us as when god commands etc three partiality fourth peaceableness or a desire of peace and harmony is a virtue which consists in diligently and carefully avoiding all unnecessary occasions and causes of offence discord strife and hatred and in reconciling those who are offended either at us or at others and which for the sake of retaining or preserving peace does not shrink from troubles or from the endurance of injuries so long as there is no reproach cast upon the name of god or grievous wrong inflicted upon our own safety or that of others in a word it is a virtue avoiding all offences and occasions of anger and discord and which at the same time endeavours to remove and bring to an end such strifes and misunderstandings as arise from time to time there is opposed to this virtue one quarrelsomeness which shows itself in giving and seizing occasions of strife to which there is attached an eager desire or delight in contention slandering backbiting whispering etc hence all contentious persons slanderers backbiters whisperers etc are here condemned two such a lenity as when any one desires to keep peace without any proper regard to the glory of god 
for his own and neighbor's safety. This is a sinful gratification. The virtues which contribute to the safety of men. Fifth, commutative justice in punishing is a virtue which preserves an equality between offences and punishments, inflicting either equal punishments or less in view of just and satisfactory causes, having a proper regard to the circumstances which should ever be taken into consideration in civil courts for the sake of maintaining the glory of God and the preservation of human society. For when God forbids the infliction of any wrong upon society, and wills that the magistrate be the defender and preserver of order according to the whole decalogue, he also designs that those who manifestly and grossly violate this order be restrained and kept within the proper bounds by just punishments. The magistrate, therefore, may be guilty of doing wrong, not only in being cruel and unjustly severe, but also in being too lenient and in granting permission to certain persons to injure others. Because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life and thy people for his people. He that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. Ye shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer, which is guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death. 1 Kings 20 verse 42, Leviticus 24 verse 17, Numbers 35 verse 31. This form of justice therefore belongs to this commandment. Objection. It is here said, Thou shalt not kill, therefore no one must be put to death. Consequently, this justice is not comprehended in this commandment, inasmuch as it cannot be maintained without putting many to death. Answer. Thou shalt not kill, that is, not thou who art merely a private person, according to thy judgment and desire, when I do not command thee and give thee any warrant from this law. But this does not do away with the office of the magistrate, for he is the minister of God and does not bear the sword in vain. Romans 13 verse 4. Hence, when the magistrate puts wicked transgressors to death, it is not man but God who is the executioner of the deed. We may also reply to this objection by reversing the argument thus. Therefore some are to be put to death, lest human society be destroyed by thieves and robbers. The opposite of this virtue is 1. Cruelty or too great severity, 2. Private revenge, 3. Lenity when those are not punished who ought to be punished, 4. Partiality, or to express it more briefly we may say that the opposite of commutative justice is injustice, which either does not punish at all or else punishes unjustly. 6. Fortitude is a virtue which braves such dangers as sound reasons require us to meet and encounter for the glory of God, the salvation of the Church and Commonwealth, and for the preservation and defence either of ourselves or others against grievous wrongs and oppressions. The fortitude of the saints springs from faith, hope, and the love of God and our neighbour. Heroic fortitude is a special gift of God, as in the case of Joshua, Samson, Gideon, David, etc., Warlike fortitude is the defender of justice and the undertaker of just defense respecting ourselves and others, although it is not accomplished without great danger. War is either a necessary defense against such as are guilty of robbery, cruelty, or oppression, or it is a just punishment for wicked outrages, which is undertaken by the force of arms by the ordinary power. The opposite of this virtue comprises timidity, which shows itself in flying from necessary dangers, and presumption or foolhardiness in rushing into dangers unnecessarily. Seventh, indignation or zeal is, from a love of justice and from a regard to our neighbour, to be indignant on account of some grievous or outrageous wrong inflicted upon the innocent, and which, according to the ability which any one possesses, endeavours to repel and revenge the wrong according to the commandment of God. Or it is a virtue which is justly provoked and indignant, on account of reproach cast upon the name of God, and on account of some grievous wrong, by which either God or our neighbour is injured. There is opposed to this, one, unjust anger, two, lenity or remissness which shows itself when there is no just grief or indignation felt in view of grievous injuries, and when there is no disposition to avenge them. Eighth, humanity or philanthropy, specially and properly so called, is a true and sincere good will and desire to perform towards men what we desire others to perform towards us, with a declaration of good will in such words, actions, and duties as are fit and becoming. Or it is benevolence in the mind, will, and heart towards others, and a declaration of it in such words, actions, and duties as are possible and proper. 
This virtue is likewise called, in the Holy Scriptures, the love of our neighbor. Philosophy terms it humanity. All men, by this virtue, perform towards others what they would desire others to perform towards themselves. Let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Galatians 6 verse 10. The opposite of this virtue comprises one inhumanity or moroseness, which either omits doing those things which humanity requires, or does the opposite. 2. Ill-will or envy, which shows itself in grief at the good and prosperity of others, and in a desire to secure this good to itself, or at least to avert it from others, mir nicht, dir nicht. 3. Self-love with a neglect of our neighbor. 4. Unlawful gratification. Ninth, Mercy is a grief felt in view of the calamities and misfortunes of the innocent, or such as fall through weakness and infirmity, with a desire and attempt to mitigate these calamities, or it is a virtue which pities good men in their calamities, or those who sin through ignorance or infirmity, and which desires to remove their misfortunes, or at least alleviate them, as much as justice will admit of, and which rejoices not in the calamities, even of such as are our enemies. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Matthew 5 verse 7 there is opposed to this virtue on the side of want, one, a want of mercy, or cruelty and hard-heartedness, which is seen in not having compassion upon those whom we ought to commiserate, two, rejoicing in the calamities of others, and on the side of excess we may mention lenity as that which spares those whom God wills to be punished, which is a cruel mercy by which society itself is injured, and also the person that is spared. Tenth, friendship. A species of humanity is a true and mutual goodwill between good men, formed by a knowledge which each party has of the other's virtues, or by the performance of such duties towards each other as are becoming and possible. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Proverbs 18 verse 24. The extremes of friendship are 1. Enmity. 2. Neglect of friends. 3. Readiness in contracting and breaking friendship. 5. Flattery. 6. Unjust gratification. A Table of the Sixth Commandment The Sixth Commandment, Thou shalt not kill, divided into 1. Forbids every unlawful injury inflicted upon our own or our neighbor's life and safety. Our neighbor may be injured either divided into 1. By forsaking him, or by not assisting him according to our ability, which includes a neglect of the duties which are required for the preservation of life. 2. By wronging or injuring him, which is done either, divided into 1. By external force or violence, as by 1. Murder, 2. Slander, 3. Injuries of every description. 2. By internal affections, such as 1. Anger, 2. Hatred, 3. Desire of revenge. The sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill, divided into two, commands the preservation of our own and our neighbor's life and safety. This is done either, one, by not injuring anyone, those ought not to injure others who are, one, not provoked, which belongs to justice, two, who are provoked, which is the province of gentleness and equity, three, whether provoked or not, which is peculiar to peaceableness. 2. By rendering assistance to others. This is done either 1. By repelling injuries from our neighbor, which is done by 1. Commutative justice in punishing, 2. Fortitude, 3. Indignation, or 2. By helping our neighbor, as 1. By humanity, 2. By mercy, 3. By friendship. End of section 67. Section 68 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Osinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Seventh Commandment. Forty-first Lord's Day. Question 108. What doth the Seventh Command teach us? Answer. That all uncleanliness is accursed of God, and that therefore we must with all our hearts detest the same, and live chastely and temperately, whether in holy wedlock or in single life. 
Question 109. Doth God forbid in this command only adultery and such like gross sins? Answer. Since both our body and soul are temples of the Holy Ghost, he commands us to preserve them pure and holy, therefore he forbids all unchaste actions, gestures, words, thoughts, desires, and whatever can entice men thereto. Exposition. God in this commandment enjoins and sanctions the preservation of chastity and marriage, and hence authorizes marriage itself, for whenever God forbids anything, he at the same time commands and authorizes the observance of that which is opposite thereto. God now in this commandment forbids adultery, which is a violation of conjugal fidelity. When God singles out adultery as the most shocking and debasing vice of all the sins which are repugnant to chastity, he at the same time prohibits and condemns all wandering and wanton lusts, whether they be found in married or unmarried persons, and prohibits all other sins and vices contrary to chastity, together with their causes, occasions, effects, antecedents, consequence, etc. And on the other hand, he enjoins all those virtues which contribute to chastity. The reasons of this are these. 1. When one thing is specified, all those are understood which are closely allied or connected with it. Therefore, when adultery is prohibited, as the most shocking and debasing form of lust, we are to understand all other forms of lust as forbidden at the same time. 2. Where the cause is condemned, there the effect is also condemned, and where the effect is condemned, there the cause is condemned. Hence the antecedents as well as the consequence of adultery are here forbidden and condemned. 3. The design of this commandment is the preservation of chastity amongst men, and the guarding of marriage or keeping it holy. Whatever, therefore, tends to the preservation of chastity and the protection of marriage is enjoined by this commandment, whilst that which is opposed thereto is forbidden. There are three virtues which we may speak of under the seventh commandment, chastity, modesty, and temperance. 1. Chastity in general is a virtue contributing to the purity of body and soul, agreeing with the will of God, and shunning all lusts prohibited by God, all unlawful intercourse and inordinate copulation in connection with all the desires, causes, effects, suspicions, occasions, etc., which may lead thereto, whether in holy wedlock or in a single life. The term chastity comes, according to some, from the Greek kazo, which means to adorn, because it is an ornament, both of the whole man and also of all the other graces or virtues. The name has therefore been given to this virtue by way of preeminence, inasmuch as it is one of the principal virtues which constitute the image of God, according as it is said, God is chaste and will be called upon by those who are of a chaste mind, and has regard to such prayers. Chastity is of two kinds, one of single life, the other of holy wedlock. The former is a virtue shunning all wanton lusts without marriage. Conjugal chastity is to preserve in holy wedlock the order instituted by the wonderful counsel and wisdom of God. The causes of chastity are, one, the command of God. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Follow peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 and 4. Hebrews 12, verse 14. 2. The preservation of the image of God. 3. A desire to avoid defacing or marring the image of God and the union between Christ and the Church, of which Paul speaks when he says, Flee from fornication, know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ, and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 15 4. Rewards and punishments We may mention as being in opposition to chastity, a dissembled chastity, an impure single life, whoredom, concubinage, incest, adultery, and all wanton and hateful lusts, in connection with their causes, occasions, and effects. All the various species of lust may be referred to these three classes. The first class or kind are those which are contrary to nature and from the devil, such as are even contrary to this our corrupt nature, not only because they corrupt and spoil it of conformity with God, but also because this our corrupt nature shrinks from them and abhors them. The lusts of which the Apostle Paul speaks in the first chapter of his epistle to the Romans are of this class, as the confounding of sexes, also abuses of the female sex. The magistrate should punish these heinous sins and abominable transgressions with extraordinary punishments. Incest is greatly opposed to this, our corrupt nature, although examples of it occurred in our first parents. 
These examples, however, were of necessity, or by a divine dispensation, and are therefore to be regarded as exceptions to the general rule. The second class of lusts are those which proceed from this our corrupt nature, as fornication committed by such as are unmarried, adulteries by persons that are both married, and intercourse between such as are married and unmarried. If a married person have connection with another person that is unmarried, it is simple adultery. But if one married person have intercourse with another person that is married, it is double adultery, for he violates his own marriage and also that of another person. Fornication takes place when those that are unmarried have connection with each other. Magistrates ought, by virtue of their office, to punish severely fornication and adultery. God appointed and required capital punishment to be inflicted upon adulterers, and although he did not appoint death as the punishment of fornicators, yet when he frequently declared in his word that no whore should be found among his people, he signified that it should be punished according to its heinousness and aggravated nature. There are other lusts which are committed by this our corrupt nature with an evil conscience, such as those evil desires to which we give indulgence, or with which we are delighted, and which we do not study and endeavour to avoid, which, although they are not punished by civil power, are nevertheless joined with an evil conscience, and punished by God. The third class of lusts are the corrupt inclinations to which good men give no indulgence, but which they resist, and from which they cut off all occasions, so that their consciences are not troubled, because they call upon God, seek the grace of resistance, and have in their hearts the testimony that their sins are graciously forgiven them. Marriage was instituted after the fall as a remedy against these sins. It is therefore said, in view of these inclinations, it is better to marry than to burn, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 9. Yet Paul does not, in these words, approve of such marriages as are premature, injurious to the state, entered into before a suitable age, or which are against good customs and manners. Second, modesty or shamefacedness is a virtue abhorring all uncleanness, joined with shame, grief, and sadness, either on account of past impurity, or on account of fear of future uncleanness, having also a desire and purpose to avoid not only uncleanness itself, but everything that might lead to it. It is called by the Greeks erdos, which means bashfulness or shame, which Aristotle defines to be a fear of disgrace. This virtue is necessary for chastity as a help, a cause, effect, consequent, and sign of chastity. The extremes or vices which are repugnant to modesty are 1. Immodesty or imprudence, which makes light of impurity, 2. Stupidity or unrefined and perverse bashfulness, when any one is ashamed of that of which he ought not to be ashamed, as of a thing proper and becoming which calls for no shame, 3. Obscenity and scurrility. Third, Temperance is a virtue observing such limits as are becoming to nature, propriety, sound reason, and the order of persons, places, and times, according to the law of nature in things pertaining to the body, as meat, drink, etc. This is the mother and nurse of all the other virtues, and is the cause of chastity, without which there can be no chastity, for without temperance we cannot be chaste. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness, and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfil the lusts thereof. Luke 21 verse 34, Ephesians 5 verse 18, Romans 13 verses 13 and 14. The extremes of temperance are 1. Intemperance in meat and drink, gormandizing, gluttony, drunkenness, inebriation, which signifies properly not the excess itself of drinking, but the nausea and reeling of the head, which are felt the day following. 2. Luxury, which is too much prodigality and profusion in food, clothing, equipage, etc. 3. Hurtful temperance, or too great abstinence, and such as does not agree with our nature, as the temperance of hermits and superstitious fasts. End of section 68section 69 of commentary on the heidelberg catechism by zacharias asinus translated by g w williard this librivox recording is in the public domain on marriage since this commandment sanctions and authorizes marriage it is proper we should here introduce some remarks in reference to it and in doing so we shall consider 
first what marriage is second why it was instituted third what marriages are lawful fourth whether it be a thing indifferent fifth what duties devolve upon married persons sixth what things are contrary to marriage first what is marriage marriage is a lawful and indissoluble union between one man and one woman instituted by god for the propagation of the human race that we may know him to be chaste and to hate all lust and that he will gather to himself out of the whole human race thus lawfully propagated an everlasting church which shall rightly know and worship him and that it may be a society of labours toils cares and prayers between persons living in a state of matrimony second why was marriage instituted god himself is the author of marriage it is therefore no human device or invention but was invented by god himself in paradise before the fall of man the causes on account of which it was instituted are as we may learn from the definition which we have just given one that it might be the means of perpetuating and multiplying the human race in a lawful manner two the gathering of the church three that it might be an image or resemblance of the union between christ and the church four that wanton and wandering lusts might in this way be avoided five that there might be a society of labor and prayer between those who are married this society or connection is closer and more intimate than that which exists between men generally hence the prayers of those who are living in this state are more ardent inasmuch as we more earnestly desire to help those by our prayers to whom we are united in the closest relations of life as parents pray more fervently for their children than the children do for their parents for the reason as it is commonly said love descends not ascends third what marriages are lawful that the union constituted by marriage may be lawful the following things are necessary one that it be a union contracted between persons fit to be joined together two that it be contracted by the consent of both parties three that it meet the approbation of parents or those who are in the place of parents and whose consent is required by the law four that no mistake or error be made in the persons five that suitable conditions propriety and lawful means be observed in the contract six that it be contracted between two persons only the twain shall be one flesh genesis two verse twenty three matthew nineteen verse five the fathers who lived under the old testament had many wives but we must judge of the propriety and lawfulness of a thing not by examples but by law seven that it be contracted in the lord that is between the faithful and with prayer eight that it be not contracted between persons who are forbidden or who are of such near relationship or degrees of kindred as are forbidden by god and wholesome laws kindred or relation by blood is either consanguinity or affinity there are some however who regard kindred and consanguinity as one and the same thing consanguinity is between persons having sprung from the same stock or family being closely allied by blood affinity is the relation between a man and his wife's kindred arising from marriage the stock is the person from whom the rest proceed or spring those now who are related by blood are distinguished by lineage and degree lineage is the order or line of kinsfolk descending from one stock the degree which distinguishes them is the distance of kinsfolk whether on the side of the father or mother from the original stock this common rule is to be observed in reference to these degrees there are as many degrees as there are persons who have sprung from the stock the law of god forbids the second degree in marriage wise and wholesome political laws forbid also the third degree lineage is either of ascendants or of descendants or of collaterals ascendants include the ancestors descendants include all the posterity collaterals are those who are not born one from another but from the same persons the lineage of collaterals is either equal or unequal it is equal when the distance of the common stock is equal and unequal when the distance is unequal the degrees of consanguinity which god forbids to be united in the marriage relation may be found in the eighteenth chapter of leviticus and that these degrees are natural and moral is proven one because the gentiles are said to have committed abominations on account of having violated them and to have been rejected of god on this account the gentiles now had not the civil and ceremonial laws of moses two because god punished or destroyed the world by the waters of the deluge for the violation of these laws or for indulgence in wanton lusts and incestuous marriages 
3. From the design of this commandment, which is the prohibition of incest, which design is universal, perpetual, and moral. 4. Paul most severely reproved the incestuous man who had married his father's wife, of whom we have an account in the fifth chapter of his first epistle to the Corinthians, and commanded that he should be excommunicated. So John the Baptist also reproved Herod for having married his brother's wife, in that it was unlawful for him so to do. Mark 6, verse 18. Fourth, is marriage a thing indifferent? Marriage is lawful for all who are fit or proper persons to enter into this state. It is a thing indifferent, by which we mean that it is neither commanded nor prohibited by God, but left to the will and pleasure of those who possess the gift of continency. It is different, however, with those who do not possess this gift. To them it is not merely permitted, but commanded by God himself, that they marry in the Lord. Hence to these persons it is not a thing indifferent, but necessary, as is evident from what the Apostle says, It is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. I say to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them, if they abide even as I, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. 1 Corinthians 7 verses 1, 2, 8, and 9 a proper regard should be had to time both in first and second marriages, nor should we give loose reins to our lusts and passions, but rather curb and restrain them by prayer and earnest efforts to the extent of our power, so as not to wound our consciences or violate that which is proper and just. Plutarch, in his life of Numa, testifies how carefully the Romans guarded against this and all improprieties in reference to marriage when he says, quote, "'Woman remained widows ten months after the death of their husbands,' and that if any one married before the expiration of ten months, the laws of Numa required her to sacrifice a cow heavy with calf, end quote, etc. The want of a proper regard to time in marriages is a cause of many evils, both in civil and ecclesiastical affairs. Yet those who have once lawfully and in the Lord contracted marriage may not break or violate their vow except for adultery. Fifth, what are the duties of married persons? The common and mutual duties of married persons include 1. Mutual love, 2. Conjugal fidelity, which requires that each one love the other only, and that constantly, 3. A community of good, together with sympathy in each other's sorrows and misfortunes, 4. The training and education of children, 5. Bearing one another's infirmities with a desire to remove them. It is the duty of the husband, 1. To nourish and cherish his wife and children, 2. To govern them. 3. To defend them. It is the duty of the wife. 1. To assist her husband in providing and preserving what pertains to the family. 2. To obey and reverence her husband. When these duties are not performed, there is a great breach of what tends to the lawful use of marriage. 5. What things are contrary to marriage? The things which are contrary to marriage are the same as those which conflict with chastity. 1. Fornication and adultery, by which conjugal faith and chastity are violated by one or both parties. Also, incest, unlawful copulation and abuse of marriage. 2. Hasty and rash divorces, which in former times were common among the Romans and Jews, and which are, even at this day, frequent among uncivilized nations. The divorces, of which we here speak, are not such as take place on account of adultery, but from one person deserting or leaving the other. 3. Forbidding to marry. End of section sixty nine. If you enjoyed this recording, please support our channel by subscribing, liking, and sharing our content. We would also be happy to receive any comments or feedback below.